Morgan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Sudden loss of weight might be cause for anxiety, but one good thing at least, it makes the pallbearer's job a whole lot lighter. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Once every year, an epidemic of lunacy sweeps across the nation. Some call it midsummer madness. You get sunstroke by day and moonstruck by night. I got my dose of it in a resort hotel. Jubilee Villa, the big neon sign across the roof said. Jubilee Villa, where days were given to pinochle and golf, and nights were given to lawn dancers under big sheltering pines. Like everybody else, I was dancing. Unlike everybody else, I had a genuine, non-dyed, natural blonde babe in my arms. Oh, you danced divinely, Barry. Hmm. You'd only put that in writing, Blondie. In writing? I collect testimonials. Oh. Blondie was a vacation guest with a ruby mouth and a slim, trim panatella chassis. Not an extra ounce of butterfat or chocolate bonbon anywhere on her. The name she gave was Linda Paris. I was kicking my heels at Jubilee Villa at Linda's own request. She'd phoned me to please come. What she had on her lovely mind, I didn't know yet. I was uh, too busy totaling up what she had on the outside. Well, I suppose the time has come to talk, Barry. Cruel words. You've probably been wondering why I telephoned you and dragged you up here. I stopped wondering after the second highball. Uh, down that path there, there's a, there's a grape arbor. We can be alone there. You've enticed me. Only to talk about my problem. Oh. I really do have a problem, Barry. Yeah, I know, with men. You've had that same one problem since the age of three, I'll bet. But leave us sojourn. A gray barber under the moon with a bewitching blonde at hand means all things to all men. But to a confidential cop, it only means work, police work. You have facilities for finding out about people. I do. Now, who do you want to find out about? Stuart Stoner. Who's he? A guest here at the hotel. So you want a confidential police check on him? Yes. I want to do the conservative thing before I... Before getting too enmeshed? Before getting engaged. And you're afraid Stuart is a low-down fortune hunter. Is that the number of it? Oh, well, he led me to believe that he, too, was rich. I'm assigned. What are the vital statistics on Stuart Stoner? Hometown, family, business, etc., and so forth. I know nothing except that his people are supposed to be in Milwaukee society. You'll know more when I'm through. Milwaukee, here I come. One thing about a long train ride, you catch up on your back reading. Came today after tomorrow, I returned to Jubilee Villa, full of news from Milwaukee. Bad news for Blondie. It's... It's all so incomprehensible to me. Then let me repeat myself. There is no Stoner family in Milwaukee society and no young aristocrat named Stuart Stoner. Then Stuart is a masquerader. It would seem. And so are you, too, a masquerader, Blondie. I check both ends of the matrimonial question mark. I'm a bug for thoroughness. Linda Paris of Brockton, Massachusetts. No such she-animal. Now, what's the real name, Blondie? Mary Ranseroff. A working girl. A wage slave. Department store ribbon counter? I'm a manicurist. You're putting on quite a big show here at Jubilee Villa. Where'd you get the wardrobe? And the $55 a day? My savings. Your pitch to snag a rich husband? It's just as easy to love a rich man. Touche. All right, assignment completed. Pay me off and kiss me goodbye. No. No? I still want to know about Stuart. Like you, he's fortune hunting. Oh. Well, I... Well, you see... You go for him. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding. 
Okay, then. I'll stick around a while. On the day I go, you can call me the guy who murdered Cupid. I didn't buck Stuart Stoner right away. I made a study of him first from afar. Watched his behavior like a guinea pig behind glass. A guinea pig with a pencil-lined mustache. I watched him whack a tennis ball. Well, nice. I joined in the gallery applause. I watched him elbow up to the oval bar in the cafe lounge. Much too green in the gills for an athlete and a haunted look around his eyes, like sleep came tough. And ordering the type of drink guaranteed to drown anyone's sorrow. Steve, another one of the same. A uh, double. I watched him playing cards in the casino. A two-handed game for stakes that could lift the national debt in Pongo Pongo. Well, that beats me. Guess it's not my night. Well, better luck tomorrow. Huh? That's what you said yesterday. Uh, I'm afraid I'm a little short of cash. Oh, check is fine, Stoner. Uh. And if you're overdrawn at the bank, an IOU's just as good. <laughs> A $6,000 loss for the afternoon's play. But what made it especially interesting for me was the face of the winner. I knew the face. I, I'd seen it around, on the streets and in the rogues' gallery. Lou Latimer, a con man, card shop, and plain crook. The question I asked myself was, why was a card shop accepting IOUs from a phony vacationer posing as a son of wealth? Latimer worked like a cop worked. He checked the pedigree of every sucker he sat down to cards with. Latimer had to know that Stuart Stoner was a made-up name. So why was Latimer accepting paper instead of cash? That evening, after a supper orgy of boshed and baked herring, I tackled Stuart Stoner in person. He was sprawled on a hammock, letting the supper digest. Evening. Hello. Craig's the name. Barry Craig. You, uh... Don't feel sociable? Frankly, I don't. That's a surprise. Why is it surprising? I've watched you around the clock. Tennis, cards, and chit-chat. I've seldom seen a more gregarious and sociable guy. Well, maybe it's a question of the kind of company. That remark meaning? You interpret it. You draw the line where I'm concerned. Now, if you don't mind... You want to be alone. Look, Mr. Craig, I've an absolute right... Don't let your thermometer rise, Buster. Who warned you off me? Why, why do you say that? Because that's my guess about our unfriendly little situation. So who was it? A oh, friend of mine. Your card partner, Latimer? What did Latimer tell you? That I was an unsavory character or something? Ah, you're very astute. All right, he warned me that you were, well, some kind of operator. Underhanded, a type that... Works vacation resort. Uh, words to that effect, yes. <laughs> what have I now told you Latimer was describing himself? I'd expect you to say that. You would? Latimer also told me you'd lie if trapped, that you'd reverse everything. That you were clever like that. Look, Buster, Latimer's a card shop and a crook. And let's settle a question of my veracity once and for keeps. I'm a detective. Here, squint your eyes at my credentials. The, uh... Badge is authentic. Did Latimer also warn you that I'd flash a phony chicken inspector's badge? I'm... I'm confused. So am I. What particularly confuses me is why a smart boy like Latimer would collect your worthless IOUs. My worthless... You're here using an alias. The name Stuart Stoner is made up. You've been handing a doll named Linda Paris a line of bunk. You let the impression circulate that you're loaded, filthy rich. But the odds are a hundred to one you haven't even got cash enough to pay your board bill. You were saying? I have nothing to say. Don't please heckle me anymore. I'm I'm spinning. Yeah, you are. In a steaming sweat. Your eyes rolling. You subject to fits? Uh, no, no. <laughs> no. No, no fits. Just just every now and then a feeling of suffocation, like like now I I blank blank out. Stoner. Blank out, he did big. Eyes staring blindly and not a flutter to him, hardly a pulse. And his face contorted in ugly red folds, like it was an outside picture of some deep agony inside. I left him as he was and went for help. The 
house doctor had been gone for almost 20 minutes before Stoner could put words together coherently. Uh, uh, please, don't broadcast what you saw tonight. You seem to slip into a fog then, Stoner. You got the feeling your eyes were seeing sights you were trying to shut out. My eyes were seeing sights? The eyes of memory, let's say. Well, like you were looking over your shoulder into yesterday. Like you were an amnesiac. What's in yesterday that gets you by the throat, Stoner? Oh, you, you're talking talk I don't understand. Stuart Stoner, you call yourself. Well, what's your right name? Oh, so, some other time, huh? If you insist on this sort of weird interrogation right now, I I just I just want to go to bed. Want help getting upstairs? No, no, I want nothing from you. I'll help Stuart to his room. Hello, Stuart. Oh, um, Margot. The house doctor told me you'd fainted. I came as soon Introduce as I... me, Stoner. Uh, Mr. Craig, Margot Swift. Hello. Mr. Craig? You want him, lady? He's all yours. Margot, if I can just have your arm. I watched them move away slowly, her arm around his waist and a love light in her eyes. A tightly trussed look to her figure, cold black hair, colored gypsy kerchiefs around her neck, and a look of experience to her. Older than Stuart, but you'd need her birth certificate to prove it. She was that preserved. Linda and Margot, blonde and brunette. Stoner was doing okay with the ladies. A while later in my room, while wrestling with a knot in my tie as a prelude to showering before bed, I found a typewritten note propped against my bureau mirror. The management regrets the need to terminate your stay due to a prior reservation made for room 211. Room 211 was my room. There was a deadline noted on the bottom of the eviction note. We would appreciate possession of room 211 by 9 p.m. 9 p.m. was one minute away. Correction. It was 9 p.m. I acted calm in the emergency. I tore up the note. I'd been slugged senseless in room 211, carried to a nearby lake and tossed in. Attempted murder. Somebody was very careless about whether I lived or died. When I was up to it, I had questions to put to the friendly management of Jubilee Villa. The guy managing Jubilee Villa looked like a wax museum exhibit. Skin you'd hate to touch unless you were a fellow zombie. And horn-rimmed glasses with lenses so thick his eyes magnified into the size of golf balls. A brass nameplate on the desk read Otto Henser. His attitude towards me was downright contemptuous. Mr. Craig, you expect me to give credence to this fantastic story? I do expect. Mr. Craig, you suffer from sunstroke. I wear a visor cap in the sun. Well, then, it is too much to drink. A man with your imagination should never drink. I've been on buttermilk since I arrived here. Look, Hanser, I don't imagine being slugged and thrown into a lake. Well, then, at least thank your stars that you are alive. No fault of my assailants. My guess there is he didn't figure I'd land in a shallow bed. Then you insist on this preposterous story. At the top of my lungs. Someone in Jubilee Villa resents my being around. I'm a meddler. There's some scheme afoot and... Wait. Yes, Mr. Craig. The management of Jubilee Villa, that's you, wanted me out of the place at 9 p.m. tonight. Why, Hanser? A prior reservation for room 211. Sure that's the only reason? It is the reason, of course. I didn't comply with the vacate request. I went to bed. And from there, I was forcibly evicted. I woke up in the lake. Mr. Craig, there is no connection between our simple request that you give up your room in this, this hallucination. I'm getting awfully tired of you insinuating I'm a nut. All right, then. I will accept your story. And your explanation of it on that basis? A prowler. There have been other incidents, come to think of it. They, uh, a trespasser entered your room. You were assaulted. And, and carried a half mile from my room to the lake. Mr. Craig, the criminal mind is something unpredictable. There, there, there is no logical pattern. Oh, you sure have been trying to sell me one idea after another, Hansel. Why? Because I'm perplexed. Like you are perplexed. I think one thing and then I think another. I see. Right now, Hansel, I'm thinking one thing. And what is that? That you could be a grade-A 14-carat phony. The 
next day, I let the con man in card shop Lou Latimer tell me a few lies. Man has a right to live down his past, Craig. No question. I had a few brushes with the law once. Sure, I don't deny it. You served a few sentences? One sentence. Pardon the slander. I'm a changed man today. Pillar of the community. San Quentin community? Oh, the way you cops love to ride a guy. Beastly of us. Look, I'm a respectable businessman today. What business? Uh, salesman. Selling bunco? Machine tools. What are you doing here at Jubilee Villa? Vacationing. With a deck of cards in every pocket? I don't play cards the same old way. Meaning? I play for pastime. For profit. So I play to win. Who doesn't? Which brings me to a basic question. What? An IOU. I saw Stuart Stoner give you a $6,000 piece of paper. I won it fairly. Even supposing you did. How come you're accepting paper from a masquerader? A what? A masquerader. The name Stuart Stoner is an alias. The young man is here representing himself fraudulently. Oh, wait a minute, Craig. Stoner's loaded. He's from a rich clan. The Stoner's in Milwaukee. He is not. That's only a cardboard front. Stoner is a phony. And you know it, Latimer. How would I know it? Because that's how you operate. Before skinning a sucker, you check every detail of his pedigree back to the day he was born. You know how much he's worth or how little, so you can judge how much to take him for. Well? Well, what you say is a fact. If Stoner's a phony, then I, I'm in rook, huh? I'm holding worthless paper. <laughs> well, that's not me, huh? It would appear. But I still wonder... Latimer. What? See the giant egg built in in my skull? Up here? Looks nasty. Want to claim credit for it? Oh, the way you try to cut me down. You've some surface polish. You look distinguished in your Bermuda shorts. But you're a mug underneath and a thug. Look, chum, if this heckling session is over... I've got another insult, killer. Killer? Until you convince me otherwise, I'll go on thinking you tried to drown me last night. So long. One minute, Latimer. Now what? A token of my very high regard for you. <laughs> Love either conquers all or it surrenders. My client, Linda Paris, born plain Mary Randvahar, ran up the white flag. I'm leaving for home after dinner tonight. Goodbye to Jubilee Villa. Yes, I'm already in packed. Say goodbye to Stoner yet? Oh, we had a long talk over breakfast. And the gist of it? He admitted to having assumed the name of Stuart Stoner. What is his real name? He couldn't say. Barry, he didn't seem to know. Really offering himself as an amnesiac, huh? Look, Blondie, I'm here on your account. I can't follow your example, pack up, scram, and forget. Leave everything unresolved. I'm a cop, at heart and by profession. I want to know who, what, and why is alias Stuart Stoner. I want to know what Lou Latimer's game is and where the management, Otto Henser, fits into the scheme. And Margot. Oh, I'm glad you brought her up. What about the lady Margot? She and Stuart were close when I first arrived. I suppose I cut Margot out. Stuart began to chase me. Well, I can't blame him there. I've seen Margot in clandestine meetings with that man Latimer down at Prippet Lake. Anything else you've tucked away in your lovely mind as a significant detail? Mm, yes. Henser kept trying to involve me with other male guests as if he... To preserve Stoner for Margot in line with a three-way partnership. Otto Henser, Latimer, and Margot. I don't understand. A three-way scheme connotes loot, wolves, sharing a lamb. But where's the possible profit in Stuart Stoner? What's the bait for Henser, Latimer, and Margot? Stone is a phony and masquerader, a deadbeat. Maybe Henser, Latimer, and Margot don't actually know Stone is a masquerader. If they didn't know, impossible to believe as that is, if they suckered themselves in some attempted badger game, they do know now. I told Latimer that Stoner was a phony. Now, do you want to quit or follow through? I'm a fool not to mind my own... All right, what do we do? Search every inch of Stoner's room and effects. You play lookout while I play burglar. The 
results of searching Stoner's effects were a little frightening. Later, in a woodsy hideout, Linda and I shivered over what we found. Barry, it's fantastic. Lengths of copper wire, all cut down to convenient size. The tools of a strangler. I, I just can't believe then it. Then try believing Stoner's amazing collection of newspaper clippings. These. Mystery Strangler Terrorizes East End. Dateline, Minneapolis. And this one. Strangler Claims Elderly Victim. Dateline, Seattle. And these similar clippings. Dateline, New York, Boston, Shreveport. For one man, too. Operate east, north, west, and south all over the map. Yes, the scope of it. But this isn't one man's autobiographic collection of himself. It isn't? The dates on the clips cover almost four years. They represent a lot of stranglings and a lot of stranglers. A lot of stranglers. Some of whom have been caught and jailed. I recognize a few of the cases. Then? This is just a collection of clippings. Fetish is the word, I think. The pleasure the collector, call him psychopath, gets comes from the clippings themselves, let's say. The joy in some other fellow's crime. Stuart is a madman. It would appear... A madman or... Or... That's what somebody wants us to think. Mainly wants you to think. Me? So you'd scream and run. Glad to escape a fate worse than... All this is part of a scheme? Well, that's my surmise. But what basis do you have? The character of Henser, Latimer and Company. Thoroughgoing connivers who play to win. They knew the cop and me would sooner or later send me up to Stoner's room. This stuff was planted for me to find. Enough to disillusion me in Stoner, but not enough to pinch him. No real evidence of a crime or an actual criminal personality. What now? Well, let Henser, Latimer and company horse themselves into believing they hold trumps. That you're scared off. That I'm disinterested in any further to do with a nut. We make our fond farewell. We leave Jubilee Villa? Officially only. Unofficially, we're still around. We're holed up somewhere with our eye on this place, watching to see the next move of the gang against Stoner. But what can they want of Stewart? I finally come to the conclusion about that. One, Stoner is an amnesiac. Isn't sure of who he is and where from, etc. Two, he is not a poor masquerader, but a rich one after all. Stuart, rich? Uh-huh. Doe, position. And a good marital catch for Margot. Also a profitable game for Latimer to account for the IOUs. Also a Klondike for Henser. Otherwise, there'd be no reason at all for a plot. Well, that means they know Stuart's true identity. They do, but Stuart doesn't. So will you join me in hiding, doll? Where do you hide with a blonde? <laughs> Not being able to find a treehouse, we settle for an auto camp a quick two miles from Jubilee Villa, adjoining cabin. After two days of keeping Jubilee Villa under surveillance, we finally got a look at how Henser, Latimer, and Margot planned to play their trump card. The kind of trap they had baited for a weak-minded stoner. Sweet music in the cool of the evening piped into the grape arbor. The grape arbor set with intimate tables, a canopy of freshly cut flowers, a few picked guests, and the local parson. A marriage was taking place. Margot and Stoner, with Latimer and Hanser there to give the bride away. You're not going to let them get married. Shouldn't I? Shouldn't? Oh, Barry, you're teasing. Shh. I'll stop it, Blondie, but only at a strategic moment. The strategic moment came. The man in the high collar was reaching the end of his text. If any man knows some reason why this pair should not be joined in the bonds of matrimony, let him now speak. Speaking... Stop the wedding. <laughs> I'd played cop at Jubilee Villa fine, but I hadn't played Cupid so good. Linda left in my company, as it turned out, and not in Stuart Stoner's. That is, alias Stuart Stoner. Stuart is really Fabian Carlyle. So Latimer confessed. The Carlyles of Honolulu. Big shipping family. Will his amnesia... Might disappear, might reoccur. I'm not a doctor. Oh, I suppose I'll always regret it. Letting the rich one get away? Yes. So why did you? Stoner looked like he could be coaxed all over again. Oh, I'm sure I'll regret it. Want a last piece of advice? What, Barry? 
When you marry, have eight kids. With eight kids around, doll, you're too busy for regrets. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Midsummer Lunacy, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of blood money, about which Barry Craig has this to say. In next week's story, Blood Money, an oriental rug dealer finds himself as snug as a bug in a casket when a killer comes calling with gold in his eye. Good night, folks. See you next week. National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator, directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard Hilary Hall as Linda, Alice Backus as Margot, Tony Barrett as Latimer, George Neese as Stewart, and Herb Ellis as Henser. Eddie King speaking. Within the next 20 seconds, a fire will break out somewhere in the United States. Lives may be lost, property damaged, homes or buildings destroyed. Yes, there are 4,600 fires in America each day of the year. They kill 11,000 persons and disfigure or severely burn thousands more. The unfortunate part of this picture is that most of these fires could have been avoided. For example... 90% of all fires which start in the home can be traced to human carelessness. By obeying a few simple rules of fire prevention from now on, you and I can protect ourselves and our families from this devastating menace. Rule one is don't smoke in bed or discard lighted cigarettes carelessly. Rule two, clean out old newspapers, magazines, and other inflammable debris. Rule three, promptly repair defective wiring as soon as you notice it. Fire won't wait until tomorrow. Rule four, use only those cleaning fluids which will not burn. And last but not least, be careful with matches. Keep them out of the reach of small children. Remember, it doesn't pay to gamble with fire. The odds are against you every time. There's another exciting Dragnet adventure tonight on most NBC radio stations. Romo Seltzer and NBC present William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. There's a familiar saying which goes, uh, give a rogue enough rope and he'll hang himself. The theory holds fine except in one instance. What if the chap doling out the rope happens to be the hangman? Bromo Seltzer, famous for fast relief of headache and upset stomach, and the National Broadcasting Company present William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. This is Bill Gargan. Before I tell you about tonight's story, which I call Behold a Corpse, Here is a message from Bromo Selsa, famous for fast relief of upset stomach as well as headache. Miss Jordan, report to clinic. Miss Jordan, report to clinic. Miss Jordan... In recent clinical research, nurses reported that sparkling, refreshing Bromo Selsa relieved distress of stomach acidity and nervous indigestion better, more effectively than other leading upset stomach remedies tested. 
You see, Bromo Seltzer contains sodium citrate, one of the finest ingredients known to doctors for the relief of acid indigestion. And only Bromo Seltzer gently relieves nervous tension so often associated with upset stomach. Next time you have acid indigestion, take Bromo Seltzer. Like so many nurses, you too may agree. For upset stomach, Bromo Seltzer works best. Remember, for prompt relief of stomach acidity as well as headache, take sparkling, refreshing Bromo Seltzer. For best results, use cool water, follow the label, avoid excessive use. And next time your stomach is upset, remember that many nurses report... For upset stomach, Bromo Seltzer works best. Barry Craig speaking. A confidential investigator isn't always hired on his merits. His merits as a fact finder, I mean. Some clients choose you because they hope you're stupid. They don't want a cop. They want a stooge. You ought to be the front behind which they can keep a criminal operation going. You're the rubber stamp certifying their sincerity so they can get away with murder. Yeah, you get them like that. Cases phony from the word go. That was my first hunch on Brenda Connor, a brunette with a tendency to overact. We launched her case in Central Park in a handsome carriage, complete with horse, silk-hatted driver, and lap robe. Around the park at $3 an hour. But I wasn't paying the tab. The lady was. Why the handsome cab and the freezing weather? I didn't ask. You get used to eccentrics. The rhythmic slippity clop. I'm able to think. So who's the demon? Demon? The demon pursuing you. You have a flippant way, Mr. Craig. To cover up my emotions. I'm the type who identifies. A sad lady like you, I can cry harder than any little white cloud around. You were about to tell me. It's my husband. Funny now how it always is. Ralph Connery. He was gone for five years, completely out of my life. A long wait for a streetcar. I'd almost forgotten him. And then one week ago, he came back to me. And you resent his return? I didn't say that. That's right, you didn't. But you don't look overjoyed. No. But but it isn't what you think. I have no basic quarrel with my marriage, even despite the separation, but... Throw the punchline. Ralph, this man who is my husband come back. I'm not so sure that it is he. I let Brenda Connor continue to unburden her soul over coffee. The tab was on me this time. How much coffee could a lady drink? Uh, my alarm's about my husband, Ralph. Yes? I, I don't mean to leave the impression with you that... That uh, you're sure he's an impersonator? Yes. My reaction to him since his return, my suspicions have been intuitive more than actual. I, I feel I, I don't know. Her well, husband takes off for five years and then suddenly he's back. How did you receive him? Gladly enough, at first. You asked him questions? Yes. His explanation of his absence seemed genuine to me, understandable. He'd been out of sorts with himself. Suddenly, 40 and restless, disoriented and neurotic, full of self-dislike, dissatisfaction with the career he'd chosen. Said career? Uh, realty management. Connor and Saxton. Saxton is his business partner. When did the doubt begin for you? The doubt, uh, intuitive as you call it, uh, that this voyager come back maybe wasn't really your husband. The very first evening, Ralph was different. A, a stranger I, I didn't know. After five years, he would be. Yes, yes, I know. But what I mean is the personality I once knew, the, the habits, the, the little things a wife knows about her husband. I could find none of them in, in this man. Little things. Uh, can you give me something specific? Yes. The, the foods Ralph liked, always liked. This man has very different tastes. And even his speech, his way of phrasing things, and his thoughts so so different, so very changed. And even something physical. What's that? Left-handed. This man is left-handed. My husband, the husband I knew, wasn't. Quite a switch, then. How about his appearance, looks? Oh, there are some differences. Still differences that could only mean time, how time changes the face. Ralph was full in the cheeks. This man is gaunt, thinner. Oh, mind you, I'm not saying... Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm confused. I'm so confused. I can't even speak straight, Mr. Craig. Hooray 
for confusion. But there was more to it than the lady was telling. There always is. I got a peek into what was omitted in the telling. The time was later that same afternoon. It was raining buckets. I had my formal tie on for a ride over to see the husband, Ralph Connor, firsthand. The great thing about a jalopy, it either starts or it doesn't. Mine wouldn't. Wet wires from the downpour, I figured. But my guess was wrong. There was a gentleman on hand to correct me on it. You'll only run your battery down, Craig. Get off the starter. A guy in a rain slicker slouched in the back of my car. Nice eyes and an easy grin. And a familiar swell near the left armpit. I knew what that swell was. I had one myself to match it. A gun holster. The wires aren't wet, Craig. There's another reason she won't start. What's that? This. Here. Your rotor. Rotor? You don't know about cars? I know they go or don't go. The rotor belongs under the hood on the engine where the distributor is. I removed it. Why? So your car wouldn't go. Why again? So you'd bum a ride from me. Where are you parked? Right behind you. Come on, I'll show for you. You sound like you know where I'm going. Yeah, I think so. See Ralph Connor. You want to look him over? You're well informed. I took courses in mind reading. Come on, I'll drive you. To Ralph Connor, this is? No, not right away. I've got something else to show you first. Are you stalling, Craig? No, I'm thinking. How about? The penalty for armed kidnapping. Twenty years. Life if you cross state lines. That's the Lindbergh law. And the chair, if you compound kidnapping with murder. So what's it to be, Craig? I'd been grabbed at gunpoint before, but this one had a new wrinkle. No violence, no dent in my skull. No impulsive ride to the country. Just a short ride over to Queens, to a roadhouse you had to shove your way into. More people and floor space. A jam at the bar and a jam on the postage stamp dance floor. People laughing it up. People living it up. Look over the dance floor. You see something? Yeah. Sweat and suffocation. No, I mean faces. For instance, over there, the brunette swooning all over the he-man in the plaid shirt. You see her? I see her. You know her? Brenda Connor, my client. Well, that ends my mission. So long, Craig. You're on your own now. Buster, wait. Yeah, Craig? The plaid shirt with my client. He's not Ralph Connor. (laughs) Married folks don't spend time here with each other. No, he's Chris Contura. He's a tennis player. A tennis player? Love matches in the hot afternoon sun and love matches under hot blue lights with slender ladies with fat checkbooks. Is this why you brought me here? To show you a two-timing wife so you discount half to 90% of what she told you. Look, uh... As long as we're talking... I've said all I want to. Uh, so you won't knock yourself out identifying me when I'm gone. Here's my card. So long again. The card he'd left with me read, Mike Hassock, private detective. The guy who'd put the polite snatch on me was a private eye. I switched my plans around. You do with new developments. I didn't try to interview Ralph Connor right off. I drove over to his residence to case the place. Pretty fancy. A townhouse all lit up like utility bills were no concern to anybody. There was a parlor floor drawing room that opened onto a stone balcony. I was enough of a gymnasium genius to make the balcony without setting up too much of a commotion. After ten minutes of eavesdropping on the rustle of thick oriental carpets, I got to listen to a live show. Brenda Connor and a guy I took to be her ever-loving mister on the other side of the glass. You've got that odd look again, Brenda. Look, Ralph? What odd look? The frail, pale princess in the grip of a nameless terror. Oh, you've been cruel deliberately. Deliberately? To unnerve me. Push me to the edge of reason. Push me... Beyond the edge? Into insanity, yes. I see. Now, suppose you try the shoe. I try the shoe? To see how it fits you. What's been your scheme with me? Scheme? I have no scheme. The terrified glances since my return, so nicely timed when company watches, so beautifully acted. And the way you contrived to look at me other times, the unfamiliar stares, if I were not your husband, but an interloper. Not an interloper, Ralph, but an... 
Yes, Brenda? An imposter. I see. Uh, I am not who I am. Is that what you're saying? Oh, what about me is so changed? I'd like to know, Brenda. Everything has changed. Your manner, your talk, your, your habits, so many little things. And not like the Ralph I knew, the Ralph I remember. An imposter, that was your word. Do you then really think I am not Ralph Connor? That I am somebody else, some diabolical somebody else playing at being Ralph Connor? I don't know. I don't know. It was time to get off the balcony and make a more formal entrance into the life of Ralph Connor through the front door. I started to do same when I had a mishap. Cute word, mishap. It can mean anything. It can mean a tear in your trousers from an unexpected nail. It could mean a ton of brass landing on your head. In my case, it meant the last mentioned. A ton of brass. <clears throat> it fell from a height, from upstairs somewhere with cannonball speed. What? Who? I was too sleepy to care. I just lay down. To Barry Craig in just a moment. Our American heritage of freedom is one of our most priceless possessions. Over a large part of the world today, totalitarian government has done away with many of the liberties we have in our country. Indeed, with the whole list of freedoms given us by our Bill of Rights. Freedom of speech in the press. Freedom of religion. Freedom of assembly. Equal treatment under law. Every one of us realizes the vital importance of keeping the liberties we have. But because we often take them for granted, we're not as vigilant in our defense of them as we must be. Keep democracy strong and our American heritage intact by being an active citizen. Serve on school boards, jury panels, and in the government of your community. Combat racial and religious prejudice and all attacks on our liberties from whatever source. Don't be a lazy American. Work for your freedoms. It's the only way to keep them working for you. And now, back to William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. One thing about consciousness, it always returns sooner or later. If you're not dead, that is. I wasn't. I had proof I wasn't. I could wiggle a finger. When you're dead, you can't. Rigor mortis won't allow it. I was on a couch with a guy slapping cold compresses on my forehead. A guy with nice eyes and an easy smile and wearing a rain slicker indoors. He was the private eye, Mike Hassock. Able to get up now, Craig? I'm up. What hit me? A flower pot, solid brass. It was on the window ledge three flights up. It fell? No. Oh, it was dropped on me. That's right. By whom? Me. You're working for the Mr. Ralph Connor? That's right. An impersonator. Stand in for the real article. If you want to believe a wacky two-timing wife. I see. Who owns all the loot in the family? So don't answer it. I can guess the way it shapes. My client, Brenda Connor, does. Your client hasn't got a dime. That stuff about Ralph Connor being an impersonator is the malarkey, Craig. Maybe, but answer me this. Can a man who's been right-handed to the age of 40 suddenly turn up left-handed? But don't answer it, Hassock. Think about it while I'm busy somewhere else. You're going to heckle Connor? Maybe. Oh, uh, Hassock. What? Come here to the rear window a minute. Yes? What's outside? The yard. Yeah, it's a backyard. Not much of a drop. Only ten feet, I'd guess it to be. Ten feet? So what? So one of us has to be discouraged. You've had your whack at me. Now it's turn about. Craig, let me go. Put me down. Put you down? Sure. Exactly what I intend doing. <laughs> you meet 
meet some guys sometimes who have to be paid back in their own coin. I didn't set up a talk with Ralph Connor. I passed him up a second time. I had nothing to say to him yet. Instead, I looked up Saxton of Connor and Saxton Realty Management. Connor's business partner. Maybe he could shed some light. A short guy with two stomachs and pink ears like he was always blushing. There was an oily look to him like he was an accomplished phony. I still don't quite understand the purpose of your call here to me, Mr. Craig. If you've stalled long enough, Saxon... If I've stalled? Worked out answers in your head. Well, I, I have no ulterior motives in evading you. Then? Well, it's just that uh, I, I don't care to become embroiled in the man's affairs. Uh, that is, his affairs other than our joint business. Frankly, I've always found Connor strange and unpredictable. Explosive. He was gone for five years. Yes. Did you keep his end of the business up for all that time? Oh, yes, scrupulously. His share of the net profits were put into an escrow account uh, for what they amounted to. His uh, drawing account, of course, was suspended while he was gone. In the time he was away, did he write to you, keep in touch? Uh, No. Now a big question. Is he Ralph Connor? Yes, Mr. Craig. You don't seem surprised at the question. No, no, I'm not surprised anymore. I, I've been asked the same question before. By who? Two persons. By Mrs. Connor and by a private detective named Mike Hasick. So Hasick wasn't so sure of his client's identity either. Uh, what's that you said? Oh, just thinking out loud. What makes you sure this new Connor is the same old Connor? Why, everything about him. Like... Like, uh, well, um, I, I don't know how to answer that quite. He he looks like Ralph Connor, facially and physically. He knows about me, our business, the, the background of our business. He's demonstrated all that to you? Why, uh, yes, yes, of course. He has demonstrated an intimate knowledge of our business. It, it couldn't be faked. Uh, the man simply had to know. Connor was Connor. Only thing, Saxton didn't sell me the notion convincingly enough. I double-checked on Saxton's truthfulness by applying some heat to the office bookkeeper of Connor and Saxton. Why, Mr. Saxton told you outrageous falsehoods. Outrageous! He didn't ring true to me too much. Good I got to you, Mr. Uh, what's it again? Uh, Pippet. I'm the one to tell the truth. Oh, that's peachy dandy. But uh, get around to telling it. Well, now, uh, Ralph Connor... Uh, the new one. He's a queer one. Meaning? Well, when he came back after being away all that time, he didn't know my name. He kept calling me Pippin and Poppin. Pippin and Poppin, mind you, when it's Pippit, like it's always been. Pretty staggering. And, and then about the business, he didn't know about the old Cameroon account. He didn't, huh? The, the, the biggest account in the Connor Saxton agency, and he didn't even seem to know he had it. Like this wasn't his business. What else? Well, uh, his easy way about money. Tipping me a dollar when he sent me out for coffee. The old Ralph Connor only tipped five cents. Is the new Ralph Connor also easy about money in other ways? Business ways, for instance. I, I, I don't know what you mean. I mean, like, not asking for an accounting from Saxton to cover the five years Connor was away. Well, then, there never was an accounting. And, and Mr. Connor never yet asked for one. Well, you'd know that. You're the bookkeeper. Oh, yes, yes. I'd be the one to know, all right. Is there an escrow account with Connor's share of the profits of the last five years in it? Oh, no, there's no escrow account. Well, were there any profits the last five years Connor's been away? Oh, yes, yes, good profits. Business has been very good. Uh, how good were the profits? Well, I, I couldn't say without going over the books. Fifty thousand dollars, is that close to it? It, it isn't far from it. And a sharpie like Saxton would have reason to play ball with somebody not the real Connor, but an impersonator. Keep all the accumulated business profits, so long as the new Connor didn't stick his hand out or yell for the D.A. Well, I'm afraid now you're getting too deep. Oh, the, uh... forget it. Uh, you've been a great help. You can go back to your books now, Pippin. The name is not Pippin. Oh, my mistake, Poppin. It's Pippin. It was time to form an independent impression of Ralph Connor, I figured. The townhouse sat next door to the East River. I'd just gotten to the doorbell when I found myself doing some more eavesdropping. 
Nothing subtle this time. Anybody for a mile around could eavesdrop along with me. A scream has carrying power. A high-pitched woman's scream. <laughs> Brenda Connor. I could identify the voice. Brenda Connor at home. Either being strangled to death or blowing her top. Inside the house, I didn't get to see my screaming client. She was in her room behind locked doors. The husband, Ralph Connor, told me the melancholy facts. Or do I mean the melancholy fiction? Brenda is in there in her room with her doctor. Doctor who? Does that matter? It matters. I'm jotting it down in my notebook. Mrs. Connor is my client. Dr. Phipps. Uh, 275 Dartmouth Street, if you also want the address. Phipps is Brenda's own physician. I get your emphasis. When can I see Mrs. Connor? I don't know. She's under restraint. Restraints meaning? She's had a nervous breakdown. All of a sudden? No, my wife has a history of, uh, say, emotional instability. Hallucinations, compulsive behavior, a fascination for uh, unsavory places and people. That's a careful reference to the roadhouse and tennis Adonis. Mike Hassock made sure I'd see. Yes, so that you'd be aware of all the facts. Now, this emotional instability in Brenda, it's one of the reasons I left her five years ago. I've had all I could stand of hysteria. You'll make a glib case of it. It's the truth. What happens to Brenda Connor from here on? Hospitalization. It's not the first time Brenda has been confined before. And cured? Evidently not, as this new breakdown shows. Comes a time she's declared mentally incompetent. Uh, who gets her money? That is an impertinent question. I'll answer it. You do. You step into her estate. I'll even bet you've already got the petition before the court with Dr. Phipps' affidavit pinned to it. I don't care to dignify this nonsense any longer, Mr. Craig. So if you don't mind, good night. On the street, I had an encounter with a guy who was making a habit of it. Stop a minute, Craig. What for, Hasek? A talk. Friendly talk. With a gun in my ribs? The gun's for my own protection. You play too hard. So do you. I have to. I'm in it for the cabbage, just like you. Speak only for yourself. <laughs> You'll change your mind. A hundred grand. We split it down the middle. Who gives it to us? Connor, if you don't spoil it for him. Keep talking. Connor is a phony, an impersonator, like you said. The real Connor, he probably knocked off somewhere, the way I figure it. Not none of our business. Now... This Connor grabs the wife's estate. We let him. You let him. Then the bite. He pays us off. We own him. You're sure of your fact? I checked. I sized everything up. Connor's a fake, a smart fake, and a winner. Let's win with him, okay? Why did Connor hire you in the first place, Hasek? To follow his wife around, report on who she saw, spent time with, that tennis player, you. So now tell me, are you playing it smart along with me? What do you think? I think you are. Sure you are. <laughs> what have you got against money? I played it smart, the poor man's way. I didn't go home and let Connor play out his scheme. I went back to Connor for a closer look at his scheme. You've become a frequent visitor, Mr. Craig. <laughs> Every ten minutes, sir. I realized out on the street that I'd said things in here to you that were out of line. I'm sorry. Forget it. Thanks. I can see now what a screwball Mrs. Connor is and how I went for the bunk. Uh, the uh, only thing... Uh, yes, Mr. Craig. I'm a working operative. I put in time and sweat. Uh, I've had expenses. Oh, I see. You've got a bill and you're wondering how you're ever going to get paid. <laughs> That's it. Uh, it's no obligation of yours, I know. Oh, nonsense. I'll pay Mrs. Connor's bill. In fact, I'll uh, make out a check right here and now. How much is it, Mr. Craig? Well, uh, 100 will about cover it. $100. Very well. Uh, here you are, Mr. Craig. A $100 check for you. It means more to me than you think, Mr. Connor. Oh, you don't have to thank me. The money's due you. <laughs> but I didn't mean it like that. Guess again, Connor. <laughs> I, I frankly don't understand you. I'll explain myself. You wrote out a check, and you also wrote out a confession. A confession? You're right-handed. You wrote that check out right-handed, like Ralph Connor should, since he was always right-handed. Look here, Craig. Let me finish. But you've been deliberately left-handed. 
for Mrs. Connor's benefit since you came back to her. To confuse her about you, start her doubting your identity. See you as an imposter, but never be sure. Until she went out of her mind like she has. Would you... You can't prove a thing, Craig. All kinds of tricks like that to play on her imagination. You thin down, change your known habits and clothes and foods, your style of talk. All to make an already unstable woman a screaming lunatic. Have her declared mentally incompetent so you could take control of her money and her estate. How big is the estate, Connor? Big, I judge it to be. No end of money. It has to be a fabulous grab to rate your fancy technique in crime. I say again, you can't prove a thing. Because you're really Ralph Connor, huh? And can prove it. Birth certificate, relatives stuck somewhere, fingerprints. That's what you're gambling on. Why you're so cocksure. You're immune, you figure. Win or lose, you can't lose. Since you're really not an impersonator, but the genuine article. Get your hat anyhow, Connor. My hat? Where are we going? To the district attorney's office to see what charge he can fit to your kind of cute scheme. Offhand, I'd say conspiracy. But what do you bet the DA finds a few more in the book? You've been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Behold a Corpse, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Sinister Snowman, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I find that murder on skis is twice as romantic and deadly as murder on foot. When a skiing champion gets permanently stiff in the joints. Not so much from the cold weather as from the icy chill in a lady's eyes. Good night, folks. See you next week. Romo Seltzer, famous for fast relief of headache and upset stomach, and the National Broadcasting Company have brought you Barry Craig, confidential investigator, starring William Gargan. Featured in the role of Brenda was Barbara Weeks. Carl Caruso speaking. Tonight, enjoy Meet the Press on NBC. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig... Confidential Investigator. Distemper is a human failing, but don't ever try blowing the lid of your coffin. You'll only frustrate yourself. A national broadcasting company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. A long-legged blonde follows you to the ends of the earth. Don't always feel flattered, friend. She might only be tailing you. Such was my case on the public streets one sultry summer's evening. A doll panting after me, but keeping a discreet 50 or so yards between us. I got a look at her face without turning around. How? A gimmick standard with cops. A pocket mirror held in front of me. My pursuer was good-looking, with twin dimples in her cheeks and an aristocratic hook to her eyebrows. I let her follow me into a cocktail lounge. Inside, I watched her fidget at the far end of the mahogany bar for a couple of minutes. When the sweat began to spoil her makeup, I joined her. Hello. Look, you're wrong if you... Uh, If I confuse you with a pickup, I don't. Well, then... Cry wolf if I'm wrong, but I get the impression we've been inseparable for hours. Inseparable? I left my office at 345. 
I've been east, north, south, and west, and now it's 5.15. In all that time, the shadow I threw was you. Well? No, you're right. I'm sorry, I couldn't help but follow you. I'm your dream man? I meant nothing personal. Oh, that deflates me. If I can explain. Do. At 3.45, outside your office building, I didn't dare come up. Why not? I discovered that I myself was being followed. Oh. You were strongly recommended to me. As a confidential investigator, I could trust implicitly. To whom do I owe that bouquet? Never mind. I followed you, hoping we could eventually talk somewhere without being observed. Like this. What makes you think we're alone with each other now? What makes... You mean the person following me? I do mean. I haven't seen him for the last hour. Shadows don't generally quit any more than you did. Now, look around. He's not in here. Describe him. Unusually small man with an enormous head, totally bald, wore an odd candy-striped suit. You're describing a freak. He did look freakish, yes. Tell me, lady, uh, how do you uh, uh, feel generally? I'm quite sane, believe me. Which brings us to your problem. It's more precisely my husband's problem. Well, introduce yourself. Vera Baxter. My husband is J.C. Baxter. You say that like J.C. Baxter is a muckamuck. My husband is someone substantial. Rich, upper class, a figure in the business world? All of those things, yes. He hasn't been himself for months. He's morose, secretive. He can't eat, he can't sleep. I believe my husband is submitting to blackmail. Does uh, J.C. know you're aware of his situation? No, he doesn't know. He's always been violent on the subject of his own privacy, his own private affairs. Mr. Craig, I'm frightened for him. And for myself. Then you want me to pinpoint what it is that has your husband in the toil? Yes, watch him. Follow him if need be. See who the persons are who telephone and molest him and... And... and? If humanly possible, help my husband out of his predicament. Don't you maybe mean if morally possible? A fellow yielding to blackmail, he's generally a little dirty himself. I played tail on the monkey to J.C. Baxter for 36 hours, on foot and by automobile. J.C. leading the parade in an expensive custom job hardtop. Me rattling behind him in a jalopy no self-respecting junkie would even buy for salvage. I knew the trip wasn't just a waste of gas by the route J.C. was taking. All back roads and the fringe areas where the city began to look like the Sahara Desert. I watched him slow up crossing a small bridge. I could guess what J.C. was up to on the bridge even before I saw the parcel go sailing over the bridge rail. I let him speed off before I stopped. A familiar payoff pattern. Money thrown into a specified area. A blackmailer wanted dough, but didn't want to be identified taking it. I went to see how much was in the parcel. From the weight to the parcel, there was plenty. Plenty was an understatement. I only needed to look to estimate the payoff at $10,000. No bill bigger than a twenty. I restored the parcel. The anonymous caller would find it in the bushes below the bridge. He'd find the dough, and he'd also find me. The moon was out, and the cricket serenade was going full key when somebody came looking for the money. A little guy, not too much taller than the reed. A big round head to him, the size of a circus balloon. When he finally found the parcel, I found him flush on the jaw. <laughs> he came to with his balloon head noticeably deflated. He had a complaint. Oh, I'm bleeding from the ear. And I'm bleeding from the heart. Hey, what do you want to go and hit me for? I get uncontrollable fits of violence. Well, I... Hey, who are you? A cop. Your name? 
Lou. Lou what? Too hard to pronounce. Make a try at it. Zymoparticus. Zymopar... Oh, we'll settle for Lou. Yeah, I figured you would. Now, tell me why J.C. Baxter thinks your silence is worth $10,000 to him. Why J.C. who is what? The ten grand you had your fat little hands on in this parcel. Why do you rate it? Uh, let me take this slow, huh? You're telling me there's $10,000 real money in that bundle? I am. And that it's coming to me? You had possession of it when I caught you. Well, sure, sure, I had it all right. There's no doubt as to that. Only I thought it was just uh, some old paper. Work up an act, you'll only promote yourself into bleeding all over. Mister, let me tell you, I only came down here looking for old newspaper. What for? For the frogs. So I could make a bundle when I catch them. Catch frogs? Let's see. Uh, let's see over there by the pond? So? Frogs. When the moon is full like now, there's millions of frogs. Here, see this flashlight I got on me? What about it? Well, I sneak over to the bank there and I shine the flashlight right in their eye. It hypnotizes the frogs. All I have to do is pick them up and wrap them. Now, what do you want with frogs? The Valencia Laboratory over on Mercer Boulevard. You know the medical students? I get a quarter for every frog. That's your story? Yeah, so you see, you, you got a case of mistaken indemnity. You don't want Lou's um, Zy... Zy... Hepaticus. Thanks. <laughs> My own name had me. <laughs> yeah, we can fix that. How's that? Shorten it. Shorten it to a number. Let's go. Irregardless, I'm pinched, huh? Irregardless. Come on. The frogs won't miss you. Riding back to town with my frogman in custody, my jalopy began to shake as if age and abuse had finally gotten him. Hey, the heat shimmying from side to side. Yeah. The wheels are wobbling front and rear. Like, uh... Old age. Like all the bolts work loose. Hey, come on, stop before we turn over. You said arrest me. You didn't say kill me. Bolts had come loose, all right. Uh, any minute, you'd have lost four wheels. Yeah, but not from natural causes, Buster. Not? Human hands did this while I was down in the reeds pollywogging with you. Well, hey, why would somebody want... The worry? answer to that's in the car now approaching. You want to bet? The guy behind the wheel with a big beak pushing through a handkerchief he wore as a mask. The play was his. Who wanted to argue with a gun? Hey, you there, shorty. Me? Yeah, you. Climb into my boat. Me switch cars? You're rescued. By the boss, is it? You talking one ear comes out the other. Right now, I don't know what you're talking about. Sure. You only know from frogs, liar. So long, now. Now you, big stuff. That presumably is me. Give me a lip, I'll plug you. I'm speechless. All right, hand over the parcel. Parcel? Oh, yeah, the parcel. Here. Parcel at the back window. Okay, you've got it. The contents are intact? Check with your stool. I'm asking you. I held out a dime. You want it? <laughs> no, you keep it as a tip. That incline over there, you see it? Yeah, I see it. Well, start climbing it. What for? Exercise. Be glad I'm leaving you in shape to climb. Watch me go. He watched me go, and then I watched him go. No rear license plate I could read. He had black tape over it. I was up against pretty resourceful competition. That much was very plain. When I finally escaped from my country exile, I organized a progress chat with my client, Mrs. Vera Baxter, in an apple orchard. They lived like that, the Lucky Baxters. The big house in an apple orchard where the goldfish pond left off. That it's true. My husband is being blackmailed. He's dancing to a handsome tune. Ten thousand so far, I can vouch for him. It's my nightmare realized. The leg man in the situation is a midget with a watermelon for a dome. The man I saw following me. The same, undoubtedly. The gent ordering him around is self-conscious about his kisser covers it up with a handkerchief. But I caught one facial detail. 
His nose. It's a pelican beak. That mean anything? No, nothing. I've never seen anyone my husband's in negotiation with. Just what I told you. Just letters, whispering telephone calls, and mysterious conferences in the garage. Yes, that's right. Mrs. Baxter. Yes, Mr. Craig? I'm stymied. I've only got one next approach. What? Your husband, J.C. himself. Grab the dog by the tail. I've got to talk directly at him. Oh, no, please. Oh, without involving you. He won't know you brought me into it. What will you say? One artful dodge or another. I've got a lot of experience at being noncommittal. Well? All right, if you think you must. I, I have to get back to the house now. I'll wait ten minutes and then ring the doorbell. J.C. looked as morose as a guy could get and still want to live. Face tight, every muscle in place. Very close to the screaming Mimi. I find your visit a little fantastic, Mr. Craig. In my business, the fantastic is everyday stuff. But to single me out, why? How is what you really want to ask. How I found my way to you. I'll only tell you what I have so far. Let your imagination fill in the rest. You're paying hush money. You threw 10000 over the rail at Ramapo Bridge. Now, confide in me. I'll mind my own business, and I'll thank you to mind yours. For your own sake, Baxter, any rap is worth facing up to when the alternative is giving in to blackmail. Blackmailers keep coming back again and again. You won't have a dime left or a shred of self-respect. My advice is, open up and get done with it. I dared what you suggest. I, I wouldn't have a shred of reputation. You lick your wounds, take your lumps, and start all over again. Life's a long time. You can fall down and get up. Now, who's blackmailing you and why? I have nothing to say to you. Okay, then. I'll go. Uh, I'm in a puzzle to stay, Baxter. I can be delayed, but I can't be stopped. I'll be back with the answers one day. Bet on it, Baxter. Oh, wait. Now, you're smart to get it off your chest. This is in strict confidence. Sorry, I can't make blind promises. I was abroad three months ago. I became involved with a young lady, a young lady tourist. Oh, platonically, mind you, nothing compromising. We were only companions. Go on. There were talks. I was lonely. There were dinners and walks on the promenade. Visits to museums, the tulip fields in Amsterdam. Just a harmless diversion. But the young lady tourist made more of it, huh? She distorted our situation. I've been receiving letters here at home. Demands for heart balm, redress. Her broken heart. I'd misrepresented my status. I'd not told her I was already married. No foundation to any of her claims? All lies, a blatant fakery. I was only an escort, a friend. Why are you paying blackmail? To prevent scandal, to forestall any needless hurt to Vera, my wife. You feel that vulnerable? To pay tribute to a lie? My social and business situation is sensitive. My colleagues, all of them, blue noses, very provincial. For the merest breath of notoriety. And also, my wife is a woman of certain delicacy of spirit. A perverse sense of pride and propriety. I could never make her understand. Vera would turn against me. You see my trap. I see it all right, only I'm not so sure I believe it. You don't believe me. A man your size in the world, Baxter, top dog, a high social level, a howling business success. You don't figure to be stupid enough to yield to a blackmail built on a tissue of lies. No, I don't think I believe you. That's very arbitrary of you. Whatever's got you playing obliging sucker is motivated by something a lot more potent than an old-fashioned badger game. Now, this girl, what's her name? I'll not disclose that to you. And you won't either disclose what she's really got on you. She and company, that is. I've already told you all there is to tell. You fed me a line of bunk. I'm sure you can find your way out. Yeah, out and right back in. Watch for me. I'll be back to tell you some of the things you've left unsaid. Goodbye now. <laughs> In due time, I got to identify Baxter's young lady tourist. It wasn't too tough. 
I accomplished same at the customs desk of the International Airport. The passenger list of the plane Baxter had returned from abroad in three months before. Only one of the passengers qualified for the description of young lady tourist. Paula Wiley, age 23, residence Manhattan, New York, 216 Marlboro Heights. I found Paula at home, at home and about to decamp. Dressed to go out, and two suitcases at the door. Who did you say you were? Barry Craig. My credentials. Police? Private investigator. I bring you greetings from J.C. Baxter. Oh, you're not going to deny knowing J.C. How is Mr. Baxter? Oh, he's got an ulcer growing in all directions. Where were you going? Uh, away. The, uh, the Adirondacks. I have a summer job. Nice ad lib. I suppose I should resent your talking. Oh, but you can't. Guilt's all over you like prickly sores. I'll give you a choice. Choice? Talk to me here, or let's do it at the tomb. The chairs are more comfortable here. Uh, what am I being accused of? Blackmailing J.C. Baxter. He complained to you? Uh, how else would I be here? Why, the dirty, underhanded... uh uh, -uh. Now, try to live up to your ladylike looks. What did Baxter tell you? All kinds of things. Oh, it's still inconceivable to me that it dare. Dare send me after you? Yes. You did say he engaged you. Well, call him up and ask him. Confirm it. Be smart, baby. Hang Baxter with his own noose. What's Baxter trying to scare you out of? I'm not sure you're not handing me a line, a... Uh, come on. Oh, take the gamble. You're gambling anyhow. Blackmail has its risks. I take you on good faith. You won't get rich. I'm resigned to being poor. Baxter, I was with him in Amsterdam, Holland, the Diamond Center. We were picnicking and taking color pictures of the tulip fields. But Baxter was there for another purpose. Buying up diamonds. Industrial diamonds. He didn't know that I knew what he was doing. You looked beautiful and dumb. You can guess the rest. Baxter never declared the diamonds at customs. He smuggled them into the United States. Yes. And that's the real blackmail gimmick. Yes. Now, the uh, two gentlemen sharing your gold mine, who are they? Why must you know that? Well, I like to know all the company I keep. <laughs> ben Stacy. He's a sort of boyfriend. He handled all the contacts with Baxter. I never personally appeared in the situation. Well, uh, where does Stacy hang his hat? Down the block, the Baker Apartments. And uh, who is the little fellow with the pumpkin head? Lou. Stacy uses Lou for odd jobs. And other times? Lou works in the Imperial Bowling Alley. He's a pin boy. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, here. For you. Hmm. Money. Five hundred dollars. There'll be more for you another time. Oh, the things I could do with five hundred bucks. You're not going to refuse it. Take it, I'd lose my license, let alone my self-respect. Oh, then you're a cop after all. You're disillusioned? No, I half expected an outcome like this. But I took the gamble. <laughs> it's a funny thing. Yes? My heart's never been in the thing with Baxter. You see, it's my uh, maiden debut in crime. You're lucky. Lucky? Lucky to be caught first time out. It could prevent your becoming a habitual criminal. Let's go, huh? With Paula in custody, I looked up Ben Stacy at the Baker apartments. No answer to the door buzzer. A formal entrance doesn't pan out. You try an informal one, which I did. I found Ben Stacy receiving at home. He was in. He'd just been playing possum. Dead possum, that is. On the floor, flat on his back, face up and his eyes blind. The manner of death required no guesswork. He had a hole on the side of his skull the size of a quarter bullet hole. There was an ornamental touch to the corpse, a square of gold glittering close by his shoe top, a gold cufflink. 
not Stacy's. Stacy wasn't wearing French cuffs. The murderer's cuff link, apparently. It lay there like it had been lost in the struggle between killer and victim. It took less than 60 seconds to find the $10,000 Stacy had relieved me of on the highway. It lay on a bureau top, exposed to the casual eye. I had two brief calls to make, out of respect to the dead. The morgue and homicide. In the tombs, Paula wept for the dead. I got Stacy into this. It's my fault he's dead. You cry like he meant something to you. I was, in a way, in, in love with him. Did you maybe, in a way, kill him? Kill? What possible reason? Eliminate a partner. It happens, doll, among the best of thieves. You were going away when I caught you. Get out of here. You get out of here. In the Imperial Bowling Alley, the balloon-headed Stooge Lou looked like he only wished he'd lived a king. I can't leave here till 6 p.m., mister. The short of pin boys. Very sad. So come around and see me then, huh? So a morning band on your sleeve, Lou. Huh? Hey, somebody died? Yeah. You're once in a while, boss. Stacy? Stacy. Uh, what'd you want to go and tell me for? You'd rather I hadn't? Now I won't be able to keep my mind on the pins. Hmm, better that way. Now you can concentrate on your troubles. Troubles? You're fingering me for the Stacy killing? You're a suspect, chum. Please join me. Uh, oh, wait till I set up the alley. And lend a hand there on number four, huh? Like I told you, they're shorthanded today. In a more fragrant setting by the shade of ye old apple tree, Mrs. Vera Baxter clutched her heart. Murder? Murder it is. You've really got a domestic nightmare now. Oh, no, you can't let your suspicions... I can't exclude your husband as a suspect. He had a pretty impressive motive against Stacy. But he's incapable. He's a gentleman. An ungentle crook. A crook? Smuggler, I should have said. But the characterization of your mister doesn't really surprise you. No. No, it doesn't surprise now. Last night in my husband's study, I pried open a drawer. What did you find? Diamonds. A bag full of diamonds. Diamonds he bought in Amsterdam and smuggled across. Your husband had a little racket going for himself. It's incredible to think that he'd stoop to... To profit? The truth out in the open, that's what you hired me for. (laughs) Yes, the truth. I don't know how to live in fear. I, uh, I now show you a gold cufflink, this one. Can you identify it? Well? Uh, I'm not sure. Your eyes tell me you are sure. No good trying to evade, Mrs. Baxter. It's a link to a set I gave my husband. I had them specially designed at our jewelers. I I feel faint. Yeah, who wouldn't feel? What does the cufflink mean, Mr. Craig? I can't say positively, but uh, it could mean the chair for J.C. Baxter. Oh, no. While the DA's office figured out which of the three was eligible for electrocution, Baxter, Paula, or Lou, Mrs. Vera Baxter decided to be the best wife her husband ever had. She was in my office in the bright and early a.m. My husband couldn't have murdered this man, Stacy. Why not? I believe the word is alibi. You can alibi his time? I can. Jay was at home with me all that day and evening. Well, that's a sudden thought. Oh. I was too upset to even think yesterday. You wouldn't be telling a big lie. I'll swear to what I say. Jay couldn't have done this murder. Funny thing, I'm inclined to agree with you. I've been doing some clear thinking myself. You don't need to alibi him to save him. A nice try and a nice lie, but unnecessary as it happens. No, your husband couldn't have done the murder. Neither could the other pair. Not the other pair? Paula or Lou. You see, while the corpse lay on the floor, the 10,000 lay on the bureau, where I found it. I don't follow your reasoning. Neither Paula or Lou would eliminate Stacy and overlook the loot. Only the loot could be their motive to kill. Cut Stacy out, grab everything. And if your husband killed Stacy to stop blackmail, he would cart the $10,000 away. 
not only to recover his money, but to provide a red herring. Make it look like a job done by Paula or Lou. I'm glad you're exonerating my husband. But if you also eliminate the others, then who? I boil it down to one last suspect. You. Me? Uh-huh. You murdering Stacy to implicate your husband. Your revenge. What revenge would I want? Revenge for infidelity. You all along thought your husband was paying blackmail to conceal an indiscretion. You didn't know until last night that his actual crime was smuggling. Not philandering with Paula, but smuggling. I'm afraid you played some kind of a crazy joke on yourself, lady. I don't know what to say. Well, don't say anything. Think for a long time. And when you're through thinking... Make a simple confession, huh? You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Murder by Error, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of Death's Little Helper, about which Barry Craig has this to say. We call next week's story Death's Little Helper. It deals with a beautiful girl and a couple of highly unbeautiful corpses and winds up when a killer realizes that death doesn't need any help. Good night, folks. See you next week. National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production. William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard were Gene Bates, Julie Bennett, Herb Vigran, Hal Gerard, and Herb Ellis. Eddie King speaking. Here tonight's exciting Dragnet Adventure on the NBC Radio Network. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Overexertion can be dangerous, folks, but no exercise at all is even worse. Complete inactivity can only mean you're either muscle-bound or dead. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Cargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. speaking, every profession has its system of reciprocal favors among colleagues. A doctor consults a fellow practitioner. Lawyers put their heads together. And even private police operatives requisition each other's time and brain power. The colleague and competitor who sought my aid one fine day was a chap named Max Marcy. Marcy operated a one-man investigation agency a half mile from the dump I call my own. Not too young, Marcy. Long in years. Ready for retirement, but too poor to afford it. Uh, I'm 35 years in the business, Craig. I'm afraid there's only one way I know of to quit. Feet first, huh? In a pine box, yes. What keeps you coppering, Max, when you could be riding a rocking chair? Uh, the same thing that started me working three decades ago. Food, shelter, and the high cost of government? A livelihood, yes. Nothing sucked away, Max? Oh, maybe... Five hundred dollars in war bonds. Not much for a lifetime in harness. You know, there's an old axiom, Craig. Yeah, it's up there on my wall, reading Cops Die Broke. Work for me, Craig. On what? The man I frankly find impossible to locate. For three weeks now, I've used every trick I know. 
Every avenue. His name? Anatole Barber. The only clue I have is that he was once a rug dealer. A rug dealer? Oriental rugs. Fifteen years ago, he had a store on Third Avenue. Cold trail, huh? Cold like ice. Who assigned you to look for Anatole Barber? And that information is confidential. I understand. Client doesn't want his name bandied about. So you're really stuck, huh, Max? Oh, not so much stuck as... Uh, as? Sick. Exhausted. I, I don't have the old strength. You know, the, the machine runs down. This coming October, I'm 64, Craig. Then why not just dump a tough case? Why aggravate yourself? $2,000. Who can dump $2,000? <laughs> no cop I know. Find Anatole, Barber. I'll split with you. Uh-uh. The fee's all yours. I'll just tap you for expenses. Barber, a one-time rug dealer. You've, of course, got a full description of him. Uh, even a photograph. Oh, Craig, uh, I don't know how to thank you. Hmm. I'm not doing it for you, Max. I'm really doing it for me. I look at you and I see me. Me, a quarter of a century hence. I'm out asking a younger cop to help me stay in business. One cop runs into a blank wall. Another cop finds a door through the wall. The luck of the game. What was tough for Max Marcy was easy for me, as it turned out. An ex-Oriental rug dealer is a member of a clan. The tricky science of rugs limits the colony of dealers to a small, tight elite. One big family of operators, so to speak... My information on Anatole Barber came from a gentleman named Amar Serebi. Yes, Anatole Barber is well known to me. Under which rug is he hiding? Mm, for a long time now, Anatole is not in our trade. He had a store on Upper Third Avenue some 15 years ago, I hear. Yes, the Mecca Bazaar. He was the cleverest trader of all of us, Anatole. But he folded his tent. Why he gave up his business, nobody knows. You make it sound mystifying. Mm. Fine oriental rugs are more than a business, Mr. Craig. They're a culture and a passion. I might even say a cult. It is in our blood. Now, really enlighten me, huh? Where can I find your renegade colleague, Anatole Baba? He lives in Sackett Bay. Uh, Sackett Bay on Long Island? Yes. He's using his mother's name now, Belmar. His mother was English. Anatole Belmar. Yes. Tell me, how is it you have Anatole Baba Belmar's whereabouts at your fingertips? Oh, we have a trade association. I am corresponding secretary. Even though Anatole is retired from our trade, he has faithfully kept up his dues. I see. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Serebe. I've been privileged. Uh, you are perhaps interested in a fine Bokara rug at a great sacrifice price. Mr. Serebe, please, let go of my coat lapels. I phoned Max Marcy the good news. Hello, Max. Yes, Craig? That $2,000 fee, start spending it. You found Anatole Barber? Anatole Barber Belmar. He's using his mother's maiden name. Lives out in Sackett Bay. Thirty miles out in Long Island, Max. Craig, I'm at a loss for words. Why, it's hardly been twelve hours. No bouquets, Max. It happens. The breaks. I got the breaks. Okay for me to follow through in Sackett Bay? Uh, just to verify his presence there, how he's established. Uh, Craig, the man into flight. I'll pose as a door-to-door -door salesman. Max, don't worry. Uh, telephone me from Sackett Bay. Will do. So long. <laughs> At Sackett Bay, Long Island, the guy with blue freckles in the general store told me where to find Anatole Belmont. On an island a half mile off the mainland. Anatole B. was known around Sackett Bay as the recluse type. The gent with a black patch over his eye ferried me to Belmar's Island. He drove the leaky motorboat like a suicide. As many knots an hour as he had kids in his brain. Hey, Buster, slow down. That Buster, I'm two premiums behind in my insurance. No oh, answer. Either a deaf mute or not the talking cat. I found a suitable prayer and began to mumble it. Belmar's Island had overstuffed seagulls on it the size of vultures. It also had a shack. 
It's a shack put together with paper, paste, and wire. I knocked politely. Oh, uh, Anatole Belmar. No answer. I did the impolite thing. I just walked in. Inside, I again did the polite thing. I removed my hat. You generally do if you've got visiting manners. You even make a special point of remembering to remove your hat in the presence of the dead. How dead was Anatole Belmar? Dead beyond recall. He was hanging by his neck from a beam eight feet off the floor. I changed my first diagnosis of suicide when I saw the lump on his head. He'd been slugged and strung up by somebody hoping to pass it off as suicide. I had news for the local police, and after that, I had mournful news for Max. Back in Manhattan, USA, I gave Max the mournful news. Funny thing, though, Max wasn't too surprised. All day today, I anticipated just what you've now told me, Craig. You guessed I'd find Anatole Barber Belmar dead? I guessed, yes. Where do you hide your Ouija board? Uh, I'll explain, but first tell me if you smell something. Smell? Yeah, smoke. I smell smoke. Now come, I'll show you why. In my fire room. Look, Craig. You've had a fire in here, huh? When, Max? This morning. How come the fire was localized to the one room? Uh, chemical extinguishers. The building porter discovered the fire. He broke down the door and managed to put the fire out. An incendiary fire, obviously. Plain as my nose. And said nose is as plain as an aviation landing strip. I see papers were pulled out of your cabinets, piled on the floor, then a match lit to the pile. And when I found the fire, I knew at once you'd find Anatole Barber dead. What's your theory there? The client who engaged me to find Anatole Barber. I had his signature on a retainer, a form I regularly use in my agency every time I take on a case. So? I've carefully reconstructed the pattern of the fire. What files were burned, I asked myself. Who would have some interest in destroying a section of my files? And you finally fixed on this one client? The only active account I've had in six weeks. His file was among those destroyed. Well, it's a bit arbitrary as a conclusion, Max. And not so arbitrary when you're related to the murder of Anatole Barber. It's a fact, Craig. The purpose in engaging me was to find Anatole Barber Belmar so he could be murdered. And the trick with my files was to erase every clue there could be to the murderer. The murderer being the man who engaged you in the first place? Yes. What was the signature on that retainer phone? Alan Merritt. A traceable signature, no doubt. Since for a cop to find in some public record... That's why he had to recover it and destroy it. Yes. And the fire was set to confuse matters as a cover-up. Alias Alan Merritt. What does he look like, Max? Oh, like anybody. Nothing distinctive to his appearance. He's average in height, build, complexion, dress, speech. Oh, great. What reason did he give you for wanting you to round up Anatole Barber? The barber owed him $10,000 from an old business investment. He wanted to locate Barber so he could file a civil suit. A uh, fish story. A lie, yes. Surely a lie. Uh, Max. Yes, Craig. The sad truth is, in finding Anatole Barber, you gave an unwitting assist to a murder. Also, to uh, give credit where credit is due, so alas did I. We were fingermen. One other thing, Max. What? This alias Alan Merritt. Even with the traceable signature on that retainer form no longer worrying him, he's still got a loose thread dangling. A thread that can become a hangman's noose. What thread? You two ever come face to face? You can identify him. I can, yes. Are you reading my mind, Max? Yes. This alias Alan Merritt, to really be safe, he... He must also kill me. That chance meeting face to face, somewhere, sometime, fate's little irony. Your client must right now be fretting over it. He'll try to kill you, Max. And that puts us right back in business. Or puts me in a grave. To get at you, he's got to show himself. He shows himself and I nab him. Craig. What, Max? After you make the arrest, please see that Max Marcy gets a decent burial. <laughs> a hearse drawn by 16 prancing chorus girls, Max. I make you that promise. 
In due time, the attempted murder of Max Marcy, Private Eye, came to pass. On a quiet street in the noonday sun, Max leaning conspicuously against the stall window reading a newspaper. And yours truly deployed across the street, waiting in Washington. The attempt came like a clap of thunder from the sky. Max was just a wee bit hysterical. Quick, quick. Look how close the bullet came. Here, see the crown of my hat. A hair singe is beneficial, Max. Helps prevent premature baldness. Craig, don't joke. If I didn't joke, I'd cry. He escaped you? Totally. He was staked out somewhere on one of the roofs. On that, frankly, I never figured. Uh, now what? Well, we line up a second try at you. I'll have the roofs covered this time. All the men Lieutenant Trav Rogers over at police headquarters can spare. Sorry to do this to you, Max. The unfortunate thing about murder is you can't always predict where and when it will take place. We had cops staked out on roofs, Max sunning himself on the open street every day for a week. But when the second attempt on Max finally came, it came out of left field. It was in Max's office. In the afternoon heat, summer heat, that dehydrated you every ten minutes. I watched Max idle over to his filtered water cooler. I watched Max pour himself a drink. Ten seconds later, I watched Max turn colors. Craig. Max, what's wrong? Craig. I'm po- poisoned. Max. Poisoned. Poison in the water cooler. But not enough to kill, luckily. In the hospital six hours later, Max managed a whispered conversation. Craig. Yes, Max. One, two attempts. Number three. Ah, superstition. Fatalistic talk. Think of it this way. Two strikes so far. Strike three, the killer's out. How how long would I be laid up? Overnight. You got a mild dose. Only enough to give you stomach cramps. Oh, it, it's hopeless, Craig. Alias Alan Merritt would even more in the dark. Better to give up. He's shrewd and slippery, our alias Alan Merritt. But I'll find an avenue to him. From here on, I'm going all out, Max. For utter lack of a lead, I did next best to the aimless thing. I stopped in to admire Oriental carpets in the shop of my original contact, Amar Serebi. Yes, I have heard this sorrowful news. Police check disclosed that no next of kin, no relatives. Anatole Barber was alone in the world. How about best friend? Anatole Barber turned friendships away. He was suspicious and secretive. How about lady friends? Ladies? No, I do not think. Oh, come on. Even a suspicious and secretive recluse has some male ego. Some passing interest in the opposite sex. There was a woman. Oh, but such a long time ago. What was her name? Madame Mila Gallard. Know where I can find her? Nobody has seen Neela Gallard for mm, eight, ten years. How close was she to Anatole Bala? All I know to say, she worked in his store, the Mecca Bazaar. They would work together, take their meals together. Sounds chummy enough. Say, uh, Serebi. Yes? Anatole Barber's burial. The police have it scheduled for the day after tomorrow. A potter's field burial under the auspices of the city. Oh, this is regrettable. I shall see that the association extends the honors due him. That is to say, uh, pays the bills for the funeral. Well, that's fine, but uh, keep that quiet. What I want you to do is uh, kinsman's being given an obscure pauper's burial. Create sentiment and sympathy. Make old friends and business associates want to pay their last respects. Uh, give Anatole Barber a decent send-off. You think Neela Gallard will hear this and come to the funeral? Huh? I hope Neela Gallard will put in an appearance. Funerals are sad. But to me, this one was a joy. I was all smiles when Amar Serebi whispered the magic words into my ear. Gun standing there, wearing the black veil. She is Madame Mila Gallant. 
some hours later, I took tea with Madame Gallant. Her home was a frame dwelling in suburban New Jersey. A middle-aged woman, once beautiful, you could tell, but heavy lines in her face now like she'd known trouble times. I knew it was a mistake to come to Anatole's burial. Now, look, you're a dignified woman, so let's do this with dignity. Don't make me talk like a bad-mannered cop. I have a sealed envelope given to me by Anatole Barber. I have kept it unopened for 15 years. He wanted it kept unopened? Yes, he was afraid. Afraid of what in the end was his fate. Murder? Murder. Here's the letter. On the, uh, on the envelope, you will see Anatole's own handwriting. To be opened only in case of my death. You're in the total dark, making blind circles, and then a bar of clear daylight knifes through the blackout. Suddenly, you're in the know. I let Max Marcy in on the contents of the letter left with Madame Gallant. Oh, you're a bloodhound, Craig. I keep moving and hoping you sooner or later got the spot. Anatole Barber spells out his secret in this letter. Blackmail. Fifteen years of it. Anatole Barber had been blackmailing an important social figure named Wynne Blake. Wynne Blake? Oh, that's very hard to believe. The man is one of 50 best-known people in the world. In the letter, Anatole sounds a fatalistic note. Right in your style, Max. He expected to sooner or later be murdered. The blackmailer's chronic anxiety. They figure the worm has to turn. The sucker must finally strike back. Craig. Yes, Max. What? What's your attitude at this point? Meaning? Oh, don't misunderstand me, Craig. Please, but... But? You can speak out openly, Max. Well, do I motivate decisions from now on? Or do you? Meaning it was your case originally? There are these new ramifications. A lot of it, none of our business is private operatives. Then a man like this Win Blake, a figure his size, we, we bungle handling it somewhere, it could blow up in our faces. Come down to what's bothering you, Max. All right. Frankly, is it any of our business now? It's my business, Max. You can scare off and quit. Figure the angles and decide there's no dough anywhere in it. Only headaches and risks. But don't please decide for me. Murder and blackmail is a public business. And while I'm a private investigator, I'm also a public citizen. <laughs> You're pretty good at speeches, too. All right, forget I said anything. Do what you have to do. What I had to do was go see Wynn Blake, which I did. The Blake House was not only upper class, it was the top story of the upper class. And the guy who wielded the scepter in the palace looked every inch his role in life. Gray, distinguished, with a stiff, aristocratic spine. A polished surface veneer with only one thing marring it. His eyes. I'd never seen sadder eyes. I wondered when there would be that a man just like yourself, a detective, would come to Blake Manor. You've been wondering that nightmare for 15 years. Yes, for 15 years. The ordeal of it, sir. The eternal apprehension. The ghost in your closet clanking his chains. And these days since uh, the death of Anatole Barber. I've barely weathered them. Remorse? I'm not surprised at the innuendo. I rather expected it. Who else would care to murder Anatole Barber? I have no answer to that. Barber, a leech who's been blackmailing you for 15 years. But I paid his every demand all these years. Why then now would I want to do violence to the man? I've got a simple answer to that. You just couldn't find Barber to kill him. I did not murder or cause the murder of Anatole Barber. What was he blackmailing you for? What did he have on you? Without legal counsel, I'm not sure I... All right, I'll tell you. I was involved in an accident in the summer of 1939. Automobile accident? Yes. A late hour in the driving rain, very little visibility... It was on a downtown street. I struck and killed an elderly pedestrian. Hit and run, huh? I'm ready now to face the charges, but I was coward enough and fool enough to drive away. I let my panic override my better judgment, my more decent instincts. You see, you had a lot to lose, you figured. You didn't want a vehicular homicide against you. I, I just drove away. But not unnoticed and undetected as you believe then. 
Somebody saw the accident, jotted down your license plate number. And I told Barber. Mm-hmm. He operated a store where the accident occurred, a rug shop, the Mecca Bazaar. He saw everything through his store window. And he's bled you ever since. He promptly closed up shop and made you his chief business from then on, huh? He exhorted a fortune for me in these 15 years. When did he tap you last? Two weeks before he died. How much did you give him? The usual periodic $10,000 in cash. I left the money in a designated place, as I always did. Barber never showed himself personally. He wasn't taking any chances. Did you hire a private detective to locate Anatole Barber's whereabouts for you? I did not. No, huh? Anybody else in your family aware of your uh, predicament with Anatole Barber? My wife knew, and so does my son. Your wife knew, you say? My wife is dead. Oh. And your son, where is he? He lives away at his school. What's the school? Eagle University, a medical college. Stewart's in the senior class. But my son couldn't possibly have anything How to do. How can you be sure? I, I suppose I cannot be sure. Son trying to get his pop out of a situation. A son nervy enough to commit the murder his father shrinks from doing. Wynn Blake or the son Stuart Blake. I ask you, uh, who else would want to murder Anatole Baba? Craig went to college. College dormitory room is only a box built around silver loving cups, souvenir banners, and pinups of Jane Russell. Barber was vermin. Murder was too merciful for him. He asked me he deserved 15 years of some insidious oriental torture. Did you kill him? Did I what? Murder Anatole Barber. Yeah. Yeah, sure I did. He had it coming, and I gave it to him. Nice try, Sonny. Try? Try at taking the heat off your father. <laughs> My father? <laughs> Dad hasn't got the moxie for the job done on Anatole Barber. But you have, huh? I say I killed him, so let's not beat that question around anymore. Okay, we'll bypass that question for the time being. Now answer me this, and truthfully. Did you hire a private detective to track down Barber? I hired Max Marcier. Do you doubt that, too? Well, proof could help. Proof, huh? Sure. Sure, wait a second. Here. Here's your proof. A receipt. That's right, for $300, a retainer initialed M.M. My down payment to Max Marcy for his services. There was a statue in bronze on the college campus steps. General somebody or other. There was almost a second statue unveiled there about the time I was leaving statue of yours truly, stiff in the joints with an undertaker's glaze on top. A shot that froze me. Froze me, but didn't chill me. I was marked for murder. I had the case wrapped up, and the killer knew it. I brought Max Marcy up to date. Uh, the son is plainly lying to protect the father. That's my thought. Uh, arrest the father. Under arrest, he'll confess. To keep the boy honest, huh? Or to let the son take his, the father's blame. That's the ultimate cowardice. It's unthinkable. No decent father would. You're right there, no doubt. I, uh, swiped a photograph of the son off his bureau top. This, Max. Hmm. Handsome kid, huh? Yes. Strapping. Nothing average about his looks, huh, Max? Way above average in height, size... Very distinguished looking, generally. Crew cut. A break in the beak of his nose. An unusual looking boy, yes. That admission, Max, kind of gives you the lie. The lie? Oh, you mean my description of alias Alan Merritt? Do yeah. You? Your nothing description of a man you invented. The big lie you told me. I've just remarked on the uh, glaring flaw in your almost perfect scheme, Max. Scheme? Crime. You're accusing me? Of beating my time to Sackett Bay. Of murdering Anatole Barber before I got there. I found Barber for you. You did the rest. But, Craig, consider all the facts. Facts, huh? Facts like the phony fire you set yourself. Or the hood you hired to climb a roof and shoot at you. Or the modest dose of insect poison you deliberately poured yourself from the water cooler. All to blind me to your guilt. Or maybe the fact that you tried to kill me today on the campus steps of Eagle University. 
You are full of ideas, my good friend. Yeah, I am. How much dough have you got sold away now, Max? I'm penniless. Was. Until you found that gold mine of cash in Barber's shack. The fortune you knew he'd accumulated by blackmailing Wynn Blake for 15 years. You really tried providing for your old age, colleague. Words, accusations, talk, you need proof. I know. A tough old bird like you, it will need an army of cops to find that fortune you swiped and stashed away. Sure, proof's going to be tough. But let's start it going officially, huh? You're arresting me? Arresting and charging you. From there on, it's up to the regular police. I've personally gone as far as I care to go. <laughs> You're sentimental about me. No, Max. Not a bit sentimental. Just fed up and bored. You're kind of creep I'd rather read about you in the papers. Why knock myself out? Walk ahead of me, Max. <laughs> You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Blood Money, was written by John Robert. Next week, our story is titled, Hay is for Homicide, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week's story is titled, Hay is for Homicide. And the reason for this has something to do with a hayride and a farmer's daughter. With that combination, how could it help being a uh, murder? Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator and directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard were Jim Nusser, Marvin Miller, Betty Lou Gerson, Jack Moyles, and Paul Richards. John Lang speaking. There's another exciting Dragnet adventure tonight on most NBC radio stations. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Refer to a guy as the ghost of his former self. Look twice at the getup he's wearing. He might be sporting a bed sheet. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Barry Craig speaking. There's generally a lot more to show business than what people finally get to see from the 480 seat. The backstage, behind-the-scenes shenanigans of what is delicately referred to as the pre-production phases. Brother, can it get wild? Wild and very homicidal. The particular case I have in mind began innocently enough. It commenced up near Yonkers, in a rubble-strewn area that looked like an A-bomb testing grounds in the Nevada Flats. The ground floor door I went through read Luther Bassett, Canine Dentistry. Canine Dentistry. Inside, there was a guy in a short white medical coat. A pretty patch of hair on his chin in the style of old Vienna. Luther Bassett, I figured him to be right off. I'd never seen a goatee on a Joan. The dog with him was on the operating table. <laughs> A while later, in a cubicle off the operating room, Dr. Bassett and I tried to reach an understanding. I thank you for coming so promptly, Mr. Craig. Well, you phoned me. You said urgent. You said liberal payment. I liked your language, especially liberal payment. <laughs> now, uh, squelch my curiosity first. Uh, what do you fill a dog's teeth with? Uh, a T-bone steak? <laughs> the same as with humans. Amalgam, gold. The one you watched had lower bridge work done. Lower Bridgework, huh? Oh, that dog is a Broadway star. Oh. Fluff. You must surely know him. Oh, uh, when I go to the dogs, I do it on the east side of town. Never on Broadway. Oh, what play? The hit comedy, Mr. Galuli's Ghost. Uh, Fluff plays a big part. Oh, he gets a tremendous salary. Hmm. 
High living's ruined his choppers, huh? So, uh, what's the nature of my employment to be, Bassett? Something to do with dogs? Of the human variety. In show business? Yes. Oh, you're also in show business? Only as an investor. Uh Uh-huh. How much? And, uh, what theatrical? I have invested $20,000 in a proposed musical fantasy called 2055. 2055? The calendar year, 100 years from now. Oh. It is a fantasy about the end of the world. Hmm. Amusing thought. Who's producing it? Stanton Bishop. And, uh, what's your particular anxiety? Rumors that I've heard that the show is overfinanced. Is that bad? Well, perhaps I'm not using the right word. Wait, I think I know. A man has 100% to sell to investors, but he sells 150%. The show opens, flops, loses its nut, but Stanton Bishop isn't a bit worried. He has a load of sucker money salted away. If Stanton Bishop is a swinter and not a legitimate producer, I must know. You must investigate for me uh, discreetly. Uh, do you want a retainer? <laughs> Foolish question. Money in front sharpens my talent. I found Stanton Bishop in a rented rehearsal hall on a side street along the main stem. Black Hamburg, pink cheeks, yellow teeth, suede shoes. When I found him, he was pulling producer's rank on a lot of long stem dolls and dancing types. Girls, tomorrow I want to see more bounce, more jump. The title of the number is A New World is Born. That means leaps and ecstasy. You've got to prove it to the customer. Dismissed for the day. I listened while he complimented the baritone. And Mr. Eduardo Bernard. You sang, and all I heard was a television commercial for a mouthwash. Before signing as a lead baritone, you should first have your adenoids removed. You're fired from this show. When Bishop finished throwing his weight around, I tried abusing him. By what authority do you inquire into my private business affairs? This badge. Hmm. Chicken inspector. If I were a more sensitive man, that could get you a punch on the nose. No, no, I'm a, I'm a hard case. You punch me and you're a murderer. The book, please. The book? What book? The one you keep for your own information. The record of investors and money. Who and how much. Now, where do you keep it? Are you in my safety vault? Not here in your desk? Here in my desk? Huh. Why? To accommodate sneaks like you? Huh. That laugh sounded very falsetto to me. You stay out of my desk. It's, it's personal. It's sacred to me. Oh, I'll bet. Oh, could this be it? You give me that ledger. Hey, wrestle with me, Buster. Okay, if you must be placated. <coughs> now, uh, don't oversleep, Buster. I get through this book, my hunch is we'll have things to talk over. Bishop had his swindle written down in his personal ledger so plainly it looked like a confession to the D.A. Bishop came, too, and we talked it over. Your musical is budgeted to cost $300,000. You've accepted investors' cash totaling over $400,000. Well, money for contingencies, isn't it? Baloney, who is a show angel named Eloise Finchley? She's in for a cool $150,000. She can afford it. Oh, I would imagine. Uh, Craig. What? Eloise Finchley's investment, it isn't exactly a straight stock deal in the show. Then what is it? Uh, more of a, a, a personal loan to me. You sure thought that little dodge up fast? Well, that balances my books, doesn't it? Take away Eloise Finchley's money, and the cash I have so far accepted is less, less, mind you, than my proposed budget. I'll believe the personal loan dodge after I've talked to Eloise Finchley. So, uh, what's her phone number? I don't want you telephoning her, Craig. Uh, how many times a day must you be rocked to sleep? I'm making a change in that script, if you'll notice, Craig. Uh-oh. And, uh, where was that gun up till now? Never mind. You look more like a hood now than a show producer. More in your natural element. Don't force me to shoot. Hang up that phone and get out. Bishop's violent urge to get me out of his office at that moment was nothing impulsive, as I soon found out. It was strategy, plain and simple. Nor did he go far. Just a motor ride to the nearest Gretna Green. Gretna Green being shorthand for any place where marriage could be completed as fast as a couple could chirp, I do. I read all about it in the morning papers. 
With Broadway impresario, Stanton Bishop marries socialite Eloise Finchley in surprise elopement. At my first opportunity, I paid my respects to the bride. In a fancy bridal suite, almost as close to Central Park as the uh, statue of Sherman's horse. Champagne, Mr. Craig? Conversation, Mrs. Bishop. You disapprove of my marriage? Your mister will never get through the pearly gates. Oh, is there a man without vices, really, Mr. Craig? How come you eloped with Bishop? Immediately with my investigation of him. How come? Now, let me see. Mm, yes. He invited me on a motor ride. It was perfect weather. The moon, Mr. Craig, you've never seen such a gorgeous moon. And that was it? Love doesn't stop to reason, Mr. Craig. I've heard. Bishop married you as a cover-up for his larceny. The marriage takes you off his books as an outside investor and puts it in the family. It, uh, balances his books. Must we really be so dull, Mr. Craig, so prosaic? I'm a bride. I'm in heavenly raptures. Yeah? You're heading for one big hangover. <laughs> I adore champagne. I'll leave sounding one last dull and prosaic note. <sighs> Must you? The sudden elopement smacks of conspiracy. Conspiracy to frustrate an investigation of Bishop's peculiar theatrical financing. Sweet matrimony was only a device for whitewashing him. How about that? You don't really expect me to testify against my husband, Mr. Craig. Okay. I know when I'm licked. And you forget. $150,000 of the total on Stanton's books was my own money anyhow. My own money, Mr. Craig. Yeah. And frankly, that angle of it has me befuddled, perplexed, confused, and mystified. I reported back to my client, the canine dentist, Luther Bassett. Well, uh, who's the dental patient now, Bassett? Another famous dog actor? Oh, yes. This is Rinky Tintin. Rinky Tintin? Reputed to be a grandnephew of Rin Tintin. Bow, wow. Genuine aristocracy. And what show is Rinky in? The World and the Egg. It's a play about reincarnation. What does Rinky play in it? Napoleon. The dog is the 20th century reincarnation of Napoleon. Oh. <laughs> Mind you, it is an allegorical play. Yes, I get you. <laughs> hmm. Well, you can leave your 20000 with Bishop or not, as you please. You mean the operation is legitimate? Now it is. I think I scared him into legitimate producing. I mean, if Bishop actually has the show business know-how for producing musicals. But he was first contemplating a swindle? With every breath in his body. Then I will withdraw my investment. Well, you won't get all of it. Not at this date. Bishop has had some pre-production costs already. But uh, salvage what you can. Go ahead. Well, my cost to you is 300 bucks. Pay me off, Bassett. End of case. Only it was. It was just the beginning, as it turned out. The blissfully newlywed Stanton bishops were doomed to make more headlines. Gruesome ones this time. I saw it first on a street newsstand. Mrs. Stanton Bishop. I could only see that much. Hey, uh, give me that paper, boy. The whole headline read, Mrs. Stanton Bishop killed in street mugging. It had sure been a short honeymoon. I let official sources amplify the newspaper details for me. In this case, the first grade detective in homicide named Scotty. What's your interest in the late Mrs. Stanton Bishop, Craig? I mourn her passing. How did she go? A street assault. And what was taken? Well, so far as we know, her purse, a diamond wrist watch, and her wedding ring. Uh, according to whom? Stanton Bishop, when he identified the body. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, what police results so far? None. No clue to the alleged mugger? You hit the word alleged. Why? Because, frankly, I'm uh, skeptical. Your reason? Nothing concrete, so I won't give it yet. What was the cause of death? Strangulation? A broken neck. She'd been hit with the side of the palm, a rabbit punch. It's a favorite blow with mugging. Or a killer trying to make it look like a standard mugging. Now, where did it happen? 54th and 9th. We found the victim in an areaway. Hmm. Hard to believe. What is? A lady of her style being at 54th and 9th to begin with. 
Eloise Finchley Bishop was Park Avenue, very perfumed, very upper class. Not always. Well, what would that mean? Our check into her pedigree turned up some interesting facts. She was posing as a socialite, and her maiden name, Finchley, was an assumed one. Then who was she, really? Eloise Berkey. Father was a railroad brakeman. Parents now both dead. Eloise herself was a dress model when she worked. <laughs> Not that there's any law against posing as society, folks. No, there isn't only, uh... One thing really has me confused now. Yeah, what's that, Craig? Well, where would a sometimes dress model get $150,000 for a theatrical investment? I was around the rehearsal hall to give my condolences to Stanton Bishop personally. He looked a little different to me this visit. The pink cheeks were sallow, deep lines in his face, like he'd had some new worries added. What do you want here, Craig? What was Mrs. Stanton doing on the wrong side of town? How should I know? Well, what was stolen from her? I've already told the police. Well, tell me. Her pocketbook, a diamond wristwatch, and her wedding ring. Craig, you're not going to maliciously persecute me. Shouldn't I? Well, I'm in mourning. I, I experienced a horrible tragedy. I think of how Eloise died. I, I have nightmares. I'm in a cold sweat. Sad. What's happened to our 150000 Craig, please, not at a time like this. Tough to answer, huh? Look, I'm straight, clean as a new baby. Maybe I had ideas once, wrong ideas, but all right, you cured me. Now, let me live. That depends on how your wife really died. She was attacked, she was robbed, her neck was broken by some homicidal maniac. Oh, that's how it was made to appear. Then you are going to persecute me maliciously. At least until you explain to me how an ex-dress model was able to invest a fortune in your show. Also, uh, what really was the attraction that got you two married? Heckle me or embarrass me with the police and the public. You'll only make trouble for yourself. Did you murder your wife and father it off as a mugging by a person or persons unknown? No. I tell you no. I tell you no. I did a further check into the background of the corpse with the grudging connivance of first-grade Detective Scotty. Hey, Craig, I, I can get reprimanded for this. Or promoted. Yeah, promoted for letting you into an apartment officially sealed to the public. Now, look, I saw this. I quietly turned the information over to you. I don't take a bow. You get a promotion and a raise. Oh, boy, are you good at dangling sucker bait. Ah, well, Louise we'll Berkey, Ellis Finchley, ex-dress model. Where did she ever get $150,000? Well... Squat somewhere, Scotty, while I look around. I came up with a ton of stuff, hidden away in bureau drawers, ribbon packages, and a steamer trunk. The personal stuff nobody ever throws away. Old letters, diaries, a high school pin, and picture albums. Lots of picture albums. The recent Eloise had collected the history of her life in snapshots. Yeah, she's in it from the first baby pose on a bear rug right to maidenhood. Yeah, Eloise in pigtails, in her school graduation dress. How she looked at Sweet Sixteen on her first date, as a slim chick in a one-piece bathing suit. How she looked as a dress... Hey, hold it, Craig. Well, what strikes you? That page of snapshots, the two shots... Eloise posed with a guy. Six pictures, the same guy. Well, what about it? Well, study the face of the guy. Now, you recognize him? Yeah, I've seen him. Why, sure. He's famous. Notorious. He's Artie Anzac. Big gun Artie Anzac. Big gun used to be. Oh, he's responsible now. Retired from the rackets. He's had it. Served 20 years in Leavenworth for tax evasion. Uh, this page of pictures, Anzac and Eloise... Uh... They look like very recent photographs. Watch out with Anzac, Craig. He's still king to a big piece of gangland. I'll be uh, most respectful. I've got a thing about royalty. Anzac lived like royalty should. A heavily wooded estate on the outskirts of the city. With a high stone wall around it like the side of a mountain. I found him practicing golfing putts on a library rug. 
I talked while Anzac concentrated on his stance. When he'd figured out his answers, he gave them to me. Sure I know, Eloise. Sweet kid. Sweet dead kid. Yeah. Ain't it a shame? Out walking and that's it. Still, everybody dies. Some just go sooner. What was she to you, Anzac? A babe. I bought her a coat. I bought her one of them foreign cars. And then I moved on to another babe. Period. Period. I'm not poor. Spread the wealth, I figure. Did it bother you when Eloise married Stanton Bishop? No, not a bit. I'm for marriage. My mother was married. I even sent them a wire of congratulations with a load of flowers that cost me a C note. Craig, I already had another babe. Yeah, you said. Now I'd like to get back to my partner. Huh? I'm in a tournament tomorrow. But I'm not through talking. What else is it? Well, I'm at the point now of mentioning $150,000. Not a dough. Eloise invested that much in Bishop's musical production. Now, where would a babe get that kind of cabbage? I think from you. Hey, I'm not that generous. I think Eloise invested it for you. Idle money, hot money, undeclared income. Hmm. She was your front, so tax officials wouldn't be the wiser. You'd already served time for tax evasion. You'd had enough of that. Hey, that's quite an idea you got. Oh, I'm loaded with ideas. I also think Eloise double-crossed you, that she invested the money for herself, and that Bishop knew the source of the money and what Eloise was up to, and that Bishop used that knowledge as a weapon to make Eloise marry him. Now, why would he do that? Oh, he had to make Eloise marry him. I'd been investigating Bishop. I'd found irregularities enough for me to alert the district attorney. Bishop had to find a device for shutting me off. I got practicing to do, Craig. I'm in a tournament tomorrow. I think you murdered Eloise to pay her off for the double cross. And as an object lesson for Bishop. So Bishop will respect your $150,000 piece of his musical production. I think you're the killer, Anzac. Watch this putt. Huh. Beautiful, huh? <laughs> I left Anzac to drive home. Anzac's wooded estate adjoined a famous state park, popular with campers, hikers, and hunters. Signs on roadside trees advertised the two-week open hunting season. Deer was the big game. I almost qualified. A rifle shot through my side window that almost skinned my scalp. A wild shot, I wondered. Or was it a devoted Anzac subject trying to please the king? It was one of the things in life I'd never know. A chain is no stronger than its weakest link. Stanton Bishop figured to be the weak link. An easy mark for a trick designed to get corroborating evidence against a suspected killer. I found him alone in the rehearsal hall, chewing on a dead cigar. Craig, you... Soured my whole life. Oh, sad. I wonder how nervous you'll be, Bishop. Strapped in the electric chair. Strapped? Me, Craig? For what? The murder of your wife. I've got evidence against you. Evidence? Those articles supposedly stolen from Eloise. So? So I've got them locked up in my office safe. Where... Where could you get them? Right out of your wife's bureau. It's a trick. You're lying to me. You're trying to trap me in something. (laughs) But you can't be sure, huh? You had lived a story of stolen articles to make the alleged mugging plausible. Why were you so anxious to have it written off as an unsolved mugging? Who were you afraid of? Now, you clam up, you'll only be a fall guy, Bishop. Who's the somebody else, Bishop? Come on, it's trembling on your lips. Anzac. Artie Anzac. He murdered Eloise, and I'll tell you why. Oh, don't bother to. I already know why. Now, the guy answering this phone will be Scotty of Homicide. Tell your story to him. From here on, it's his case. Hello, Scotty. This is Barry Craig. Scotty, uh, I've got a guy here who's going to mean your raise and promotion. (laughs) Yes, sir. A Craig promise is always redeemable in cash. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig.
confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Corpse on the Town, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of The Golden Touch, about which Barry Craig has this to say. In The Golden Touch, a doll with amnesia forgets everything but her alibi when her partner in unholy matrimony takes a second fatal leap out of her arms and into eternity. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Directed by Andrew C. Love, the cast included Harley Bear, Frank Gerstle, Vivi Janis, and Joe Forte. This is the NBC Radio Network. I wanted to read you my leave for tomorrow's column. I... Oh, at the door. Hold the line, Barry, while I see who it is. Don't answer that, Mike. Stay away from the door. Stay away from the door. Oh. You, look, I told you it's no use coming here. You're just wasting your time. My life's too short. Confidential Investigator, starring William Gargan. Barry Craig speaking. It was one of those nights. I was sitting in my office with my feet hooked on the corner of my desk, trying to whip up some enthusiasm over an assignment to bodyguard a couple of tin coffee pots at the Long Island wedding when the telephone rang. I let it ring a few times before I reached out and snagged it off its hook. After all, when they're that anxious, they can be mighty worthwhile. Yeah, who's this? Al White from the Chronicle. Remember me? Oh, Al White, sure. How's the gossip column racket these days? Warming up. I got a chore for you. I'll bet you have. Meaning what? I've been reading that column of yours. Those cracks you've been making about Larry Slade throwing the big fight, they can't have made him very happy. I hear he's looking for you. Yeah, so do I. I need a bodyguard. You keep printing that Slade took a dive and you're more likely to need an undertaker. I was right about it, wasn't I? I even called around. Sometimes there's something better to be than right. Such as? Alive. Something you're not likely to be if you keep needling Slade. He's big and sensitive. My heart bleeds for him. Look, do you want this job or not? All right, Al. Where do I start guarding the body? The Casa Daily Bar. Midnight. It wasn't the kind of case I'd like, but a private detective is like a doctor or a lawyer. He can't always pick and choose. Anyway, a few minutes short of midnight, I parked the car outside the Casa Daly. It was an old white frame building that Ace Daly had converted into a plush boob trap. One of those joints where if they don't get your roll with the fancy prices at the bar, they got back rooms all rigged up with roulette wheels and crap tables where they do. I was holding down the bar with an elbow, squinting through the fog of blue-gray smoke when my client, Al White, walked in. Waiting long? Not very. Seen Ace Daly? Yeah, he went in the game room a little while ago. Larry Slade with him? Champ? No, why? Just a hunch. He'll be here, too, before the night's over. Daly's in the game room now, huh? Now, why the interest in Ace Daly? I thought you were after Slade's hide. Maybe I'm after both of them. You think Ace had a hand in fixing that fight? Yeah, and tonight I'm looking for proof. Any objection? Sure skin, if you like to wear it with holes in it. That's what I'm paying you to prevent. Maybe we better make this one uh, cash in advance. <laughs> and you trust me? Oh, sure. I just don't want to have to go to the trouble of suing your estate to get my money. Oh, very funny. Hey, 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 wait a minute. 
You must read tea leaves. Huh? Don't look now, but your old friend, the ex-champ, just came in. Is he heading this way? No, he's going on through into the gaming room. Good. What's good about it? I had a tip slave would be showing up for the payoff tonight. It settles it. He dumped the fight and Daly paid him to do it. You still haven't got any proof of a payoff. With a little luck, we might even get that. What are you going to do, follow Slade in? Not yet. Give him a minute or two head start. He won't go direct to Daly's office. He'll probably waste a couple of minutes looking around in the gaming room. Just to make sure he isn't being followed. Now, if we time it right, we may catch him in the act. And if we do, I'll have the biggest story of the year. I only hope you live to write it. All right, it. Don't you worry about me. All right, then. Don't worry about me. I only hope that I live to read it. We stayed at the bar, finished our drink, and listened while a tinny five-piece combo did unmentionable things to a popular ballad. Then Al White dropped a handful of silver on the bar and nodded he was ready. I led the way out of the bar to the disguised entrance of the roulette room. The door was presided over by a tuxedoed man with a broken nose. We stepped into a small vestibule, waited while he closed the door behind us. Then another door opened and we stepped into the game room. A low buzz of conversation, spiced with the click of roulette balls, rolled out toward us. A dozen or more people were huddled around a huge roulette layout in the center. On the far side, a hot crap game was in session. Neither Ace nor Slade was in sight, so we ambled past the bank of slot machines toward a door marked private. From behind it, we could hear the sound of someone laughing. Ready? All right. Let's go. Let be your marriage. Be as happy as you are, beautiful, my dear. Hold it, Judge. We got company. Something just crawled out of the woodwork. Something was wrong. Instead of a payoff, it looked like a party. Lifting a champagne glass with Ace Daly and Slade was the most gorgeous redhead I'd ever seen. And a tall, distinguished, white-haired man was just proposing a toast. It wasn't what we'd figured to find. But Al White didn't let that stop him. He walked right in like the life of the party. Or maybe the death of it. Hello, Larry. Evening, folks. I've been looking for you, White. I'm going to knock Easy, you... chap, Easy. My client doesn't like to be crowded. Make it easy on yourself and you keep at it. Cut it out, He's champ. got it coming. I'm going to... Him... Okay. Okay, Ace. You're white. On your way. Daly, you could lose a lot of customers talking to them that way. I didn't send for you. Get out. Ace, who is this man? Yeah, Ace. Why don't you introduce us? I'm Al White, Mr. Dare. I read a column for the Chronicle. How do you know my name? Recognizing faces is part of my business. And how are you, Judge Adair? I thought you and Ace Daly were all political enemies. How nice to see that you've got them together. I, uh, I think perhaps, sir, you'd better excuse us, Ace. Louise and uh, I... Uh, sit down, Judge. I'll take care of White. He's just about to leave. Don't mind if I do, now. You see, I came here looking for a story in the fight fix the other night. Oh, that's small potatoes compared to a political fix. What does he mean, Ace? You and Ace, the happy couple. Well, really? And maybe if Ace helps the judge to get reelected, he can claim the bride as his reward. What a story. Ace, he mustn't print that. Not before election. He'd ruin everything. Don't worry, Why, judge. He... He's not printing anything. That's where you're wrong. I'm not only printing it, but I'm going to do a feature piece on it. Don't push your luck too far. You're still healthy because nothing will happen to you in my place. Providing you're out of it in five minutes. Just let me take him, Ace. Let me Without take him. Without a rehearsal, you. champ. I thought you always rehearsed your fight. Well, you little rat, I'll kill you. It's the last Look, thing, Ace. champ. I don't have my hand in my pocket because it's cold. I told you the guy's my client. Sit down, champ. As for you, Craig, put up the heater. Ace, you've got to stop him. He mustn't print that. It would ruin us, all of us. Don't worry, Louise. If he so much as hints at it in that rag of his... I'll not only be on the line of people who want to kill him, I'll be at the head of it. As we weren't in any position to cop any popularity prizes at the moment, there didn't seem to be much point in hanging around the Casa Daly. We got out with about two minutes left of the head start Ace had given us. White insisted that I drop him off at the combination office and apartment where he worked. So I locked him in for the night, then headed for my own apartment and some long-delayed shut-eye. 
I didn't need anybody to rock me to sleep as I was practically snoring by the time my head hit the pillow. So when the phone started to dance off a stand a couple of hours later, it took me a few minutes to locate it. Oh, stand still, will you? Yeah? Now, wait. What time is it? Oh, about 4.30. Oh, it's the middle of the night. Not for me. Even my office hours. Just finishing up tomorrow's column. I want to read you an item. I can wait until tomorrow to read it. Hey, what's that? Oh, the doorbell. Who is it? Hold the line a minute. White, don't answer that. White, stay away from that. White! White! Without stopping to think twice, I knew that whoever was paying that late call to Al White carried a peculiar calling card engraved in lead. I started dressing, made par for the cost, and was headed for a cab in less than six minutes. A police cruiser outside of Al White's apartment house told me somebody else had heard the shots. When I finally got to his door, it was opened by Sergeant Marty Moran of Homicide. Well, yeah, I might have known. What are you doing here? White was my client. Wise? Don't let's get cute, Marty. I was talking to him on the phone when he got us. Oh, that accounts for the phone being off the hook. Do I get in? I suppose so. What were you talking about when it happened? He wanted to read me an item out of tomorrow's column. Column? He didn't find any column, just a few blank sheets in the typewriter, no column. Yeah, there he is. We haven't moved him yet. Yeah, me hasn't gotten here. Got it in the back, huh? All five of them. Hmm. Small caliber gun. 32 or less, I'd say. Hmm, big enough to do the job. Yeah. And you said there was no trace of a column. No, just a few blank sheets of paper in his typewriter. All right to handle? Yeah, I guess so. Barry, what's on your mind? Just a hunch. I'm wondering if Al White had the same habit most new triple boys have of jamming two or three sheets into their machine at a time. Hey, you got something there. If he did, we may be able to bring out the impression on the second sheet. Well, that's worth a try. There should be some dusting powder in the lab kit. Yeah, here's some. Let's have that second sheet. Here you are. Think that's enough dusting powder on it? Yeah, a little more, maybe. Let's shake it around. Well, what do you know? It worked. Can you read it, Sergeant? I think so. First, let's blow off the excess. Yep, there you are. Clear as a carbon copy. Take your vows later. Uh-oh. Here it is. Listen. The mob is giggling over Ace Daly's payoff if the election goes right. Now, instead of fixing fights for sugar, the ace is fixing elections for honey. Ace Daly in this? Yeah. He told White that if that item appeared, he'd kill him. Well, why didn't you say so? That makes it easy. We put out a pickup on Ace and we got it made. Better pick up Larry Slade, too, Marty. The champ? Yeah, he got into the act, too. He promised to kill White if he mentioned fixed fights again in his column. Oh, fine. First I have no suspects, now I've got more than I have teeth of my own. How many other characters promised to make this creep a prospect for a headstone? Offhand, I don't recall, but as I think of them, I'll keep you informed, Marty. I got away from Sergeant Moran as soon as I could. He was yelling pickup orders into the phone as I closed the door behind me. On the street, I grabbed a cab, told the cabbie to double back up a couple of streets to make sure there was no police trail on me, then gave the driver the address of the Adair home. It was an old converted brownstone house with a large brass knocker. Through the glass door, I saw the commoded figure of Louise Adair. Over her shoulder on the stairway, I could see her father, his white hair shining in the gloom. What? What do you want? I'd like to see you for a few minutes, Mr. Adair. Now? What about? Murder. Murder? Yes, our wife, the colonist, a few hours ago. I see. Uh, perhaps you'd better come in. Uh, what is it, Louise? You go on to bed, Dad. This uh, gentleman wants to ask me a few questions. Maybe your father ought to sit in on this. Leave my father out of it. Nonsense, Louise. Now, uh, what's this all about? Al White, the columnist you met last night at Ace Daly's, is dead. Murdered. And this uh, gentleman, being a detective, has it figured out that Ace did it? I didn't say that, Mr. Dare. I said he had a motive. So did a lot of other people. You, for instance, or your father. Ah. Why not? 
If White printed that story about you and Ace, it might have cost your father the election. But... And it certainly wouldn't help your social standing. Why, that's absurd. Ace and I were merely waiting for the proper time to announce our engagement. After the election, I suppose, when it wouldn't be so embarrassing. I can't have you making insinuations like that. I must ask you to leave. Suit yourself, Judge. I was just trying to make it easy on you. White was my client. And he's dead now. Maybe so. But when a guy hires me to see that nothing happens to him and something does, I want the guy that made it happen. But don't you see? We'll get dragged into it. The scandal will ruin Dad's chances of re-election. That's unfair, Louise. How can we help? Well, you can give me a fill-in on the time set up last night. What time did you leave the Casa Daly? Mm, about four. We came home and went right to bed. Four, huh? That would give Ace plenty of time to do the job. Was the champ there when you left? Uh, Mr. Slade? No, he left before we did. His uh, uh, lady friend dances in one of the clubs. Lily DeVore. If you can call it dancing. He saw her last night, huh? That might be his out. My father and I'd like to get some sleep. Uh, if you have any more questions, would you mind if we discuss them later in some more suitable time and place? All right. Let's say four o'clock this afternoon in my office. Meanwhile, I think I'll drop by the Carteret Arms and have a chat with Lily DeVorg. The Carteret Arms was a big, expensive-looking pile of rocks in the West 50s. By the time I got there, a heavy drizzle had started, and it didn't pep me up any to learn that Lily hadn't gotten home yet. I found a soggy cigarette in my jacket pocket, got it burning, and settled back to wait. The gleaming wet face of a jeweler's clock across the street said ten after two when a cab skidded to a stop at the curb. Lily DeVore jumped out, ran for the protection of the lobby. I gave her ten minutes to get settled, then crossed over. It took a two-spot and a lot of fast talk to get by unannounced. The two-spot was more effective than the talk. Anyway, I got up to 4D and knocked. Yeah? Message for Miss DeVore. Coming. Okay, Buster, let's have... Say, what is this? I want a little talk with you. Get your foot out of that door. Nice of you to ask me in. You mean I had a choice? Look, I don't know what's on your mind, but you don't... Don't be so modest, Lily. You know you're irresistible. Yeah, and I know something else, too. You're liable to be unconscious when the champ hears about this. I make it a policy never to worry unnecessarily. And I make it a policy never to entertain strange men without a warrant. That goes double for private cops. Outside. Okay. I just thought I'd help keep your champ out of the hot seat. But if that's the way you feel about it... Look, you can't pin that killing on Larry Slade. You know he didn't do it. That's not what the police think. Where is he, Lily? I don't know. Hey, where do you think you're going? Oh, just to have a look around. Get out of here and leave me alone. What's in there? I thought I heard something. Oh, mice, no doubt. That's just a closet. Stay away from it. Stay away, I tell you. <laughs> As I moved Lily from in front of the closet door, I turned my back for a second. The door swung open behind me. I heard rather than saw the blow that knocked me to my knees. In that moment, the man in the closet made a break for it. He headed across the room for the bedroom door beyond. I was a little groggy, but I managed to follow him. By the time I got to the bedroom, I heard him go through the window to the fire escape beyond. I followed, stuck my head out. He snapped a shot at me from below. Gouged a chunk of windowsill a foot or so from my head. I pulled back fast. I wasn't that curious. Lily was still in the living room when I walked back. Okay, baby, playtime is over. I lose my boyish smile when people use my skull for target practice. Who was it? I don't know. A prowler, I guess. If it was Slade, why did he run? You can alibi him for last night, can't you? What? Sure. Or can you? Of course I can. We were together all morning. He left Daly's before four. When did he get to your place? About four. We left the club together, and then we... You're lying, Lily, aren't you? No! If you are, I can check up at the club. You might as well admit it now. Oh, all right. The director called a rehearsal on next week's show. Slade got bored and walked out on it about 4.15. We worked through. In other words, he had time to knock off White. If he didn't do it, then why was he trying to hide here in your closet? Slade wasn't in that closet. Who was? I don't know. Who was it, Lily? Oh, what's the use? Why should I cover for him? It, it was Ace Daly. What was he doing here? Same as you, looking for the champ. 
To help him fix an alibi? Slade doesn't need an alibi. He didn't do anything. Why don't you leave him alone? Maybe I can help him. Where is he, Lily? I told you I don't know. And I wouldn't tell you if I did. That's what I thought. Just the same, if you want to see him get a break, you get to him and tell him to get to me. I didn't have long to wait. I just got him back to the four walls and desk I laughingly call my office, shuffle the two ads in rent bill that represented my mail, and lit a cigarette when the phone rang. Hello? Larry Slade. I hear you want to see me. What about you? I don't do business over the phone. Come in and... Yeah, and walk right into a police stakeout? Okay, so I'll come to see you. Where? If it's a plant, you'll never walk away from it. Where? The end of Pier 6, East River. Make it 3.30 sharp. I'll be there. And come alone. Because if you don't, you'll have plenty of company when you leave. They'll be carrying you. Pier 6 was a deserted strip that stretched out into the murky water of East River for a quarter of a mile. Anybody walking to the end would be visible for minutes before he reached the end, setting him up as a perfect target. The goose pimples and icicles running down my spine were caused by the cold wind, I think. The rain hadn't let up, and I was drenched by the time I reached the end of the pier. Larry Slade stepped from behind an old rotting shack that had been a watchman's shanty. He looked bigger than a Brahma bull and twice as nasty. Hello, champ. What do you want? The one who killed Al White. Cops think maybe you did. I can read. I don't think you did. That's nice, so... Give yourself up. I don't want you to take the fall for the killer if you didn't do it. I don't take any falls for nobody. You're set up for one right now and don't know it. You're lying. Why should I? Ace Daly's the only one got anything to gain by lying. He wouldn't cross me. Not unless he needed a fall guy, and he does. Why don't you tell him that... Hey, Ace. Busy little man, aren't you, Craig? I tried to get around, only this time I didn't get around fast enough. Looks like you beat me to it, Ace. Looks like I did. He thinks you're trying to pin the murder on me, Ace. Now, why would I want to do that, Larry? Why would I want to frame the guy who's giving me my alibi? Your alibi? He hasn't even got one for himself. Not after he left Lily Duvall last night. Oh, yes, he has. Larry came back to the Casa Daly. We were both there together at 4.30 this morning. Now, what do you say to that? You've had time to cook up a nice little story, haven't you? But coming from the two principal suspects, I doubt that the police will take your word for it. You'll have to think of something better than that to prove you were really there. Don't worry. We can. After he got home, Judge Adair called me up to talk things over. That's funny. The judge didn't mention it to me. But then maybe you haven't had a chance to give him his briefing yet. Don't worry, Craig. He'll back us up. Willie Ace, aren't you forgetting something? What? You can't help him now. When the story of your little deal gets out and the papers tie it in with this murder, your support would be the kiss of death. His only chance of re-election now is to wash his hands of you as fast as he can and try to make hay on the other side. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, Ace, but I gotta go see the judge. I... Kind of like to hear what he has to say before he's had any coaching. Stop him, Slade. What do you want me to do? You're the champ. Figure it out for yourself. Larry Slade grinned, licked his lips. He hunched his left shoulder a bit. And I saw the punch dot somewhere near the tip of the shoe, but I couldn't get my jaw out of the way fast enough. It landed like a ton of bricks, and the pier came up and slapped me in the face. I don't know how long I was out... Could have been minutes, probably. It was only seconds. Both Ace and Slade were gone when I opened my eyes. I couldn't find it in my heart to regret their going. All I could do was hope that they were going to the wrong place if they wanted to locate Judge Adair. I managed to get a cab and gave the driver my office address. When I got there, two people were at my door trying to knob. Even in the semi-gloom, I had no difficulty making out the sleek lines of Louisa Adair as one. The other was her father. Looking for me? Oh. I thought you'd forgotten our four o'clock appointment. I, uh... I thought of something you should know. Good. Let's go inside where we can talk. Make yourselves comfortable. I suppose we really should have told the police that... Dad preferred to talk to you first. Well, let's have it. I think I know who killed your client. I thought you might. 
Judge Adair, after you and your daughter got home this morning, did you phone the Casa Daly? Why, why, how, how did you know about that? Then you did make the call. Why, yes, about 4.30. Well, there goes the old ball game. I thought that Ace was lying. But Ace wasn't there. No one answered the phone. He didn't? Why didn't you tell me that this morning? But Dad didn't want to get involved. It would cost him the election. Cost a man his life. I finally realized too late. When Daly tried to reach me today... I see I got here just in time. Ace! No, don't shoot, Daly. I won't tell anything. Don't... Boy, you dirty double-crossing old buzzer. He's got a gun, Dad! When the smoke cleared, Ace Daly was sprawled in my doorway. Louisa Dare was doing a good job of trying to swallow her fist. The judge stood dazed, staring down at an old twenty-two target pistol that he still held in his hand. I managed to pin my eyeballs back in their sockets long enough to walk over to Ace. At that moment, the door to my office burst open and Sergeant Marty Moran came tearing in. What's going on here? Holy cow, Ace Daly, who did it? I, I'm afraid I did, Sergeant. It was self-defense. Daly was going to kill both of us. M- Mr. Judge shot him, all right. Why should Daly want to kill you, Judge? He wanted to keep me quiet. I knew that he killed Mr. White. You were taking an awful chance going up against a pro like Daly with that pea shooter. I couldn't keep quiet and see him get away with murder. Even if it does cost me the election, I, I couldn't do it. Cost you the election? You kidding? You come out of this mess a hero. Delivered a killer all wrapped up. Just too bad Ace Daly didn't kill White. Didn't kill him? What do you mean? Yeah, you better translate that for me too, Barry. Daly couldn't have killed White. I was talking to White when the killer knocked. He got up and let him into the apartment. So? He wouldn't hire me to hold his hand while he was talking to Daly in a public place. Then led him into his apartment. But uh, Ace could have disguised his voice. Old wash, baby. White was shot in the back. That means he opened the door to the killer, then turned to lead the way into the apartment. He never would have turned his back on Daly. In that case, I have a little surprise for you. Brian, bring Slade in. We picked up Slade waiting outside in Daly's car. Ace, who did it? I... I'm afraid I did, Mr. Slade. I thought he killed White. Which leaves us only one logical suspect. Oh, I get it. I'm supposed to be the fall guy, eh? Why, you two-bit shameless, I'm going to let you have it. Right in the whiskers. You KO'd the champ. I owed him, that's it. Holy cow, so I did. Hey, he didn't throw that fight. He's got a glass jaw. Well, I'll get him out of here and booked. He didn't kill White, either. He never would have used a gun. He'd get a bigger charge out of beating him to a pulp. Well, if neither of them did kill White, who... You did, Judge. What? what? And that wasn't self-defense when you shot Ace Daly in my office. It was murder. That's fantastic. Why should my father kill either of them? Because White was getting set to break a story that would have blasted your father's chances. Ace knew your father killed him and covered him for your sake. But your father knew when the heat was on, Daly would throw him to the wolves. But to go up against Daly with a twenty-two. Ace was a sitting duck. The judge shot him before he knew he was being double-crossed. Using me as a witness that it was self-defense. Now, see here. This is ridiculous. I was in bed when White was killed. Sorry, Judge. I went to your house an hour or more after the killing. You were supposed to be in bed, but your hair wasn't even mussed. I won't listen to these lies. Tell them, Dad. Tell them. What's the use, Louise? I took a long chance and lost. I killed them. Well, they can't prove a thing. Yes, they can, now that they know the story. I left too many traces. Why did you kill White, Judge? I had to. My only hope of escaping prosecution for malfeasance was to be re-elected to cover what I had done during my last term. I would have done anything to be re-elected. Even come to blows with a thug like Daly. Don't talk, Dad. They can't prove a thing. It's no use, my dear. I'm ready to make a full statement. Okay, boys, take the judge out. We'll book him later. For murder, I guess. Barry? While we're waiting for the medical examiner, tell me... Not now, Marty. I've got an important date. Anybody I know? Lily DeVore. You crazy? That's the champ's girl. He's plenty jealous. Plenty jealous, but I just found out he's got a glass jaw. So long, Marty. So long, folks. See you next week. You have just heard Barry 
Larry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Starring William Gargan. Next week, another exciting transcribed story starring America's number one detective, William Gargan, as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's script was written by Frank Kane and featured Santos Ortega as Ace Daly. Edward King directed. Your announcer is Don Pardo. All names and places mentioned in this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Till we meet again next Wednesday for another hard-hitting adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator, let me give you a brief rundown of the adventure shows you can hear on NBC. Tomorrow night on NBC, there are a trio of action programs starting off with Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, as he investigates the rich young widow murder case. Then, Dragnet brings you another authentic criminal case history, as taken from the files of the Los Angeles police. Later, Counterspy is called in to solve the case of the Kilroy gang. And then on Saturday, screen actor Brian Donlevy takes you down the shadow-filled corridors of mystery on another dangerous assignment. Later Saturday evening, there's adventure in the realm of international intrigue with Mr. Moto. Then on Sunday, Douglas Fairbanks is featured in The Silent Men, with authentic action stories about your government security agents. On Monday, Herbert Marshall comes to the NBC microphone to assume the mysterious identity of the man called X. And then Tuesday night, hear Big Town and another pulse-quickening story as told by editor Steve Wilson of the Illustrated Press. Yes, there's always hard-hitting adventure based on the drama that is Big Town. Well... There you have a complete roundup of the top mystery shows you can hear on NBC. And then, next Wednesday night, we hope you'll be back with us for another adventure with William Gargan as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Now, it's Meredith Wilson's Music Room. <laughs> Confidential Investigator, starring William Gargan. Barry Craig speaking. Detectives come in three sizes. City cops, big agencies, and guys like me with a small office and an insurance company retainer to pay the rent. Cops don't have to worry about getting cases, and the big agencies have branches from here to Shanghai. But from where I sit, you never can tell where your next case will come from. Last week, it started with my old brown suit. I'd been on a bodyguard case, and the suit looked as if I'd been sleeping in it for a week. There was a good reason for that. I had. I tucked it under one elbow and ducked into George the Taylor's. George had a king-size shoebox in the basement of my office building. Morning, Mr. Craig. Hi, George. What can you do with this suit? <laughs> if you like herringbone handkerchiefs, I could maybe salvage enough goods. All right, so I'm not Adolf Monju. How about it? Tuesday? With the spots out... Thursday. Okay, Thursday. <laughs> oh, say, uh, Mr. Craig, I-, I wanted to ask you, I've got a problem. Well, what is it, George? Got a pair of plaid slacks with no coat to match? No, 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 I- I'm serious. My wife says, George, you go to the police. 
But she wasn't here when that man came. What man? What's the pitch, George? The man said I need protection. Shakedown, huh? The man said I've got to pay $50 a week to stay open. He says, George, you wouldn't want trouble. Maybe a bottle of acid spilled on your racks. Did you pay him? Well, I didn't have $50. I told him to get out. Now I'm scared, Mr. Craig. Look, you're a detective. I want to hire you. You protect me. That won't work, George. Stopping a protection racket is a big operation. You need 24-hour guards, a whole setup to protect all the shop owners. Well, I, I could pay in installments. You've already paid for protection, George, your taxes. You better call in the cops. They're the only ones who can swing it. Oh, no, he said they'd beat me up, maybe kill me. Look, George, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll drop in at headquarters tomorrow and bend the lieutenant's ear. He'll give orders for a cop from the precinct to look after you. And start the ball rolling to find out who's behind this racket. Will you really do that for me, Mr. Craig? Sure, sure. After all, I wouldn't want anything to happen to my brown suit. George disappeared in the spritz of steam, and I headed home. I put in a call to Lieutenant Edwards. He was out, so I left a message that I'd call in the morning. I was propped up in bed eating pretzels, reading a medium hard-boiled private eye opus, wondering where he found all the beautiful blondes with the low-cut problems when the phone rang. I left the intrepid uh, sleuth under a falling blackjack and stretched for the receiver. Craig speaking. Mr. Craig, you've got to come quick. George? You've got to come down right away, Mr. Craig. Please, please. What's up? Somebody there? Hello, George. George. Hello, George. I slid into my shoes and took off across town. When I hit the pavement outside of George's shop, I had company. A hook and ladder, two pump engines, and a crowd of fire buffs who traveled to Denver to see a lit can of Sterno. The smoke was pouring out of the cellar as I muscled my way through the police lines and ran into Lieutenant Edwards. What do you want to be when you grow up, Craig? A cop or a fireman? I'll take a rain check on the lap, Lieutenant. What are you doing here? Just holding back the crowd. They ask me, all these fire buffs are nuts. Anybody know what started the fire? Doubt it. Cleaner stores go up like birthday candles all the time. What does George say? Who? George, the tailor. He runs the shop. Probably at home playing three-handed stuss. No, no. He lives in back of the shop. He called me from here. You sure he isn't around? Haven't seen him. Fire boy said the joint was clean. Maybe. we better find out. Hey, where you going? Inside. It's chilly out here. I grabbed a rubber chest of from the hook and ladder and headed inside. The first flash had died down, and the shop was burning nicely at the proper temperature for browning the turkey quickly. Under the fireman's coat, I was beginning to base my own juice as I pushed into the back room. I found what I was looking for under the counter. George the tailor, dead. I carried him outside and knocked off a few minutes to pump the smoke out of my lungs and siphon a little oxygen in. You all right, Barry? <coughs> You know where I can get a new pair of eyelashes? Craig, what are you doing sightseeing in a fire at this hour of the night? And how did you know that guy was in there? I told you, Lieutenant. George called me. He was up against the protection grip. He tried to hire me. I told him I'd have you look into it. Well, it's too late for a referral now. Yeah? Well, it looks like it's my baby now. You better give me the whole shooting match to date. I have. That's all I've got. Anything turned up on your end? Any other complaints of a protection shakedown? Not a mutter. You're lucky you're out of it. I'm not. I haven't welched on a client yet, and as far as I'm concerned, George was my client. Well, it's a good, clean pro job anyway. Tough to prove arson. Maybe not. I found this wedged under George. Plastic? Celluloid scrap. Comes in real handy. Stick a plumber's candle in a pile of it, and by the time it blazes up, the mechanic is clear to Nutley, New Jersey, to establish his alibi. Celluloid, huh? Well, then I'd better make my call in, arson. Yeah, and while you've got the precinct on the wire, just casually mention murder. The bus from Bellevue rolled up and they loaded George's body in the back. I watched it pull away. Then a hand fell on my shoulder. I turned around slow and found a pair of thick eyeglasses staring right through me. Oh, Mr. Craig, I'm Alfred Whittington. Oh, look out for the lapel. This has just become my only suit. Uh, you're the confidential investigator, aren't you? I've got a license. I want to hire you. I pay rent on an office that's open during business hours. If you don't mind, right now I'm tired and a little burnt around the edges. I overheard your conversation with Lieutenant Edwards. You'll get your ear pinched in a keyhole that way. I'd like to talk to you, Craig. Perhaps my apartment? Perhaps not. Would it interest you if I told you I want to retain a detective to find out who killed George the Taylor? Oh. All right, Mr. Whittington, as you say, let's go to your apartment. 
rode uptown in the caddy that had to bend to get around corners. The name clicked as we crossed 42nd Street. Alfred T. Whittington. He ran the newspaper that did the big crime series this year. They got Sluts Longo to talk and almost pinned half a dozen rackets on the coattails of Herman Jess, the big operator. Of course, they had to put Longo together with scotch tape for the funeral, but it made nice reading. And Herman Jess had left town until it all blew over. Whittington's apartment was in the penthouse on top of the newspaper building. We sailed up in a private lift and waded through the nap to his library. It was the kind of a room you see behind the iron gray hair and the whiskey ads. Whittington was a little cozy about speaking his piece, so we discussed interior decoration till he got ready to make the plunge. I, uh... I had this room specially designed for my hobbies. Oh, looks like you make a hobby of hobbies. Guns, original oil paintings, and that fish tank is big enough for a stunted whale. Oh, uh, that isn't all. I've got movie editing equipment in those cabinets. Color slide projector. I'm very interested in photography. All you need is an erector set. Look, Mr. Whittington, I'm not writing an article for House Beautiful magazine. Of course, I, uh... I just like to get to know a man before I talk business. With me, it's the other way around, so let's have it. You uh, know, of course, the paper's been running a series on crime in the city. The board of directors is very anxious to continue. They've so instructed me. Where do I fit in? I heard you say you were going to work on this protection racket. That's right. Do you uh, still intend to? Up to the top. Good, good. We can help each other, Craig. I want to retain you on behalf of the paper. What happened to your reporters? Measles? Contrary to popular fiction, reporters aren't trained as detectives. You are. What do you want? Whatever you can get. Of course, I want reports direct to me, strictly confidential. That comes with the price of the entree. Our legal staff will have to go over everything before we print it. And nobody's to know you're working for me. Bashful? Discreet. The staff here would feel I didn't have confidence in them. Don't you? When I want a job done right, I go to a professional... I want the truth, no matter whom it involves. But I want the story exclusive, as it develops, step by step. All right. Then you're my second client, because George the Taylor comes first. Next morning, I went down to the insurance company that pays me that nice, steady retainer, rain or shine. I waited through the acre of desks in the outer office and rapped on the glass door marked Arthur B. Goldsmith. Art was the company expert on fires. He knew enough angles on arson to burn out an asbestos mine. I planted the scrap of celluloid I found under George the Taylor on his desk and flipped over a few questions. No soap, Perry. Celluloid is standard equipment. It doesn't point to anybody? It'd be like asking which ball player uses a bat. The mechanic plants a plumber's candle in the celluloid scrap, down she burns, and then they can file the insurance claim in the morning. Much doing these days? Average. Not like in the Depression. In 33, the only way to make a profit was burn your own place down every six months. Art, if you wanted to hire the best, money no object, uh, who would you get to start a nice, cozy conflagration? Pro job? Major League. Let's see. Mike DiGiorno is in Elmira. Maybe uh, Irving Turkle, celluloid Harry Bush. I'll give you a list, maybe ten men. Thanks, Art. It's a long shot. Got something else? Not yet, but if you rake a red-headed clinker out of the next fire, that's me. I started checking down Art's list. It was like looking for the clams and a bowl of cheap chowder. Two of them were at peace in the lower bay, hugging a load of bricks. I found Irving Turkle on Center Street, right opposite police headquarters, pushing a baby carriage full of hot charcoal and roasted chestnuts. Hot roasted chestnuts. All hot. Uh, time's worth, Turkle. Who are you? Barry Craig. Art Goldsmith at Federal Indemnity put me on you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Why, I got a lot of respect for Mr. Goldsmith. I got a lot of, a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. Here's your chestnut. Thanks. Look out for worms. Yeah, I will. How's business, Turkle? You push ice cream, turns cold. Switch to chestnuts... You could fry an egg in the sidewalk. Tough, huh? My worst enemy should have it better. You haven't been roasting anything besides chestnuts lately? <laughs> like, like what? Like tailor shops? Mr. Craig, I, I'm telling you honest, I ain't so much as set fire to cigarettes since the last time I got sprung. Sure. Look, look, I, I, I ain't so young no more. You, you could get pneumonia standing out here, but 
inside those cell blocks. It ain't so nice, neither. I ought to know. I, I've been in maybe 18 years since I was... I was 13. Warwick, Myra, Clinton. I've been to them all. Enough already. I made up my mind I want to die on the... <coughs> out. <coughs> Could you use five, Turtle? Yeah. The kid. I want to find a mechanic who did a job on the west side yesterday. A tailor shop? You know about it? I read it in the paper. I got a list from Art Goldsmith. Save me some time, and it's worth a thin. Uh, me, Mr. Goldsmith, I should not have put me on the list. I, I retired. I, I wouldn't. How about do... the rest of them? Well, I, I heard somebody the other day saying Harry Bush made a good connection. Where can I find him? All right. Uh, look, Mr. Craig, I'm, I'm, I'm on my own now. There, there wouldn't nobody even feel bad if I got took. I'll cover you, Turkle. All right. Harry Bush has got a drop in Long Island City. Easy glide roller skating rink. All right, Turgle. Thanks a lot. You you tell Mr. Goldsmith I'm retired. You tell him that. I, I got a lot of respect for Mr. Goldsmith. Excuse me, I uh, I gotta get back to work. Chestnuts? Hot roasted chestnuts? <laughs> Glide roller skating rink was in a factory district across the river in Queens. It was an oversized barn with high school kids on wheels where the cows should be. I managed to collide with a redhead in a turtleneck sweater and one of those velvet skating skirts that looked like the paper panties on a lamb chop, and she told me where to look for Harry Bush. There was a sign on the door that said, Manager, keep out, but I decided to overlook it. Who's that? Hello, Harry. If you want to rent skates, you're in the wrong pew. Mind if I smoke? Who are you? We got a light, a match, maybe a plumber's candle. What are you, a cop? Private license, Barry Craig. It's a nice drop you've got here, Harry. What are you talking about? I'm the manager of this Been to any good fires lately? What would I be doing at a fire? Lighting it. They say around town, celluloid Harry Bush is working again. You're in the protection racket up to your pointy ears. You're crazy, Craig. I haven't been near a tailor shop. Yeah? I didn't mention any names, Harry. I just said protection. How did you happen to think of tailor shops? I read about it in this morning's paper. They're still burning people for murder in this state, Harry. But then you won't mind. You like fire. I wouldn't even get booked. Listen, Craig, I don't care what you think. It ain't gonna do you no good. Somebody covering for you, Harry? What do you think? Who is it? Why don't you find out? Maybe I will. So long, Firefly. Outside, I parked my shoulders against the wall just around the corner and went into a trance. I didn't have long to wait. Celluloid Harry came bouncing out in less than five minutes and headed to town. I stuck with him like bubble gum till he ducked into a doorway in the East Sixties. I gave him a running start, then I walked in in time to see the indicator on the elevator hit five. I ran a finger down the directory. There were only two officers on file. A Dr. Martin Kudulik, a DDS, and an outfit named Star Enterprises that could stand for anything. I grabbed the elevator on the next bounce and punched the button marked five. I put my shoulder to the door marked Star Enterprises and heaved. What? What's the idea? Well, Herman Jess, I presume... I didn't know you were back. Who the devil are you? Where's Sonny Lord Harry? Who? A little spark plug. He came up here. I have enough trouble without guessing games. Who are you? Barry Craig. You're not police. Private. Now, you can't break in here like this. I'm not a well man. I should be in Florida right now. What's keeping you? Well, that's my business. Yeah, I know about your business. You're really a public benefactor, Herman. Where would a kid get a reefer without you, huh? Well, now, look, now, look, the doctor said I shouldn't get excited, though. That must be a handicap in running your rackets. I'm not in rackets anymore. I, I'm retired. What makes you think I'm going to believe that? Now, does it look like I'm running a business here? Well, no, but... I've got uh... no desk, no files, not even a telephone. Now, the doctor says I've got to have absolute quiet. All right, then. Just tell me where celluloid Harry is, and I'll stop disturbing the peace. Now, now, look, Craig, you, you want some somebody named Harry. I haven't got him. There's only one door here, and you came through it. Now, take a quick look in the closet and walk out of here. My heart can take just so much. And... I'll take you up on that, Jess. Hmm. 
Not even a bone. Now, kindly leave. Okay, okay, Jess. But if you haven't quit the rackets, I'm warning you now. I'm after the mechanic that burned George the tailor and the man who bought him. Clear up to the top. Put that in your blood pressure and smoke it. I started for the door with a sinking feeling that I was a sucker in a new style shell game. Celluloid Harry had to be in Jess's office. Unless he was under the rug, I couldn't see him. The elevator door was just sliding closed as I reached it. I got a quick shot of a pretty picture. Celluloid Harry with his finger on the first floor button. The door slammed and I stared at the arrow as it swung around. It didn't add up. It wasn't in Jess's office. The only other room on the floor was a dentist. I decided to develop a toothache. Can I help you? Uh, it's my tooth. Uh, this one, see? Hmm? Hurts something awful. Oh. Dr. Weiss is on the first floor and Dr. Carey on the third. What's the matter with Dr. Padulik? I'm sorry. He isn't in today. How about the fellow just came out? There's been nobody here. Then I guess I made a mistake. By the way, you like roller skating? I beg your pardon? Nothing. A book of matches on your desk says Easy Glide Roller Rink. I thought maybe you liked to skate. <laughs> That dentist setup smelled like a herring factory at high noon in July, but I didn't push the point. I left and found a phone booth in the lobby of the building and poured my story into Whittington's shell-like ears. There might be any number of reasons for that girl lying to you, Craig. Harry might be a boyfriend. She doesn't like to skate. And Herman Jess is right next door. I think the dentist's office is a blind. Do you think he's fronting with Jess? I'd lay the odds. When the crowd thins out, I'm going up there to check. Well, what do you expect to find? I figure with the rackets Jess is running, he's got to have complete records handy or he couldn't keep track of the take. I want to find those records. All right. If you come across anything, bring it straight to me. The receptionist had left for lunch, so I rang a few peels on the bell to see if Dr. Padulik was at home. He wasn't, so I let myself in with a bobby pin and went to work on the desk in the inner room. I pulled out a stack of records. That latest date was three months ago. The appointment book past that date was blank. The bills checked. Nothing later than three months ago, except the last one. A bill from the Conmont Memorial Hall for $700.84 for the funeral of Martin Perdulic. What are you doing in here? Huh? Who are you? Who do you think I am? Dr. Martin Perdulic. <laughs> He was a rabbity gray little man, looked pretty good for a three months corpse. There was a vein in his forehead, jumping like a kid on a pogo stick. But his hand was steady as a rock, as it was wrapped around a thirty-eight revolver. You stay where you are. What do you think you're going to do? I... Why, well, you broke into my office. I'm going to call the police. Fine, fine. You go ahead. Maybe you can explain to them how you happened to be buried three months ago. What? You're no dentist. You're fronting for Herman Jess. Well, then... You're crazy. Am I? I'll save you time. I'll call the police. Give me that gun. And you give me that gun. Fair. Fair trade. Now, settle down, friend, while I jam a chair under the doorknob. I'm going to look for Herman Jess's records. I was in a tough spot, and I knew it. The license commission doesn't look kindly on breaking and entering, and if that office was clean, I was in for trouble. I knew I couldn't search that room for anything smaller than an elephant in the few minutes before somebody drifted in. So I kept one eye on my buddy and played it cozy. I yanked the desk drawers out and threw the papers around like a picnic. I pulled the medical books down off the shelves to make sure that there weren't any false fronts. I wasn't getting any cake from the phony dentist, so I headed for the other room. I dumped the instrument trays and he couldn't have cared less. When I headed for the file cabinet in the corner, the vein in his forehead beat like a ragtime drummer on bathtub gin. You can't get away with this. I'll, I'll have you in jail. Yeah, yeah. I slid open the file drawer. Nothing but dental records. I slammed it shut and my playmate relaxed like a hangover in a Turkish bath. I couldn't figure it. Those records ought to be near that file cabinet. Maybe a secret panel. I couldn't be sure without an x-ray and then I got it. What are you doing? Taking a look in this box on top of the file. Those are valuable x-rays. 
Don't get them out of order. Hmm. I won't. I'm taking them with me. This first batch are teeth, all right. But from here on, these pictures didn't come from anybody's mouth. Not unless his molars kept double-entry books. Oh, company. Let me in. I know you're in there, Craig. Not for long. Which way is the nearest fire escape? Hurry! I got him! In the pig's eye, friend! Oh, 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 oh. Craig, stand still or I shoot. <laughs> The window was locked, so I tossed the waste paper basket through it. I was two floors down the fire escape when Jess showed up in the window. I was slamming around like a pinball game with body English. I hit the ground and sprinted for the curb. Then I jumped into a waiting hack. To pull the way, I saw a celluloid Harry bounce out of the building and into another cab. Hey, mister, I wouldn't want to make you nervous, but you're being followed. No, I'm very popular. Can you lose them? Uh, no, my life insurance lapsed last week. Would 50 bucks change your mind? What good is insurance after I'm dead? 50 I can spend now. Hold on to your plate. We weaseled through Manhattan. The cab behind us stuck like a mustard plaster. We got into a jam and a transverse across Central Park. Hang on, mister. I'm going to cut inside that bus on the sidewalk. You get caught by the light. Shot straight up to Whittington's midline sewer. He was showing himself color shots of his copper spaniel on the slide projector when I walked in. Craig, you didn't bring? Doorbells are for process service. I've got Herman Jess and the protection racket in my pocket. Here. What are these? Dental x ray films. Only there isn't an inlay in the bunch. These are Jess's records, microfilm to match the teeth x rays. Are you sure? You can't read them without a magnifying widget. But I'll bet there's enough in that envelope to send Jess up the river like salmon. Shall I call the cops? I'll take care of that, Craig. Wait. You expecting anybody up here tonight? Uh, no, I left orders not to be disturbed. In that case, we'd better get ready to receive company. Somebody's coming up the stairs. I thought I lost Harry, but I guess he's stuck. Chuck that envelope in the fish tank. What's up? Go ahead. It won't hurt the films. Now, I'll try to look innocent. All right, Craig. Get them up. We were just talking about you, Jess. Was your nose itching? You hoist them too, Whittingham. You can't get away with this, Jess. I'll have you... You won't do anything. You're pretty brave in those crusading editorials. Wreck my health. Let's see you stand up against the gun. Craig, do something. You got any suggestions? And I want those records this, this sponge brain stole from me. You got me wrong, Jess. Shall I work on them? No, no. We'll try Whittington. What are you going to do? Harry, ask him where those records are. You get away from me. You heard, Mr. Jess. Where are the records? I don't know. Hey! Don't move, Craig. Ask him again, Harry. Come on, Whittington. Where are they? I don't know. I told you. Put me alone. Listen, Jess. Don't move. I'm a very nervous man. It would be very bad for me to shoot you. Now you got anything to say? No. No, not when you put it that way. Okay, Harry, go ahead. All right, Whitting. No, no, don't hit me again. No, don't. Where are those records? No, no, not again. There, in the fish tank. Craig hid them there. Harry! I got them. Look inside. It's films, all right. All right, we're getting out of here. Come on, Harry. What's that? Mr. Whittington is having open house. What are you talking about, Craig? I think the boys in blue are coming to tea. The cops. He's bluffing. Care to wait and see? Get the back door, Harry. We don't have trouble on the way out. Take care of me. A pleasure! <laughs> Harry was behind me when he let me have it with the butt end of his gun. I retired temporarily from this world, and when I got back, I was looking at a pair of shoulders four yards wide with Lieutenant Buck Edwards cooing gently in my ear. Craig, Craig, you all right? Oh. I'd better send for a doctor. How about Jess? He had his yesterday's racing form. He tried to shoot it out with the boys I had staked downstairs. And celluloid Harry's on his way to prison ward at Bellevue. Just did, eh? Uh... Uh, Lieutenant, uh, did you search the body? There was certain evidence. You mean this envelope? That belongs to the paper, Lieutenant. Part of a confidential report. I don't know, Mr. Whittington. I'll uh, take complete responsibility. We rate a break on this story. Craig was retained by us. Go ahead, Buck. Give it to him. Excellent. Excellent. I'll put it in my safe. Better look at it first. What do you mean? You'll find it's a real classy collection of diseased choppers. 
What are you talking about? They aren't the real microfilm records. They're just a bunch of legitimate x-rays of teeth. I left the real records with the cab driver and told him to take him to Lieutenant Edwards. But you told me... Sure I did. But I like to play it safe. I knew Jess would be after me, and I was afraid he might persuade you to give him back. I... I'm sorry. I'm afraid I was rather weak. But I really thought he intended to kill us. Oh, don't apologize. You were terrific. That was a great strong-arm scene you played with your stooges. Stooges? Sure. Why do you think I ducked those records, Whittington? When I was going through that X-ray file, one thing caught my eye. A color transparency. It didn't exactly belong in that file because I'd seen a print of that picture before on your desk. A very flattering portrait of your wife. My wife? Yes, you made a slight mistake. You must have got it mixed up with your microfilm records when you shipped them back to your boy, Herman Jess. Oh, see here. Are you trying to insinuate that I... I... mean, you're the real boss behind this record, not Harry Jess. Why, well, that's absurd. If that were true, then why would I have hired you? Self-protection. Your board of directors was pushing you to deliver that crime series, but you figured that if I turned anything up, it'd be easy to take care of me this way. Craig, you're out of your mind. You can't prove a thing. Oh, yes, we can. We checked those microfilms, Mr. Whittington. There's a payoff to you listed on every page. You've been under arrest for the last five minutes. Well, Whittington, I guess this squares accounts for George the tailor. But you still owe me for one brown suit. I'll put it on the bill for services rendered. Boy, Take you... him away, boys. Coming, Barry. Coming, Lieutenant. So long, folks. See you next week. <laughs> just heard Barry Craig Confidential Investigator starring William Gargan Next week, another exciting transcribed story starring America's number one detective, William Gargan, as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story was written by Ernest Canoy and featured Santa Ortega in the role of Alfred Whittington. Your announcer is Don Pardo. All persons and places mentioned in this program were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Till we meet again next Wednesday for another hard-hitting adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator... Let me give you a brief rundown of the adventure shows you can hear on NBC. Tomorrow night on NBC, there are a trio of action programs starting off with Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, as he investigates another thrilling mystery. Then Dragnet brings you an authentic criminal case history as taken from the files of the Los Angeles police. Later, Counterspy is called in to solve a case which threatens to endanger our national security. Then on Saturday, screen actor Brian Dunleavy takes you down the shadow-filled corridors of mystery on another dangerous assignment. On Sunday, NBC's adventure shows include a spine-tingling visit with Martin Kane, Private Eye, followed by the exciting story of The Whisperer. Later, Douglas Fairbanks is featured in The Silent Men with authentic action stories about your government security agents. On Monday, Herbert Marshall comes to the NBC microphone to assume the mysterious identity of the man called X. Then Tuesday night, here Big Town, and another pulse-quickening story is told by editor Steve Wilson of the Illustrated Press. Well, there you have a complete roundup of the top mystery shows you can hear on NBC. Next Wednesday night, we hope you'll be back with us for another adventure with William Gargan as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Now it's Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC.
One thing about marriage, folks. Many are made in heaven, but there are others that are unmade by the forced application of the vow unto death do us part. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. That's the name, Barry Craig. You rent an office on the third floor of the old mercantile building. You've got a city license which says you're a confidential investigator. So, most of your life, you sit around and wait. Some of the guys in the business hire blondes and call them secretaries. Others confide in cab drivers, bend bartenders' ears, even buy dictating machines. Maybe it helps them forget that they're the loneliest guys in the world. Because nobody really talks to you. The suspicious wives, the frightened parents, the desperate kids who walk into your office never even see you. To them, you're a license, a pair of ears, and sometimes a gun. Nothing human. And after a while, maybe you're not. It's open. How, how do you lock this door? There's a thing underneath the doorknob there. You slide it over. Oh, yeah. You're Barry Craig. Yeah. You're not doing very well, are you? I could write my name on the dust in your desk. What name would that be? Wilma Lord. How do you do, Miss Lord? Mr. Craig, have you ever killed anyone? Not for a fee. Will you answer a question about the weather? I don't know much about the weather. Why'd you lock the door behind you, Miss Lord? I can't have anybody see me here. There's a woman comes around a couple of times a week. I'll speak to her about the dust. Oh, that's not... I'm going to marry a man named John Waring. Uh Uh-huh. He's... Older than I am, a lot older. It's a question of taste. He's rich. Sweetens the taste. We're going to be married in a few weeks. I want nothing to happen to that marriage. I'll hire you. Cupid Craig, with a dollar sign in front of the Cupid. What do you think might happen? Death. Something wrong with Waring's health? You've heard of murder, haven't you? I've heard of it. Whose murder, yours or Waring's? (gasps) The door's locked. Who's murder? I can't stay. Is there another way out? Back of the water cooler. Leads to the back hallway and the fire stairs. I'll phone you. Sure. Yeah? Get get out of my way. That gun a little heavy for you? I said... Okay. Well? The day. Where's the day? You don't look too good. Where is she? Got a name for him? The dame. Walked in the ice, seen her. And now you want to take another look? Well, I give her back a knife. Right? The floor stopped him. I kicked the door shut behind him. The knife he'd mentioned was angling out between his shoulder blades. I didn't want anybody to confuse him with a client. The homicide squad arrived and went to work. I don't like watching the boys. They're too smooth. I start thinking of all the stiffs they practiced on. I shut my eyes. Are we boring you, Craig? Lieutenant Rogers, I've seen it all before. Too bad. If only we could work out an entirely new approach. Then perhaps you'd watch us, hmm? Stop being so tough, Trav. Everybody's forgiven you for having gone to college. Thanks. You're welcome. Craig... The story's no good. It's the only one I've got on hand. I'll tell you why it's no good. The punk there with a knife in his back was on the Harry Otis payroll. Oh? Well, my lord is on the Otis payroll. Must be a large payroll. Among his varied and largely illegal activities, Otis also runs a separate club over on the east side. The Gilded Lily. Mm-hmm. You can have Wilma Lord for supper there six nights a week and twice on Sundays. It's too early for supper. The last couple of months, Otis has been very busy. Hovering up. The Crime Commission? The Crime Commission. 
Mr. Otis is a very large target for them. He's been doing his best to shrink recently. Woman Lord could have come to you because she planned to concertize with the commission and wanted protection. Why me? You're big. You're good-natured. And, uh, well... I'm stupid? No, no, no. But you like to believe people when they give you a chance to. What about the wearing angle? Did she pick him out of the phone book? There is no wearing angle. John Waring happens to be a distinguished philanthropist. That means a guy with so much money he can give some of it away. Thanks for the translation. I still believe Wilma Lord's story. Why? Because she's young, beautiful? Because she looked you straight in the eye when she told you all? <laughs> no, Tram. Because she was nasty. <laughs> Homicide wound up and went away. One nice thing about it, after they were through, the office no longer needed dusting. The clock in the church tower across the street made noises. So, after a while, did my stomach. But I was waiting for a phone call. Maybe the cops would get Wilma Lord before she could reach a phone. Maybe Wilma Lord had no intention of phoning me. I've been a sucker before. I prefer it to being a wise guy. So I listened to the bells, ignored my stomach, and was rewarded. Hello? Mr. Craig? Yeah. Late, I thought you might have gone home. I'm still here. You're alone? Yeah. I I've got to see you. That is, if after what happened you want to. I want to. I always believe a client. I didn't know you'd... You'd taken the case. Where do we meet? Well, not here at my apartment. It's too dangerous. Wait a minute. Would there be a couple of cops sitting on your lap by any chance? No. Why not? They've got an alarm out for you. Well, the apartment isn't in my name. Look, let's make it park the 67th Street entrance in an hour. The park in an hour. Oh, Miss Lord. Yes. Don't bring a friend. I locked the office door. Nothing in the office worth stealing, but this way, maybe I could tempt a burglar. I felt underprivileged. I'd never been burgled. Hey, Mr. Craig. Never mind the glad greetings, Jake. Terrible tragedy you had, Mr. Craig. That's what I meant. Stop licking your chops and let's ride downstairs, huh? Terrible tragedy. Lieutenant Rogers says he didn't bleed much. You take the lieutenant's word for it. By the way, Jake, uh, did the corpse come up in the elevator? Lieutenant asked me that. A coincidence. Did he? Yeah. Come up in the elevator. Didn't have that knife in his back at the time, though. Maybe the elevator was too crowded. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. How about the girl? She come up the same trip? Lieutenant asked me that, too. Whatever made you give up that farm in Vermont, Jake? Got tired of watching the Four Seasons. What I told the lieutenant was, maybe she did come up in the elevator, but... But I didn't see her. Uh-huh. How about opening the door? And if she was young and pretty, like the lieutenant said, why, I'd have spotted her. Sure. After all your experience with the Four Seasons. Jake, how about... Oh, I keep forgetting. Mr. Craig. Yeah? In case anybody stops around and asks for you, what will I tell them? Tell them I'm out checking a season. Good night, Jake. The park was close enough so I could take a couple of hamburgers aboard at Willie's wagon. A couple of hamburgers and a cup of the stuff Willie calls coffee. Willie keeps his coffee urn shined. I was facing it. What I saw in the urn looked like what you see in the distorting mirrors in the Coney Island Funhouse, except not so funny. Willie! You got a complaint? Take it up with the mayor. Take a look over my left shoulder, Willie. Ah, it's gorgeous. You want I should pin a gardenia on it? Somebody looking into the wagon had his face plastered against the window. I don't want to turn and tip him off. Huh? You hitting the pipe again? No face. I bet you inhale, too. Oh, forget it, Willie. You must have ducked. Here. Take that up with the Bureau of Internal Revenue. Boy, are you throwing dough around. What's the matter? You had a horse in the fifth? No. I had a corpse in the third. The 
park was half a dozen blocks over and west. I couldn't spot a tail on me, which didn't mean a thing. Good tails don't get spotted, especially working on me. I'm easy to keep in sight from a long way off. Nobody had moved the park around. The 67th Street entrance looked cozy and dark. I tossed a mental coin, came up heads, which meant I should go home and spend a few hours asleep. Then I cheated. I went on into the park. An investigator's job is a funny one. Either you play it hard and believe nobody, which is fine. It's safe. You stay out of trouble. Maybe after ten years, you're growing ulcers because nobody likes you. But an ulcer never killed anyone yet. Or else you believe people. Then you've got trouble. You're not smart. Except maybe it's not a choice. It kept getting darker. Not a choice because it depends on the way you're built. The way I'm built, you stick your neck out. I did. Only warning was a slide of feet on the gravel path. <laughs> if you hit on the head hard enough, you get knocked out. All you remember afterwards is getting up. It's a memory you're willing to trade cheap. The guy looks like he's returning to us, Mr. Otis. You might have fractured his skull, people. Private eyes have got very mm. thick skulls. How I know is I read about them all the time. Private eyes are always getting bopped on their skull. It don't bother. It bothers me. People help the gentleman. Never mind. Mr. Craig. I've got a headache. I'm sorry, Beeper is so enthusiastic. Send him over a little closer to me. I'll calm him down. <laughs> I'm afraid not, Mr. Craig. Beeper is armed. He was acting on instructions from me. Was he supposed to bring me in alive? <laughs> I'm not that funny. How did he find me in the park? He trailed you there from your office. Uh-huh. Rather a cold, unpleasant night, Mr. Craig. You often walk in the park. I managed to get there from time to time. You wouldn't have been meeting anyone there? I could use a couple of aspirins. Hmm. Beeper was perhaps a little impatient. How was I supposed to know he had a point? Beeper. I beg your pardon, Mr. Otis. Well, Craig? I could still use those aspirins. I see. Well, perhaps it isn't very important... What's more to the point, Mr. Craig, you had a visitor this afternoon. I had lots of visitors, most of them in uniform. <laughs> I'm referring to the gentleman who preceded the police, the gentleman whose untimely death was responsible for the visit. You didn't happen to kill him by any chance? The cops didn't think so. They might be prejudiced. Also, you may have pleaded self-defense. Otis, you know better than that. A man like you has pipelines to the department. Very well. A question, then. What was the gentleman... You mean the punk with the knife in his back doing in your office? He was dying there. Hey. I'm hearing music. A ringing in my ears? A rather good little orchestra. They'd be insulted by your description. Don't tell them about it. This wouldn't happen to be the Gilded Lily, would it? You know the place? Sure. Some of my best friends have had supper in it. What was Jimmy doing in your office? A punk. He might have been looking for a confidential investigator. Oh, for what purpose? To help him find his lost innocence, maybe. Beeper. I'm not joking. What job was he doing for you? What makes you think he was doing anything at all for me? He was on your payroll. Indeed. The cops told me. They're blabbermouths. Mm, pity about the civil service. Things would be so much easier otherwise. You could buy more for less, huh? You're not going to tell me why Jimmy came into your office? I didn't say that. I'll tell you why. He was looking for the owner of the knife in his back. Oh. He never got around to telling me who it was. Would you like some information? Very much. At what price? We'll discuss that later. The information goes like this. Your boy came up in the elevator. He didn't have the knife in him then. He did have when he got to my office. So? Someone presented him with a knife someplace between the elevator on your floor and your office. Yeah. One thing more. It wasn't right outside the office door. No? Oh. He got it near the elevator. He went down. There were a couple of bloodstains on the hall floor indicating that. 
He went down, stayed down for a while, pulled himself to his feet and made it to me. Why? You didn't like my previous suggestion? No. Craig, whom did Jimmy follow to your office? It'd be nice to know, wouldn't it? I mean, for me. Because you know, don't you? You mentioned something about a price for the information. What price? What do you think about matrimony? I have no time to discuss philosophy at the moment. Or philanthropy? Beeper. Yeah, Mr. Otis. Up until this moment, I've been considering Mr. Craig an honest, if somewhat stupid man. Now, I'm not so sure. Yeah? Either of his honesty or of his stupidity. I can get your references on both counts. I would like to be sure, Beeper. I take him apart. Unless Mr. Craig would like to tell us another story. I'm out of story. You're in trouble, however. Beeper, we want Mr. Craig to explain his remarks about matrimony and philanthropy. Yeah, hold it, Craig. I wouldn't mind plugging you in a leg, say. Give me an excuse. You're gonna stand and take it nice? Okay. Take it. <laughs> I hope the gun barrel don't scare you permanent. How about putting your arms behind your back, huh? It's gonna start getting painful soon. Thanks. Now, hey, who? Opportunity knocks. No, Otis. I've just inherited a gun. Beepers. You weren't expecting company. Mr. Otis, I've been knocked unconscious. I've been pistol whipped. Maybe I'm sore. I wasn't expecting company. Yeah, that's the reason people were startled. All right, open the door. Let's see who it is. Hello, Mr. Otis. The Marines. Hello, Trav. Hi, Craig. Mind if I come in? The office belongs to Otis. You're holding the gun. That belongs to Beeper. Beeper? He's lying down. Tired? He ran into a door now. Have a gun on him. Thanks. Who knows? Maybe he has a license for it. We'll see. Exactly what do you want here, Lieutenant? We've had the place staked out. Nobody we were interested in showed up. I got the report that a big man was carried in. Turns out it was Mr. Craig. That's how it turns out. The place staked out? Then you're looking for... If nobody minds, I'll get up. In a hurry, Barry? I'm late. For what? A date. Now, wait a minute. Way it looks, you were slugged and brought here. I guess it does look that way. You could prefer charges. Uh-uh. It was all in fun. That welt across your face doesn't look funny. One of the reasons I'm in a hurry. What? I want to have the nasty little bruise kissed away. Lieutenant Rogers didn't argue with me. He wanted conversation with Otis and Beeper. Nobody had mentioned Wilma Lord yet. Not Otis, not Trav. But they were thinking of her. So was I. I tried to park. A couple of hours had died since the appointment, but I had to make sure. I made sure. Maybe Wilma Lord had been waiting for me. Maybe not. Either way, she wasn't waiting anymore. Trav would annoy Otis for a while. He had nothing to hold him on. He had nothing to hold Beeper on. For a while, Otis and Beeper would be busy with the lieutenant. After that, they might be busy about something else. I remember Trav's definition of a philanthropist. I could use some money. My name is Barry Craig. Yes? You're John Waring? I am. Mind if I come in? It's rather late. So late you sent the butler to bed, huh? Well, that is hardly... Who did you say you were? Barry Craig. Should I know you? Yes. Why? Because you're a philanthropist. Good night. I didn't finish. Because you're a philanthropist about to get married. Come in. Thanks. In here, if you please. Now then. Your name is Barry Craig. Uh, you're a reporter, perhaps? Not exactly. Then why your interest in my... Marriage? I've been hired to make sure it goes through on schedule. Hired? By whom? Your fiancé. My... Didn't I use the right word? 
You mean Miss Lord? How many girls were you planning to marry? Mr. Craig, I permitted you to enter my home because you seemed to know about... about my marriage. I didn't expect you to insult me. I'm sorry. Blood gets on my nerves. Blood? A man was murdered in my office today. Then that's why... That's why what? Nothing. Uh, this man was murdered. Had he any connection with... Your marriage? Yes. What do you think? I can't think anything about it. I, I, I'm i confused. So confused you haven't thought of offering me a drink. I beg your pardon. Oh. Yeah. I could almost think you were expecting me. That's two glasses you've got sitting on that coffee table. I... With the drinks in them. One's rye by the color. The other... Uh, Mr. Craig, you're in my home. Looks like cream de menthe. A girl's drink. I suppose it's too much to expect the behavior of a gentleman from a confidential investigator. Yeah. We're the sordid type. I had an appointment with Miss Lord. She kept it, didn't she? Why don't we ask her? Ask? Nice drapes you've got. Pity they don't quite reach the floor. Now, look here, young man. Never mind, John. Hello, Miss Lord. Hello. Did you decide the park was too cold at this time of the year? I... What made you come here? You wouldn't be holding up in your apartment, listed in your name or not. The cops are bright nowadays. Well... Where else would you duck for cover? It was simple. Lucky for me, it was simple. I get confused easy. What do you want? You hired me to do a job. I believe you. I always believe my clients. Sometimes I'm suckered, sometimes not. Because sometimes clients don't expect to be believed. I resent all this... Don't this... be in too big a hurry, Mr. Waring. Miss Lord was afraid that the marriage was going to be interrupted by murder. Murder? She didn't get around to telling me whose murder, yours or hers. Because another murder happened to somebody else. I didn't... Somebody on Harry Otis's payroll. Whose idea was this marriage? I... I asked Miss Lord to be my wife. And she said yes. Why? I love... You don't have to laugh at me. Harry Otis. You were on his payroll too, Miss Lord. The Crime Commission was getting ready to ask him questions. About his business, his tie-ins with officials, his, uh, backers. I must ask you... You were going to... to say leave. Let's pretend it was explained. Wilma Lord's young. She's beautiful. Maybe she could have wrangled a marriage offer out of you anyway. But her working for Otis can't be a coincidence. Sure you asked her to marry you. After she told you she knew about your connection with Otis. My connection? Financial. Dollar bills don't have pedigrees on them. That's a shame. How many of the dollar bills making up your bank account came out of Harry Otis's dirty enterprises? This is absolutely, absolutely unwarranted. No. Up until five minutes ago, it was a guess. A stupid guess. Because I couldn't figure any other reason for the whole deal. Now it's not a guess anymore. It's not a guess <gasps> anymore. Hello, Otis. I've been expecting you. And the gun. That's nice. Beepers outside with a gun, too. And the car? With a motor idling? Another stupid guess? Sure. The stupid ones give the most trouble. If you'd had brains enough, Craig, you'd have stayed out of this. I couldn't. I was hired by Miss Lord. I had to, Harry. I was I afraid. had you set up. Waring was going to marry you so you couldn't testify against him. Why'd you bury the knife in Jimmy's back? I didn't. I had him on you all the time. Would you have had any reason for killing him, Otis? What reason? Not even a stupid guess. Otis. Yes. This, this squabbling. It's unpleasant. And, uh... A waste of time. Meaning what? Whatever Miss Lord did or didn't do, Mr. Craig is now in a position to inform the Crime Commission of... Of... Our business association? Yes. That would be disastrous. Not only for myself, but for you as well. I, uh... I hesitate to suggest anything violent, but, uh... But what choice have we got? Precisely. No, there's been... Shut up, I... Wilma. You've still got Jimmy's death to account for. Oh, you... You... Miss Lord! What? Don't drink that! What are you talking about? You took my drink away. You in a hurry to die? The man is... is insane. Otis. Yeah, Otis. The man looking for a murderer. What was wrong with the drink? Another guess. A solid one this time. Wilma Lord's wanted by the police for the murder of your punk. Wilma Lord disappeared. Suppose she died in this house. Waring would have the body what? Buried? Burned? Either way, no more Wilma Lord. The cops would spend the next century looking for her. The case would be closed. Oh, no. Also, John Waring wouldn't have to marry her. He'd be rid of a witness against him. 
What he had in mind for you, Otis, I wouldn't know. But he had something in mind. Then he'd be free. He could go on being philanthropic. This is... It's childish melodrama. Murder's melodrama. Only it's not childish. Mr. Waring, when I walked in here, you asked me if I was a reporter. The gag being you'd never seen me, heard of me before. But a little later on, you said something about a confidential investigator not being a gentleman. He must have followed me, too. You said Wilma Lord had kept her appointment with me. How did you know? If she told you, you wouldn't have confused me with a reporter. If she didn't... Wait a minute. He was checking on her because he was planning to get rid of her. But your boy Jimmy spotted him on the third floor where my office is. Nobody else would have had any motive for killing him. Waring had to because it tipped his hand about his plan for the girl. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Then suppose you drink this, huh? I... I detest creme de menthe. Drink it, Waring. I... I shall leave now. I find this highly... I distinct. said drink it. You're being a fool. A fool. <laughs> had to be done. It's done. The reason I knew the drink was poisoned. Take a sniff at it, Otis. Don't bother. A deep sniff. <laughs> so sorry. Got it in your eyes. Thanks for the gun. Hey, you... Mustn't lose your temper. Waring killed Jimmy. Sure. But you had to kill Waring, didn't you? If you'd turned him over to the cops, he'd have blabbed. The crime commission. Beeper! Shh. Beeper? <laughs> you know something, Otis? You must be a sinking ship. <laughs> was it. All wound up, I went home, I slept. The next day, I was back on the third floor being lonely. How do you lock this door? There's a thing underneath the doorknob. Oh, you remembered. Somebody following you again? No. I just don't want to be interrupted. And what? Thanking you. I don't have any money. I'm not marrying a rich man anymore. But I don't think you'll mind. Oh. I always believe a client. Good night, folks. See you next week. have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Case of the Borrowed Knife, was written by Lou Vitez. Next week, it's an exciting story titled Dead on Arrival, about which Barry Craig has this to say. <laughs> Next week, I devote my time to a bashful blonde, an escaped lunatic, and a stone-cold corpse. And brother, is it murder? See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Wilma was Elspeth Eric. Barry Craig. Starring William Gargan is under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. This Sunday night, be sure to hear The Big Show with a full 90 minutes of outstanding entertainment. This Sunday, The Big Show will present such stars as Sophie Tucker, Morton Downey, Ann Sheridan, Jerry Lester, and your glamorous, unpredictable hostess, Tallulah Bankhead. The Big Show brings you a sparkling program presenting drama, comedy, music, everything to provide you with the biggest show in radio. Yes, for people in the know, Sunday means The Big Show on NBC. Then later Sunday night, Theater Guild on the Air presents Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton.
starring lovely Claudette Colbert and MacDonald Carey. Yes, there's 60 minutes of top-flight drama coming your way this Sunday as Theater Guild on the Air brings you Age of Innocence. And for photos as well as feature articles on your favorite NBC stars, be sure to buy the current NBC Silver Jubilee issue of Radio TV Mirror Magazine. This Sunday, hear the best, hear the big show, and Theater Guild on the Air, both on this, your NBC station. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. The odd thing about a killer, folks, you'd never believe it if his gun wasn't showing. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. The big gripe with a confidential investigator is that he has no confidential life of his own. You're on call day or night. Some jokers found your pedigree in a Manhattan telephone directory. There's a missing uncle wandered off his nut, a double-crossing partner wandered off with the cash register, or a tomb relic sure to set off a tongue war if you don't recover the same look at his split. Oh, carve out five minutes of privacy for yourself and bet on it. Someone's at your elbow asking for a bite. A case in point began a night or so ago in a barber shop. Tony's tonsorial power, the gold leaf on the window read. It was my next. One more customer move and I'd stop looking like an unemployed violinist. Well, I never got to sit in Tony's barber chair. Fate popped into Tony's open doorway to beckon me out of the joint. Psst, you there. Craig. Fate was a guy in baggy pants chewing an unlighted cigar. Marty Walensky, a hack driver. Hey, Craig! If you've never been shortchanged by Walensky, you haven't lived. I dragged myself over to Walensky. What's on your fat little mind? At your jalopy outside, Craig? The dark green job? Yeah, across the street. Why? I thought it looked like your load. You got a dame in it, waiting for you. A dame? Walensky, what kind of a gag she are you... She flagged talking? me at 78 and 3rd. Do I know a good, reliable charmer, she asked. So here we are. I keep an office. We've been there. Now we're here. She's waiting in your jalopy. You don't want the business? Oh, I haven't seen the back of my neck for six weeks. It's my neck. And you, the long hair looks good. Listen, Craig, it can't wait. Whatever's with this chick can't wait. As a matter of fact, confidentially, she didn't even stop the dress before flagging me down. <laughs> Walensky wasn't too inaccurate about the lady's get-up or lack of it. Hair pinned up high like she just left off washing her ears. A mink wrap over a nightgown that flapped over satin bedroom slippers. And fear. Fear and neon lights all over a pretty face. I'm Barry Craig, miss. I'm Peggy Palmer. Well, what's it about? Not here. Drive somewhere quickly. But just an idea. There isn't time. I, I have a feeling I've been followed. Well, please start your car. Look, miss, this isn't a public hack. And before I get involved, I want to know what... <laughs> what? Somebody's rifle happy. You hurt, miss? No. You? How does the side of my jaw look under glass? You're bleeding. Flying glass has that effect on me. I start to gush. Pull away, please, Mr. Craig, before we're murdered. Later, in my office, while I kept busy with incidental washing and cauterizing, a frightened lady in mink gave me the facts. A bite at a time. I live with my brother, George. George. 
And no love lost? No love? I'm counting the scratches on your beautiful neck. Oh, my brother fought to keep me from leaving the house. Uh, George Palmer. You've heard his name? Have I? Oh, yes, I have. A Sunday picture story in the tabloids. Oh, uh, oh help me with this adhesive. Uh, I... Oh, thanks. A freak get rich on, wasn't it? Uh, he found oil in his backyard or something? He found a diary believed to be George Washington's in the works of an antique wall clock. Pardon my error. A clock he bought in a rummage shop on 3rd Avenue. It should happen to me. So what's the problem? The diary's the problem. Why so? It's valuable. So cheers. No. Since the diary, our home's been a madhouse. Claimants and cranks. People looking to buy it. People looking to steal it. Uh, the usual backwash to a Klondike. Yes, all those things you say. What seemed to be a stroke of good fortune has become a nightmare. Does Brother George want to sell the diary? Very much, but for an enormous price. Enormous, like... Uh... $100,000. Wow. A lot of cabbage. Any nibbles? One collector, a Grant Tyler, telephoned to say he might pay that much if he could examine the diary. Authenticate it. But? My brother wants the money in hand, in cash, first. I see. The window glass on my jalopy, uh, who do I bill for it? I, I don't know. Brother George? Perhaps. Uh, or anybody, Mr. Craig. Anybody? You said claimants and cranks. The usual backwash. <laughs> How right you are. Anonymous phone calls. Notes and weird hieroglyphics slipped under the door. Bricks hurled from the street. <laughs> Broken window glass. We've got more of it than anybody, Mr. Craig. Just come home with me and see. Come on to my house, huh? Just what job do you have in mind for me? Take charge of the diary. Negotiated sale to this Mr. Tyler or, or somebody. And how do I wrestle a diary free from Brother George? You won't have to. I have the diary here with me. Hmm? I took it secretly from George's wall safe. A hundred grand sometimes doesn't look it. I was leafing through an old battered notebook. Blow on it and it would shred into yellow confetti. Valley Forge and Bunker Hill. I could make out some of the date lines and references. Mostly personal stuff, it looks like. The founding father's beefs at the end of the day, his good cheer. Yes, that's what makes the diary so valuable. It isn't a history of the revolution. It's a story of the people around him, his personal relationships. I say turn it over to a museum. What? <laughs> Do that and turn your brother over to an asylum, huh? Negotiate it, Sale, please. End this terror. What's your phone number? My phone number? To negotiate anything, I'll need your brother's consent. But, uh... The way it stands now, beautiful, you stole the diary and I'm compounding a theft. Or oh, don't fret, I'll talk to him like a Dutch uncle. Foresight 2, 1643. Foresight 2, one. Three, four, three. Hello? Hello, George Palmer? Yes, this is George Palmer. This is Barry Craig. The detective? Confidential investigator. Now, uh, try not to blow a fuse. Your sister Peggy's with me. Keep her. Generous of you, but my harem's overcrowded as it is. She's a little unnerved uh, over that diary. I want you to authorize me to negotiate the sale of the diary. The biggest buck possible, and I don't want a cent. No. Try being reasonable, Palmer, or all the diary will get you is a diamond-studded straitjacket. You can go to... Craig, there's somebody here. Craig, help. Palmer. Craig. Palmer, what's happening? I'm going to be murdered. Something happened to my brother. You just inherited a George Washington diary. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's go pay our last respects. George Palmer lay flat on his back. His eyes were open and calm. As if now that he was dead, the furies had left him. Two bullets fired close to the head. If the diary had been here... 
afraid that's too much. Don't borrow guilt, Peggy. Your departure with the diary had nothing to do with nothing. Your brother was chilled first, then came the search. Keep puffing those eyes and you'll need a seeing-eye dog to lead you around. I... I can't help feeling miserable. No. You had a brother and now you haven't. It's something to get used to. Dead. And only an hour ago. He was clawing at your throat. It's a bereavement, sure, and I don't want to be unsentimental. Ask your questions. Is this that antique wall clock your brother found the diary in? Yes. I worry about myself on rickety chairs, but that's the only way to see the inside of this clock. Hmm. Clock's older than sin, that's for sure. In good running order? Why, yes, I believe so. The, uh... Sales receipt for the clock. Do you have it? Yes. uh, George kept it here. In his desk. A wall clock in running condition. $25. Sold to George Palmer. Company? Got any idea who? No. I'll play butler. Who is it? Telegram for Miss Palmer. Let's have... Halloween was last week, mister. Your hands raised, please. Thank you. You too, Miss Palmer? I've been stuck up by a lot of guys, all kinds and shapes. But this one was in a class all by himself. Short and petite. A waxed mustache with a comical Fu Manchu slant at the end. White gloves and a moth-eaten formal tuxedo, two sizes too big for him. The gat he was holding was something else for the books. Percussion flintlock. An antique type you only see in a museum case where the card reads, Relic of the War of the States. I watched him sniff around the room a little and then come back to us. The George Washington Diary. You will please give it to me, Miss Palmer. The, The diary? He hasn't got it, friend. No. Back up two feet and say hello to a stiff. Uh, he I- is George Palmer? Was. Oh, dear. Whoever gave him those twin perforations of the skull took off with the diary. This is the truth, Miss Palmer? I- I- yes, it, it, it's the truth, of course. <laughs> of course not. The lie sticks in your throat. It's only a prominent Adam's apple. Give her a complex about that and you'll the find... The George Washington diary. Give it to me. To give you what we haven't got, we'd have to be magicians. <laughs> Even to live, you'd have to be magicians. So, it comes down to that. You have one minute. That uh, hunk of museum cast iron that can do the work of a gun? You'll see. Yeah, boom, boom, and where did the world suddenly go? <laughs> Funny thing, I, I can't wait to see. I'm that curious. Curious? Uh-huh. I know about guns. If times get tough in my business, I can be a gunsmith. If I live, I... Uh, this is idiotic quibbling. I'm coming to a decision. My hunch is that what it takes to load that museum piece isn't around anymore. Nobody manufactures it. Nobody sells it. The minute is gone. My hunch is that you're bluffing, friend, to play the old psychological squeeze. What if I just... Begin moving. You'll be shot. Barry, don't. Don't bury me on the side of the hill, beautiful. I hate sleeping lopsided. Please, nothing foolish, nothing heroic. Give him the diary. My life's against it, beautiful. Give it to a runt in white gloves and a baggy tuxedo. I'd have to disown myself. I'm coming over, No, friend. stop. Stop, you fool. I'll shoot. I'll shoot. Get, let me go. Sure. When your outlook on life gets a little more social. I'm like, the whoa. <laughs> Smallest man in the world can be the most tenacious. This one fell apart in slow motion. Before giving up, his thumb gouged my eye a little and his teeth made a meal of my arm. Before coming to, we had to throw him into a bathtub of water. He was out as cold as that. Keep an eye on him, beautiful. The size of him, he can wash down the drain pipe. The 
chances finally wrung out of them still add up to the zaniest of my experiences. I'm Stephen Courtney Bellows, the fourth. As long as a name can get. My great-grandfather was the Stephen Courtney Bellows, intelligence captain in the army of the Rev... Rev... <laughs> His undates. <laughs> he was accused of spying for the British. Uh, unjustly, Mr. Craig. It's an infamous slur against a great man. Rough. Even now, I have a petition before the President of the United States demanding that he restore the good name of my great ancestor. Which brings you to the diary? Yes, I, I wanted to examine it. Uh -huh. If George Washington wrote things that reflect well of my great ancestor, I want this information shouted from the rooftops. And if General Washington called your great ancestor a skunk? Then the diary must be suppressed. The, the infamous lie must not be repeated. It must not. Cut. It... One question, Bellows. Yes. What lunatic asylum do you call home? Harbor Heights. Hmm. Uh, but I was detained there unjustly. It, it was all part of an in, in, infamous... <laughs> an escaped lunatic in a monkey suit, armed with an old dueling pistol. <laughs> About the pistol, it turned out my hunch was cockeyed. It was loaded. You could have been killed. If the gun didn't backfire. But I can't understand. Why didn't he shoot? His reflexes wouldn't reflex. <laughs> he was so hoodooed watching me behave like a suicide, he couldn't get up the coordination it took to blast away. Oh, I'm glad he couldn't. So glad. Are you so glad? Yes. You say that like... You know something? What, Barry? Keep twinkling those eyes at me, and I'll climb right up on that white cloud with you. And, Barry? Go sailing over the moon. Oh, I love sailing over the moon. A little later, over ham steaks and coffee in the Midtown Hofbrau, Peggy and I batted the case around with Lieutenant Trav Rogers. Just a few more facts, Craig. That is, if you can spare them. Well, uh, you know about all there is. I know you gave me exclusive custody of a corpse and a lunatic. Show more respect, Trav. Bellows' great grandfather. I've already had the pedigree up to my ears. I want the diary, Craig. Who doesn't? You'll have to get on the end of a long line. You uh, won't surrender it? By court order? By police request. No can do. And our reason? It's the property of my client here, sacred to my keeping. I asked your reason. Bait. The diary is the honey that draws the flies. While I've got it, it's open season on Barry Craig. Someone may come calling with a gun, and voila, I'll catch me a murderer. Or catch a bullet. All right. It's your life. Squander it any way you like. Good night, Miss Palmer. Good night, Lieutenant. With the good lieutenant off muttering to himself and Peggy off tending to whatever it is girls tend to, I made like a negotiator. Grant Tyler, a guy with $100,000 worth of interest in an old notebook, was a guy well worth cultivating. Hello? Hello. I want to talk to Grant Tyler. This is Grant Tyler. Barry Craig, uh, representing the Palmers. Yes, Mr. Craig. That cash offer of $100,000 for the George Washington diary, does it still hold good? It does, providing, of course, that I can first examine the diary. I'll bring it right over. What's the shortest route to your place? Up Cohegan Boulevard, the third traffic light past Forest Park. Third traffic light. I've got it. Be seeing you, Tyler. The second traffic light past Forest Park. I got the stop signal. A hand signal. A guy in a blue uniform, 
traffic cop or a fireman or a parcel delivery messenger. In the dark, he looked like all three of them. You were going 60, pal. The gas pedal jammed. Are you a traffic cop? No. No? Then what the... Uh Uh-uh, don't get impolite, pal. No. I'd be a dope, too. So it's a stick-up. Surprise. Forty bucks is all I've got. You'll never make Bermuda. Keep your wallet in your pocket. I'll drive into the park. All I want is your company. Into the park, pal. A closer look at the uniform and I knew it. Four dollar rental in any theatrical costume shop. I'd been suckered. Our destination in the park was a shadowy side road. On the green, Buster got down to cases. Let's have it, pal. It? The George Washington Diary. Oh, you know about it. Hand it over. Just like that, huh? Cigarette? Stalling can't do you no good. Can I help it if I'm a dedicated chain smoker? Oh, matches. I'm out of them. You, Buster? Uh, here. Thanks. Ah. I can face the future now. Give me the diary. Or do you still want to clown around? No, no, the diary. Here it is. From me to you, without love. Uh, who are you working for, Buster? Two kids and a blind grandmother. Mind if I borrow your car? Help yourself. Thanks, sport. Now, turn around. Must you? It's a compulsion with me, pal. I'll cash in this diary and go get analyzed. Prowess? My word of honor. It took a long time for the balloon to drift down from out of gravity and settle back on my shoulders. When I was finally used to owning a head again, I had a cab drop me at Tyler's. I'd meet up with the baloney cop again if the cover of his matchbox I'd connived was any help. Moriarty's Bar and Grill, the cover said. I'd be haunting the place. Yes? Barry Craig. Oh, you're late. Sorry, I was detained. Well, we'll have to do this another night, Craig. I've no time left for you now. Tough. Can I come in a minute? Well, I see no point in... Thought you were an Americana collector crazy to buy the diary. I am, but, uh... But I haven't got it to sell, and you know I haven't got it. That's why the brush now? You're speaking nonsense. Am I? I was detained, I said, by a hood who stuck me up for the diary. I know nothing about it. Then what do you know? Talk and act responsibly, Tyler. George Palmer was murdered earlier tonight. George Palmer was murdered? If you didn't know it, talk to me, Tyler. Well, after your telephone call, Mr. Holland telephoned me. The junk dealer who sold Palmer the antique wall clock? Yes. Holland said he'd have the diary for me, and could he come over right away, tonight? And you said yes? Well, I'd be a fool not to. Holland's price is only 10000 And ten years for receiving stolen goods? Holland claims to be the rightful owner, that he merely sold Palmer a clock. Even so, you'd still buy a lawsuit? That much of a risk I'm willing to take. Holland's engaged lawyers offer to guarantee me against loss. Holland's due here tonight, you say? Any minute now. You, you'd better go. No, I'd better stay where I can listen and not be seen. Oh, here, maybe. Parked behind the draper, Mr. Craig. You'll lose the argument, Tyler, so don't argue, huh? I got an earful. Holland looked and sounded like a guy ready, willing, and able to set fire to his junk shop and to himself. You don't have the diary, Mr. Holland? No, I came to tell you no. But you assured me. Something went wrong. But give me one day, Mr. Tyler. One day and I will get you that diary. One day and I will finish the transaction, I promise. I only have to get my hands on a no-good double-crossing rat. A no-good double-crossing rat. Oh, my friend in the park. Buster had been working for Holland until he branched out for himself. Mori 
Moriarty's Bar and Grill was a sewer joint. Open a manhole and drop in. Twenty minutes in it and Peggy was gasping for air. Oh, I can't stand much more of this place, Barry. You won't have to. Surprise. You see him? He sees me. And making like to come over, yes. What? The, the gall. Hi, pal. The name's Barry Craig. I'll sit with the law. <laughs> I just figured out how you got to Moriarty's. Did you? Yeah, cute gimmick. Conning me out of that matchbox. Your car keys. Car's parked on a corner. Thanks for the loan. Don't mention it. Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, the diary. You'll be wanting that back. Yeah. A change of heart? Yeah. I'm a regular Jekyll and Hyde. Half of me wants to go straight, the other half gets out of line. Sad. How worthless did you find the diary to be? Hey, you're smart, Craig. Smarter than one guy's got a right to be. You approached Grant Tyler with the diary? Yeah, I approached Tyler. He checked it through with a spyglass, page by page, and then threw it back at me. It wasn't worth the plug nickel, he said. The diary isn't worth... Don't take it so hard, lady. You got the diary in a grab bag. But my brother... Oh, yeah. That. What about that, Buster? You can't pin it on me. No. I'm for hire, but I'm not a torpedo or a fall guy. Whoever murdered Palmer wasn't me. Uh, can I go now? No. For coming clean like I have? You give me a break. Make out like we never met. No. Sawhead, huh? Yeah, I'm the compulsive type. But I'll go get analyzed after I even up the score. <laughs> Buster nursing his jaw in the pie wagon, I went cruising with a beautiful lady. Uptown, cross town, downtown, watching the lights go out. Dawn's coming up. Yeah, for me too. For you too, Barry? Dawn. You get drugged by night, you can't see a foot ahead of you. You're too busy listening to the thump of your heart. Especially with a beautiful babe blowing stardust at you. <laughs> Barry, you're talking all mixed up. I'm always confused before I'm clear. That wall clock was sold in running order. Holland's sales receipt guaranteed running order. Oh? Your mind's on the case? On a corpse. The clock couldn't be in running order, not with a notebook hidden in the works. But now you're contradicting. Stay with me, baby. When I examined the clock, it wasn't running. The mechanism had been injured. It wasn't running. Yet it was when Holland sold it to your brother. Does that mean something? It means that someone planted the diary in the clock after George Palmer carried it home from Holland's. Am I clear? <laughs> no, not to me. A phony diary not worth its weight in paper sets off a chain reaction of cranks, connivers, and grabbers. <laughs> Everybody went for the gag. George, too? It cost him his life? Yeah, George, too. The question I'm asking is, who could or would plant a worthless diary in a wall clock? Who could or would? Only somebody who wanted George Palmer murdered, but not for the diary. How long was your brother dead? Before I called him up. Barry! Well, you're out of your mind. You heard George shot. I was with you when you did. Don't bank too hard on the alibi, beautiful. But... I heard somebody shot. But it didn't have to be George. Anybody could have called himself George Palmer with me. Especially over the telephone. Anybody. Or, say, uh, Grant Tyler. Staging a phony murder so you could blow stardust in my eyes. Make me your iron alibi. We're... We're stopping? End of the road, beautiful. Police headquarters. I don't suppose you want to tell me your motive. <laughs> Insurance, I guess it to be. You're the lucky beneficiary. 
Those nights riding a white cloud, beautiful. You and I'll never see them again. Yeah, dawn's really come up. It's broad daylight now. <laughs> Good night, folks. See you next week. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Tonight's story, Dead on Arrival, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of murder in wax, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I meet a wandering parrot screaming bloody murder, a sculptor with an amazing knack for making the dead lifelike, and a hired killer who sticks closer to me than my socks. The three put together spell murder. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Peggy was Arlene Blackburn. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. Now it's Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. One kind of free lodging that leaves everyone cold, folks is when it's yours, by courtesy of the city morgue. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. There's one little thing a confidential investigator has in common with a crooner or a tap dancer. Ballyhoo. You can't get enough of it. The right kind of publicity break with pictures, nats, and your fees skyrocket. Even better than money, you promote your pick of jobs, scoop off the cream. I wangled me a break like that. A lady reporter, Mona Gale, assigned to follow me around by the True Life Picture magazine. An elegant redhead, lugging a camera and a notebook, she'd been ordered to profile me and get the story of my life from cradle to now. But the assignment had her miffed, I could see. I wasn't important enough people for her. Is there some point to this dreary hike you've got me on, Mr. Craig? Yeah, there is. Tenement Row near the docks. America's melting pot. Out of it comes governors, songwriters, bookies. Look around you. I have looked around me. Then start taking notes. Garfield Place. I was a kid on this block. That rat trap there. I played stickball off the stoop. Go ahead, sister. Make with a pencil. Must I? Posterity will want to know. Are you naturally egotistic, Mr. Craig? Are you naturally a snob? I'm tired. So have a seat here on the stoop. Ah, what's better than city? Grand view, huh? Mm, great. Dirty-faced children, push carts, squalor. Isn't there some other way of profiling you, Mr. Craig? Like 
Oh, one of those celebrated cases you perform in so heroically. Couldn't I just watch you at work? Sure. If I had a case, which right now I haven't. Come on, beautiful. Get the feel of this block. Imagine back to me as a kid. That kid over there, reading the comics. Now, he could be me once upon a time. How about that weird-looking boy carrying the parrot? Boy carrying a what? Parrot. Well, yes. What do you know? The kid is carrying a parrot. And coming this way, too. He wants to pose for a before and after picture with you. Uh, you want to buy a parrot, mister, for cheap, mister? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, sonny. He yours? No, I found him on the docks. Lost. He's sick. Sick? Yeah, yeah. Look at the blood on his foot. Yeah, it is blood. Bring him closer. Hey, what you examine him for? Like a doctor. Funny. The parrot hasn't been hurt. Not a scratch on him, I can see. But the blood? I'll bet ten. It's human blood. Human blood, Mr. Cray? Yeah. Now, figure that. Oh, if only the parrot could talk. Hey, he talks good. Watch. Hey, go ahead, you talk. <gasps> Don't shoot me. <laughs> Don't shoot me. Is that the parrot talking, or is the boy a ventriloquist? Help! Murder! Help! Murder! It's the parrot, all right, yelling bloody murder. Sit tight, sister. You hold on to that parrot. Where are you going? To telephone check with Lieutenant Trav Rogers at police headquarters. I want to know what bloody corpse the parrot belongs to. Could be you will be watching me work after all. Mona got to watch me work. Over the phone, Lieutenant Trav Rogers set up a date for the parrot to be reunited with his master. The setting for the sentimental reunion was the city morgue. Roll him out, Ernie. The parrot belonged to him, Craig. Oh. Steady, Mona. Who was he, Trav? A Vince Larimer, according to an identification card in his wallet. He was found on the docks beside an empty bird cage, shot to death by an unknown assailant. And? We traced him to a banana boat. He'd booked passage from Honduras to New York. Period? Period. On ship, Larma kept to himself, stayed in his cabin. Uh, a mystery figure, isn't that how a reporter would headline him as Gail? That parrot you two chanced across was Larma's only known companion. Can I see the cage the parrot came in, Rogers? If you must meddle. I'm being immortalized by True Life magazine, so please don't louse it up. <laughs> This is the cage. How do you figure the parrot escaped, Trav? Larma was shot. He dropped the cage. This padlock broke off in the fall. The cage door flew open, etc., etc. And the parrot copped a walk, huh? No, Lieutenant, I don't think so. You don't? Not enough concussion for a padlock to snap off. Larma could only be carrying the cage a couple of feet off the ground. So? Look at the twists and the wire here where the padlock was originally secured. Hmm. Ah, wire is unusually twisted. The padlock didn't break off. It was broken off, deliberately. But why would a killer stop to do that, Craig? I'm puzzled like you're puzzled. Any other personal belongings found on the late Vince Larman? Uh, just this wristwatch, pocket knife, the silver ring. The silver wedding ring. The end? The dead end. A corpse, a parent, a few meaningless trinkets. Where would you go from here, Mr. Holmes? Oh, you're sure working hard at lashing me up with Mona. But it so happened a detour developed in the dead end. The next morning, while I was sorting my mail over coffee and sinkers in the crosstown banner, and while waiting for the red-headed Mona to show up for her day's grind, the mail was the usual garbage. Bills, all of them stamped final notice. Circulars advising me where to get my pants pressed, where to buy my geraniums. And one circular I really stopped to read. The Starbright Park Museum of Murder. Exhibits in wax. 
the circular entitles Barra to a 50% admission discount. Good morning, Mr. Craig. The ripened friendship we've got, it's time you call me Barry. With a good morning kiss. If that's how you like to start your day. Mm. Look, I was assigned to you to play Boswell, Barry, not Madame Bovary. And what, prey have you in store for me today? A trip to the Starbright Amusement Park. Amusement park? Read the circular. Bargain rate. So? Read where it says about the new wax exhibit. Oh, see, the brutal murder of Vince Lorimer. So real it will startle you. Hey, Vince Lorimer. Our corpse of yesterday. But, but, but how... How could, could a wax exhibit already be set up for the customers less than 24 hours after the murder happened? Yes, and circulars printed. Printed and in the mails. One of them in the mails to me. You think it was purposely? I'd be a dope not to think that. I'm not only being invited to get a look at Vince Larimer being shot, but also at who is shooting him. All this in wax. It's incredible. I'm in an incredible business, beautiful. In what other business can you get an educated redhead personally assigned to you? <laughs> Starbright Park was a ramshackle amusement area, a stone's throw off a public highway. Well, here's your museum of murder. Those signs, shocking, sensational, lurid. And closed. No ticket taker, no open door. It's boarded up? There's a bell here. This side door. What do you want? A word with the owner, lady. I'm the owner. Oh, I'm Barry Craig. This is Miss Gale. So what? I got a circular from you in this morning's mail. This one. You and a thousand other people, mister. Everybody from A to C in the telephone directory. Oh, and you didn't mean the circular especially for me? Are you out of your mind? Often. The circular advertises an exhibit of the murder of a man named Vince Larimer. You come to prove to me you can read? And also to see the exhibit. Another time when we're open. You're closed? For safety repairs. The building department found 14 violations. Oh. Come again. Wait. I want in. You say that like a cop. Invite us in. <laughs> Having fun, Maura? It's gruesome. Snyder and Ruth Gray in the hot seat. Dillinger bleeding all over Chicago's sidewalk. Why, baby, you're holding hands. I get affectionate and morbid surroundings. The Vince Larimer murders the last one in a row, right after Bluebeard. Here it is. Some light on the subject, please. I got no lights to switch on. The power battery's disconnected. Another order of the almighty building department... Here, you can use this flashlight. Thanks. Hey, quite a likeness. Barry, the victim does look like Vince Lorimer. Like Lorimer posed for it. Even the clothes, the pinstripe suit. And holding a cage with the parrot still in it. The minute before the actual murder, the scene's supposed to be. Uh, miss, or is it madam? It's Dolly. Dolly Flanders. Dolly, the hooded killer holding the gun. Why the hood? I, I don't get your question. Is there a head, a face under the hood? Yes, I guess there is. Model? How? How? In the likeness of the killer, I mean. In the likeness? How could that be? That's a question I'm saving for later. First, suppose you raise the hood. Get in there and raise it, Dolly. Don't raise it, Dolly. Barry! Voices jump you all the time in my business, Mona. You take it calmly. Freeze as you are, Dolly. Craig? Yeah? Drop that flashlight. Try beaming it at me and... Okay, stubborn. <laughs> Dolly, he shot you! No. Bullseye on the flashlight. My wrist's dead from the concussion. Get flat on the ground, face down, Craig. And your lady friend. Be smart, Craig. From where I am, you're a clay pigeon. Get down, Mona. <gasps> Horizontal in a wax museum. Include that in the piece you're writing. I'll even include it on my headstone. You, Dolly. What? 
This box of matches. Pick it up. Now this newspaper. Now roll the newspaper into a torch and light it. It's late. What shall I do now? A wax figure holding the gun. Stick the torch under the hood and hold it there. <laughs> Let's see how fast it melts. With the figure melted down, my gun-happy friend took one last precaution. I hate working over a guy when he's down. But you will. So you'll stay put while I leave? <laughs> bomb burst and my head set off the chain reaction. The last thing I heard before being blown to bits was Mona screaming. <laughs> I came around. A long night and a hundred years later, I came around. There was a face looking down on me. Pretty with red hair, red eyes, red eyes from crying, crying over me. Oh, Barry. And music. Bird music? The music, Mona. It's a yellow canary singing. You're in Dolly Flanders' office. Dolly Flanders? Dolly. I'm not responsible for what happened out there. Who was he? I don't know any more than you do, Doc, like it was. He didn't want me to see the face under the hood. Because it was his own face, Barry. He's the man who murdered Vince Lorimer. Yeah, the obvious conclusion. Maybe even too obvious. Dolly. What? How come a wax exhibit here dramatizes a murder that happened only yesterday? You tell me. Don't you order your own exhibits? No, I take what's shipped to me on a rental basis. So much a season. Shipped to you by home. A Mr. Scala. Fernando Scala, wax sculptor. Where do I find Scala? He's got a studio in Havamaya Flats near the railroad yards. Number 179. You threw third degree in me? No. How come you, a woman, run this kind of a business? Your husband, isn't he with you? How'd you know I had a husband? The silver wedding ring on your finger. Oh. Well, coming back to your first question about me and this business. Yes? I won't be in it anymore after today. Why not? I just sold it, as is, lock, stock, and barrel. Who to? Do I have to answer that, too? Not if it's a secret. It's no secret. Here's my copy of the bill of sale. Know ye by these presents that Howard Crump, purchaser, has this day for the sum of... Mr. Howard Crump thinks he's going to coin a mint run in this museum, as it should be run, so he says. Won't he coin a mint? He'll starve to death. That yellow canary of yours, you ever uh, let it out of its cage? Why should I do a fool thing like that? Skip it. Expecting visitors, Dolly? Crump. He haunts the place to see I don't cart nothing away now that he's bought the place. Come in, Crump. Dolly? Oh, excuse me. This is Mr. Craig. With him is Miss Gale. How do you do? Congratulations on your purchase, Mr. Crump. Oh, you know? Yeah, Dolly was telling us. Dolly said you're convinced there's a profit in murder. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> That's a curious way to put it. Then you put it. Uh, yes, I believe a wax museum can be run profitably. With, of course, judicious management and promotion. The underlying principle, Mr. Craig, in any business... Cut. My aching head crumb. The head I'm taking out of here is already twice the size I came in with. Coming, Mona? Outside the wax museum in a drugstore, while Mona calmed her fevered nerves with a double coke, I got the cracks in my skull glued and an iodine pomade where it lumped. After that, I telephoned police headquarters. Hello, Lieutenant Trav Rogers. Never mind paging him, Buster. A message will do from Barry Craig. 
Tell him to check Vince Lorimer's fingerprints with police files. Prado. Uh-uh. They're asking more questions than I've got answers. <laughs> Like Dolly had said, the Havermeyer Flat studio of Fernando Scala, wax sculptor specializing in murder, overlooked the railroad yards. Pint sized guy Scala, the mouse of a mustache and the look of a fox. With those trains, how can you concentrate on your wax modeling, Scala? Even better with the trains, Mr. Craig. I am filled with the wild river. Spare me the poetry. Then, uh, for the lady? Spare her the poetry, too. All right. I say only what you want me to say. I wonder. Where do you keep your crystal ball? Crystal ball? You identified the man who murdered Vince Larimer. I identified a murder? <laughs> you are joking. You modeled a victim and you modeled a killer. Oh, but you are surely mistaken. Am I surely mistaken? I modeled the victim, yes, from the newspaper pictures. And from the imagination also. But uh, the killer, uh, him I did not model. You didn't, huh? Oh, just a head with no face. A head I cover up with a hood because I cannot know the face. Who telephoned you in advance of my coming, Scholar? Prime you on how to answer me. Telephoned me? But I swear... Was it Dolly Flanders, maybe? Dolly Flanders, the owner of the museum? Dolly Flanders, the ex-owner of the museum. Oh, no, she did not telephone to me. Now, if this interview is over... I'm to scram and take Mona. Uh, my apologies for it, but I have so much work. You're a shrewd customer, Scala. Uh, thank you, Mr. Craig, for the great compliment. <laughs> there are no, uh, how you say, flies on you either. <laughs> oh, excuse me. He's told all he's going to, Mona, so let's go. Isn't there some way of compelling the truth? Yeah, a way that's a beaut. But I don't think you could stand watching it. I see. Yes. Oh, Mr. Craig. What? This uh, telephone call. It, it is for you. Nice job of acting mystified, Scholar, over a prearranged deal. Give me the phone. Hello? Craig? You know it's Craig. Guess who this is? The guy I've got a date with, that's for sure. If you live. I won't just shoot a flashlight out of your hand the next time. Through talking? Up. I'm on your tail, Craig, every minute. I followed you to Dolly's and I followed you to Scholar's. You better stop chasing around asking people questions, Craig. You better stop, or else. The case began to wrap itself up with a valuable assist credited to the good Lieutenant Trav Rogers. The return message for me, left with Jake the elevator up in my office building, suggested that I meet Trav post-haste in the Marble Lawn Cemetery. But why meet in a cemetery? A favorite long-lost aunt. Rogers wants me to help dig her up. Oh, taxi! Hey, taxi! Trav! Trav, where are you? Craig, I'm over here, the first footpath. Greetings, ghoul. What do you hear from the beyond? Read that tombstone in front of you. In memory of Sam Tracy, born 1910, died 1945. His loving wife, Dolly. Dolly? Barry, Dolly! Don't get into the lieutenant's act, beautiful. It's his show. Let him have the fun. But, uh, not here. Somewhere over a hot cup of coffee. That headstone read, Sam Tracy died 1945. He also died in 1951. The same man died twice. What Rogers is saying, Mona, is that our Vince Larimer was also named Sam Tracy once. Right, We checked Larimer's fingerprints with police files, as per your request. Larimer's prints correspond to the prints we have of a Sam Tracy, a one-time thief and safecracker. But there is a Sam Tracy now buried in the Marble Lawn Cemetery. (laughs) Mona's yet going to convert from reporter to detective. No, beautiful. Whoever's buried in Marble Lawn is a ringer. Someone buried as Tracy, as a trick to free the real Sam Tracy... 
and it's the late Vince Larriman. That was my guess, too, Barry. Great minds run on the same channels. Who said that? What was the original Sam Tracy trying to escape from? A safe robbery in 1945. Tracy made off with a cash haul of $100,000 belonging to a stockbroker named Rufus Scott. The police gave up when Tracy, the, the uh, phony Tracy, as it turns out now, died. Died how? In a rooming house fire while hiding out. And the 100 G's? Went up in smoke. So the police thought, I mean. As did the insurance detective in the case. Insurance detective? A certain Sandy Dowell, an eager beaver in his day. Dowell chased Tracy all over North America before the fire burned him out of the case and into retirement. Well, you got something you can contribute, Craig? This. Sam Tracy, alias the late Vince Larimer, was the husband of Dolly, the ex-owner of the Starbright Park Museum of Murder. I read the tombstone, too, genius. Besides, it's a matter of record that uh, Dolly Tracy posed as the widow in the phony burial of her so-called husband in 1945. I guessed Dolly to be the very late Larimer's widow this morning. By divination? By a silver wedding ring on her finger. An exact replica of the one you found on the corpse. Hmm. Well, we know a lot and we know nothing. Tracy got away clean with $100,000. Even got out of the country. Why then did he come back, posing as a Vince Larimer? Why take that risk? And get murdered. And who released the parrot? And why? Frankly, Mona, I don't know if that's really significant. Bet on it, it is, Rogers. It's the key to our killer. All right, where would the key fit? Seabright Park, I'd say. Tram? Yes. Suppose I call the moves. Can you bear it? If it catches a murderer. Spoken like a good cop. With Trav swallowing his pride enough to backstop me, I stormed the Museum of Murder. Yes? You. Close that door, Crump, quick. You, uh, seem urgent. Urgent? There's a rifle happy wild man tagging after me. Where's Dolly? Packed up and gone. I've taken possession. Uh oh. That's my rifle, man. Don't open that door. Where are you going? To your office to telephone for help. Now, look, Craig, I can't get involved in your affairs. Craig! Hello. Hello. Dead. Now the line went dead. Someone's cut your wires, Crump. Craig, you can't stay here. I'm running a business, not a headquarters. You want me dead? No, but... What's oh, this? My rifle happy friends finding the range. Craig, get out of here. I'll be murdered. That's not my concern. I insist you go. You want me to walk out at a certain death? It's certain death. Anyhow, staying in here, cooped up in here, cornered. Craig, I'll be killed too. The next bullet might get me. You're raving, Crump. Well, you stay here. The room is a death trap. You look green, Crump. Sick as if you're suffocating. Suffocating. Yes, I am. The room's close. Stifling. Close and stifling like a cage? Y y yes, And I... you hate cages, don't you, Crump? Uh, that's why you let parrots out of cages. You can't stand seeing anything caged. No, 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 I can't stand... Even the yellow canary, Dolly's yellow canary. The cage is here, but the canary's gone. You emptied that cage too, eh, Crump? Uh, yes, yes. Crick, I can't bring it. I'm suffocating. Trav and I swapped postmortems and Tony's while Mona took notes. Claustrophobia, the fear of confinement. Crump couldn't stand anything in cages, or being caged or cornered himself, like I made him feel in his office. It even showed in his clothes, baggy suits, sizes too big, shirt open at the neck, no necktie. His clothes gave you the hunch on him. That and the bill of sale Dolly showed me. How so? Crump paid $40,000 for the Museum of Murder. $40,000 for a worthless business. Blackmail? It had to be. Dolly knew it was Crump who'd murdered her husband on the docks. She devised a cute way to make Crump pay off. But why would Crump murder... Now, wait, wait. I think I know. Crump is really Rufus Scott, the, the stockbroker Sam Tracy robbed six years ago was hired to rob by arrangement. My bet is that Crump invited Tracy to come tap his safe. I'll buy that, sure. 
the Scott firm was on the verge of bankruptcy before that robbery. And then Tracy never got to keep the stolen $100,000. He was just the tool. The patsy. Lucky to escape with his life. That's why he skipped the country. But, uh, Craig. But? Who staged the rooming house fire and the burial of a bogus Sam Tracy? Somebody who wanted to permanently shut off police interest in Sam Tracy and in the 100 G's. The men say, uh, you were supposed to be Rogers when you stalked me in the museum of murder and helped pull Crump apart at the scene. Ah, uh-huh. The beneficiary of the $100,000 was the thug who worked over you, eh? A thug who could only be one guy. Trav, your retired insurance dick. Sandy Dow. Sandy Dow. A guy I've got a date with before you have. On a Craig, don't be vindictive. Don't you be casual, Trav, about my head. Before you put the cuffs on Dowell, I'm handing him his cuffs, and that's for sure. And before you two stalwarts of the law really go at it in earnest, will you tell me if I've got it down correctly? Uh Uh-uh. Some other time, we'll go into a huddle over your notes. Mm -hmm. Just one footnote to murder. Dolly ordered that wax exhibit from Scala and invited me to come see it. It was her way of forcing Crump to come across by her museum. The end? Almost. All it needs now is the... Clinch. The clinch, Barry? Yeah, to keep your storyline straight. Page one, boy meets girl. End page, boy gets girl. Hmm. Oh. Uh, Trav. What? Vamoose, huh? But, uh... All of a sudden, Mona's got that certain primitive look in her educated eye. Oh. Excuse me for being dense. Yeah, scram, Lieutenant. Please do not louse Craig up with the press. <laughs> Good night, folks. See you next week. You have been listening to William Gargan. In another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Murder in Wax, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of the naughty necklace, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I'll tell you how I was hired to buy a string of pearls, which was almost woven into a noose to hang me with. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Mona was Joan Alexander. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. Now enjoy Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. The trouble with murder as an occupation, folks, is that it doesn't last very long. In no time at all, you come to a dead end. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig. Confidential Investigator. Barry Craig speaking. An investigator's license costs only a few bucks. When you're starting in the business, you've got ambition. So you have the license put under glass and framed. You spend a couple of hours deciding on the best place to hang it. 
Then you find out all you've done is bought yourself a front seat for the back stairs. But you also find out an awful lot of people use the back stairs. It's open. Craig? Yeah. You alone? There are mice. Uh, they're tame, though. I uh, wonder if you're the man I'm looking for, Craig. You'll have to figure that out by yourself. It says confidential investigator on your door. I had that put on myself. Maybe I was boasting. Small place. Hmm. What's this door? Leads to the back stairs. Yes? You want to look under the desk, too? I have to be careful. How much money do you make a month? Not enough to have my clothes made by your tailor. Mm -hmm. I think that you'll do. Thanks. This is what you'll work with. An envelope? Take a look inside. All right. Money. Count it. Uh Uh-huh. Five thousand. Yes. I want you to buy a necklace for me, Craig. For five thousand dollars. That's right. You got any preferences in necklaces? A girl named Wendy Harper has the one I want. She lives at the Beecham Towers Hotel. Maybe she's got more than one. Oh, no. The necklace is pearl. You buy it from her, turn it over to me, and collect 500. You don't like the Beecham Towers Hotel? Well, what's that got to do you with You could it? go over there, buy the necklace yourself, and save my fee. I could also be sued for divorce. Meaning you can't afford to be seen with her. Fair enough. I'd like a receipt for the 5000 Sure. Received from... From? You don't need that. How will I get in touch with you? I'll phone you. Okay. Your receipt. Thanks. I suggest you begin work at once. Right. Now, one thing. Yes? Suppose she doesn't want to sell. She'll sell. You're sure the necklace is worth five grand? Yes, I should be. I gave it to her. I congratulated myself cautiously. A case a week like this, and I could start getting my clothes tailored, too. I locked the office door. Who knows? Word might get around I was a man people handed $5,000 to. It would give the entire building, all three moldering stories of it, class. Burglars might start dropping in. Oh, hello, Jake. Hey, Mr. Craig. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, I'm going down. Don't rush it. Elevator's got to have time to rest. After the long pull? Yeah. Got to rest your horse at the end of a furrow, you know. Jake, forget about that farm in Vermont, will you? You're in the big city now. I'd rather have a horse. If you was in such a hurry, why didn't you walk down? Too proud. I've just moved into the upper income brackets. That so? Thanks. By the way, Jake, uh, did you notice the man you took down from my floor a couple of minutes ago? No. Had your nose buried in the farmer's almanac? I didn't take nobody down. Oh. Well, that was my client. Who was? The man you didn't take down. I don't suppose you took him up either. No. Use the stairs both times. The back stairs. Hmm? Jake. Yeah? When was the last time those back stairs were swept? I don't know. I've only been here six months. Yeah. Mr. Craig. What? Must get kind of lonely up there on the third floor. Sort of. Why? Oh, just wondering. You sure you had a client? I smiled at Jake. I could feel a fat envelope in my pocket. $5,000 carries a lot of conviction. Sir? Miss Harper. Is she expecting you? Phone up to her and she will be. Yes, sir. The name? Craig. Uh, one moment, sir. Miss Harper? Uh, there's a gentleman here to see you. Uh, Mr. Craig. Yes, of course, Miss Harper. Uh, 407, Miss Harper's expecting you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> 
The Beecham Towers was a lot nicer looking than the building on 23rd. But then I didn't use the back stairs. Miss Harper, I figured, was leaving it all up to me. 407 was a suite. You walked past the small foyer before you hit the living room. It was a nice living room. The furniture was modern and bright. There was a wrong note, though. Miss Wendy Harper. She was on the couch. She looked modern and bright, too. The wrong note? She happened to be dead. Her eyes were open. For a minute, I had the impression they were looking at me. I couldn't decide if they liked what they saw. Or if they were looking over my shoulder, the way I should have looked. the house detective. Good for you. Now, you're in my way. You're not coming in. Now, listen. The old lady in the next suite heard a woman screaming from here. When? A few minutes ago. She needs new batteries for a hearing aid. What time is it? 7.30. Nobody screamed in here for at least a couple of hours. Where's Miss Harper? She's in. I want to talk to her. You're going to be disappointed. Miss Harper's in no mood for conversation. I'd like her to tell me that. Lots of things we'd like just never happen. Hey, hey, what's your idea? If you want to get in here, take my advice, call a cop. I slammed the door shut in Clancy's face. Clancy was guessing. He wasn't sure. Maybe I was just a boyfriend with a temper. He'd stand around and wonder what to do for a while before trying to come into the room again. That gave me time enough to go through the suite make sure it was empty. Make sure Miss Harper was still dead. She was. They don't come alive very often. And then check on a pearl necklace. There wasn't one around. I hadn't figured there would be. By that time, I was in a hurry. This time, I was the one for the back stairs. I was picking up time with every step I took. But time for what? The back door led to an alley. I had ash cans for company. A man named Nothing, whom no one had seen, for a client. And a crude frame-up for murder as a future. I had no optimism about my chances for playing tag with the homicide squad. The cops had a name for me. I had no name for the man who'd sent me to visit a dead girl. No name, no lead... Nothing but a hope that whoever had set up the deal would be too impatient to wait for the morning papers. Up the street, the Marines were coming. I said goodbye to the alley before they could land. Made the other side of the street. And waited. The hotel was on a quiet street. No crowds. Nobody watched the cops pour into the hotel. Nobody but me and... A small man pretending he was part of a doorway down the street. The last cop went into the hotel and the small man abandoned the doorway. He didn't know it, but he had me for company. It was easy. The small man wasn't worrying. According to the general idea, I was being interviewed by a dozen cops at the moment. He led me across town with no trouble. The address was 5413 East 79th Street. The house was old. The ivy on its walls was probably hand-picked. The small man used the servant's entrance. I decided to be formal. A brass plate under the doorbell read John Peter Kendall. I thought he'd be surprised to see me on his doorstep. I was surprised. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Kendall? I'm Mrs. Kendall. Good. Your... You're excused. Better shut the door. Are you a salesman? <laughs> Not exactly. Well, you're big enough, heaven knows, but you don't look very dangerous. So? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kendall home? I don't think so. I, I don't know. I guess it is a pretty large house. <laughs> it is. 
Also, John and I don't get on very well together. But why am I telling you this? Maybe because I look reliable and a little stupid. <laughs> That's silly. It's not very hospitable keeping you out here in the hall. It's not. Uh... But uh, I intend to continue doing it unless you can give me a reason. And for your being here, I mean. I do insurance work. Oh? Your husband hired me to trace some property of his. Well, he must have been very anxious about it if he asked you to come here at this hour. He was anxious. Strange. Why? Dear John has so much property. Oh, this was something special. And uh, confidential? It used to be. What does that mean? Lost any pearl necklaces recently, Mrs. Kendall? Why, yes, I did. That's what he wanted me to trace. Oh. Please come with me, Mr. Uh... Jones. Jones. Wait here a moment. All right. Uh, Mr. Jones. Yes? This is the necklace I lost. It looked like five grand, too. Mrs. Kendall, her price tag wasn't showing. Well, Mr. Jones... When did you get it back? John brought it to me, perhaps an hour ago. An hour ago? Then he is home. He said he might go out for a stroll. I didn't try to translate. A stroll in John's peculiar vocabulary could mean almost anything. You asked him where he got the necklace? No. I assumed he'd hired someone like you to find it for him. Mr. Jones. Yes? Yeah? What are you really after? Will you see if your husband's home, please? All right. Mr. Jones. What? Are you sure you're doing something for my husband? Not to him? She didn't wait for an answer. It was very still in the Kendall home. I wondered how well Kendall had covered his relationship to Wendy Harper. Pretty well, I thought. There were no cops around. Mrs. Kendall was taking a long time. Too long a time. Mrs. Kendall! Mrs. Kendall! I'm here. Where's the light? No, no, we might shoot again. Never mind. It's gone. The light switch, the wall to your left. Okay. Oh, right. Talking to Max. He's our handyman. I, I'd asked him about John. That's Max over there? Yes. Max started to tell me something about... Oh, it's crazy. About a, a hotel. When John opened the door, he, he'd been listening. He had a gun. It was dreadful. Dreadful. Here, sit down. I'll have to take a look at Max. All right. Why, I, I don't know. He'd been there or seen something. He was staring at me as though he were terrified and... And then the door opened behind him. I could see John's face. And after that, the shots came. You'll have to phone the police. I? Yeah, I can't stay. I've got a date. Mrs. Kendall, where would your husband go if he didn't want to be found? John? I, I don't know. I don't you know. You must know. A man as wealthy as he is. Well, he's got a place on the Sound. It's only a shack. Sort of a boathouse. What's the address? Riverview Road. Right off the parkway. I'll find it. You'll be all right. The police Mr. will... Mr. Jones. Why was Max shot? Why? <laughs> My benefit, mostly. Your benefit? Yeah, his death moves me right out of the chair. I don't understand. You don't have to, for right now. I've got an errand to run, to convey thanks and make a payment. Hey, bud. Yeah? Kind of late to be driving out to the Sound, ain't it? You mind? Nah, I don't mind. As long as you've got the fare. I've got the fare. Only reason I brung it up is, uh, not many cars going out this way this time of night. Yeah, I guess so. So the, uh, car behind us must be tailing us. Car behind? Yeah. It's been there last half an hour. It's got one headlight weaker than the other, kind of stuck in my mind. Don't worry about it. I don't want no trouble. There won't be any for you. Reverend 
Riverview Road, bud. That the shack up ahead? Yeah. The other car. Didn't swing around a bend. Was with us up until then. Nice. How much do I owe you? A couple of bucks. Here you are. Thanks. How about me hanging around for a while? No, it might discourage my friend. The guy on your tail? Uh huh. Good night. So long. Craig, Barry Craig. Recognize the name, Mr. Kendall? Uh, what do you want? Hard talking through a door. Don't try anything, Craig. You don't need that gun. Let's not agree about that. It's cold out here. Come in. Slowly. Thanks. Over there at the table. Sit down. Okay. Put... Both hands on the table, please. Everybody knows all the angles nowadays, except maybe me. Why did you come out here? I had a report to make. Report? Sure, don't you remember? You hired me. Oh, well, I... Funny thing. Nine times out of ten, people who hire me don't expect me to believe them. Or to carry out their orders exactly the way they gave them. They're always working on an angle. What's so funny about that? I always believe my clients. I do my best to carry out their orders the way they say they want them to be. That gets me into more trouble. You're wasting time. And you don't have much time left? You... You said you had a report to make. Sorry. That necklace you hired me to get. Well? It's back in your wife's possession. You... You gave it to her? No, you did. It's a little late for jokes. No jokes. You can check with your wife. Not only that, Mr. Kendall, the whole deal worked out a lot cheaper than you expected. What do you mean? $5,000 is a lot of money. One girl's life, a lot cheaper. You, you've still got the money? Yeah. Now, don't reach. Stop being so nervous. I was just getting this. $5,000. And Wendy? What do you think? What? Well, I don't understand what you mean. You've had time enough to get here, so I'd better get rid of this light. <laughs> Your gun, Kendall, I'll need it. Don't pull around, Kendall. Dark in here. Our mystery man outside hasn't got artillery on the revolver. We're safe for right now. Well, I don't know what's happening. Shut up. He's moving around. Waiting. We can wait, too. Yes, but for what? He's got to make up his mind. If we're dead or not, you have to check. Till then, let's chat, huh? A man comes into my office, hands me five grand, instructs me to buy a pearl necklace from a girl in a hotel. Shh. I don't... It's my story. The guy uses the back stairs, doesn't leave his name. I take the dough, get to the hotel, walk into the girl's suite, and get knocked out. The girl is dead. Just but You I didn't... keep interrupting. I wake up to find the old lady next door has heard a woman scream and yelled for the house stick. He's at the door. He's supposed to walk in, find the dead girl, and me with 5,000 bucks in cash on me. He calls homicide. I tell my story to them. How do you think they go for it? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Don't overdo it. It's plain enough. My client is a work of the imagination, they say. I knock the girl off her a dough. Very simple and very pretty. Well, then, then who is that outside? When I got to the hotel, I had to be announced. The clerk called upstairs. He held a conversation with Miss Harper. He told me she said it was okay to go on up. But Wendy Harper was already dead. Well, then... Then... Shh. Junior's making his bid. Okay, drop it. What? I said drop it, Junior. You got the moonlight behind you? No. I don't like it, but... Oh! Got a match, Kendall? Uh, yes. Yes, I have. Let's have a light then, huh? Oh, all right. Over here. Yeah, the hotel clerk. He's registered his last guest, death.
John Peter Kendall didn't have any comments to make. He stared at the dead clerk as though he'd never seen a corpse before. Maybe he hadn't. He was my client, wasn't he? Let's get out of here. Yes, but what about him? He's dead. Well, isn't there something we should do? There's nothing you do about the dead. Well, I mean, he was killed. Yeah? Well, the police... You're in the clear on this particular death. What are you worrying about? I suppose you know better than I. Also, I've got the gun, so... All right. Yeah. The clerk's car is out here. How about yours? I came here by cab. That can be checked. I still say I came here by cab. Okay, we'll borrow the car. Hold it. That's on this road. The police. Sounds like them. Of course, they could be on their way to a ball. Would you like to stay and chat with them? No, no. No, there, there, there are too many things. I, I'm confused. Where's Riverview Road lead? To the city. I mean the other way. Well, it sort of, sort of peters out about a half mile from here. No good. We'll take one look at the cops and come after us. With the road a dead end only a half mile away, we'd be finished. Come on. Well, we... We could drive toward the city. You think they'd let us pass if they're heading here? Forget it. We leave the car where it is. Who planted these trees? I had them put there. Oh, good for you. You should have planted them a little more thickly, however. We get in among them. Ah, this ought to be good enough. But any search would... Find us? Sure. But maybe... Uh Uh-oh, here they come. The squad car and the taxi. Yeah, the cab I came out in. The driver spotted the clerk tailing me. He must have hung around down the road and heard the shots, then went back to town and collected police. Well, they've checked the car. Empty. Now for the house. In a half dozen seconds, they'll be popping out of there looking for us. Come on! What are we... Maybe we can make the cab. The driver left it out in the road proper. What good did that do? The, the squad car... Don't worry about that. Get into the cab and start it. All right. Me, I'm going to be nasty to a tire. Yeah. Get going. Fine. Well, what did you do? Screw the tire valve open on the squad car. The clerk's car is blocked off. So they'll have to change the tire. Maybe we'll have enough time. The police won't like it. How very true. You know, Mr. Kendall, I'm in trouble. Not only am I wanted for murder, but now for committing a nuisance on police property. I was glad we weren't close enough to hear the cops discuss their flat tire. I think their language would have been frightful. Hey, take it easy, Mr. Kendall. We don't want a ticket, too. We're almost back in the city. Where do you want to go? Home and sleep, but not just yet. Well, then let's make it your home, huh? My home? The mansion you and your wife play hide-and-seek in, except both of you seem to be hiding rather than seeking. If you don't mind, I could do without your wit. So could I if I had any. Mr. Kendall. Yes? The whole thing started with a necklace, a pearl necklace. Right. You didn't bother telling me it had belonged to your wife before you passed it on to Wendy Harper. It hadn't belonged to my wife. And why all the anxiety about getting it back? Well, she found out about it through the jeweler where I bought it. I had to pretend I'd gotten it for her as a surprise. That meant you had to get it back from Wendy. It would have looked bad in the divorce case. And Wendy wouldn't part except for five grand? That's right. Do we have to? We do. Come on. Better not ring. Your handyman wouldn't answer. Max? He's dead, too. What? Use your key. Why, I I can't take much more of it. There won't be much more. Go on. Hello, Mrs. Kendall. Mr. Craig. Mr. Jones. And John. You started to say Mr. Craig. What? The name is Craig. Where are the cops? The... Oh, about Max. Yeah. Well, I, I haven't phoned them yet. I was ill after you left. Terribly ill. I still don't feel right. That hotel clerk doesn't feel right either. What hotel clerk? You sound like... like Max. The one who sent me up to Wendy Harper's room. The one who had a conversation with Wendy Harper after she was dead. This is all completely... 
completely... Isn't it? John, what's happening? Why are you staring at me like that? He doesn't love you anymore. Oh, you... No, no, no. Let's keep it genteel. Kendall? Yes? Call some cops, huh? Police? Yeah. They want to take Max to the morgue. Max, who led me to your wife and died for it. And even more, they'll want your wife. It had been a long evening. I'd stayed ahead of homicide for a while, but they always catch up. Craig. Well, Lieutenant Trav Rogers. Give me one good reason why your license shouldn't be revoked. Mrs. Joanne Kendall. I said a good reason. What else could I have done, Trav? You're not trying to tell me you were afraid of the frame. I never tried to tell a lieutenant of homicide anything. No, I wasn't. But I had a job to do. I got it done, too. You could have been killed in the process. Oh, there's a law against that. Oh. Craig, we got the whole thing laid out. The Kendall woman moved in on what looked like a perfect opportunity to get rid of Wendy Harper, frame you for the killing, and have a club over her husband's head for the rest of his life. Because he'd hired you, all she had to do was threaten to tell us about that, and he'd be tied in. But where'd you get the bright idea it was Mrs. Kendall who set you up and not her husband? Clancy, the house dick at the Beecham Towers. Huh? He came up and told me an old lady had heard a woman scream a couple of minutes before I regained consciousness. The Harper girl had been dead for hours then. So it had to be Mrs. Kendall screaming. To get Clancy up and you arrested. Mm-hmm. Come on. Buy me a beer. Well, we'll go out and have beers, but what makes you think it's going to be on me? You just made 500 bucks, remember? Holy smokes. What now? I forgot to collect. Good night, folks. See you next week. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Case of the Naughty Necklace, was written by Lou Vittes. Next week, it's the strange story of paper bullets about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, folks, I find out that words can be bullets when two prize-winning authors do their literary best to prove the gun is mightier than the pen. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Mrs. Kendall was Barbara Weeks. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. Now enjoy Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. The old saying, early to rise, folks, can't possibly mean a thing to a corpse. Your Pontiac dealer presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. (laughs) 
If you crave all the elbow room you can get, folks, be sure to have your coffin built to your own specifications. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Live sharply with your senses in high gear as a confidential cop must. You notice things the average citizen never sees. Little situations that look normal on the surface, but aren't really. Like a loving couple on the subway, the Sea Beach Express, en route from Times Square to Coney Island. A cute red-headed girl with an ice cream look, and a young fellow with an actor's profile. He had an adoring arm around her, around her waist inside her coat. Young lovers, peaches and honey. Only thing I could see the hard outline of a gun under the girl's coat. She was acting cozy, all right, by persuasion. Going through a tunnel, I changed seats to chaperone the situation. Nice day. Huh? You say something? I asked, uh, what do you think of the world situation? Hey, what are you, some kind of a nut? Isn't everybody? Look, creep, blow. My seat's paid for. But my ears aren't. Oh, now, that's an unnaverly attitude. What does your girlfriend think about it? Mind your business about my girl. I can't. You what? Chivalry. I've got the taint of the southern gentleman. I once spent a weekend in Chattanooga. I can't ever pass up a lady in distress. What uh, makes you think she's in any distress? Isn't anybody... With a gun in their ribs? Look, wise guy. A gun can point two ways and I'll bite your tongue. Can't do. I'm a lifelong vegetarian. You can get plugged. So can you. Even faster than me. What does that mean? Cast a downward glance, brother. My right hand in my right coat pocket. If I fired, now, let's see. Yeah. You'd be shot in the seventh rib. Who, Who are you? Sir Galahad. I've got a suggestion to make. What? The next station stop, we get off. The three of us. You, me, and the redhead. If not, we'll both be disappointed. On the subway platform, I took the obvious precaution. Your gun. Let's have it. Huh? Hand over your gun. Yeah, I guess you would want that. Only thing I'm not so sure... I've got the drop on you. I know. First shot's yours, then my turn. You want it like that? Call me crazy. Tex, give him your gun. Tex, please. Looks like Angie's for you, mister. For you? She doesn't want you dead. Look, it's my life. You're not getting my gun. I'll have to lose it to you. Okay. You give me no choice. Don't, mister. Don't, please. Don't shoot Tex. No? He's stubborn, hard-bitten, crazy stubborn. That's his trouble. That's always been his trouble. You sound like it's been a long time with Tex. It's been a long time. I know him through and through. I see. So what's your line on the situation? Let him go. Just let him walk away. Take a walk, Tex. Sure. Sure, if you say so. I won't thank you, Angie. My hunch is Galahad. He is too yellow to shoot anyway. Go, Tex. Why, you can. Go. Sure. Sure. I'll be looking you up again. We got uh, unfinished business, Angie. Now what, miss? Take me home. Home was a cheap hall bedroom. An old iron bed and a linoleum rug with designs of cherubs pointing bows and arrows on it. There was a blue waitress's uniform hanging on a clothes tree. I wait on tables. Renzi's chop house. No, I won't be able to. Tex, huh? He knows about my job. But doesn't know your home address? That's one secret I managed to keep. What are you two to each other? Sweethearts. We used to be. We grew up together on Elkin Street off Chatham Square. Rough neighborhood. A street killing once a month like clockwork. <laughs> we 
became engaged when Tex was 14 and I was 12. A ring he stole from his mother. Uh, you still love him? How can I? Yeah. He's a bad actor. What gives between you two now? I... I don't feel free to discuss it. Oh, well, maybe you'd better. He left threatening, quote, uh, unfinished business. Also, I'd worry about his gun if I were you. I do worry, believe me. I'm up night smoking and walking the floor. I'm a cop. Not the regular kind. Private. Confidential. I can handle a situation without being hemmed in by regulations. Meaning? I can be a friend. All right. I'll confide in you. For Tex's sake as well as mine. Tex came out of jail last week. First thing he did was look me up. Why? A sealed envelope left with me before he stood trial. Go on. Tex was convicted of robbing a payroll messenger. The Hubble Electrical Company, $30,000 was stolen cash. The court never got Tex to tell where the money was. Just took his lump, served five years. He stashed the money away. I... I don't know that. The sealed envelope left with you, it had to do with where Tex had the money. I'm sure you guessed that. Yeah, I guessed it. But I never opened the envelope. I I didn't want it on my conscience. I, I felt that I owed some loyalty to Tex for, for what we'd been to each other. I remember good times we'd had. Times Tex acted civilized and normal. You uh, turned the envelope over to Tex last week. Then what? Well, Tex came back the next day. He couldn't find the money. It was gone. He... He, he accused you of a double crime. Yeah, imagine that I'd steamed open the envelope and then sealed it back. Where was the money supposed to be hidden? Well, Tex didn't say, and I don't know. Are you the only person Tex suspects? No. He also suspects his brother, Willie. Willie's his twin. Well, how does he connect Willie with the alleged double cross? Well, uh, while Tex was up, I'd been seeing Willie. Oh. Dates. I needed companionship. I couldn't sit around like a stick of wood. Well, Tex thinks Willie got to the envelope, that I was careless with it. Where did you keep the envelope? Oh, there, under the linoleum. Could Willie have kidded you along just to get at the envelope? I'd say no. Willie's sweet. The opposite of Tex, hardworking and honest. He drives a laundry truck, works like a dog to get somewhere, but... But? Oh, you never know who to trust. You never know who's rotten in his heart. Yeah. Any money to tide you over while you stay away from Renzi's chop house? I got four dollars. You've got 24 now. Why are you giving me money? No strings attached. What good's my helping you if I let you starve to death? For so long, I'll be in touch. Goodbye. And, uh, thanks. A few doors up from Angie's furnished room, the neighborhood got over-friendly. One resident constituted himself a committee of one to see to my comfort. A fellow with sideburns that ran into his neck. Hey, you feel something, Pop? You've got ten years on me, pal, so how can I be your Pop? Well, my gray hair, that in age, I do it on purpose. Why? So as I can look distinguished. Why? Why? Well, don't, don't everybody want to look distinguished? Hey, you're ribbing me. And you're ribbing me. <laughs> yeah. I asked you before, do you feel it? I feel it. Huh. Sharp, huh? Another sixteenth of an inch, you'll draw blood. I got that knife trained that does just what I say. Tell it to climb back in your pocket. Ah, the knife says for you to step into the alley. Which alley? Oh, pick any one you like. Okay, that one. Show it away. In the alley, I submitted to a frisky. Hold still. What fray are you looking for? Uh, a gat. How come, fella? Check my wallet and deduce for yourself. Oh. Private eye, huh? Worried? No, cops don't worry me. I worry them. A cop fighter. I was ten and one shot my old man for nothing. I never forgot. 
Shot your old man for nothing? All he was doing was a saloon stick-up, only for laughs. Only for laughs? Yeah. It was a Saturday night, nothing doing, everything dead. The old man wanted to liven things up. And then, boom, and I'm an orphan. Stupid cop. Sad story. Well, should I love cops? No, but don't hate me. I'm private. I work for me. <laughs> now work for me. What do you want? I seen you with Angie Palmer showing her home. So? So the dough Angie held for Tex when he was sent up don't leave Nick out of it. You being Nick? Yeah. Me being the Nick that used to beat the ears off of Tex when he was kids, PS 142. 30 G's and hot money. I've been drooling over it. Who's got it, huh? I don't know. Angie or Tex, huh? I said I don't know. Or maybe you. All I've got is what's in my wallet. Ten bucks. My worldly goods. Eh, take back your wallet. I'm after big stuff. Just like you're after, huh? Meaning? Oh, you're after Angie for my reasons. Maybe. You make out. Remember, don't leave Nick out of it. Your knife says. My knife says. That fence there, you see it? I see it. Climb over it and find yourself some other street. I don't want to be seen with you. I'm hard luck climbing fences. I tear my pants. Get. Texas twin brother, Willie, didn't exactly look the part of a hard-working stiff who drove a laundry truck. The suit on him was custom-tailored. The shirt under it was pure silk. The ring on his finger had a rock in it the size of a rhinoceros egg. Prosperity all over him in neon lights. I haven't seen my brother Tex in five years. Train stop at Osning. Oh, Tex warned me never to visit him in Sing Sing. A feud between you? We're peas in a pod, only on the outside. Meaning? Tex has always given me a bad time, abuse, trouble. He resents my respectability. <laughs> Being twin to a bad man has its complications. Such as? I'd been arrested time and again for something Tex did in the years before he was sent up. Ladies have identified me as a purse snatcher, stuff like that. I'd stand sweating it out in police lineups. Angie, uh, why are you romancing Tex's girl? The normal reasons. Love? Uh-huh. Head over heels since I was this high. But Angie's been Tex's girl. Once. That's over. The guy your brother is, you're asking for a headache. I know. It scares me, but it scares me more to give up Angie. I see. I glean you had more schooling than Tex. At night school, I take courses in speech and electronics. Pointing for trade? Radio TV repairman. I figure someday to open my own shop. Tell me, what's the twist in Tex? Well, he was a show-off as a kid. He got used to the wrong kind of applause. He'd pull all kinds of petty stuff just to get attention. He couldn't stand being ignored. It drove him crazy, made him feel like dirt. He's still a kid showing off. Oh, but don't take my analysis for it. I'm not a psychologist. I've got a rough question for you. I think I know it. Go ahead. Did I get close to Angie? Or just to nose out where Tex had the stolen $30,000? What's the answer? No. You have no idea where the loot is? No idea. Where can I find Tex? Have you any idea? Uh, it happens I do. In my own way, I keep a corner of my eye on him. Concerned for Tex and to protect myself. He's hot-headed and unpredictable. I never know. Well, where can I find him? 22 Tillery Street, a yard house behind the Corning Iron Works. Tex has always used it as a hideout. Thanks for the information. For, uh, go, go easy on Tex, huh? He needs understanding. He needs a straight steer into his future. He's got a blind wall in front of him. I'm referring to the 30,000. The frame yard house behind the ironworks looked like a strong wind would blow it down. I found Tex in the room that had the smell of last year's rain. He was stripped to his waist, stretched out on an army cot. More in a coma than asleep, his eyeballs popping in a lunatic stare and sweating a hot paste of sweat. Sick, he couldn't be sick, and delirious, babbling in a delirium. 
Mistake for text. Text riding high. In the world, Blasi no good. 30,000 beautiful, beautiful, beautiful <laughs> Dunstan's chicken farm. Or go live from the coop. Easy. Oh, it's easy. Do it blindfolded. Easy. Easy as pie. Easy. Pretty soon, I was playing nurse to a hoodlum, bathing his brow and cooling him down. And then his eyes were on me, blind to who I was, and suddenly calm as if the fever had passed. Oh, you. Yeah? The bottle. The shelf over the sink. Uh, reach me a pill, would you? Sure. Oh. Here, now, raise up a little. Oh. oh. Thanks. The pill brings me to... Fine. Oh, I must have passed out. You were delirious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fever. Fever. I, 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 I got it in the tropics once. I was a kid on a job in the tropics. Rubber plantation. I was hired out to a surveyor. Forty lousy bucks. The fever. It hits me and goes all, all the time. It, it hits me and it goes. Chronic, huh? Yeah, 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 chronic. The prison medic had me on shots. Uh, uh, you, you... What? Uh, 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 do me another thing, would you? Uh, uh, fry me a couple of eggs. My, oh, my stomach. It feels like an empty drum. Uh, how do you like your eggs? He'd downed four eggs and a pot of coffee before he bothered to figure out where he'd seen me before. His eyes began to focus like a veil had dropped. You're the creep who jumped me on a subway train. No hard feelings. What's your game? Good Samaritan. <laughs> the other time you were Galahad. I'm versatile. You're either a crook or a cop, which? Cop jerk. But you're prejudiced. I did five years. For armed robbery. The penalty fit the crime. Salvation talk. You can use some. Some what? Salvation talk. Cops hounding me. Look, I paid my debt. Not quite. Not quite. The $30,000 still outstanding. You're still in debt. I earned that 30000 five years. I lay in a hole for five years. You'll live in the shadows for the rest of your life if you try keeping that money. My risk. Besides, I haven't got it. Who has? Angie or my phony brother, Willie. Or Nick? Yeah. Or Nick. The rat Nick. He was up at Sing Sing visiting Sundays, handing me a carton of smokes and a line. Tip him to where the money was. He'd keep it safe for me. <laughs> safe in a pig's eye. Angie, Willie, or Nick. Anybody else you suspect could have beat you to the money? McAvoy. The insurance dick in the case. I swear he had a phony look to him. Or you. I wouldn't put it past you. Everybody's dishonest in your book, huh? Yeah, sure. The only honest sucker who ever lived was my father. Five bucks a day digging ditches until he fell dead into one. What killed him? The five bucks a day. He made five. He needed ten, period. Where did you have the money hidden? Sure, I'll tell you. Why not? <laughs> it's no secret now. There's a chicken farm up in Yonkers. Dunstan's chicken farm. Weekends, I candle eggs for old Dunstan, for eats and pocket money. I buried the dough so far from the big coop and so far from Dunstan's tool house. I made a map at a location. And gave the map and a sealed envelope to Angie. Angie glad to you, huh? You searched up at Dunstan's farm? Yeah, I searched. Joke. You might have missed finding it. It could happen. Baloney, I dug up a half an acre of ground. Let's have another go at it. At Dunstan's. Another go? To really make sure it's gone. You and me. <laughs> Wouldn't I be crazy? We turn up the money, I won't lay a hand on it. It's yours. I'll let you decide for yourself. Decide what? Take off with it or give it back. Really clean the slate, Tex.
We had four hours of digging in the evening quiet of Dunstan's chicken farm. What well, used to be Dunstan's chicken farm, that is. Dunstan was gone, and there was a for sale sign on the abandoned property. I give up. Oh, my sentiments, too. We've at least dug up an old shoe. Now, if we can find one to match it... I don't make with the jokes. The money's been snitched. I know it. Maybe old Dunstan himself. Don't sell me that. Or anybody. Some lucky stranger. Still no sale. It's Angie, my smart aleck brother, or Nick. Hey, somebody mentioned my name? Nick. Yeah, in person. Hiya, kid. Greetings. This disposes of one suspect, Tex. Yeah, how's that? Nick trailing around after us, letting us dig and watching us. Would he if he had the 30000 No. No, I guess not. Unless it's a smart cover-up. Yeah, don't beat your brains, Tex. I ain't got the loot. Yet. I was sure you two chumps was going to lead me to it tonight. May I offer my regrets? Save them. So it's Angie or Willie, huh? Next, stay away from him. Says who? I'm warning you. Oh, long time since I batted your ears, little man. Yeah. Yeah, I have taken my lumps from you. Sure, from kid days up. You've been my pigeon. Oh, Nick. What? Got your knife sharpened? Yeah, and pointing at both of you. I notice. But see what I've got. What? Hey, a gun. Cocked and ready. Drop your knife, Nick. Oh, sure. No argument. Drop. Tex. Yeah? I've got a hunch about you. That you've taken a lot of guff from people right from the cradle. That it gave you, say, a, a complex. Made you try awfully hard to pass yourself off as a tough guy. Yeah. I've taken a lot of abuse from Nick here, right? He made me the joke of the block. All the time, the joke of the block. With his fists... Fair and square, and the best man wins? <laughs> Fists my eye with his knife. I got scars to show. Then go to it. Go to it? Here's your chance to lick Nick in a fair fight, man to man. Lick Nick and lick a few of your complexes. Yeah, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah, I always wondered how I'd do it, Nick, fair and square. Let's get to it, Nick. Hey, wait a I'm minute. gonna beat your brains. No, in. now listen. Well, show oh. some fight, Nick. Oh. Listen, Tex. With Nick demolished, we had T-bone steaks for ourselves in a lunch wagon. It was a new shine to Tex. Confidence, but of a different variety than before. Oh, I feel great. Great. I'm glad to hear. Oh, like a weight off me. Like Nick was the symbol of something that had me down. Always had me down. Well, in flattening Nick, you proved to yourself you could make out on the level with honest sweat and toil. Yeah. It flashed through me the exact words you say. I, I, I got stuff I don't have to put on. I can be me, me. Uh, but I'm forgetting something. What? The money. The money's going to pull me down, down low. Meaning? Somebody's enjoying it. But it's my rap. I'll get the short end of it from the cops, the insurance outfit. They'll, they'll never believe I lost the loot to somebody. I got to put the screws on Angie and Willie. Tex. Yeah. I'll make book that neither Angie or your brother have double-crossed you. Well, why wouldn't they? They're just not the criminal type. Ah, that's crazy. While you're learning things, also learn to have a little faith in people. <laughs> That's going to come a little tough. Angie's a sweetheart, and your brother's solid gold. Yeah, nice words. Now, about the money. Who got it? I've been picking my brain. No, who hasn't? I've got an advantage. I'm a cop. Meaning you think better? Twenty years of the trade gives a man a certain training. Yeah, well, you show me. Your room behind the ironworks, when I came across you earlier today, you were in a coma, delirious, babbling out loud. The fever. The fever. It comes and goes, you said. Yeah, yeah, it comes and goes. Now think. Did the fever get you in prison? Yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, very bad once. Last year, that, that was, I, I, I was in a hospital for a week. A week of babbling out loud, like you babbled to me in that room. You know some of the words I caught from you while you were delirious? No, go ahead and tell me. Dunstan's chicken farm. 
Walk a line from the coop, blindfolded. Do it easy. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, babbling in in my delirium. Is that like uh, talking in my sleep? Talking things wild horses couldn't drag from you when you were conscious. The DA and a judge couldn't drag it from me. Neither could the warden. Where was the dough? I laughed in their faces. Now think hard, Tex. If you get my drift. I'm ahead of you. I know who we're after. I got his face in front of me. Who is he? Joey Stutz, a short-timer in Sing Sing. He was an orderly in a hospital. He couldn't do enough for me. With the alcohol and the sponge, with the medicine, every time I'd come to, there was Joey sitting in my bed. Smart Joey. He got an airful of your babble. Oh, yeah. I made him a present of 30 grand. Know where we can look him up? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I do know. Wind up a case, you don't always do it to the king's taste. Or should I say, the law's taste. We found Joey Stutz, all right. Living it up big in a Park Avenue duplex. Funny-looking run of a guy in a Japanese kimono and gold stitch bedroom slippers. Joey had a surprise for us up his kimono sleeves. I wondered when you was going to tumble to my little trick, Tex. Your ears open while I lay in a coma, rat. It, it took just four days for me to figure out what you were telling me. How to walk ten yards from a coop and, and then five more left at a tool house. Cough up the dough. I can't. Make it tough, Joey, so no, help no, me. No, no, no. Take it easy, Tex. Take it easy. I, I, I'll give you what I got. Look. It, it, how much is there, huh? Eighty-two cents. Thirty G's, Joey. Oh, wait till I show you, Tex. Hey, look, look, look. Cancel checks. See? Eh? You total them up, I think you'll get thirty grand just about. You, you went through thirty grand. Sure, in a year it was easy. <laughs> I, I, I had myself a ball. I had horses and, and, and dames and a fa fancy foreign sports job that I rented. <laughs> Tex, it, it was like a dream come true. A dream? Yeah, for one year, but you're king of the world. You, money to burn, not a care in the world. Oh, Tex, come on, you had the same dream yourself, huh? huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the same dream myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I sure had. <laughs> Climax has happened like that. A fortune blown to the winds, and that was all there was to it. I consoled Tex. Craig, what's my situation now? Well, we get the truth on public record. I'd say you're in the clear yourself, blameless. Free to live the new man. Joey here has a debt to pay. I'm, I'm ready to do time. Because, brother, what I did was worth it. Yeah, you had more fun. Eighty-two cents left out of $30,000. How did you manage to hold on to 82 cents, Joey? <laughs> I got a thrifty streak in me on my mother's side. <laughs> hey, 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 look, you're grinning, Shamus. Yeah. I'm thinking how I'm going to take you downtown as you are, in your silk kimono and gold slippers. Huh? <laughs> I want headquarters to see what the well-dressed crook is wearing nowadays. Shall we go, gentlemen? <laughs> You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Tough Guy, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of murder by error, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week's story, Murder by Error, a footloose husband stubs his morals and almost collapses into the electric chair when a hot pistol sends a cold chill through him. Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, directed by Arthur Jacobson. Heard in our cast were Charlotte Lawrence, Shep Mencken, and Larry Dobkin. This is Eddie King speaking.
NBC sends a welcome to WAPI Birmingham, its newest affiliate and Alabama's oldest radio station. This is the NBC Radio Network. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Murder is a human, just like anybody else. Every once in a while, their work begins to tire them. They need a vacation, which isn't too much of a change for them. They kill time instead of people. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. The office where my license as a confidential investigator hangs is on Madison Avenue. Madison Avenue is in New York City. New York City in the summertime is a good place to go away from. I was going away from it, in the general direction of the Adirondacks, a week's fishing. I rarely catch any fish, which makes two parties of the deal very happy, the fish and me. And I hate fish. I was in the club car, looking admiringly at a planter's punch when company came. Uh, would you have any objections if I sat here? <laughs> would anybody object to Santa Claus dropping in? <laughs> Thank you. What's your name? Barry Craig. I'm Claire Roberts. What are you drinking? Well, I haven't started yet. It's almost too pretty to drink. <laughs> it's a planter's punch. Mm, looks wonderful. Uh, would you mind? No. Oh, wait a... Yes, sir. Uh, one of these for the lady. A platter punch, sir, right away. Where are you going, Barry? The Adirondacks. They're very tall mountains. Well, I don't intend to climb any. What I had in mind was a small amount of fishing. Oh, that's a wonderful coincidence. It is? I'm going fishing, too. For what? Fish. Oh, fine. Barry, uh, before the waiter gets back... Yes? Will you keep this for me? This? It's only a small envelope. Please, Barry... Well, why you do you... give it back to me when... Oh, your drink, madam. Oh, thank you. Will there be anything else, sir? Uh, not right now. Thank you, sir. What did you do with the envelope? My breast pocket. You're very sweet. And now let's drink... Oh, the very... Watch out. Well, you knocked the glass out of my hand. Yeah. Well, I suppose accidents will happen. No accident. What? I spotted the waiter dropping something into your drink when he was bringing it. Oh, no. Hold it. A little accident, sir? That's the way it looks. I'll get the lady another drink. Uh, don't bother. The lady isn't thirsty anymore. Thank you, sir. Come on, Claire. I, I did want that drink. Even if it was poison? I could have been wrong. Maybe all the way to dumped into the drink was a pinch of nutmeg or something. I didn't think so, though. I've taken a bedroom. Here it is. Uh, would you like to come in for a bit? Sure. You're uh, wondering about me, aren't you, Barry? A little. Was it nice? It was puzzled. Oh, you mean the envelope and the drink. Oh, I'd like to tell you what's in the envelope, but I, I don't dare. Why not? Because then you might become one of them. One of who? One of the people who want me to die. She didn't go on to explain. There wasn't much conversation after that. She said she was tired. I said good night and went on to my bedroom. Hmm, I've been careless and left the lights on. Ah, uh, but you didn't leave the lights on. I didn't, huh? I put them on. Why? I'm afraid of the dark, shall we say? If you like. Now, Mr. Craig, if it wouldn't trouble you too much, may I have the envelope Mr. Roberts gave you? It would trouble me too much. I was being polite, but only superficially. The envelope, if you please. I don't have it. Mr. 
Craig, you may be under the impression that this gun I'm pointing at you is merely for display purposes. It isn't. It's a rather deadly weapon. If I must employ it on you, I shall. Aboard a train filled with people? Oh, come now, Mr. Craig. Surely you know enough about firearms to recognize a silencer, don't you? The only sound this gun will make when fired would resemble a cough. I don't have a cold. You were pleased to make a jest. I have smiled. Now, the envelope. I haven't got it. I'm not a child, Mr. Craig. I know Miss Roberts gave it to you. You must have been snooping. I would rather have that envelope from you alive, but I am prepared to forego my preferences and take it from you dead. Well, stick to your preferences. Would you like to search me? Take your jacket off. Okay. And toss it to you? Oh, no. Just drop it at your feet. Thank you. I move back against the wall. A careful boy. An explanation of why, in my profession, I am still alive. And your jacket. Mm-hmm. No envelope. No envelope. Mr. Craig. Yeah? Where is it? I don't remember. Very well. You have exactly five minutes in which to remember what you did with that envelope. Five minutes in which to remember or die. The gentleman with the silencer on his revolver was a tired-looking man, beautifully dressed right down to the gloves he wore. It occurred to me they'd never find his prints on the gun he was getting ready to use on me. I felt bitter about that. I also began wondering how smart I'd been hiding Claire's envelope in Claire's bedroom. You haven't very much time left. I haven't got the envelope either. But before you knock me off, maybe it would be more polite if you mentioned your name. It's Wiley, if that helps you any. Wiley? Doesn't help at all. I... Well, come right in. Don't tell. Sorry. Mr. Uh, Craig? I'm Craig. I have a telegram for you. Fine. You'd better wait. There might be an answer. Mr. Wiley here is leaving anyway. Uh, yes, of course. Leaving your bedroom, Mr. Craig. Not the train. Hmm. Well, let's get at the telegram. Hey, nothing here but a blank sheet of paper. That's right, Mr. Craig. Maybe it's right, but it isn't usual. Well, I thought it would be the best excuse for getting the other gentleman out of here. Any excuse would have been the best. I don't understand how you come in on this, though. Miss Roberts sent me. For what? The envelope she asked you to hold for her. She would like to have it now. Of course. Oh, a uh, conductor. Yes. Oh, what time is it? Uh, let me see, uh... Yes, uh, 10.50. Thanks. Now, if you'll give me the envelope. That's a nice costume you're wearing. Costume? Sure. I've never seen a real conductor wear a wristwatch before. He must have had a glass jaw. He went down and out quietly and quickly. I worried for a couple of seconds... Maybe conductors have started wearing wristwatches. But then I stopped worrying. Because after I went through his pockets, I found out his name was James Bryan. His shoulder holster told me he preferred a 32 caliber revolver with its serial number filed off. And the haircut under the barred conductor's cap said that Mr. Bryan had very recently been a guest at a penitentiary. I left the phony conductor in my bedroom and decided to visit Claire Roberts and hers. It was maybe time I found out exactly what was in that envelope. There was a vestibule between the car she had her bedroom in and mine. A vestibule that was occupied by a club car waiter who tried to drug or poison Claire Roberts. A waiter who finished with waiting, though. Somebody had buried a knife in his back. Barry Craig. Just a minute. It's uh, pretty late. I've been keeping in touch with the time. Uh, has anything happened? Quite a lot has happened. You better let me in. Of course. Thank you. You still have the envelope? No. <gasps> Barry! Don't worry. I know where it is. Where? In a safe place. 
Claire, what's inside that envelope? I can't tell you. It, it's not my secret. I wonder if you realize exactly what kind of a secret it is. I'm not sure I know what you mean. It's led, among other things, to an attempt on my life. Oh, no. It has also led to imposture. Led me to knock a man down, and finally, very finally, it's led to the death of a man. Which man? The waiter who tried to gimmick your drink. Well, the waiter? But I didn't even know him. Maybe not, but he knew you. I... I can't help that. You can tell me what's inside the envelope. I can't believe me, Barry. Could you tell Mr. Wiley about it? <gasps> I see you recognize the name. He... He's the head of them, the people after the... The what? Barry, he's evil. He's terribly evil. So is that lion. Claire, would it interest you to know that among those aboard this train is the next convict named James Bryan? I didn't catch her as she fell. I let her fall. She hit pretty hard, which told me at least one thing. The faint was genuine. I didn't rush to revive her. There were things to be done first. One of them was to get her suitcase open. I did. Well, they were clothes in it. Maybe I was a cad for intruding on a beautiful girl's privacy. Any thoughts I might have had about that didn't last long. For a girl who was going fishing, Claire Roberts had packed the wrong thing. A couple of silk dresses, sweaters, odds and ends of nylon, and a number of high heel shoes. So I shut the suitcase. It would have been fun thinking of how Claire would look in various clothes she was carrying, but I didn't have time for fun. One thing was pretty obvious, with the clothes she brought, whatever she was going fishing for, it wasn't fish. Barry? Yes? Yeah? I... Oh, I must have fainted. You did. Here, I'll give you a hand up. It was silly, feigning like that. It was genuine. Who's James Bryant? I don't know. Just the mention of his name made you faint. Well, I, I meant I don't know what he's doing on this train. He's a gangster, Barry. Uh-huh. He kills people. In which case, he ought to be in jail. Why isn't he? Well, he was in jail. Barry, he must have escaped. That's not legal. You're sure he's on this train? Very sure. He's the jet I knocked out a little while ago. Where is he? In my bedroom. You're about to suggest I get a half a dozen conductors together and uh, rest, Brian? No. No? Well, I mean... Well, well, of course he's an escaped convict and all that, but... I right, the door. Something's opening. That light. Put it out quick. Shots miss Claire. They miss me. They were, after all, shots in the dark. Hmm. They did wake a lot of conductors, though. These were genuine conductors. They all carried nice, big watches, which made them helpful so far as giving us the right time. But beyond that, they didn't have any good ideas. So they left. Barry. Yes? You didn't tell them about the envelope I gave you. Neither did you. You didn't tell them about the dead waiter, either. Waste of time. They all came through the vestibule where I'd seen him. But they didn't mention anything about... A dead waiter? No. Which means he isn't with us anymore. Somebody threw him off the train? Has to be. Brian? Well, that's a question Brian could answer better than I. I think I'll go look him up. I don't want you to leave me. There's a conductor on watch outside this bedroom. You'll be safe enough. Maybe. But will you... I didn't waste any time thinking up an answer to that question. I couldn't think of a good one anyway. I did hesitate for a minute outside my bedroom door and then decided that he who hesitates is a hesitator. Mr. Bryan, I discovered it left. Maybe I should have been sorry about that. I wasn't. Time was 20 past midnight. 
In a few hours, we'd be reaching the Adirondacks and the fishing lakes that Claire was heading for, according to her. I wondered if going to sleep was the smart thing to do. Well, I could brush my teeth anyway, I decided. It's good for your teeth. By the time I got my toothbrush out, though, I changed my mind. I'd packed a blue one. The one I found in my suitcase was yellow. I lifted it to my nose and put it right down again. Bristles had been thoroughly soaked in something I strongly suspected was a deadly poison. Poison that gives off the odor of almonds. I'm sorry I have to barge in on you so late, but... uh, That's all right, Mr. Gray. As head conductor on this train, uh, you might be able to help. Anything else happen? No, but it was intended to. That's not important, though. There's a Mr. Wiley on this train. Could you tell me where he is? Well, if he's reserved a compartment of the bedroom, yes. Give me a moment. Sure. Those shots at you and the lady are dreadful. Well, they're not so bad. They they all missed. Uh, Mr. Thomas Wiley has a compartment B in car 437. Thanks. Is that all you wanted? It'll have to do for right now, except, uh... We're on our way to Martindale. Have they had anything exciting happen up there recently? Martindale? Well, it uh, seems that the postmaster's wife and the grocery clerk... Oh, I uh, uh, didn't exactly mean along those lines. I I meant any crimes, hold-ups, or... uh... Oh, oh, I see. Well, well, yes, yes, there was something. It uh, it happened several weeks ago. Well, what was it? The payroll robber, it seems to me. A man killed, too. The watchman. And the criminals? Well, the police are still looking for them, as far as I know. They worked pretty quick. The reason I remember about it is the train was held up for a couple of hours while the police went through it, looking for the for the payroll money. Would they find it? No, they didn't. They couldn't hold anybody either. There was no proof, you see. Uh, large payroll? Well, it's one of the lumber concerns back in the mountains. Pretty large, I'd say. Too large to get into a small envelope. Huh? Oh, yes, yes. Well, thanks a lot. Well, I've been glad to answer your question, Mr. Craig. I wonder if Mr. Wiley will be. I had plenty to think about while finding compartment B, car 437. By the time I found it, I stopped thinking. Who's there? Barry Craig. I wasn't really expecting you. Weren't you? Better take your hand out of that pocket before I come in. I, uh... There's a conductor in this car. He wouldn't approve of shooting passengers. Very well. I'll disarm for the moment. There. Guns out of the way. Come in. Thanks. Now, to what do I owe this visit? The fact that I didn't brush my teeth. You're being obscure. Blunt. Someone tampered with your toothbrush? You did. You have proof of that? Enough to satisfy me. Among other things, how did you know it was the toothbrush, not the toothpaste that had been tampered with? A lucky guess. Maybe not so lucky. Wiley, did you know that James Bryan is on this train? He is. I find that of no interest. You're a liar. Have you seen that waiter recently? The one you bribed to drug Claire Roberts' drink? You're making quite a number of unfounded assumptions. No assumptions, not unfounded. Have you? I don't choose to spend my time with waiters. Too bad you didn't spend more time with this one. Oh, why? You might have talked him out of testifying against you. You're lying. You really think so? I I don't know what the waiter may have told you, but whatever it was, it's not true. He, He's a blackmailer. That could be. Mr. Roberts and I were shot at less than an hour ago. Well, I've been in this bedroom for the last two hours. Got any witnesses to prove that? I, I, no, you could hardly expect. True me. enough. Mr. Wiley, how do you feel about payrolls? I have no particular feelings about them. We're reaching Martindale in a few hours. You're getting off there? Why should I be traveling there otherwise? For the same reason that Claire Roberts is, or James Bryan is. And that 
reason being the payoff. I left Mr. Wiley. His conversation lacked frankness. I wandered through the train looking for Mr. Bryan. I didn't think he'd be out in public view. He wasn't. I returned to my bedroom, shaved, and twiddled my thumb. The only result of that was that half hour before arrival, I almost sprained my left thumb. Barry. I was hoping you wouldn't be asleep. I, I couldn't. Uh, come in. Barry, I'm frightened. You've got reason enough. Someone's tried to drug you and to shoot you. I know. You haven't asked me for that envelope again. I think maybe you better keep it. Until when? Where are you going to be staying? The Green Lake Lodge. Oh, do you know what the phone number is? Green Lake 465. 465. I'll phone you after we get in as soon as I think it's safe, and then we can meet and... You're sure you'll phone me? Well, of course I'll want that envelope. After all, I've gone through because of it. You... Okay, then you'll phone me. Well, looks like we've arrived. On time. Yes. I think maybe I'd better get that envelope now. Get it? Yeah. I slipped it behind the seat cushion here. What? Uh-huh. I'm touched. Y you hid it here? Sure. Safest place for it. The last place anyone would think of my hiding it in. After they'd seen you give it to me in the club car. Barry, you are clever. Now, uh, you better leave first. I'll follow after a while. And Claire. Yes? Give me a ring sometime, huh? Claire got off the train and I watched her. Wiley got off immediately after she did. He didn't follow her. Brian also must have left the train, but he didn't show in the open. However, he didn't follow Claire either. Nobody it was seen was interested in where she was going. But when I got into a cab, it was a different proposition. Uh, mister? Yeah? Ain't none of my business, but uh, there's a cab following us. There is? Well, you're right. Matter of fact, it's even more complicated than that. It is? Yeah. There's another cab following that one. <laughs> It added up neatly enough. Wiley was trailing me. Brian was trailing Wiley. I didn't think the hotel management would care for either of them. Therefore, uh, cabby. Yep. Pull over to the curb. Okay. Now, wait for me, huh? Okay. Have fun following me? Oh, uh, look here, Craig. I suggest you look back. Back? <laughs> Brian. Yeah. Brian, what are you after? Stop kidding. You're not the only one who has a gun. You dirty... Take it easy, boys. Hmm? You've got too big an audience for fireworks. Three cab drivers, me. They don't bother me. You don't either. Even if I owe you something for that sock on the jaw, but we'll forget it the minute you hand over the envelope. You can have it. Now, wait a moment. You can have it too, Mr. Wiley. Both of you can have it. One condition, though. What's that? That it's open here and now. No. No? No envelope. I, Don't uh, be a fool, Brian. He could have opened it at any time if he'd wanted to. We've got nothing to lose. Well. Okay. Thanks. This is the envelope given to me by Claire Roberts. So it would appear. I, uh, yeah. Ain't been opened. Fine. I will now open it. And we discovered, to somebody's surprise, maybe, that the envelope was... Empty. Right. Goodbye, gentlemen. Hey, wait. Great. How can I be sure you didn't open it before I... You can be sure because Mr. Wiley is leaving. But... Yeah. You must have figured... So long, Craig. Goodbye. Or maybe only till we meet again... I 
went on to the hotel, checked in, looked at the lake, and went to sleep. I slept for quite a while. No phone call disturbed me. Towards evening, I got up and performed a couple of errands. One took very little time. The other consisted of crawling under the baggage counter at the railroad station. The baggage clerk understood. Clerk? Yes, miss? Uh, Will you get my bag for me, please? Here's the check. Oh, thank you, miss. Get it for you right away. They ought to build higher counters. Barry! Hello, Claire. What are you doing here? Waiting for you to phone me about the envelope. Oh, I, I did phone several times. The line was busy. Funny. Because there's no such number. Oh. You still have the envelope? No, no. I, I turned it over to Wiley and Brian. Oh. Don't look so hopeful. They opened it right away. The baggage check you just handed the clerk wasn't in it, as Wiley and Brian had thought. I, I admit I hoped they'd go after you for the empty envelope. They did. I'm a fair-sized decoy, Claire, but not made out of wood. I realized the envelope you gave me was empty... I also realized after I'd had a look at your suitcase that you weren't coming up here for the fishing. You were carrying the suitcase as a blind. You came here for only one thing. Here's your bag, Ben. For that. You know what's in it? Sure. A payroll, Claire. Okay, baby, hand it over. Brian! You didn't think I was so dumb I couldn't figure you held out on a baggage check? No, I... I... Give me that bag. I already killed a couple of guys for it. The waiter on the train among them? I had to make sure Claire didn't pass the baggage check to him. Don't worry, this confession ain't gonna do you much good. It's a large gun you have there. Large enough to take care of you and the clerk. Now hand over that bag, Claire. Once I was dope enough to pass you the bag of check when the cops was after me. Not anymore. Oh, all right, all right. I don't think so. Hmm? My hands are below the level of the counter, Brian. What do you think I was doing while I was waiting for Claire and you to show up? What? Practicing this. <laughs> Funny they never realize that the guns they use on other people can be used on them. Oh, don't go away, Claire. You've got a date. It didn't take the police long to arrive. They took Claire with them and Brian. Brian wasn't badly hurt. He'd be in perfect health by the time they got around to electrocuting him. As for me, I went back to the lodge. I was a little sorry about Claire. The way it turned out, all I was going to wind up with was uh, fish. The next week's story, For Love of Murder, a jail cell built for two becomes a honeymooner's cottage. When a prisoner of love squares a triangle by simply eliminating the competition. Good night, folks. See you next week. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Death Buys a Bedroom, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of For Love of Murder, about which Barry Craig has this to say. In next week's story, For Love of Murder, a jail cell built for two becomes a honeymooner's cottage. When a prisoner of love squares a triangle by simply eliminating the competition. Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard were Betty Lou Gerson as Claire, Byron Kane as the waiter, Jack Moyles as Wiley, Lou Krugman as Brian, and Victor Rodman as the conductor. Eddie King speaking. Here's a word about the daytime listening NBC has in store for you Monday through Friday. It's a refreshing schedule with quiz, music, news, and heartwarming drama. A well-balanced lineup for your summer day. For quiz fun, there's Strike It Rich, the quiz show with a heart. And The Phrase That Pays, a program that can mean prizes for listeners at home 
as well as the studio audience. For music, there's the Bob Smith Show with plenty of laughs blended in with the melody. The drama is supplied by a series of longtime favorites. Programs like Stella Dallas, Young Widder Brown, The Woman in My House, and many more. And for news, NBC is your best bet all through the day for keeping well informed. You'll hear commentators and reports like Alex Dreyer, Pauline Frederick, Morgan Beatty, Ray Henley, and many others who bring you the latest news as it happens and take you behind the scenes for the inside stories. For the very best in daytime radio entertainment, stay with NBC. There's another exciting Dragnet adventure tonight on the NBC Radio Network. William Goggin stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Someone once said that murder is a fine art. There's a catch, though. If you're a successful artist, they hang your paintings. If you're a successful murderer, they hang you. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Even confidential investigators need a vacation. Sometimes they've been known to take one. The place I'd chosen was Vermont. The main reason for that was Jake. He was on vacation, too. He decided to come home and see if he'd been smart in abandoning Vermont to run an elevator on Madison Avenue. Say, Jake. Uh, yeah? What's the verdict? Madison Avenue. Why? Is Madison Avenue dark and quiet like this? Nope. Is Madison Avenue surrounded by tall trees, cooled by gentle breezes, filled with the fragrance of unspoiled nature? Nope. Now, what's Madison Avenue got that this place hasn't? Girls. Well, you may be right. But... Or you may be wrong. That came from directly up the road. Nice night for a hayride. Is it? Yep. Could have been giggle. Oh, what a loud giggle. Girls got very loud giggles sometimes, especially but... on a hayride. Oh, Jake, stop pulling my leg. Hey, wait a minute. What's that in the road up ahead of us? Hay wagon. I refuse to believe it, but it is filled with hay. Usually I am. There's a horse out in front of it, but where's the driver? Say, Jake, would, would he have gone off and left the wagon out in the middle of the road? It ain't too likely. Oh. I'm coming up on that wagon. That girl, if it was a girl, didn't giggle. She screamed. I'd better take a look around in the hay. What's going on? Anything larger than a needle. Yeah, there's plenty of hay up here. Anything else? No, I... Mr. Craig? I was rushing things. There is something else up here. What? A man. A very pale man. What's he doing up there? Nothing. Just being dead. He lay very still. His eyes stared up at the summer sky overhead, but saw neither the stars nor the moon. The moon that shone on him and on the metal handle of the knife that was buried in his heart. He was wearing overalls and a work shirt. His short hair outlined clearly the skull beneath. There was nothing I or anyone could do for him. Murdered? Yes. Anything on him? No I... identification at all, Jake. We need a phone. Mm, past the farmhouse, half mile back. Now, well, let's go. Think it's all right leaving him there? He won't mind. The Vermont night was as quiet and peaceful as it had been before I heard the scream and a man died of a knife wound lying on a mound of hay. Nature doesn't concern herself too much about us and our doings, which is very bright of nature. 
Got to turn up the road to get to that farmhouse. Yeah. Oh, somebody ought to oil that gate. Yeah. Whole house is pretty run down. Jake, get down. It ain't necessary. Those shots over our heads. Her rain might improve. Her aim. Well, you can see her. Farmhouse window. This time it's not the farmer with the shotgun. It's the farmer's daughter. Spoil a lot of stories that way. Hmm. She's left the window. Yeah. She knows she didn't hit either of us. Those shots were either a warning or possibly a yell for help. How are you going to decide? Well, if it was a warning, I don't think she'd have left the window. So it must be a call for help. Come on. That was real logical, Mr. Craig. Thanks. Let's hope it turns out to be true. There were no more shots. If did or didn't prove, I'd been right. The shooting would be better once we were inside the house. I ever heard of targets knocking on the door. The lady may have had all the target shooting she wants. Who's there? Barry Craig and Jake. Hello? Barry Craig? Yeah. And Jake? Me. Neither of you look very terrifying. Is that bad? No, it's not. Please come in. Thanks. Please, make yourselves comfortable. Nice room. Rustic, perhaps, but I like it. Do you like being a farmer? Or, or maybe I should say... A uh, farmer's daughter? <laughs> Very much. Almost as much as you like firing guns at strangers? Oh, but I didn't know whether you were strangers or... Or what? Or dead men. Maybe she was what she claimed to be. A farmer's daughter, but if she was, somebody's been telling me lies about farms. Her hairdo was sleek, as though it had been just applied. Her fingernails had had a lot of professional attention. Her dress was so simple it practically yelled Paris at you. And she didn't need any of these beauty aids. She would have been beautiful without them, but not nearly so expensive. You did say dead men. Yes. You often run across dead men walking around? Yes. Uh huh. You think I'm crazy, don't you? I don't think you're crazy at all. You've just got uh, a peculiar vision. Not sure I ought to be grateful for that. Oh, forget I said it. My name is Millie George. How do you do? This is, or was, my father's farm. He was very happy here until the dead men started walking. And then? He became one of them himself. Your father's dead? Over a year now. You live here alone? I don't really live here at all. I have an apartment. And a job in town. But I come here often. As often as I dare. My fingers idly traced the pattern in the inch deep dust on the table next to my chair. Inch deep dust. Billy George is very lovely. She told her ghost story neatly, but she was also a complete liar. I think maybe we'd better skip the walking dead for a minute. There's something more urgent that's got to be done. Where's your phone? I'm afraid there isn't one. Father never cared for what he called mechanical murderers. Murderers? He meant things that killed time, interrupted work. I see. Destroyed quiet. I see. That's too bad. Why do you need a phone? Jake and I ran across a hay wagon some distance down the road. Oh? There was a man in it. He wasn't walking around like the people you've been telling us about. He was lying down. But he was dead anyway. If I had been looking for a reaction to my words, I would have been disappointed. Lily George took the news with not a flicker of anything except polite interest. But I wasn't disappointed. I expected that reaction. The police like to be told about stray corpses. I suppose so. I think the gardeners have a phone. Where would I find them? Well, their house is about a quarter of a mile further down the road. Oh, good. Jake. Lady. Oh, by the way, this man, what did he die of? A knife in his heart. 
Oh. Suicide? The angle of the knife's entrance wouldn't be right for suicide. Oh, then it was... Murder. How dreadful. Yes, terribly dreadful. So long. So far as Millie George was concerned, murder belonged in pretty much the same category as a run in a pair of new nylons. You said how dreadful and bought another pair. You couldn't do exactly the same thing with a damaged life, though. Mr. Craig. Yeah? Millie George said the gardener's house, the one with the phone, was down the road that way. That's what she said, Jake. Then why are we going this way? I want to take another look at that hay wagon. Once wasn't enough? I think maybe there's been a change. Less hay? Less coughs. It's a nice road to be taking a stroll on in the cool evening. It would have been an even nicer road if there hadn't been a hay wagon in the middle of it. Still there. Yeah. The horse must be getting lonely. Being a farmer, you get a wrong angle on horse. You don't think being a horse's chum is romantic. I'll never say hello to a horse again. Excuse me. Getting pretty spry at climbing hay wagons, Mr. Craig. Just practice, that's all. Mr. Craig? Hmm? Count in the hay up there? No, just confirming a guess. Less corpse? No corpse. I thought back at Millie George's house that the shots might have been a warning or maybe a call for help. I knew now they'd been neither. What they actually had been were distractions. Mr. Craig, maybe... Maybe he wasn't really dead. Jake, they don't get any deader. Think likely you'd be fooled. Somebody moved him out of there. Yeah. But what for? Can't be many folks enjoy dragging corpses around. Whoever dragged this one maybe didn't enjoy it at all. Well, what was he trying to do? Save undertaker's expenses? Maybe he was trying to save his neck. We got down under the hay wagon and said goodbye to it. We wouldn't be coming back that way. Mr. Craig. What is it, Jake? Funny thing about city people. They like to walk. Oh? They do it deliberate. Even when they don't have to. Well, uh... Country people hate to walk. But, Jake, uh, we've got to get back to that farmhouse. With the girl in it? Yeah, Millie George. We're hoping that this time maybe she won't shoot over our heads? We're hoping that this time she won't shoot at us at all. And for this, we're wearing our feet down clear at the ankle? Oh, it's not as bad as that. It's worse. I got short ankles. Oh. Mr. Craig, I can tell you right now, she don't have a phone. I know, but by this time, she may have something else. Do I want to know what it might be? Not in your condition, you don't. Thanks. We didn't have much farther to go, which was just as well. Jake had started groaning at every step. Next to Jake's snores, Jake's groans are the surest recipe for punctured eardrums. Oh. Oh, you can stop groaning, Jake. Uh -huh. We're at the house. Oh. Yeah, I got strength enough to lift my head. I am uh, at the house. Think you can make it inside? Oh, dear. I can try. Fine. Jake. I am. Uh, it doesn't look as if anyone's going to invite us in. Well, this don't make me feel bad. We'll go in without an invitation. Now I don't know how I feel. Find out later. Well, oh, somebody left the lights on. Wasn't a Vermont man. Quiet. Yeah, let's try the parlor. Oh, anything for an excuse to keep walking. I suppose this is the parlor. Nobody in here. It's the parlor. Hmm. I don't like this much. A 
The only thing left for us to do now is uh, sit down. Excuse me while I cheer. I... Well, what are you waiting for? Go ahead, Grandpa. Cheer. Company. So I notice. Kind of thing you'll have to run into in old houses. They come out of the woodwork, I think. Uh, uh, don't try to insult me, mister. Why not? Anything you're liable to say is liable to be true. Don't be foolish. I don't use that kind of language. You also ain't using the kind of language I would like to hear. What language would that be? The one telling me where the baby is buried? A boy or a girl, baby? Jake. Oh, that grandpa's a joker. Grandpa could easy get his head knocked off. Put the gun down, son, and grandpa will be glad to tangle with you. I ain't putting no guns down. And when I say baby, you know what I mean. You mean uh, something worth money? Oh, you are a bright one. Okay, so where is it? Even if I knew where it was, I wouldn't tell you. Why not? You've got the wrong R.H. factor. Wrong? Uh, well, uh, suppose I get a hold of the right one. It wouldn't buy you the time of the day for me. Uh, language like that's got guys killed before this, mister. So have guns like that. Well, uh, this is kind of fancy, but it ain't very productive. What makes you think I know anything about the, the, uh, the baby? You're in this dump, ain't you? I'm in it. So what are you doing here? Looking for a beer? It so happens I'm looking for a corpse. Well, you're going to find one. Your own. Only ain't going to be in no condition to appreciate it. Funny thing. You didn't show any interest in the corpse I'm looking for. Whose it might be, say? Hey, Mr. Corpses is dead. They don't bother me. It's the live operators you got to keep in mind. Like you and Grandpa. How about the girl? You just leave her out of this. She's for me. Oh? And why do you think I was called in? Hey, 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 wait, mister. You trying to tell me you was called in by... By the girl, yes. That don't smell so good. Neither do you. Let's call it a draw and go home. You were saying the girl brought you in, huh? Okay. We find out fast. Hey, sugar! Come in, sugar. This joker informs me you brought him in on the deal. That's so? No. I had a long look at the girl who'd come into the room. It was fun while it lasted. She was worth looking at. She was beautiful, non-rural... Undoubtedly expensive, and she was not Millie George. Well? Call it mistaken identity. Oh. <laughs> oh, cut it out, Dina. I don't know what you think he said, but it wasn't very funny. It wasn't? It wasn't. Oh. This girl probably is on your side. She's not the one I was talking about. You, you mean there's been another babe around? Oh, honey, he must mean Joey's wife. Uh, why don't you forget you ever learned to talk, Dina? That ain't a friendly attitude. I ain't feeling friendly. Joey makes it out of the pen, ducks for cover here, and a counter here is where he buried the baby. Banks wouldn't uh, like you calling their money baby. Well, I don't like banks. So it was bank money. Thanks for telling me. Who told you? Uh, never mind. To resume, Joey gets here, and the first thing anybody knows, he winds up with a knife and a ticker. This is bad. Ain't good. Shut up. You can't say that to a Vermont man. Why not? I don't rightly remember. Well, get in touch with me when you do. What, say I'll... Now, will you lay off? You guys trying to confuse me or something? Uh, Joey winds up with a knife and a ticker and no dough. Look, ain't you forgetting Joey's wife? Hey, yeah. Uh, if she was around here, maybe she met him even before we got here. Grab the dough off of him. And then handed him a knife, huh? Fine wife. Nah, she never liked him so much. After she found out he was a bank operator. She was prejudiced against banks? She was prejudiced in favor of banks. A narrow-minded woman. So, I'm thinking maybe she's the one we got to get our hands on. And when did you see her? A little while ago. Where? Here. Well, she ain't in the house. We went all through it. If she knifed Joey and scrambled a dough, we better get after her. Brady's a scream, ain't he? Uh, don't disturb my metal processes, huh? Now, uh, there wasn't no car around before. Which means she must have headed for the village and railroad station. Okay, now we know where we're going. Oh, I think we do. That reminds me. 
What about you guys? Well, we'll hang around playing some pinochle. I've been wanting a good pinochle game. Uh, but... Dina, what do you think? I think you're a big dope. Well, what kind of remark is that? Oh, you believe too easy. Joey's wife would maybe stick up Joey, but she wouldn't take the bank's money. Yeah, you could be right. Yeah, but maybe... These characters, you ought to... Don't pay any attention to her, Brady. She's a bitter woman. Just shut up. You know what I say? I say get rid of them, and then we'll have lots of time to find the money. Hey, you could be right. She could also be wrong. All right, so she's wrong. What do I lose if she's wrong? Mr. Craig's life and mine? In my line of business, I can't afford to be sentimental. If you die for nothing, I should be sorry. But not very sorry and not for very long. Okay, here. Please, Brady. Huh? Not while a lady's in the room. Oh. Excuse me, Tina. Sometimes I think you ain't got no manners. I said excuse me. There's a nice, refined girl. You know, never even packs a rod. Well, Brady. Yeah? You're an idiot. Well, that could be. You think Tina's really going to wait for you? In that car outside? Oh, sure. Me and her is personally very friendly. That was before the bank money came up. Why shouldn't she wait for me? And share your execution? Who's getting executed? I knock you guys off. We find a door, we get out of here. Nobody knows who's even around. Tina gets out of here, you mean? You don't. The cops will pick you up in a few hours. Hey, you keep saying she won't wait for That's what I keep saying, because it's the truth. Would you like to test her before sticking your neck away out? What kind of test? Fire two shots into the floor. What for? I got nothing against the floor. Oh, forgive me. You haven't got brains enough to be an idiot. Fire these shots, and it'll sound to Dina as though you've shot Jake and me. Then if she waits for you, fine. You can go ahead with your original plan. But if she doesn't wait, if she scrams as soon as she hears those shots... Hey, it's an idea. You know, it's even a good idea. Okay, boys, just don't get alarmed. Yeah, you shouldn't have insulted Dina. She's okay. So just for insulting her, I'll kill you anyway. Shut up. Listening, Brady? Hey, Dina! And betrayed. Craig. Craig, he was right. I feel terrible. You should. But I don't understand Dina crossing me like that. What'd she get out of it? How much money was in the bank job? Hey, uh, around 30 grand. She gets 30 grand out of it. Huh? But she... Were you and she together all evening? Well, no, but... You came down to this house? Why? Well, we figure this is where Joey's going to head. Once we hear he has departed from the pen. But Joey don't show. Then you tell me Joey is now a corpse. Pretty plain what happened. One way or another, Joey latched onto a pair of overalls and a work shirt, plus one wagon filled with hay. He dug up the money from wherever he'd hidden it and headed for this house. But before he got here... He runs into trouble. He ran into Dina. Now it begins to clear up. And Dina takes him for the door, huh? She takes him. Uh, I could have figured it out for myself. Yeah, all you needed was Mr. Craig's brains. But he should have them. What would I do with them? You've got a point. Then so is your head. <laughs> Please, Grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> Dina does not wish to share this here dough with me, so she tries to get me to knock you guys off, then get picked up by the cops while she's traveling very fast in my car. Hey, this is revolting. It is. You know, you do very good guessing. No guessing. No? How'd you know Joey was an escaped con? I mentioned the fact that he was pale and that his hair had been cut short. That was enough. Farmers don't work indoors in the summer. They couldn't be pale. And why did Joey dress up like a farmer? Because he wasn't one. Escaped convicts are pale, have short hair, and seek a disguise. Hey, you know something, Craig? You're so smart, I'm beginning to worry. What about? Well, what kind of security is this criminal going to have with private eyes like you go around being smart all the time? The same kind of security you've always had. No security. Well, uh, just don't dwell on that there. I got something else to worry about. I got to figure out a way to get hold of Dina before she scrams out of the country with that dough. But Brady, huh? Dina doesn't have the money.
afraid he had a little trouble with this. Even Jake began to look worried. As far as I was concerned, I hoped. Because I could turn out to be wrong. And being wrong in a case of this kind was only one short step before being dead. But you figured it all out yourself. Logically. That Tina was the one who knocked off Joey and took the dough. What you're forgetting, Brady, is that there can be more than one logical explanation for anything. Eh. Uh, huh? He means just because something's logical don't prove it's true. Oh. And then, of course, logic can be twisted. As twisted as your mind, Brady. Ah, uh, you leave my mind out of this. It's got its own troubles. Uh, please explain. Well... Joey was a desperate man running from the police. He was also a man owning $30,000. He was finally a man in a hurry. So? How would Dina have persuaded a man in those circumstances to let her get close enough to him to stab him? Well, uh, maybe there's no way. Well, somebody got close enough to him. Of course. Somebody who was armed with a weapon that was dangerous at a distance. A gun, say. Oh, so Dina... No, no. You yourself told us Dina never carried a gun. Joey's wife wouldn't have needed to take the chance of killing him on the road. She could have waited till she had him here. You know something? I said you were so bright I was beginning to get worried. I ain't beginning no more. I'm worried. So you admit you were the one who stabbed Joey and took the money? Yeah, sure. Dina scrammed just now because she was afraid you didn't intend to share the money with her. But instead would kill her the same way you'd kill Joey. Could be. She realized you'd hidden Joey's body to gain time for doing just that. That uh, won't do her much good. I know where she goes when she's scared. But before that... You can't shoot us. Why? Well, I don't know, frankly, but give me a little time and I'll think of something. Uh, too bad, Grandpa. I ain't giving you no time at all. Oh. oh, for a fellow who's just been shot, I feel fine. You weren't shot, Jake. Come on in, Miss Millie. I spotted her behind those drapes a long time ago. I was looking for her. The trouble with you, Jake, is that you spent so much time thinking about the farmer, you forgot about the farmer's daughter. It didn't quite end there, though. The police removed the debris, put out a pickup for Dina, and then... Barry. Yeah? I really am a farmer's daughter. I know. So? Yeah. How about some country cooked ham? have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Tonight's story, Hay is for Homicide, was written by Louis Vitties. Next week, it's the strange story of Ghosts Don't Die in Bed, about which Barry Craig has this to say. We call next week's story, Ghosts Don't Die in Bed, which is a true saying. It's also true, of course, that they don't die anywhere else, because they're already dead. All except for one I run into when... Uh, when? Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you transcribed an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard, Harley Bear, Joyce McCluskey, Jack Moyles, and Bibi Janis. John Lang speaking. The aviation age of America is now in progress and calls to young Americans to keep in step by becoming members of the United States Air Force. If you are a high school or college graduate between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, single and in good physical condition, then you may be eligible to win your wings as an Air Force lieutenant. 
While in training, you'll learn to fly as pilots with the latest equipment and the best instructors. Investigate now. Visit your Air Force recruiting station for additional information. There's another exciting dragnet adventure tonight on most NBC radio stations. William Gargan stars as the hard-boiled private eye, Barry Craig. And William Bendix is Riley. Hello there, this is Victor Ives, inviting you to join us now as we relive the golden moments of radio's yesteryear. We turn back the clock to present the greatest radio shows of all time on the golden age of radio theaters. This time, from February 9th, 55, Barry Craig, confidential investigator, in the case of the missing hotel room. And then later this hour, excitement in the Riley household as Riley becomes an actor on TV. Barry Craig speaking. I was drinking myself to death this particular evening. Not liquor. At Willie's Wagon, it's the coffee that's fatal. Also, I was finding out from the newspapers that chorus girls were still busy suing elderly millionaires, that a hood named Ben Moran had knocked off an armored car and disappeared, and that the police were questioning his girlfriend, Penny Lane. Her picture was spread across the front page. It wasn't art, but it would sell a lot of papers. Also, we were going to have some more weather. That don't surprise me. That's because you're a cynic, Willie. Do I ask you about your religion? It was around 10.30 at night. But it looked later for the girl who came into the wagon as though it was the last stop on a trip she hadn't planned on making. Excuse me, but can you tell me if there's more than one hotel maker? The only one I know of is around the corner from here. You trying a phone book? Yes, I did. I I must be going insane. Hey, hey, Mr. Craig. I've got it. She passed out. Take her in the back room. I got the couch there. That's fine. Hey, sounds like she's coming, too. Get some coffee for her. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. What about? Fainting. My name is Wilson, Myra Wilson. I'm Barry Craig. What's bothering you about the Meeker? You... You won't believe me. I'm a confidential investigator. I've got a lot of practice believing people. Clients, usually. Try me. Well, my husband and I got to town this afternoon... We took a room at the Hotel Meeker. After lunch, I went shopping into a movie. Then I went back to the hotel. It, it looked the same. Hotels don't change much in an afternoon. But when I asked at the desk for my husband, the clerk said no one by that name was registered. The clerk must have remembered you. No. He said he'd never seen me before. <laughs> It was a nice story. It had shape, surprise, a, a nightmare touch. The odds were wonderful that it was pony from the word go. Maybe that's why I walked over to the Hotel Mika with Myra Wilson. Uh, good evening, sir. Mrs. Wilson would like the key to her room. Mrs. Wh- oh, back again, eh? Mrs. Wilson does not have a room here. She checked in this morning with her husband. She doesn't have a room here. Neither does her husband. If she has a husband. I could take you apart without any trouble. Putting you together again might be harder. Look, there's no card for Mr. and Mrs. Wilson. I never saw or heard of Mrs. Wilson before. I've been on duty all day. I ought to know. Mrs. Wilson, uh, you remember the lobby, uh, the clerk? Of course I do. What was your room number? 312. Let's go take a look at it. No, you can't do that. Why not? Oh. Oh. That gun, standard hotel equipment? Ollie, will you? Hmm? What are you doing with that gun? Taking care of this hoodlum, Mr. Roberts. The hoodlum's name is Craig. This is Mrs. Wilson. You manage the hotel? I do. Farley put away that gun. Mrs. Wilson, did you see Mr. Roberts this morning? No. Mr. Roberts, this woman claims she registered here this morning with her husband. That's not true. Evidently a misunderstanding, although we'd like to go up to her room. 312. If it's not occupied, I see no reason why you can't. upstairs. The clerk Farley had been very tough. 
Mr. Roberts was very smooth. I didn't care deeply for either of them. I started hoping in earnest that Myra Wilson's story was true. Three twelves down the corridor. Mrs. Wilson, would you mind describing the room? Well, there, there was a window over the courtyard. A double bed with a flowered cover. A dark green rug. And wallpaper. A yellow and blue, I think. Well, that's enough. Three twelve. Well, says so on the door, too. Okay, open up. Well, there's a bed. Outside of that, twin beds, not a double. Carpeting is maroon, not green. And the wallpaper, dark brown, striped. It, it, it's not at all the way I described it, but it, it is the same room. It must be. Well, Mr. Craig, sorry to have bothered you. Let's go, Mrs. Wilson. <laughs> picked up my car and I started driving home. That gave me a small chance to think. First thought was I'd heard the story before, only that was about a girl in Paris in 1890 or thereabouts. She'd lost a hotel, too, along with her mother. The explanation there was that her mother had died of the plague and the whole thing was hushed up so people wouldn't be scared away from the city. That wouldn't work here. We don't have plagues anymore in New York, which left what? I didn't know, but I thought it might be fun finding out. Now, uh, this is my house. Here's my key. Go on in and try to get some sleep. Where are you going? Believe it or not, I'm going to a hotel for the night. The hotel was the Meeker. Oh, you again. It's coincidence. If you're still hopping on that Wilson business... I'm looking for a room to sleep in. We're all filled up. What about 312? I... Thanks, I'll take it. Mind showing me to the room? I'm not supposed to. But you'll do it for me. I'll do it for you. That is, uh, unless you wanted to check with Mr. Roberts first. Uh, he's gone for the night. <laughs> Could it be a federal offense? What? Kidnapping a room? I thought you gave up on that. Well, that's right, too. Uh, I forgot. Your room. Well, come on in. I don't have any... Hey, hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm ripping myself some wallpaper. Great fun. Now, you cut that out. And look what I found under this striped wallpaper. More wallpaper. Guess what color? Oh, you don't like to guess? All right, it's blue and yellow wallpaper. The kind Mrs. Wilson described. Funny? You can't do things like... Like finding out this really was Mrs. Wilson's room? And that someone changed the wallpaper, the bed, the rug... While she was out shopping, only one question. Where's Mr. Wilson? The clerk didn't answer that one or anything else. I left the hotel for a doorway across the street. I put in time in nicer doorways, but this one was okay. It kept me out of sight. Until the clerk came out of the hotel and started walking. I walked after him. He led me to a dark street filled with discouraged brownstones. He started up the steps. I was maybe 30 yards from him when he opened the door and... walked into bullets. He must have been dead before he fell. All the bullets had hit him. When I got to him, it was only to confirm the obvious. I had news. I needed somebody to tell it to. Roberts was in the phone book. I always track down people that way. Maybe not very smart, but it nearly always works. Yes? Oh, Mr. Craig. Mind if I come in? Well, it's late, but... Uh, well, come in. Thanks. Uh, don't go any further. I'm entertaining. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello? I asked you not to... I said I was sorry. Now I'm not sure. Introduce me. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Craig, Miss Lane. Penny Lane? Penny Lane. What do you hear from Ben Moran, Miss Lane? Oh, now you mustn't believe everything you read in the paper. Oh, it's too bad. 
You mean he isn't going to give you a hunk of that armored car? What would I do with an armored car, Mr. Craig? I see what you mean. Excuse me. Roberts, where's Jim Wilson? Who is Jim Wilson? Myra Wilson's husband. Oh, that poor deluded girl. Not deluded. Someone changed the wallpaper in the room she had. Underneath was the paper she described. Oh? I can't imagine why or, or who would... Try anyway. Farley's really the one to ask. He's in charge of such things. Oh, I asked him. He said he takes orders from you. I'm afraid he's lying, Mr. Craig. Would you like to tell him that? I should like nothing better. Because you know he's dead? Mr. Craig, I don't think I have anything further to say to you. Too bad. I was enjoying our little chat. Good night, Mr. Craig. I suppose you need time for rehearsal. Rehearsal of what? Your story to the police. Polly was murdered. You know, I'm not surprised. Apparently, he was involved in something crooked. Is that so? Uh, why, yes. Uh, checking Mr. and Mrs. Wilson in, then denying he'd done so. Uh, having the room changed while they were out. Uh... It's going to be all folly from now on, huh? I'm afraid he wasn't an honest man. Anyway, from now on, he's going to be a silent one. You can load anything you like on him. But you've got to make it stick, Roberts. Otherwise, it won't mean anything. Good night. Mr. Craig. Yes. Mind if I come with you? No. That's nice. Night, Mr. Roberts. You know, Mr. Craig, uh, what's your first name? Larry. Mm, nice. Call me Penny, please. Penny. Ooh, that's even nicer. But anyway, I was saying, I don't think Mr. Roberts is really a gentleman. Now, that's hard to believe. Oh, I'm very serious. Well, you ought to know. Oh, Larry, you you mustn't misunderstand. I've, um, I've never been up to his apartment before. You were there tonight. Well, that was because Mr. Roberts said he had some beautiful etchings, and I love etchings, so... But you know what? What? There wasn't a single etching in the plate. We got into my car and drove away. Penny was a very beautiful woman who sounded like a half-wit and wasn't. She was putting on the Paris and springtime routine, pretending she'd fallen for my manly beauty, but, uh... She wanted something from me, and it wasn't love. What it was, I hoped I'd find out. Ben Moran must have been a rough playmate. I don't know why you keep talking about him. He fascinates me. Wanted by the police for a few murder raps, swindles, armed robberies, income tax evasions, passing a red light. Ben would never pass a red light. Oh, sorry. Apology accepted. Take me home. Where? 27 cars and drive. Okay, that's only a couple of blocks over. Penny. Mm hmm? The moon's still beautiful. The night's young. The air's filled with the fragrance of flowers. Where's Ben Moran nowadays? I used to be a friend of his. I'm not anymore. If you don't believe me, ask the police. And I hate you. So kindly shut up. Yes, ma'am. Well, you're home. Thank you. Oh, before you go, Penny, there's something I have to ask you. What? Who told you to play Mata Hari with me? Play what? Beautiful female spy. I think you're absolutely insulting. I said you were beautiful. Good night. I watched Penny walk into her apartment house and then drove away. I thought about it. She was angry, a liar, and the kind of girl who'd go very good on most desert islands. But I didn't have one. So I went home. When I got there, though, I wasn't happy. Myra Wilson was gone. Whether she'd gone on her own or had been persuaded was something I might find out sometime or other. It was a cold trail. I decided I'd try to warm it up a bit. The first step was driving uptown to Robert's house, parking opposite it using the phone booth in an all-night drugstore. I had no guarantee the gimmick would work. I didn't have much choice. Yes? Ben, I can't say anything over the phone, but come over right away. Who'd you say you were? Ben. Ben Moran, you jerk. Right away. Goodbye. The Golden Age of Radio Theater is presenting The Case of the Missing Hotel Room, starring William Gargan as Barry Craig. 
We'll continue in just a moment. Now back to the action with William Gardner. I figured the phone call, if Roberts didn't have too good an ear, would make things happen. I got back to my car and started waiting. Either Roberts was going to sit tight or he was going to make a move. To do me any good or to do Mr. and Mrs. Wilson any good, he'd have to make a move. Maybe he would. I kept on waiting. Roberts must have mistaken me for Ben Moran. He made his move. He got into his car, gunned it, and went away. So did I. Things were maybe picking up. We were across the river in Jersey. Up a dark road to a small house whose lights picked out pieces of the dark sky. I pulled up and stopped a ways down the road from the house. I watched Roberts get out, knock, and go inside. And then I started walking. I knew Roberts was in that house. I could be pretty sure a killer named Ben Moran was there. And who else? I could afford to wait and find out. That is, I had thought I could. The front door was closest. I didn't bother knocking. Hello. Craig. Oh, Mr. Craig. You better save it. There's no time. Over, over there near the fireplace. Uh-huh. Yeah. He, he's dead. He's dead. How did you get out here? Cab. At your house, I got a phone call from Jim. That's my husband. I got here. He let me in. Said someone was trying to kill him. Someone did. You see who? The shots came from there. Yeah. A door, half a jar. Whoever was in the other room would have taken off as soon as he heard me come in. I... I can't really believe Jim's dead. Start practicing. He's dead. The only thing is, he's not really Jim Wilson. What? That new corpse, Myra, is Ben Moran. Went to his pockets, found nothing but small change, called the nearest sheriff, and got out with Myra. Why? How could it have... After his last job, Moran was hot. He had to hold up and picked your town for it. Married you under the name of Wilson. Maybe that was even his real name. He had a birth certificate. Then it was. Ben Moran was his uh, business name. Oh, I, I should have known long ago. He didn't work, but always had money. He hasn't got it anymore. But maybe robbers can tell us about things. The, the hotel manager? Sure. He knew Moran, helped Moran on that disappearing hotel routine. That was to get rid of you. Well, well, you better face up to it. Makes it easier to forget. I suppose so. Moran must have decided the time was right to start spending his dough. Had to get rid of you without the police being called in. Or even if they were called in, not believing your story. They wouldn't have. No. But maybe we'll get them one now they will believe. We made good time back to Robert's apartment house. But he'd made better. His car was there. And so was he. Mind if we come in? I mind. We're still coming in. Come on, Meyer. This rust stuff won't get you anywhere. It got us inside. How's Moran? Moran? Yeah, the man who phoned a couple of hours ago. I received no such call. Oh, stop. I made it. You? I wanted to meet Moran. I trailed you to his hideout in Jersey. Then answer your questions yourself. The police wouldn't. They'd ask you to answer them. Suppose you let me worry about them. You'd better. They're going to think you shot Moran. What for? Money. Very convincing motive. I didn't kill him? Maybe I might believe you, but the police wouldn't. Not after I told them how you conspired with Moran to get rid of his wife. You couldn't prove that. Because your clerk Farley's dead? Don't be so hopeful. Myra can tell her story. The original wallpaper is still on the walls of 312, underneath the new stuff you plastered on. You were around when Moran was killed. All of that would add up to a nice package for a jury. Uh, you, uh, 
You said you might believe me. I did. Who have you got in mind for the killing? Penny Lane. Uh, no use, Miss Lane. Uh, your perfume's too distinctive. Come on out of that room and join us, huh? Hello. I, uh, I was looking for an etching. You were looking for a lot of etchings. With the Secretary of the Treasury's signature on them. I didn't find even one. Too bad. I'm sure Moran wanted you to have them. And I'm going to get them. Well, gun loaded. Uh-huh. Barry, raise your arms. Why? I'm going to search you. You better not. I'm ticklish. Not that ticklish. When there's a gun pointing at you. Well, maybe not. Well? You don't have the money. Nope. What'd you do with it? Gave it to Myra. Mr. Craig. I asked her to hold it for me. But... uh, Oh, it's no use, Myra. No use at all, dear. Give me that handbag. No. I'll take it. There. I'll open it, too. Barry. Hmm? You're a liar. I am? There's no money in Myra's bag. There's a gun, though. That's why I wanted you to take the bag away from him. Why, you what? Sure. Myra is very good with a gun. But you... But she... Stop making noises and point your gun at Mrs. Wilson. She happens to have murdered the hotel clerk Farley and her husband as well. Girls maybe will be girls, but she wanted to be a killer. Myra was very quiet about it all. She said nothing. Even when the police came and took her away, she said nothing. She was waiting for a jury and hoping there'd be mostly men on it. I'll be glad to tell you what broke the case, Willie. I didn't ask you. Well, I've got to tell somebody. Now, look. Moran wanted to shake Myra, so he had Roberts and Farley pull a disappearing hotel stunt on her. But she got to Farley. Forced him to tell her where Moran was hiding out. Then killed Farley to make sure he'd stay quiet. I can recommend the hamburgers. Here? No, nah, that new place down the block. Well, anyway, the, the, the way she gave herself away was she told me her husband had phoned her at my place. Told her where he was hiding out in Jersey and so on. But Willie, how would her husband or anyone else have known that she was staying at my place? They serve it with a kind of coleslaw that ain't all bad. Isn't all bad? Willie, nothing can be all bad. Have another cup of coffee? My mistake. Anyway, here I am, left without a case, without a fee, without... Hey... Stop breathing down the back of my neck. Turn around and I'll breathe down the front of it. Oh, hello. Hello. But you can't say I'm left without a penny. You're listening to the Golden Age of Radio Theater. tried reading confidential investigator backwards? It can be done if it's on a glass door you're sitting behind, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Me, it left sitting in my office on Madison Avenue around closing time with nothing to do but wait till I got hungry enough for dinner. Anyway, that's what I thought. Come in until they and it arrive. All right, take it easy, fellas. Take it real easy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Put it down yeah. easy. Yeah. 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 That's it, fellas. Yeah. Now wait downstairs till I get this guy's signature. Uh, there we are. Okay, okay. Mr. Right on this line. Well, wait a minute. Uh, what is it? What's what? That thing you just dumped in here. Looks like a tree in brown wrapping paper. Maybe it's a tree, maybe it's a hitching post. How do I know? It's not a tree, there's no branches, but, uh... A hitching post? A hitching post is something you hitch horses to. I don't hitch horses to anything. I haven't got horses. So now you got a hitching post, maybe you'll get some. There's a clause in my lease that says I can't keep horses in this office. Move. There's another clause which says... Oh, forget it. Will you please sign this here? Get the wrappings off that thing first. Okay. Hey, don't look now, but were you wrong? This here came addressed to Barry Craig. That you? That's me. But uh, that's not a hitching post. Who cares? It happens to be a mummy. Way off the baby talk. 
Mummy, as in embalmed. Okay, okay. So now you won't have to buy a horse. I wasn't planning on... You won't even have to move. But what could I use a mummy for? A hat rack? <laughs> no knobs. So give it away for Christmas. Mister, would you please sign us? Who sent it to me? Mister, I- I'm just a trucker. Nobody tells me the little secrets. You don't want to sign? How hard is it to forge an X? Goodbye. Hey, come back here. <laughs> time I got to the door, he was gone. I wandered back into the office and stared at the mummy. For all I could tell, the mummy was maybe staring back at me. I don't think either of us got much pleasure out of it. That was when the girl walked in. Staring at her was much more fun. Hello. Hello. You are Barry Craig. I am. I am the Princess Nepatiti. How do you do? I am coming for my sister. I don't think there that you... There we are. There? Princess, that happens to be a mummy. She are my sister. But isn't she a bit older than you are? Say, 5,000 years older? It's nothing. It's a long time between drinks. I am 5,000 years old. Well, I I don't believe it. You like that proof it? Sure. I'm telling you something what happened a long time ago to prove it. What you like to hear? Well, uh, is it true what they say about Anthony and Cleopatra? Ah, it's true. Sit down. Okay. I are sitting too. On me? You are Mark Anthony. I am Cleopatra. It's over there, denied. It's beautiful music playing. Yeah. It's very nice weather. Well, I'm glad the weather's nice. Cleopatra. She makes this with the lips. Mmm, nice and warm. Uh, I, I meant the weather. Look, uh, Cleopatra, Stop somebody just... He's jumping. It's only the beginning. And next installment ought to be something. Jake. Uh, th- this is the Princess Nefertiti. She came to get her sister. Hey, yep. She was just showing me how things were between Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Hey, yep. I do not like him. Oh, this is Jake, the night elevator man. On the Nile, there are not being elevator man. I go now. Oh, uh, but Princess... You are lousing up the history. See what you did, Jake? Loused up the history. You in a hurry? Yeah. I didn't take the elevator down, huh? I won't. Oh, but Jake, I owe you a dinner. Yep. Come on, I'll buy you one. After I find out where an Egyptian princess, 5,000 years old, goes when she goes home. She wasn't, of course, a princess, Egyptian or otherwise. And she was a lot less than 5,000 years old. I didn't have to deduce that. She'd sat on my lap, remember? But I wanted to know why she put on the act. And where the mummy came in. Must have had cars in old Egypt, eh? Yeah, it looks that way. She drives well. How's her cooking? Uh, hey, I didn't notice. Uh, Jake, behave yourself. Remember, she's old enough to be even your grandmother. Well, you think of that when... Uh, that's enough. She's stopping. Right in front of a big tomb. Yeah. Inscription over the entrance, yeah. Egyptological Museum. She's gone into the grounds. Cutting around the building. Ah, here's a cement path. There must be an annex to the museum. Uh huh. Uh, there's a small house over there. Went inside. We following the end? I don't think so. Not yet, anyway. We'll try the museum first. There are the fire. Jake. The museum might be more interesting. Ha! Huh. Well, all right, but... Uh, this door might do it. If somebody was careless, leaving doors open. Just as well. The place is filled with Egyptian relics and Egyptians. Mummy cases all around. Now, let's try this one. case and mummy inside. Who'd you expect? Daddy? <laughs> well, uh, another one. Uh, another case, another mummy. It's likely to go on like that. Maybe. I'm not so sure, though. Okay. Now, let's take a look at this. Yep. 
Mummy's moving, Mr. King. Moved, shall us. And not a mummy. What is it? A man who was alive only a little while ago. He'd still be alive if somebody hadn't buried a knife in his chest. There was no knife around, proving pretty definitely the man in the mummy case had been murdered. Suicides rarely dispose of their weapons after death. He'd been murdered and stuffed into a mummy case. Nice place to hide a corpse if you like hiding corpses. He had papers on him. Alive, he'd been a wealthy man named Osgood. I remember the name. He'd financed archaeologists all over the world. Dead, he was just a man to whom nothing mattered. Jake, unless I'm wrong, this museum was one of Osgood's endowments, which makes it a more or less natural place for him to wind up dead. Makes it a natural place for us to get out? Whoever killed him took the mummy out of that case and put Osgood inside. And then, maybe shipped that mummy to me. Why? I don't know. Here, give me a hand. Uh, uh, what? Well, I want to get him back inside the mummy case. There. He's back. Yeah. Body temperature. The fact that rigor's only starting to set in indicates he died around six hours ago. No hurry about informing the police. Let's talk to the princess about it instead. She knows the mummy out of that case is in my office. It's possible she knows more than that. From what I see when I come into your office, she knows more than that. I think she's a real princess. No, but she's real. I tell you what, Mr. Shepard. Uh, that's the annex uh, curator's house, I guess. Windows I don't know how it would go with your Vermont upbringing, but uh, we're going to do some eavesdropping. Favorite hey, winter spot up in Vermont. Three people in the room. Girl? Little mouse of a man? I'll tell you that. There's something that could be a football player. Ted, don't be an idiot. Football player's name is Ted. I'm not an idiot, I tell you. I had an appointment with Mr. Osgood here. But Lester... Lester... Mr. Osgood hasn't been here, Ted. Believe me, not for days. Listen, Lester, Mr. Osgood told me to meet him here this evening, hours ago. Now, where is he? He couldn't have asked you to meet him here. Are you calling me a liar? Oh. Oh, dear, no. No, for heaven's sake, Lester, stop crawling. Try to act like a man or something. I'm sorry, Wendy. The prince's name is Wendy, it seems, and the mouse is Lester. I want to know why you're so sure he didn't ask me to meet him here, Lester. We... we quarreled violently. You quarreled with Mr. Osgood? You? He wanted me to put those Indonesian masks in the museum. They were fakes, and I told him so. Good for you, darling. There is something you'll fight for. Maybe it escaped your notice that Mr. Osgood owns the museum. He doesn't own me. Well, I'm only his secretary. I take orders from him. The last orders I got were to meet him here. Let's try the front door now, Jake. Yep. Not a fascinating conversation we overheard, but uh, considering the corpse in the museum, it might be important. Yes? Hey, we come in, Mr. Lester. Oh, I suppose so, I'll do it. Do I know you? My name's Barry Craig. This is Jake, and uh, we are coming in. This um, seems to be uh, Mr. Craig, and uh, you'd be Ted. I am. And you, of course, are... Uh, Hello. ...not exactly a princess. You've been eavesdropping. Uh, you've been accent dropping. <laughs> it's true. Happens to us Egyptians all the time. Well, now, what's going on here? Ted talks like that because he's more or less my fiancé. We don't want to intrude, but would the three of you mind coming to the museum? Oh, but, it, but it's closed at this time. The regular hours... Master, are... don't be such a stick. Forget the regular hours and the regular rules. Girl right? loves mouse. But is engaged to football play on. I think you're right. Well, all right, but I don't know what Mr. Osgood would say. I don't think you have to worry about that. We'll return to our star, William Gargan, in just a moment. This is the Golden Age of Radio Theater, now heard seven days a week only on WTKN Talk Radio 970.
Imagine years ago turning on the big old Philco radio with the big speakers and the little tiny dial and listening to all the great stars of network radio. Stars like Bob Hope and Jerry Colonna, Tulula Bankhead, Al Jolson, W.C. Fields, Amos and Andy, and Fibber McGee and Molly. Well, we can help you bring back those golden hours with a special one-hour cassette which features all the stars I just mentioned and many more for just $2. Yes, spend many nostalgia-filled hours listening to Bing Crosby, Skinny Ennis, Easy Aces, Major Bowles, and Eddie Cantor. To order your cassette, send $2 to The Magic Radio, Box 6860, Portland, Oregon, 97228. That's The Magic Radio, Box 6860, Portland, Oregon, 97228. Along with your cassette, we'll send you a catalog so you can select from hundreds of other titles at low, low collector's prices. Send $2 to The Magic Radio, Post Office Box 6860, Portland, Oregon, 97228. This offer is limited. Don't delay. Now the conclusion of the case of the mummy's sister. Now, let's see. Yeah. This one right here. Oh, this, this mummy case? Yes. Uh, that's what I wanted to show you. Open it, Lester. No. Why shouldn't he open it, Wendy? Because, because there's blood on the floor. You're right. Since when have mummies started bleeding? They don't. Open the case, Lester. Very well. It's a trick. It won't prove anything. Anyone could have stabbed him. Stabbed who? I don't know. Whoever's in there. My dear, in spite of the fact that I've never before dared to mention it, I I happen to love you very much. But that doesn't blind me to the fact that you're frequently a fool. Now, shut up. Don't talk that way to Wendy. Are you objecting to my telling her I love her or that she's a fool? I object to both. But she is a fool. Otherwise, she'd realize the only reason you're marrying her is the money she expects to get from Mr. Osgood. Do you... You're a worm. I probably am. I hate to interrupt all this good, clean fun, but you still haven't opened the case, Lester. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll do it at once. <gasps> it's Mr. Hopgood. He, he's dead, isn't he? He's dead. Wendy, how, how did you know Osgood was going to be inside that case? I, I suspected it because he had an appointment with you and didn't keep it. And, and he had a violent quarrel with me some days ago. I'm afraid your deductions were the obvious ones, Wendy. But did you have to be quite so sure they were true? The police ought to be informed. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, I'll phone them. I can't believe all this is real. It's real. It's real as the blood on the floor. But before they went, they arrested Mr. Lester. So he went with them. Jake and I returned to my office. I thought perhaps the mummy might be getting lonely. That didn't turn out to be the case. Okay, Jake. Whoever took those pot shots at us is gone. And so is the mummy. I made a phone call. I wanted to make sure Lester was still in jail. That would clear him of shooting at Jake and me and swiping the mummy. Lester, I discovered, was no longer in jail. The district attorney hadn't admired the evidence against him. Now that means Lester's loose. Wendy's loose and Ted's loose. Well, watch that loose cop. Jake, please. Uh, I was tempted, Mr. Jake. We're going back to the museum. Is that so? Worried about the mummy? Worried about... I mean, I'm worried about the person who stole the mummy, and I'm even more worried about why. I had an idea why. I didn't linger with it. I was pretty sure I'd never get fond of it. I hoped I'd turn out to be wrong about it. Well, the museum's dark. So is the curator's house. Yep. So we'll go to the museum first. Figgies? Oh. Don't hit below the belt. Sorry. I want to check that empty mummy case. What for? Make sure it's empty. Uh huh. Empty mummy case is always empty. Except when it isn't. Tate? Tate. The mummy's back inside. That's good. That's bad. Wrong mummy? Wrong something. I'm not sure what. How's it 
too dark. We'll change that. Thinking about the little fella? Rest? Yeah. What? He's in this up to his neck. Now, where's that doorbell? Could be asleep. You'll have to wake up. He ain't waking up. We won't wait for him, then. Door's locked and solid. We'd better try the windows. One of the living room we looked through before. It's around the side here. It was ground level, which ought to help. Yeah. <laughs> Fastened down. Get out of the way, Jake. Yep. Sounded loud enough to wake the dead. It may have to. Now, most of the glass is out of the way. Now we go in. The light someplace around. Uh, living room's empty. Where would Lester's bedroom be? I don't know. It's a funny smell. You're right. That's gas. Which means the kitchen. The smell's getting stronger. The other end of this hallway, which should be the kitchen door. And, uh, stay away from that switch. Huh? Any spark might cause the gas inside the kitchen to blow up. Doors open. Jake gets with Paul Cullen near the hospital. But that's us see what's in the kitchen, please. Huh? All right. Here you go. Somebody's laying down with the rain. Yeah, I got him. Let me help you. You better. The gas is strong. You got feet? All right. Outside. The hallway. It's uh, uh, almost as bad out here. In the, the living room. That broken window there would help. Yep. Oh, it's a lot better in here. Yeah. Put him down near the window. Yeah. Oh. Oh. He don't look so good. He's still alive, though. Get on that phone. We need an ambulance fast to get to him before death does. Oh. They got to him and took him away. The intern said he had a chance. Jake and I stayed behind in the house. I made a few phone calls, and the air got better. Mr. Craig, was he trying to kill himself? No. There was a bruise on the back of his head. Well, then it was the same one who killed Oscar. Yeah. Hope to close the case by making it look as though Lester had committed suicide because of guilt. Uh-oh. Company. Oh, dear Craig, I don't like to be black down here in the middle of the night. You want Osgood's murderer caught? Sure, but... That's a peculiar odor. Where's Lester? Out for the moment. And that ought to be Wendy. I phoned her, too. It's a crack in Tess. Well, apparently they're cleaning up Oscar's murder, Wendy. I suppose they needed us here for something or other. But I thought the police decided it was Lester who... They didn't like the evidence too much, and they turned him loose. Where is he? The Samaritan Hospital, condition critical. Jake and I found him in the kitchen, breathing gas. He tried to kill himself. You'd like that? I... I... It would close the case. Final proof against Lester. The only thing, Wendy, you knew about Osgood's death before you should have. You warned Lester not to open the mummy case in the museum. That was because there was blood on the floor. You didn't explain how you knew he was stabbed, not shot. Oh, Wendy, they're right. I remember it explained to them. I can't. But that could mean... Wendy... Oh, shut up, Ted. You never cared about me anyway. All you wanted was the money. I didn't hear it from Osgood. Well, it's likely to be bloodstained now. I don't care for any of it, I think. Is there anything more, Craig? Oh, one thing. This statuette. Uh, what's it made of? What? Granite. And it should be hard enough. <laughs> don't you like Ted? No. He's a murderer. <laughs> A murderer who'd been fingering the gun in his pocket while I talked. Being hit over the head by the statuette wouldn't damage him permanently. The state would take care of that. Go! 
girl was in a real hurry to get to the hospital. Yeah, I know. So what can she see in a mouse like Lester? Chapman. <laughs> no argument. Jake Ted's motive was the money Wendy was getting from Osgood. He killed Osgood shortly after Osgood had quarreled with Lester. He figured Lester would be the obvious suspect. Anybody ask you to explain? No, no. Now, uh, why was the mummy delivered to me? Simple. Ted wouldn't have. He'd framed Lester and would have left things the way he'd set them up. So it had to be Lester himself. He wanted me to help him. He gained a little time. Thought you said nobody asked? Nobody did, but I'm telling you. Now, now Wendy had seen Lester, so she came to my office to try to get the mummy back. Bruce, she was innocent. And if nobody asked you, why are you explaining? I'm not. I'm just dropping you off at the building. Oh. Well, thanks. I got one question. What's that? Is it true what they say about Anthony and Cleopatra? Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. It's a sad fact, but very few murderers ever amount to anything. They're in such a killing profession, and when they come to the end of their rope, there's always a noose attached to it. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Ever notice the fact that the work a man does leaves its mark on him? Nine times out of ten, you can spot a doctor, a lawyer, a butcher, a baker half a block away. I wonder what a confidential investigator looks like. <laughs> he looks like me. I figured the above philosophy represented a good day's work. The shadows were creeping along Madison Avenue. I got out of the office. And I locked the door behind me. Maybe I could fool a burglar into thinking I had something worth stealing. I hoped I wasn't waking Jake. A night elevator man needs his sleep. Something was wrong. He'd started the elevator up almost before I'd finished pushing the buzzer. You can spoil tenants awful fast that way. Jake? Hey. You suffering from insomnia? No. You've been reading a book on how to get ahead in the world? No. Well, uh, stop chattering and let's get started. Well, you got the door shut fine. Now we're supposed to go down. Oh, glad you reminded me. They didn't have any elevators down on your farm in Vermont. No. It figures. No office buildings, neither. That figures, too. No shiny cars, no blondes. What did you do during the long winter evenings? Decided to leave the farm, Mr. Craig. <laughs> well, right about now is when you open the elevator door. Ain't sure I should. Why? Taint the farm. Meaning uh, we've got elevators, office buildings, shiny cars, and uh, a blonde? Yep. I'm not afraid of blondes. Back in Vermont, because her pop usually carried the gun. But here? She's carrying it. Must be a strain on her. Open up, Jay. Yep. Where'd you hide her? The shiny car. Outside? That's the one. Oh, I like them that shape. Long, rounded, smooth. You mean the car? Oh, sure. As far as the blonde goes, there's not a wrinkle or a gun on it. A bag. Oh. I see it when she parted her nose. Well, uh, maybe it's a trick cigarette case. No. She could be waiting for somebody else. Nobody else in the building. Then I'd better not keep her waiting. After all, you can only die once. Once is enough. Don't remind me. Besides, blondes rarely have any reason to shoot me. Boasting? Just being wistful. Good night, Jake. Night, Mr. Craig. Well, I've been waiting long. Not very. 
beautiful night. Isn't it? The name's Craig. I know. Well, Jake could be wrong. Who's Jake? The night man. He wasn't wrong. Then I get in? Please. Okay. Well, the name's still Craig. I'm Mona Walsh. Mrs. Walsh? Mrs. Walsh. How's Mr. Walsh? Uh, that's why I was waiting for you. We're going to see him? I hope not. I could think of an easy explanation. Mona Walsh had seen me, had been carried away by my rugged physique and my mildly scrambled features, and was now carrying me off to a tryst among the pines, or maybe the maples. It was too easy an explanation, and it didn't include the gun. We're going someplace, or just cruising? I'm trying to find words, the best way to tell you. I've been a confidential investigator for quite a while. You don't have to find the best way. My husband isn't Mr. Walsh. He's Ted Walsh. Well, what difference is that? Wait a minute. Ted Walsh? That's right. The Ted Walsh. If I remember my newspaper headlines correctly, he's killed a few men here and there. Yes. His last little effort was robbing a bank someplace in Massachusetts. And killing a guard. And killing a guard. Nice guy. I didn't know what he was when I married him. You probably won't believe that. If you turn out to be a client of mine, I'll have to believe it. Well, it's true. I didn't know until just recently. When I found out, I left him. Came here to New York. Fair enough. You're in the clear. What's bothering you? Ted's in New York, too. New York's a big place. Ted's terribly in love with me. He came here for only one reason. You could keep your door locked. Oh, please don't joke. I wasn't joking. Keep your door locked and your telephone handy. Police would be glad to remove him from your doorstep. Ted would spot them. Then he'd know I told the police about him. He'd get away from them. He's done it before. He'd kill me. Possible. But if you watched for him, he wouldn't spot you. Then as soon as he came, you carry a gun, don't you? I've got a license, too. Well, then everything would be all right, wouldn't it? Might be. That'd be a fee. I, I thought perhaps... Five hundred? Well, that's too high. I generally get fifty a day in expenses. Well, that doesn't seem enough. I run a one price shop. Well, all right. This your place? Yes. Well, let's get out. Small house. Stay there alone? Yes. I can see why you'd worry. Ah. Uh... I, I feel nervous, exposed, standing around like Well, we'll try the house. I'd better go in with you. Oh, of course. In case he's a little early. Oh, I haven't thought of... Don't get excited. I'm probably too careful. But we'll check anyway. Got your key? Oh, here. Uh, over to the side, huh? What? The lamppost out front throws some light. The house is dark. You'd make a nice target. Oh, all right. Yeah. So far, fine. Light switch near the door? To the left, on the way inside. Okay, stay where you are. Clear enough. Come on in. Got a latch on it? Uh-huh, good. Rest of the house now. I feel like a termite inspector. Except uh, termites don't kill, do they? Mr. Walsh was not at home. Mrs. Walsh felt good about it. I didn't have time to get uh, philosophical about marriage. I checked the back of the house for good measure. A high fence took care of the garden and the back door. It was only the front door to worry about. You're alone in the house, Mrs. Walsh. Yes. When I shut this door behind me, you'll lock it. Of course. Then if your husband comes calling... I'll be safe. You won't have to use that gun you're carrying around anyway. Uh, you, you'll be out front someplace? Yeah. The nearest convenient doorway. I'll find one. It's one of the things you'll learn fast in my business. How to find convenient doorways. So long, Mrs. Walsh. So long. There was a small 
small night light over the door. That was nice. It would light up Mr. Walsh neatly if he visited. I had my choice of two or three doorways from which I could watch the Walsh house and be close enough to have a clean shot at Ted Walsh. I passed them all up. I was looking for a phone, and I found one in a drugstore half a block away. Lieutenant Rogers, homicide. Harry Craig here. Aloof tonight, eh? Watch those college words. People will think you're educated. I am. Tonight you're not ashamed of being a college graduate, Lieutenant? I'm all alone in the office. Nobody Mm. will ever find out. I'll tell them, Trev. Unless I do what? (laughs) No blackmail. I want some information, though. You might have it. You flatter the department. It's about Ted Walsh. Walsh? We'd like some information about him, too. For example, where to get in touch with him. I haven't got it. Trav, on that bank job he pulled in Massachusetts, was it a solo flight? A bank job's never solo, especially one involving $60,000. But Walsh was definitely in on it. So definitely he killed a guard. Thanks, Trav. Hey, uh, wait a minute. My curiosity's aroused. Try a cold shower. Good night, Trav. <laughs> For what it was worth, was that. I went back to Mrs. Walsh's little gray home in the West. It looked the same. I pushed the button. Who is it? Mary Craig. Leave the door on the chain, but open it a crack, huh? All right. What's the matter? I've decided to throw up the job. What? Yeah, I'm resigning. But I don't understand. It's a clear saving of 50 bucks for you. Well, why are you... Let's say the hours are too long, huh? Good night, Mrs. Walsh. She was saying something as I went down the walk and away from the house. I didn't bother listening. I had to drop her. You see, I always believe a client, and Mona Walsh, however beautiful, was a liar. But however much of a liar she was, Mona Walsh was beautiful. So I hung around in one of those convenient doorways... With me apparently off the job, she'd need somebody else to keep Ted Walsh away from her. There wasn't much time left either. She wouldn't take a chance trying to find another gullible private detective. I was interested in who she would find. It took maybe a half hour for my replacement to show up. He was an anti-doorway boy. He picked an alley. I thought he looked lonely, so I dropped in on him. Hello? What? Hey, who? The name's Craig, Barry Craig. What do you want? I'm trying to find out what's special about this alley. Nothing. I'm crazy about alleys, that's all. You're sticking to that? Sure. Then... Uh, I thought you'd be packing one. What? You ain't got no right taking a guy's gun. Uh, I'm a lot bigger than you are. Would you like to argue about it? Well, there's there's a dame in that house. Ted Walsh's wife. She's kind of worried he might show. She doesn't love him anymore? Oh, I wouldn't know nothing about that. The orders was he don't get to her. What does he get? Never mind. Who's got all the big concern for Mona Walsh? Oh, why don't you leave me alone? What's your angle? Maybe I want to send your boss flowers because he's a humanitarian. Feed me a name. I didn't tell you nothing, understand? Of course. It's, uh, Mr. Harold. Harold? Yeah, but remember, you didn't get it from me. I'll remember. Here's your gun. Oh, yeah. I'm worried about Mona Walsh, too. Oh, you don't have to worry about her. Nobody will get the jump on me again. I hope not. So long. You start with the kid stuff. Snatch and run. Knock over a couple of small stores. Move up into the hot cars and cold decks. Go on to delivering votes a few seasons. Take over a few wheels. Buy a few debts and you wind up being Mr. Harold. But by then you wear tailored suits and handmade shoes. Now, what's the idea this hour? The name's Craig. Oh. Oh, Craig. I've seen the face around. Wait a minute now. You a private eye? Call it confidential investigator. Makes it seem more dignified. Yeah, I'll call it what you want, but get out of here. Not until I see Harold. 
Let's make it Mr. Harold, huh? And he ain't seeing you. I ain't the type that appeals to him. He's seeing me. You're pushing your luck or something? When I say you don't see Mr. Harold, you don't see him. So far, it's only your word. It's more than a word. Everybody's got one. Yours licensed? No, you care. Keep pushing and you're a trespasser. Okay. And... Yeah, Mr. Harold. What's the uh, trouble? Yeah, I'm having words with a private eye who wants in. Oh, indeed. Uh, let him in, Bogan. I haven't seen one in years. Okay. Who knows? He may want to have his license renewed. Not exactly. The name's Craig. Uh, Bogan, put that gun away and leave us, hmm? Yeah, okay, Mr. Harold. Bogan is so impulsive. A little crude, too, or haven't you noticed? He uh, doesn't polish easily. It's getting late. Uh, what's half of $60,000, Harold? $30,000. That kind of money worth a debt? I haven't seen the latest quotations. Ted Walsh knocked over a bank a couple of weeks ago, killed a guard, and collected $60,000. Hmm, an enterprising young man. He had a little help. The way I figure, it was 30000 for Ted, 30000 for uh, the help. Seems equitable enough, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but Harold, uh, how do you share the debt? Harold needed a little time. I let him have it. The room was nice. Good furniture, oak paneling on the walls. Small Renoir hung just where the light would hit it in the mornings. A girl brushing her hair before a mirror. She looked like someone I'd seen, and for a minute I couldn't remember where. She looked like the girl who'd married Ted Walsh. You uh, must have some interest in the uh, rather sordid subject of Ted Walsh and his uh, peccadillos. Why? Mona Walsh. She tried to hire me. She's a lovely girl. You wouldn't hire? She lied to me. Sad. She wanted me to protect her against her husband. She'd heard he was here in New York. She didn't tell me who told her. Why? I really couldn't say. She wanted me to stake out in front of her house. So when Walsh got there, I'd take him. But Harold, uh, how would Ted Walsh have found her house? She wouldn't have told him, not if she was really afraid of him. Isn't all this Mona Walsh's problem? No, uh, Ted Walsh alive gets half of the $60,000. Ted Walsh dead gets a mouthful of dust in Potter's Field. How picturesque. The problem is uh, how to kill Ted Walsh without annoying the police. The answer is... Hire a private detective, let Ted Walsh know where his lovely wife is, and uh, he heads for her. The private detective kills him. All nice and legal. I suppose it would be. Uh... Harold, <laughs> you picked me to kill Ted Walsh you're, for you. You're ruining my tie. Sorry, I have trouble with my temper sometimes. I don't like being a hired gun, Harold. You turned the job down, didn't you? What more do you want? I don't know. Maybe I'm worried because a liar is so lovely. <laughs> I got out of there. I could have gone to lots of other places after that, but I didn't. I went back to my office and sat. I didn't have any doubts. Harold had set up Mona Walsh as a decoy. When I cried quits, one of his men moved in to protect her. Harold wanted Ted Walsh dead so he could hold on to all of the 60,000. And maybe Mona Walsh, too. It was an idea I didn't enjoy. I stopped having it. I was waiting without knowing what I was waiting for. I thought it might be nice if I had a Renoir to hang next to the dusty license on the wall. Then I thought of the people and the motives that kept me in business. I decided the Renoir wouldn't fit. The hours dragged by and I stopped kidding myself. Nobody phoned. Nobody would phone. I'd get up and go home and go to sleep. I got up, but I didn't go home. The street in front of Mona Walsh's house was empty and cold. The lights in Mona Walsh's house were out. And the boy in the alley wasn't there anymore. I was wrong. I hadn't gone deep enough. The alley closed in on me, and then I found him. He was propped up against the wall. 
his legs straight out before him, his head slumped down over his chest. He might have been brooding about the blood that had poured out of that chest if he hadn't been so completely dead. I left him there. He'd keep. He'd been dead some of the while. Somebody had shot him. It got past him into Mona Walsh's house. The lock on Mona Walsh's front door was in fine shape, except that the door wasn't locked. The living room was the way I'd remembered it. I went into the bedroom. She had fallen back across the bed. The stain on the front of her dress hadn't been her dressmaker's idea. Uh, hello? Mrs. Walsh. I th- thought I'd hope maybe I'd see you again. Hold it. Emergency. An ambulance. 435 Ash. Gunshot wound. And make it quick. Yeah. Mr. Craig? Better not talk. Why? There'll be a doctor here in a couple of minutes. You've seen people like this before. I should be dead. Will you stop talking? No, I won't. What do you want me to do? Think about what my life has been. Shouldn't have married Ted. He's bad. Now, you don't have to... I'm not making excuses. Only things happen. You lie about them. Even to yourself. Now, I don't have to lie anymore. Once the doctor gets here, you... Oh, please. It's all going so fast now. Kiss me. Good night. I... When I was a little girl, my father always... Please. Sure. Thanks. Good night. The doctor was a little late. The police arrived and made noises and were very busy. Mona Walsh didn't pay attention to any of them. Barry? Yes, Lieutenant. We haven't been able to get a thing. A couple of the neighbors heard the shots but thought they were a car backfiring. That happens. Which gives us the time Mrs. Walsh and the character in the alley were killed. An hour and ten minutes ago. Does knowing that make you feel any better? With all the deaths you've seen, Barry, you ought to be a little more callous about new ones. Maybe I don't try hard enough. Stay the way you are. It's better. Otherwise, you lose humanity. None of us can afford that. They teach you that in college? It's not taught anywhere. It's something you either know or don't know. Our policeman isn't supposed to give lectures, though, so... Ted Walsh is out in the open now. He must have holed up for the last couple of weeks, but, uh... We know he's in New York now. We'll get him. Yeah. Mind if I get out now? No. Where are you going? We could, uh, kill a few bears after I'm through here. Thanks, but not tonight, Tram. Because, you see, I... I won't be true for maybe, uh, longer than that. I wasn't holding out on Trav. I had to be sure. There was only one place I could think of that might help. If I were Ted Walsh, I'd go visit Harold. I wasn't Ted Walsh, but I went to visit him anyway. I always enjoyed driving. It was a nice night for it. The only thing wrong was uh, the red stain on a girl's dress. There was a car parked outside Harold's house. It started pulling away as I came up. I didn't try to figure out anything subtle. I just cut my wheel right into it. Both cars stopped quick. I was out of mine before Bogan could quite make it. But he made it out of his car. Hello, Bogan. If I don't know what's where you're driving. Yeah, me. Oh, oh, you don't want the gun, but I do. Why, you bitch. You'll wake the neighbors. Thanks for the gun. Yeah. Hey, warm. And it's been fired. Within very recent history. Now, listen. Let's see if there's anything else in your car, huh? No. Nothing that moves. Bogan? Yeah. I can't take the time to deliver you. I'll have to put you on deposit for a little while. (laughs) 
He'd keep. I thought Mr. Harrell might still be at home. Worrying about his car, maybe. Bogan, what? Oh, Craig. We'll go inside. Now, look here. I've got Bogan's gun. All right. What do you want? Your car's in a bad way. That crash? Yeah, I'm a careless driver. Was Bogan hurt? He lived. I, I, I'm going to call for a doctor for him. No. Now, now look here. This is perfectly... Per- You're nervous. I haven't anything further to say to you, Craig. One man's opinion, yours. I don't share it. You must have looked into the car. I did. Well, that can be explained easily. Explain it easily. You saw Ted Walsh's body in the back of the car. He was a killer. He apparently thought his wife and I had been uh, a little too friendly. Had you? Well, you know how it is, Craig. I don't know. Well, anyway, he came here. Threatened to kill me, so... Well, Bogan beat him to it, that's all. It was a case of self-defense. It would stand up at any court. Sure. Oh, there's no reason to lose your head. I haven't lost it. Where was Bogan delivering the body? To the aquarium? Well, you see, Bogan's record isn't too good. He was afraid the police might not readily accept the plea of self-defense. He wanted to dispose of the body. I, Well, I tried to dissuade him, but I failed. As a matter of fact, I was just about to notify the police myself. Oh, I'm sure you were. I think you'll find the bullets in Ted Walsh's body came from Bogan's gun. I don't doubt it. Well, then, that sort of leaves me out of it, doesn't it? How about the bullets in the body of the boy you sent to guard Mona Walsh? How about the bullets in Mona Walsh's body? They, they're dead? They're dead. Oh, that's terrible. Sure. Ted must have got to them. He had a gun. The bullets in those bodies would have come from his gun. Don't you mean the gun you planted on him? Mr. Harold looked a little sick. His face matched the way I felt. For a minute, I wished I'd developed those calluses Trav mentioned. Then I forgot about it. Mr. Harold retreated behind his desk. Planted on him? Ted Walsh came here before he went to visit his wife. For his share of the bank money. Walsh died here. Bogan saw to that. But you still didn't own all of that 60000 Mona Walsh might be considered to have a claim to half of it. So you decided to wipe out that claim. You're, you're dreaming. You're headed for a house. You had to take care of the boy in the alley. Walsh would have had to in order to get to Mona. You took care of him. Then you went into the house and entered the partnership between you and Mona Walsh. No. Yeah. You came back here, planted the gun you'd used on Ted Walsh. Bogan would dump his body where it wouldn't be found for a while. That way, no medical examiner could tell that Walsh had died before his wife. That, that's very clever. You've got nothing to prove it with. It's Ted Walsh's body. Examination now will show he died before Mona did. A good lawyer... Could... I've got something else. Something that told me Ted Walsh hadn't killed his wife before I even came here. What's that? An unlocked door. I don't know what that means. Mona Walsh's door was unlocked when I got to her house. The lock hadn't been tampered with, which meant Mona had opened that door. But she wouldn't have opened it to her husband. She was afraid of him. She'd have opened it for you, Harold. I... You've been fumbling in that desk drawer long enough. Bring the gun up. Maybe you'll beat me to the shot, huh? I I don't want to get involved. You're involved. There's nothing left except maybe a chance to take me. Well? Okay, Harold. You're better, much better at killing women. Let's go tell some cops about it, huh? You've been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Long Way Home, was written by Lou Vittis. Next week, it's the strange story titled Dead Reckoning, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, matter triumphs over mind when a corpse with no head for figures starts pitching his weight around with yours truly playing catch. Good night, folks. See you next week. Featured in the role of Mona was Barbara Weeks. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Don Wilkins, Johnny. Prime Mutual Limited. Oh, hi, Don. Thanks for the Christmas present. Well, just don't take out the cork near an open flame. Yeah. Uh, say, do you know anything about a guy named Mel Pryker? Nothing good about him. Why? Got himself killed last night. Murdered. Pryker was born to be murdered. Maybe so, but not at our expense. We're holding a $100,000 policy on him. Wow. Who's the beneficiary? His uh, partner, Nick Shern. Nick Shern? You picked a fine pair of rats. Yeah, I know that now. The New York police are holding Shern, but they've got no evidence. Go down there and check it out for us, Johnny. If Nick did the killing, we're off the hook. Any witnesses? One, apparently, the hat check girl in that nightclub of theirs. What's her story? I wish I knew. She's disappeared. We've got to find her, Johnny, before some of Nick's hoodlums find her. Don, maybe they already have. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the Nick Shern matter. Item 1, 2280, transportation to New York, tips and incidentals, and taxi fare to the office of Lieutenant Ed Rafferty, Homicide Division, the man in charge of the case. Oh, hiya, Johnny. Where have you been? Not bad, Ed. How's the homicide business? Terrible. If you look at that teletype, shoplifting, five complaints right in a row. The week before Christmas, that's all we get, shoplifters. Mel Pryker wasn't shoplifting. Oh, you working on it, Johnny? Yeah, the insurance angle. Nick Shern's the beneficiary. A hundred grand policy. Oh, you got a tough one, boy. Shern killed him all right, but I don't think we're going to be able to stick him. Come on in the office. Hey, you know what that kid of mine wants for Christmas? Marilyn Monroe? Oh, oh, next year, Johnny. He's only ten, you know. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. No, he he wants a motorbike. Can you tie that? Ten years old, and he says he needs a motorbike. (laughs) Have a chair. Okay. Well, look, I know a factory representative here will make you a good deal on one, eh? Oh, now, forget it, Johnny. No, I was 14 before I even had a pair of roller skates. And then I had to buy them myself. You know, kids are spoiled today. That's the half of what's wrong with them. Uh, ah, there's the file on the case. What little we've got. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, how'd it happen, Ed? Uh, you mean, how do I think it happened? That's good enough for me. Mel Pryker and Nick Shern were both in the rackets for years, as you probably know. Yeah, I've heard rumors. Well, a while back, they teamed up and opened a string of supper clubs. That's where Pryker got it, in their main club, the Chez Colette. Strictly legitimate, huh? Well, more or less, I guess. They could afford to be. The dough they were making and arguing over, according to the word around. That's the reason for the killing, the way you see it. Sure. Nick figured if half was good, all the take would be twice as good. And the insurance on top of it. Ah, you're a fast one, Johnny. (laughs) Anyhow, uh, several people heard the shots about 2.30 in the morning, it was, right after the club closed, but none of them bothered to report it. The cleanup crew came in at three and found Pryker's body. He was lying in his office, shot twice, gun on the floor beside him, no prints. It was his own gun, and it was kept there in his desk. Where was Nick Shern? Well, we picked him up an hour later at another one of their clubs. The manager was with him, and... uh, Oh, Benny Stark. Now, he used Benny. to... Benny. Yeah, I know. Trigger man for Nick's mob in the old days. Fifteen years overdue for hanging. <laughs> That's our Benny. Anyhow, they, they both swear that Nick was there from 1.30 on. Uh-huh. What about a paraffin test, Ed? Positive. Clear to the elbow. And you can throw it out the window. What do you mean? Earlier that evening, Nick spent two hours at a shooting gallery uptown firing a pistol. Ooh, smart, huh? He really planned for it. He really did. And without a witness, we haven't got a chance. I understand there was a witness. Some girl who was mixed up in it. Easy, Johnny. You're talking to a Rafferty. Hmm. So the girl's Irish. Miss Kathleen O'Dare. Old country, back three generations. County Kildare. <laughs> then naturally, she's as innocent as a newborn babe. Naturally. Then how does she figure? Well, a taxi driver who knows her said that he saw her leave the club five minutes after the shots. She denied it, said that she left at closing time. Well, now, in my book, she was lying. Scared to talk, huh? Paralyzed. And with plenty of reason. You know Shuren's reputation. Mm. What about the cab driver? 
Now, I changed his story. He said it might have been some other girl he saw. Oh, no, no. Tell me, Ed. Let me guess. <laughs> uh, that's right. His name's O'Toole. Yeah. And I forgot to mention that Kathleen's pretty. Naturally. Anyhow, I let her go. I had to. And when I went around to talk to her this morning, she'd flown the coop. Any chance I'm a next boy's grabbed her? I don't think so. It looked more like she came home, packed in a hurry, took her kid, and blew. Kid? That ah, eight-year-old daughter. Irish and a mother, too. I was on sacred ground. Oh, he was fingering me gun. <laughs> no, seriously, Johnny. Would you find her? She may be able to break Nick's alibi, and it's our only chance. And it might be her only chance. Nick Sheeran's not the boy to leave a loose end lying around. I know. I've got 30 men checking bus depots, airlines. And no luck, huh? In this mess, this time of year, I'm a hard-boiled cop, Johnny. I've got no Christmas spirit. I'm glad it only comes once per annum. Well, there's not very much to go on, that's for sure. <clears throat> I'll see what I can turn up, Ed. Check with you later. All right, that's fine. Oh, oh, oh by the way, Johnny. Yeah? Uh, about that friend of yours. What friend? Uh, the guy with the motorbikes. Uh, how, how would I be getting in touch with him? Oh, yeah, his name's Ralph Sterner. He's in the phone book, office in the Mackley building. Hard boil cop. <laughs> well, uh, the kid's only young ones. Yeah, sure. Now, you find that O'Dare girl. Find her, keep her alive, and get her to talk. How long have I got to find her? Uh, what do you mean? Nick Shearn. How much longer can you hold him? Johnny, he was turned loose an hour ago. So that was it. A lot of maybes, a lot of questions, and a lot of pressure. A job to be done and done fast. Find one Kathleen O'Dare, former hat check girl at the Shea Colette. Keep Nick Sharon's hoodlums away from her and persuade her to talk. And three to one, Nick was looking for her too. He was free now, on the loose. And he might be anywhere. Only the way it turned out, he wasn't just anywhere. He was in one particular place. Johnny. Parked right smack in front of the precinct station. Over here, Johnny. He was sitting in the back seat of a sedan, and his trigger man, Benny Stark, was at the wheel. Been there a long time, hasn't it, Johnny? About five years, as I remember it, Nick. It was that warehouse robbery over in Queens when you got away with $40,000 worth of furs. Uh-uh, you've forgotten me. I was acquitted on that one. Oh, yeah, I know. After they pulled the only witness out of the East River, his feet in a bucket of cement. Just coincidence. I've never seen him before. You've seen Miss O'Dare before? Sure, I have. She works for me. She's a good kid, Johnny. So I hear. Well, I wouldn't harm a hair on that girl's head. She'll be relieved when I tell her that. Get in. I want to talk to you. No, no, no. Sorry, Nick. I like it fine just the way it is. In the car, I'd be outnumbered. You got me all wrong, Johnny. I don't play that way anymore. What about Benny? Has he reformed, too? <laughs> well, if that's what... <laughs> Benny, go take a walk. Yeah, boss, but... I said go take a walk. Okay. Get in, Johnny. What's on your mind, Nick? You, uh, working on this case? Yeah, I'm on it. Why? That's what I figured. I was talking to my lawyer in there and saw you go to Rafferty's office. I guess the insurance company's gonna try to welch on that claim. It's your party, it? Nick. You talk. I got a better idea. What's that? You know, it's real nice out in Las Vegas this time of year, Johnny. A man can have a lot of fun out there for the next month with... Maybe $10,000 to play with? What man are you talking about? You. I don't have $10,000. You will. 30 minutes from now, if you say the word. Oh, Nick, you're lucky we're not standing out there on the sidewalk. In a car seat, I haven't got room to swing. You're still a fool, huh? I don't know. Why don't you write me about it? You'll have plenty of time. You're up there in the death cell. Suppose I didn't make any claim on that policy. Then you wouldn't have any reason to stay on the case. No sale, Nick. A hundred grand is a lot of money. I'd want to find out why you didn't make a claim. You know why. You're out to pin this on me, and so are the cops. A man with a record hasn't got a chance. You should have thought of that before you killed Mel Pryker. Want to know something, Johnny? I didn't kill him. Well, I'm betting you did. What do you care who killed him? You're not shedding any tears over it. No, but I'd sure hate to see you get away with it. And I'd hate it even more if anything happened to that girl. Kathy O'Dare? Now, what could happen to her? She just might fall in the river. She probably thinks she's safe as long as she hides from the police and refuses to talk. She doesn't know you very well. You had me all wrong, Johnny. You know, you hear a lot about peace on earth, goodwill toward men around this time of year. But I don't have much goodwill toward the kind of rat you are. 
And I figured there'd be more peace on earth if you weren't on it. Push me, and maybe that's what'll happen. Well, at least that's fair warning. Yeah, that's fair warning. I'm going to tag you for this, Nick. You can count on it. Expense account item two, $2.40. Taxi to the east side rooming house of Kathy O'Dare. I didn't have much hope of turning up anything. Ed Rafferty and his men had already been through the place inch by inch. But it was the only starting point I had. The landlady was out and a uniformed policeman let me into Kathy's flat. I spent an hour and a half and got nowhere. I went through her mail, bills, advertisements, casual notes from men she'd met at the club. But nothing personal, not even a postcard. There were no pictures, photographs of Kathy or her daughter anywhere in the flat. She made a clean sweep, then left in a hurry. And obviously, she didn't mean to be found. But I had to find her, and fast. It was dusk when I left. The street lamps were on, and the colored Christmas lights in the windows were on the block. Snow was falling in big, soft, gentle flakes, and there was a holiday feeling in the air. It was neither the time nor the setting for murder. Make a big contribution, son. Give a little something to help poor. Oh, sure. How's it going this year, Santa? Oh, it's better than usual, but it just seems there's never enough to go around, no matter how... Well, bless you, son. Thank you kindly. Don't mention it. Good luck, Pop. Thank you, son. Well, the city ought to clean the streets better. I've been waiting for you. Sorry, Benny. It's not my day for punks. Get some friends who want to talk to you. Start walking, Johnny, down the alley. Uh Uh-uh, it's dark down there. Start walking. This ain't just my hand in my pocket. It better be, Benny, with two cops standing up there on the porch watching. What are you talking about? There ain't no cops. I smashed him in the mouth and knocked him flat, followed it up and kicked his gun. He rolled over, came to his feet and rushed me. I was hoping he was. He had that coming, son? He had it coming. Well, he, he sure did get it. Yeah. Hey, you know something, Pop? I think Benny wants to make a contribution to help the poor. Well, he ain't saying no. <laughs> oh, he's a good boy, at the moment at least. Here you go. That ought to help some. Two, three, four, five hundred dollars. What it where it'll do the most good. Well, Merry Christmas, son. Happy New Year. Yeah, same to you, Pop, and many more of them. Hey, Taxi! There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the next Shern Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, an old lady with a broken arm, a shivering girl, and bullets in the snow. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Gottler speaking. Gottler? I'm Kathleen O'Dare's landlady. Oh, yeah. And that's word you wanted to talk to me. That's right. I'm trying to find Miss O'Dare. Do you know where she is? You a friend of hers? I think I will be once I meet her. I'm an insurance investigator. I want to help her. That's what the other one said. What do you mean? What other one? The fellow that come up here a while ago, 
short, mean-faced, shifty-eyed. Benny Stark, was that his name? He didn't say, Mr. Dollar. I guess he was too busy. Busy? Doing what? Breaking my good right arm. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, New York City, to the Home Office, Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Nick Shearn matter. Expense account continued. Item five, $2.30. Taxi to Mrs. Gottler's rooming house, the place Kathy O'Dare had called home until she disappeared. Come in. Get your hands up. Mrs. Gottler. That I am. Well, look, I'm Johnny Dollar. I talked to you on the phone. It's all right. You can put that gun down. Well, I guess it's you all right. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I've only got one good arm left, and I'm aiming to keep it. Pull up a chair. Thanks. Kind of rough boy, huh? Uh, I'd have showed him who was rough if I could have got a hold of my gun. I'd have blasted him, Christmas week or not. I'd have blasted him, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I know how you feel. And me with all these presents to wrap. How can you wrap presents with one arm? That is being a paper hanger. Well, I'll be glad to help out, Mrs. Gottler. I won't guarantee what they'll look like. Well, and I sure do appreciate it. And don't worry about their looks. I got to get them wrapped, that's all. Let's see now. Uh, this paper goes on that one. Oh, all right. It's a water muffler for my nephew over in Brooklyn. You know, them terrible winters they have over there. Oh, yeah, they're frightful. Of course, it may be better this year. The Dodgers won the pennant. Ah, nothing but luck. It won't happen next year. <laughs> you never know. Hey, tell me something, Mrs. Gottler. How come Benny worked you over? Hmm? Why did he break your arm? Here. Stick this card on it huh? as soon as you get the ribbon tied. Oh, okay. No time of year like Christmas, I will Well, he wanted to know where Kathy went. When I said I didn't know, it jumped onto me. Said it was lying. If I could have got hold of that gun. Where uh, did she go, by the way? You aiming to break my other arm, Mr. Dollar? With all these packages to wrap? Here, hold your finger on that knot. I'll tie it tight now. Them postmen in Brooklyn are always busting things open. I know. Well, that's one down. Where did you say she went? Oh, I didn't. Now, this one I'll deliver myself, so it don't need to be wrapped so careful. All righty. Kathy lit out of here in the middle of the night. You think I'd sit up 24 hours a day spying on my rumors? You might, if the rumor happened to be one of your special favorites. Who told you that? What's the difference? She was, wasn't she? Kathy was everybody's favorite. Anybody that ever met her. Oh, you'll meet them as make remarks about a girl that works in a nightclub. But I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Dollar. Kathleen O'Dare is a finer lady as you'd ever care to find. And I would care to find her. Well, good luck to you, then. And if you do, let me know where she is. You helped her pack, didn't you? No, how did you know that? Here, here, here. That's about as good as I can get it. Be careful when you deliver it, though. It's not tied very tight. I didn't know, Mrs. Gottner. I was guessing, but it figured. Kathy was scared half to death when she packed up and left here. All she had in her mind was to run and hide. She wouldn't have thought of stripping that flat, taking out every bit of personal identification. Somebody had to help her. Now, where'd she go? I don't know. Look, look, you don't get the idea. I'm on her side. She's up against a rough deal and doesn't even know it. You've got a sample of the way those boys play, and that was only a sample. With Kathy, it'll be a whole lot worse. They're looking for her, and sooner or later they'll find her. Her only chance is for me to get to her first, so you... I'm not lying, Mr. Dollar. I don't know where she went, and that's the truth to help me. I tried to get her to tell me, but she wouldn't. She said if I knew it would be dangerous for me. I helped her pack, yes, but I don't know where she was going. Well, that's that, I guess. I don't know where to turn next. She apparently didn't have any other close friends. I don't even know what she looks like. I've never even seen a picture of her. I was hoping you Well, could... if that'll do you any good, I've got one right here in my sewing basket. One what? A picture. What did you think? She gave it to me about a year ago. But she'd never had many taken, but here it is. Thanks. Real pretty girl, don't you think so? Yeah, she's lovely. Well, at least I'll be able to recognize... When was this taken, Mrs. Gottler? Now, how should I know? 
three or four years ago, I guess, before she came here to the city. This photographer's address, the name of the town, is that where she came from, Brambury, Michigan? Well, yes, that's her hometown, Brambury. I'd forgotten the name of it. And she was just talking about it a week or so ago. She wanted to go home for Christmas, but she said she couldn't see. Mr. Dollar, do you think she might? Maybe. It's the most likely place a scared girl would run to, home. Anyway, it's worth a chance. Mrs. Gottler, <clears throat> I love you. Why, Mr. Dollar... Why, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item six, $88.35. Hotel and incidentals in New York and transportation to Brambury, Michigan. Brambury turned out to be a lumber village, half hidden among the pine-covered hills. It was a little bigger than a wide spot in the road, but not much bigger. A foot of new snow had fallen within the past 24 hours. A fluffy white blanket lay softly on the trees and the housetops and filled the deep hollows in the frozen ground. Men in bright red flannel shirts drove horse-drawn logging sleds through the forest trails, and their shouts sounded sharp and clear, a crystalline tinkle in the icy air. Brambury looked like the place where Christmas was invented. It was beautiful. And very quiet when it came to putting out information. I found it out first when I tried the local telephone operator. I uh, just checked in here at the hotel operator. There doesn't seem to be a phone book, so... People steal them. That's why. Traveling people going through. Oh, uh, souvenir hunters, I suppose. How's that? Uh, Look, I wanted to call the O'Dares. Could you put... not O'Dares. There ain't but one. That's old Mike. Oh, and that's the one I want to call. Would you mind ringing him? Won't do no good. He ain't there. He's slabbing up at number four mill today. Well, actually, it's his daughter I want to talk to. Daughter? Yeah, that's right. Kathleen. Do you know her? Just growed up with her, is all. Oh, well, would you mind... No, I've never met her, Where but... Where are you from? I came here from New York, What's but I... What's your name? Johnny Dollar. Now, would you please ring Kathleen and... She don't and... live here. She lives in New York City. I know where she lives. And what give you the idea she'd be up here? I'm psychic. You're what? Look, where can I get in touch with her? I wouldn't know anything about it, Mr. Dollar, and I can't give out that kind of information. You better go on back to New York and write her a letter. Let me talk to your supervisor. Supervisor? Well... I'm all there is, so I guess that's me. Start talking. Forget it. You're welcome. I got the same kind of runaround from the hotel proprietor. As soon as I mentioned Kathy, he suddenly forgot his own name, age, and the time of day. One thing's sure, this town took care of its own. I wondered if the law in Brambury would take the same attitude. I decided I'd better go find out. As it happened, I didn't have far to go. On the sidewalk in front of the hotel, the law came to me. Just a second there, mister. Hmm? I'd like to have a little talk with you, if you don't mind. All right. Quite a change to find somebody here who wants to talk. I understand you just got in from New York. Here on business? Look, you know why I'm here, but now everybody in town knows. Got any identification on you? Yeah. Have you? My name's Martin. Dan Martin. I'm the deputy sheriff in charge of this part of the county. Oh, then you're just the man I was looking for. Is that so? I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I'm looking for a girl named Kathleen O'Dare. Do you know where she is? What do you want with her? I'm working on a murder case. She's a witness. Is there any kind of a charge against her? No, I just want to talk to her. What makes you think she's here? Are you a friend of hers, Mr. Martin? I've been in love with Kathy since we went to grade school. I'd be willing to die for her. Does that answer your question? All right, let me put it this way. You think you're helping her by hiding her out. All of you think so. But you're wrong. You're helping her right into her grave. Kathy doesn't figure it that way. She's scared. She doesn't know what she thinks. I know these boys who are after her. They don't play kid games. And sooner or later, they're going to find her. So if you love her and if you know where she is, you better take me to her before it's too late. I don't know. I don't know what it is Kathy's mixed up in. I didn't want to ask her. But I know it isn't the police she's afraid of. And I don't think it's you. No, at the time she ran out, I wasn't even in the picture. I'm on her side, too, Mr. Martin, and I've got to see her. Go talk to her father, old Mike. See what he thinks. He's not at home right now. Yeah, I know. He's out at number four mill. How do I get there? The county pickup truck is parked down the block. The tire chains bit into the packed snow and pushed the four miles of logging road behind us. 
It was late afternoon, and the sun had dropped behind the timbered slopes, throwing a pale sheet of cold yellow against the western sky. Here and there, a few scattered lights were coming on, in the windows of the village and the bunkhouses of the lumber camps. Bright white smarks against the darkening shadows. Emptiness, loneliness, and somewhere in it, a frightened girl in hiding. A girl who'd run away from the city of a hundred million lights and from an unsolved murder. Michael Deere was winding up a job working at the big slabbing saw, and I stood by and waited for him to finish. Be right with you, Mr. Dollar. This is the last one. Okay. The last ship it now till after Christmas. Yeah, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, that's all right, Mr. O'Dare. My name is Johnny. Never mind, I know all about you. Dan Martin phoned, said you was on your way out. Mr. Dollar, the answer is no. I see. I've had it over since Dan called. Before I'd have anything happen to Kathy, I'd rather see ten murderers go and hung. Now, look, hiding out won't help. As long as Nick Shearn is free, Kathy's in danger. He can't hurt her if he can't find her. I found her, Mr. O'Dare. Just by luck. There's not one chance in a million of... Sounds like a car. Ooh, the tarnation would drive out here this time of the evening. We walked over to the big doors. The car had stopped about 20 yards away. A man got out and turned toward us. I was standing under the dock light, so he recognized me before I got a good look at him. He jumped back in the car and went for his gun. Benny Stark. Get back, Mr. O'Dare. It was too dark to get a decent shot. I tried once more. And missed, and the car disappeared behind the trees. Mr. Dollar, who was it? Was that one of them? That's right, Mike. They found her. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a lonely vigil in the snow, a killer prowls the night, and a lovely lady vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dan Martin here. I was up the street when you Listen, called. Listen, Sheriff, they've traced Kathy O'Dear here to your nice little town of Brambury. Who has? Nick Shearn's boys. One of them, a trigger man named Benny Stark, came out to the sawmill hill a few minutes ago. I traded a couple of shots with him, but he got away in a car. Did he head north or back toward town? Toward town, I think. You can't see the turnoff from here. All right, Dollar. You're packing a gun. Will you take the pickup truck and block that turnoff? Hold it until I can get somebody out there to relieve you. Right. How many deputies you got? Deputies? Uh-oh. What about volunteers? Is this Benny Stark the man Kathy's afraid of? He's one of them. Then I'll have volunteers. Twenty men within a half hour, armed with deer rifles. And every one of them a dead shot. <laughs> Johnny Dollar. 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Brambury, Michigan, to the home office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Nick Shearn matter. Expense account continued. Item eight, three dollars sixty cents for two packs of cigarettes and a pint of Applejack borrowed from the foreman's locker at the sawmill. I figured these as standard equipment for holding down a roadblock at ten degrees above zero. And Mike O'Dare agreed with me a hundred percent. Well, I'll tell you one thing. They can make it out of corn, rye, barley, make it out of gold if they want to. Uh, but they'll never come up with anything better than what they make out of apples. <laughs> here, here, have a short one, Johnny. No, no, thanks. I'll save it for later. Well, I'll just, uh... <sighs> It's got the taste of Indian summer in it. You ought to see this country around that time of year, Johnny. Breaks your heart, it's so beautiful. Well, it's beautiful now with the snow on. And it would be more so if there wasn't a killer running loose in it. Johnny, I want to ask you something about my daughter. And I want you to answer me honest. All right. It's no use trying to fool you. She's here all right. I know. But she hasn't told me what it was that happened in New York. What she ran away from. It. Somehow I figured it was just as well not to ask her. Your sheriff, Dan Martin, said practically the same thing. Dan's been in love with Kathy since he was 12 years old. He's a good man. Solid. So I figured. Anyway, she was scared. Scared half to death. And she'd come home for help, so we tried to help her. What was it you wanted to ask me, Mr. O'Dare? You mentioned a murder case, Johnny. You didn't give any of the details, just said that Kathy was a witness. Is, is she mixed up in this murder? And you wanted an honest answer. All right, I'm not sure. I see. That's why I wanted to talk to her, get her story, the truth. I realized from the start she might be guilty. I don't think so, but it's a possibility. You may as well know about it. I guess you realize it wouldn't make any difference. Not to me or to Dan. Oh, yeah, I figured. In other words, you're with me as long as I'm trying to protect her. But you'll fight me if I find reason to think she's guilty. That's about it, Johnny. Well, at least we know where we stand. And I hope it won't come to... What's the matter? Car coming. Light on the trees there at the bend. Yeah. You suppose maybe... Probably not, but you can't tell. Better get behind the truck just in case. You'll have to shift into low to edge past us. Let me get that spotlight on. I, I guess I'll just have another quick one. <sighs> that wind cuts right through your bones. It's a dark-colored sedan. It might be him. Funny. I'd been hoping for two months that Kathy'd come home for Christmas. And I didn't figure I'd be out here in the woods, hiding behind a truck, waiting to shoot it out with somebody that wanted to kill it. It's a crazy world. Keep your head down, Mr. O'Dear. Yeah. Just the driver by himself, wearing a dark hat. I don't know. You know, that kind of looks like... Huh? Why, Curly, it is. What? That's Ted Perkins' old wreck. No doubt about it. When did... All right, you better wave him out past. He probably thinks we need help. Okay. Uh, it's all right, Ted. It's Michael there. Go ahead, go ahead. We don't need anything. Yeah, uh, we're all right. Thanks anyway. Well, there's one thing about people around here. They mind their own business and don't ask no questions. And they don't answer them often either. How's that Applejack holding out? Two long hours went past. Only three cars came out from the village. And each time a long moment of tension while we waited to identify the occupants. But all of them were townspeople. Benny didn't show. One truck came down the logging road from the back hills loaded with dwarf spruce and fir. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. We were waiting for an assassin, but the truck only carried Christmas trees. The night was crystal clear with bright stars hanging low on the blackness, but it kept turning colder and colder. And to leave on the Applejack didn't help much. And the wind, too, changed gradually and blew fitful and gusty and strange. Eh, it's going to storm come a blizzard, maybe. Not tonight. Tomorrow sometime, or tomorrow night. I know this country. I know the signs. Uh, there's an odd feeling in the air, all right. There's an even odder one in my leg. 
Log rolled over on it pretty near six years ago. Bothers me some in the winter. Till that horse, though, right before the storm. Well, that's kind of a handy thing to have. Well, that's one way of looking at it, I guess. Like one time when Kathy was little. When her ma was still alive. God rest her soul. We had a big measles epidemic here in Brambury, and every night Kathy used to add a line to her prayers. She'd say, And please let me catch the measles so I can stay out of school like the other kids. <laughs> now she's wanted as a witness in a murder case. And somebody's prowling out there in the dark, trying to find her and kill her. Little Kathy, who never harmed anybody in her whole life. Some things just don't make sense, Johnny. Some things never have. There was another time once when men like Benny were prowling in the dark, trying to find a little child and kill him. And he hadn't harmed anybody either. That was nearly 2,000 years ago. Yeah, so it was. I like you, Johnny. Kathy will like you, too, and little Jill. Oh, oh, there's a pair for you. That kid looks more like a mother did at her age. Another car coming, Mr. O'Dare. Yeah, so there is. And this just might be the one. Maybe. I sure wish that Applejack hadn't run out. But it was only a couple of men Deputy Martin had sent out from town to relieve us and take over. Big men, calm and quiet, wearing plaid Mackinaws and heavy lace boots and carrying Winchester 94s over their arms. They told us Benny Stark had been seen. He'd come up from the west, driven onto one of the roadblocks unexpectedly. In a flurry of shots, he'd broken through. The men couldn't understand his persistence. They thought he'd run for it, get out of the area once his presence was known. I didn't bother to explain, to put him straight, but I knew Benny had never run, not now. He was a trigger man, a professional killer with a reputation at stake. And he had his orders to silence Kathy O'Dare. A half hour later, we were back in town, turning into the main street around the village square. Strings of colored lights and a tall pine in the center of the square blinked and sparkled as they swayed in the wind. Around a hundred cars and trucks were parked in the street and in the lot behind the town hall. And the sound of singing drifted out from inside. They're practicing carols and things for the big doings on Christmas Eve. Ain't it beautiful? The men at the roadblock had given a description of Benny's car and the license number. It was just barely possible. Got something in mind, Johnny? Yeah, let's take a look through those parked cars. I don't know. If it was me, I sure wouldn't be hanging around here. I'd stick to the tall timber. Yeah, but you're not a city boy, Mike. Tall timber is foreign soil to Benny. He's only comfortable when he's close to a crowd. He the fellow that's supposed to have done that murder? No, it was the man he works for, a cafe owner, ex-gangster, a man named Nick Shern. Let's check that lot around at the side. I don't think he'd show here in front. He'd be taking a big chance showing anywhere. In a town this size, people know each other. It's his job to take chances. And he probably doesn't realize... Wait a minute... That sedan against the building with the side window broken. Seven, eight, two, one. That's his car, Johnny. Yeah, wait here. I eased my gun out of the holster and started toward the car. There were no lights in the lot, only the soft glow reflected from the packed snow underfoot. And the car itself stood in the dark shadows next to the building. I couldn't see whether anyone was in it or not. The singing seemed to swell louder as I approached. I moved slowly, watching for any sudden movement. The car was empty. It was time, past time, to talk to Kathy O'Dare. And with the pressure tightening the danger close to home now, her father was ready to take me to her. We drove over to Dan Martin's house where it turned out Kathy and her daughter were staying. Dan's mother had been looking after her. Dan was there when we arrived, busy on the phone. Yeah, I know the car all right. The one Jed bought last spring down in Bay City. Seven... Three, nine, two. Uh, where was it parked? All right, keep an eye out, Charlie. So long. Benny Stark has stolen himself another car. Huh? Took Jed Wharton's station wagon. Well, what for? That was a better one he had. Charlie says the steering gear was sprung. I guess it happened when he crashed that roadblock. But how's Kathy and the young'un? Oh, fine. They're asleep upstairs. Uh, Mom's next door helping Mrs. Barton stuff a turkey. Johnny, you're... Uh... 
You figure it could wait till morning. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Dare. I've got to talk to her tonight. All right. I'll go wake her up. Mr. Dollar, no matter what she's done, don't hurt her any more than you have to. As far as I know at the moment, Dan, all she's guilty of is withholding information. And most people would have done the same thing. Nick Shearn's a rough boy to tangle with. She was scared, that's all. Lost her head. She never did belong in a city. She belongs right here in Brambury. This is her kind of life. Why did she leave? Well, we argued one day. And she said she'd show me. So she ran off and married that fellow. He treated her bad. Finally, he left her. But she was too proud to come back. She wouldn't have come back now if she hadn't have been so scared. Well, maybe it'll work out now. She ought to stay. Her kid ought to grow up here. Learn the outdoors and the woods like Kathy used to know it. Why, she roamed through those hills like a young Indian. Knew every trail in that forest. Every timber camp and trapper's cabin from here to the ridge. I remember one time the two of us were up toward... <clears throat> What's the matter? What is it, Mr. O'Dare? You said... You said Jill and Kathy were asleep upstairs. Ain't that what you said, Dan? Of course that's what I... Mike. What's happened? They're not up here. They're not up there anywhere else in the house. They're gone. be another intriguing episode in our story of the next Shern matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a little girl who believes in Santa Claus, a big girl who believes in very little, and both of them facing death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mike O'Dare, Johnny. Any sign of Kathy? No, the boys at the highway turnoff haven't seen her or Benny, either one. Not a soul out that way in the last hour. What about there at the sawmill? Nothing, Mike. No fresh tracks on the logging road, no sign of her. And the worst thing is, it's starting to snow again. Yeah, here in town, too. Dan Martin just phoned. No luck. She hasn't shown up at any of the roadblocks. She's... She's around somewhere, and we've got to find her. We will, Mike. And it's got to be fast, Johnny. There's a blizzard coming up, and that gunman Benny Stark is around, too. Maybe he's already found her. Maybe he even took her from the house, her and Jill both. Maybe she didn't get scared and run. Maybe it was him. Maybe he's... Mike, stop it. That kind of thing It's not going to help any. What is going to help? I don't know, but I've got a half-baked idea, and I may be right. Stay there at the house. I'm coming back to pick you up. And one thing you can do while you're waiting... What, Johnny? Pray. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Brambury, Michigan, to the home office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Nick Shern matter. Or more important, find Kathy O'Dare. Item 12 on expense account, $4.90. A tank full of gas for the county pickup I'd borrowed from Deputy Sheriff Dan Martin. The falling snow was thickening now, and the wind was rising and steadying in the northwest. The night had all the makings of a blizzard. And wherever Kathy and her daughter had gone, we had to find them before it hit. It was 10.14 p.m. when I pulled up at the side porch of the Adair house. And Kathy's father came hurrying out to the truck, leaving the door open behind him and buttoning his heavy mackinaw as he ran. Any news, Mike? Not a thing. All right, get in. Shut the door. Yeah, we'll get a foot of snow before morning with a zero wind behind it. Now listen, Mike. I think we can forget any idea that Benny found her and got her out of the house. In that case, she wouldn't have taken your car. He's already got one. I know. I thought of that. And he wouldn't have given her time to dress herself in jail the way she did with heavy clothes and snow boots. And she wouldn't have taken the rifle. Then what has happened? She knew I'd be there to talk to her sometime this evening. I think she lost her nerve, couldn't face it, decided to run again. Maybe so, but where, Johnny? That's what I want you to tell me. What? No, I don't mean you knew what she was going to do and where she was going to go or... Then help how to... do you think I can tell you? Look... Kathy knew about the roadblocks Dan Martin set up to trap Benny Stark, knew where they were. So if she didn't want to be seen, then naturally she'd avoid them. She couldn't, not if she wanted to get away, take the highway to Flint or Detroit. She'd have to pass one of them at least. But she hasn't passed any of them, so she's still in this area. And I don't think she ever meant to leave it. But then... Dan the... Martin said Kathy used to spend a lot of time in the woods when she was growing up. He said she knew every back trail in these hills, logging camps, trappers' cabins. She did. She used to worry that Dickens out of me the way she... Yeah. Now, where would she go, Mike, if she wanted to hide out back in the hills somewhere? There's a lot of places. Chippewa Canyon's one. Three or four timber camps abandoned in the winter. Some cabins along the... No, no, she couldn't make it. There's a roadblock before you get to the turn out there. It's got to be some place she could reach without being seen. Well, there's... There's Barker's Flats. Oh, but that's 12 miles by foot trail. She wouldn't try it in this weather, not... Not with Jill along, anyway. Then there's... Lake Pine. No, it's over the other way. Pine Lake Road. Where's that? Runs northwest of town. Not much better than a wagon road. Dan didn't put a block on it because it dead ends at the lake about five miles out. What's out there? Nothing at the lake. But you can go on up Pine Creek about four miles on foot, and there's some cabins. Maybe a waste of time, Johnny. Let's get going. Expense account, item 13, $6.90. One dry cell electric lantern, an extra pair of batteries picked up at the Brambury Hardware Company on the way through town. The falling snow, driven by a bitter cold wind, formed a dense curtain in front of our headlights. And from the turnoff all the way up the narrow twisting road to Pine Lake, I had to keep the truck in second gear. There were car tracks in the road, all right, several of them. But they were covered now by the new blanket of snow. And it was impossible to tell whether they'd been made earlier tonight or a week ago. The road ends a couple of yards past this next turn. And we'll soon know. There's four or five side turnoffs. Clearance where, where you can park. We'll have to check all of them, I guess. All right. That draw there on the right. That break there in the trees. That's that's where the Pine Creek Trail starts. Well, we'll swing in it. Mike, I guess we won't have to check those turnoffs. Huh? Is that your car over there under the trees? Yeah. That's it. I left Mike waiting in the cab while I went over to look inside the car. It was empty, abandoned. And there was no note, no clue of any kind to tell where Kathy had gone. I raised the hood and felt the motor block, ice cold. The car had been here for some time. I flashed the lantern on the ground and followed the faint tracks made by two pairs of snow boots. They entered the deep draw that led back into the hills, the start of the Pine Creek Trail. I snapped off the lantern and stumbled through the snow back to the truck. What'd you find, Johnny? It's them, all right. They've headed up the trail. I found tracks in the snow. Yeah, then we'd better get started. No, no, wait. I'll go after them, Mike. You take the truck. Go into town. Find Dan Martin. Bring help as fast as you can. That storm's getting worse. No, you don't. I know the risk. Starting up that trail with a blizzard coming on. And if you think you're going to protect me by sending... Knock it off, Mike. There's no time. And you're wrong. I'm not protecting you. I'm protecting myself. What do you mean? That bum leg of yours. I don't want you on my hands, too, along with the girls. All right, Johnny. I'll go after Dan. And hurry, Mike. I'm depending on you. Yeah. Good luck, Johnny. See you, Mike. (laughs) 
I stood there in the snow watching the headlights of the truck move away. Finally, they swung around the bend and disappeared. And I suddenly felt more alone than I ever had in my life. I'd gotten rid of Mike deliberately, sent him away on purpose, because I hadn't told him everything. I could see no point in tearing his heart out. There was another car parked on beyond Kathy's, nearly hidden by the trees. Jed Horton's station wagon. The car that had been stolen by a killer named Benny Stark. It took me half an hour to cover the first mile, and the storm kept getting worse. The beam of the lantern penetrated a bare 30 feet ahead of me before it was smothered out in the white blackness of the night. After a few hundred yards, the tracks I was trying to follow had nearly disappeared, snowballed over and blotted out. I gave up looking for them and stuck to old Mike's description of the trail, following the left bank of the frozen creek. The drifts were deeper down along the creek bottoms, and the going was rougher. But I didn't dare leave it to look for better footing. It was my only landmark. The trail itself was buried. Any man who lost his way tonight and wandered off into one of those side gullies would wander straight to his death. An hour passed. Then an hour and a half, or two hours, maybe. I lost all track of time and distance. The wind cut through my clothes, and the numbing cold crept into me deeper and deeper. Gradually, the walking, stumbling, breathing, even thinking became automatic and without feeling. The world itself seemed to narrow down to a tiny circle close around me. And all beyond was chaos, blackness, and roaring storm. I tripped over fallen logs and floundered back to my feet. Dropped my lantern and recovered it. Broke through the crusted drifts and struggled for footing and kept on moving. In the weird nightmare of the blizzard, I could hardly recognize reality when I came face to face with it. When a beam from my lantern touched him, crouching by a tree a few yards away, I could barely accept him as being real. He'd been watching my light as I approached, waiting for me. It was Benny Stark with his gun leveled and aimed. Don't be a fool, Benny. Drop that gun. A curtain of snow swept between us then, blotting out the sight of him. I was grateful. I turned and stumbled on into the storm, moving in pitch darkness now, except for the ghostly glow from the snow-covered ground. The second shot had smashed my lantern. I had nothing left to go by but instinct and luck, and they weren't enough. Within 15 minutes, I was hopelessly lost. That's when I started hearing the music. Miles from no place where there couldn't be any music, except inside my head. The cold and fatigue were finally doing their work. I knew the signs. The next step was to start wandering in circles, smaller and smaller ones, and the last step, to drop exhausted and go peacefully to sleep. Peacefully and permanently. But the sound kept growing louder, and I moved in the direction it seemed to be coming from. It couldn't be just illusions. It had to be real. Hello! Hello there! Then suddenly, only a few yards away, a brilliant blaze of light exploded from the darkness. And it seemed that a golden-haired girl was standing in the middle of it. And for a moment, my sanity tottered. Who's out there? My golden vision was wearing blue jeans and a flannel shirt and was holding a rifle. She looked exactly like the photograph I'd seen of Kathy O'Dare. And the blaze of light came from an open cabin door. Who is it? Speak up or I'll shoot. Oh, thank heaven. Hold it, Miss Dare. It's Johnny Dollar. Are you getting warm now? I don't think I'll ever get warm again. You will if you don't move away from the stove a little. The back of your shirt is starting to smoke. Yeah, I I thought I was beginning to feel something. How's the firewood? There's plenty. And plenty of food. And a radio. If I hadn't heard that music, I'd have blundered right on past this cabin. We've got everything. We can hold out for a month if we have to. I hope we have to. What about your daughter? Is she all right? Sure. She's fine. The picnic for her... A camping trip. She's sound asleep back there in the lean-to. Dreaming about Santa Claus, I suppose. Wish I could. 
How did you find me, Mr. Dollar? Oh, hunch. Guesswork. I was born under a lucky star. I wasn't. Oh, I don't know. I think you've been pretty lucky, considering everything. More so than your landlady back in New York. Mrs. Grappler? What do you mean? Betty Stark went to see her. Tried to find out where you were. When she wouldn't tell him, he broke her arm. Oh, no. Oh, the poor woman. Oh, it's a rough game, Miss O'Dear. Trying to play it cozy with a mobster like Nick Shearn. You know, of course, that he sent Benny here to find you. He'll have a hard time finding me in this place. He did find you. What? Maybe he followed you from the house or saw you drive through town. Anyway, I ran into him back down the trailerways. I thought I heard shooting a while ago. You did. He tried to ambush me. He thought he had the drop and he wouldn't give up. I had to kill him. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the showdown. Victory, and then disaster. When a visitor to the little town of Brambury turns out to be death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? Spell it. J-O-H-N-N-Y D-O-L-L-A-R That's not right. You forgot to capitalize. Hey, you're right, honey. Let me hear you spell your name. Okay. Capital J-I-L-L Jill Capital O Apostrophe Apostrophe. I never can say that. Capital D A R E. Oh, dare. Of course, my last name's actually something else. I forget. But my mother says I'm really an O'Dare. Not the least doubt about it. I can see it in a minute. I like you, Johnny Dollar. And I kind of like you, too, Jill O'Dare. You think my mother's pretty? I think she's lovely. Then why don't you get married to her so I can have a daddy? Well, that's, um, well, it's certainly something to think about. And, uh, not a bad idea. Now, I'll uh, be quiet before you wake her up. I'm already awake. And with a plot like that being hatched, I think I'd better stay awake. Is there coffee, Johnny? <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location, a small cabin in the timber outside Brambury, Michigan, to the Home Office Tri-Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment... The Nick Shearn matter. Expense account, final page. Item 15, $1 million for a certain feeling. 
I realize, of course, that the amount of this item is somewhat unusual. It may be cause for mild criticism by your accounting department, unless the accompanying report includes an adequate and detailed explanation. Therefore, to avoid unnecessary correspondence and delay, I am attaching said explanation herewith. Here's your coffee, Kathy. Thanks. How long did I sleep, Johnny? Oh, a couple of hours. It's around four in the morning. The storm hasn't let up at all, has it? Oh, it's worse, if anything. Jill, honey, it's four o'clock in the morning and your eyes are just about to fall out. Now you go back there and go to sleep. Do I have to, Mommy? You have to. Run along now. Mr. Johnny Dollar and me were having a lot of fun till you woke up. <laughs> well, that's life, sweetie. Night now. Good night, Jill. Good night. Proud of her? I'm crazy about her. That's what you mean. She's a great little girl. She's the only thing I ever did in my whole life that turned out right. That bad, huh? Johnny, it's no good. I know why you're here. I know what you expect from me, and the answer's no. You're jumping the gun. I haven't asked you anything. You will. You haven't done all this for nothing. You're going to ask me to come back to New York and testify against Nick Shearn. I might ask you to tell the truth. Is that just another way of wording it? I didn't see anything, hear anything. I don't know anything about it, and I have nothing to say. So Nick Shearn gets away with another murder. I wouldn't know anything about that. And sooner or later, of course, he'll kill you, too. He sent Benny Stark out to do it, and Benny missed. But he's got other boys, or he might even handle the job himself. Why? By now he ought to know that I'm not going to tell. But there's always that chance you might change your mind. And Nick's a gambler, but he likes the odds on his side. He doesn't take chances. Whenever he can, he stacks the deck. I wish I could help you, Johnny. But I don't know anything about it. I left before it happened. How long have you worked for Nick Shearn? Known him? Two years. I'm not wide-eyed about him, Johnny. I've heard what he's been, what he may even still be, a gangster, hoodlum, racketeer, but that's none of my business. The club was, was legitimate, my job there was on the level, and he never got out of line once. And no doubt he's always been kind to his mother and loves dogs and children. I wouldn't know. Except children. He's crazy about them. He was always buying something for Jill, asking about her. And he also shot and killed Mel Pryker. I couldn't say. I see. Well, you're letting a lot of people down. People here in Bramberry that you grew up with, people that love you, your father, Dan Martin. What have they got to do with it? You know, it's a great country up here. I'd like to spend more time in it. And it's big country, big and beautiful and dangerous. Like that blizzard outside there. It's not the kind of country that turns out cowards. Cowards? Your father said something yesterday. That some people belong in cities and some don't. And that you're one of the second kind. He was right. The city's made a coward of you. You don't understand. And they know it. Old Mike, Dan, all of them. Of course, they'll never mention it. But you're letting them down and they know it. And you know it, Kathy. They don't have a daughter to think of. It's not her fear we're talking about. It's yours. All right, I'm scared. I've got reason to be. It's easy for you to talk. You don't know what fear is, what it can do to you. I don't. It can push you and drive you and make you do things you hate yourself for. And it can destroy you. How would you know? How would any of them know? Who haven't felt it, who haven't been there. Kathy, you're not alone. We've all been there. It's not the fear that's important. It's the courage you bring up to fight it. I've tried. I've... I've nearly gotten crazy trying to think it out. But it always comes back to one thing. Jill. She's what counts. Nothing else matters. And if you love her, teach her to grow up without fear. Sacrifice anything if you have to, even your life. But teach her courage. There's nothing greater you could do for her. <laughs> it's all right, Jill. It's all right. It's all right. I knew what was right, Johnny. I knew all the time. Sure, sure. Of course you did. All you needed was a little push. Want to tell me about it now? I... I was there at the club that night. When it happened, I stayed after closing. I had some presents for Jill, and I wanted to wrap them before I took them home. Nick and Mel Pryker were upstairs in the office. Nick was there? Yes. I could hear them arguing. They didn't know I'd stayed, and then... Go on. I heard Mel yell out. He said... No, Nick, no. And then I heard the shot. Yes? I didn't even think. I ran up to the office. Mel was lying on the floor, and Nick was standing there with a gun. 
He told me to get out and to keep quiet. If I wanted to keep on living. That's it, huh? Yes. Would you make a statement to the police, testify at the trial? Yes. Oh, good. Will you help me, Johnny? Will you stand by me? You know I will. You've got to, because I'm scared. I'll be scared all the way, but I'll do it if you'll help me. I'll help you, Kathy, all the way. Why don't you curl up here and get some sleep? Come on. Maybe now I can sleep. It's going to be all right. Thanks, Johnny, for giving me the push. Oh, sure, honey. You know something, Johnny? I'm with Jill. I like you, too. She went to sleep with her face against my chest. And after a while, little Jill came tiptoeing in and curled up on the other side. And I sat there holding them both, thinking and waiting for the dawn. So that's what I mean about a million-dollar feeling. True, it wasn't my little girl, or my big girl either. But for the moment at least, well, that item still goes. I'll still tag that feeling at one million dollars. And I was sorry when the storm was over and a rescue party came out from town. Because I felt I'd had one moment in a lifetime that I'd never find again. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen when the snow lay round the The big event of the year in Brambury was the Christmas Eve show in the town hall. There was music and a pageant and singing and everybody took part in it. From the youngest kid in town to the toughest old grizzled lumberjack from the back hills. Jill was in the children's chorus, and old Mike was to operate the spotlight, so they went on ahead. I took Kathy. And since she wasn't quite ready to face people yet, we made a point of getting there late. I didn't care when we got there, as long as I was with her. We slipped in quietly and took seats at the back of the room. The string group from the high school orchestra was playing, and no one noticed us. Not even old Mike, Kathy's father, who was working the spotlights. I hope Jill does all right. She hasn't had any time to practice with us. Oh, she'll do all right. We'd been there about ten minutes when somebody else came in and slid into the one seat between us and the door. I didn't look around until I felt Kathy stiffen beside me. Oh, no. It was Nick Shearn. Nobody gets excited now or makes any sudden moves. We just sit here quiet like. He slid his hand over to feel inside my coat under my arm. Now packing around, huh? Perfect. I'd left my gun at Kathy's house. Old Mike had been dubious about it, but with Benny dead, I'd seen no reason to carry it. And after all, it was Christmas Eve. All right, now we're going to ease out of here now without attracting no attention from anybody. You're crazy, Nick. You're crazy. Shut up. And just don't forget one thing, now. I'm not holding this gun on you. He's aimed right at the middle of Kathy's back. Let's go. Johnny. No choice, Kathy. Come on. The back of the room was dark. Nobody paid any attention. Somebody was always leaving or coming back in. Come on. I got a car over at the side. Johnny. Watch it, dollar. We'll be right back, Mike. Just gonna get some air. All right, Johnny. But don't go running out before I give you your present. Huh? Here. And don't uncork that until you're ready for some serious business. All right, I'll... I'll... Re- Thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot. Don't mention it. Good luck, Johnny. Yeah, come on, let's get away from here. Johnny, he's going Take to... it easy, Kathy. It's for me! Oh, what? Oh, no. Jill, go back! I want to see Uncle Nick. Why did you tell me you were coming here to hear me sing, Uncle Nick? Well, uh... uh listen, Pick me Jill... up. Please, Uncle Nick. Take your hands out of your pocket and pick me up. Uh, look, Jill, you run along now. Who's that? Dan Martin. He's a deputy sheriff, and he's a dead shot. Better do like she says, Nick. Take your hand out of your pocket and pick her up. Uncle Nick? All right, reach in my pocket, Johnny, and take my gun. Later, Kathy and I walked around outside. We could still hear the children's chorus singing inside. Jill saved our lives tonight. No, she saved Nick's life. What do you mean? That present your father gave me. Up there at the spotlights, he could see what was happening, and he thought real fast. 
That present was a gun. Then you... I had Nick covered from the time we stepped off the porch. I'm glad he didn't move. I'm glad it happened like it did. Yeah, so am I. I thought we'd never see those stars up there again. You kept hold of yourself, Kathy. You showed a lot of courage. No. But maybe I can learn to show it. I was just thinking, Johnny, looking at the stars up there. There was fear in the world then. Two thousand years ago. And he had courage. Expense account item 16, $230.40. Incidentals in Brambury and transportation for two adults and one child. Brambury to New York. Expense account total, $486.20. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of you. From all of us here on the program. And God bless you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Peggy Weber, Don Diamond, Ben Wright, Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, Sam Edwards, and Ken Christie. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Pauline Morris at Victor Turner's office, Continental Adjustment Bureau. Oh, hi, Pauline. How are you? Just fine, thank you. Uh, Johnny, Mr. Turner asked me to get in touch with you and find out what you're working on at the moment. Why, nothing. I was thinking of going to New York for a couple of days. Well, good. Would you be interested in handling a case for us while you're there? Oh, Pauline, I'm going to New York on a vacation. Well, this shouldn't take too much time, and... Johnny, it's really one of our most important accounts. Well, how much commission can I figure on? Do you want the truth? Sure. Practically none. Oh, fine. Why does Turner foist these things on me? Oh, I guess it's my fault. I told him I thought you might do it as a favor to us. For Mr. Turner or Continental Adjustment Bureau? No. For you? Okay, what is it? Well, Wait, uh... better still, why don't you tell me about it over dinner? Say, at the Crystal Room? Oh, I'd love that. I've been wanting to go there for months. Hey, you know something? I've been waiting for an excuse to take you there for years. Eight o'clock, Pauline? Eight o'clock. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. It started quite pleasantly. Oh, no, Johnny, let's go back to the table and eat. I'm tired of dancing. Yeah, but once you sit down, you'll start talking business again. Well, of course. I will. I do have a job to keep. Okay, okay. Frustrating girl. <laughs> Besides, the sooner you clear up this case, the longer you'll have for a vacation in New York. I said okay. There you are, sit down. Thank you. 
All right, Miss Morris. Let's have the bad news. Well, the insurance company is Delaware Eastern Liability, New York office. Yes, ma'am. Their client who filed the complaint is a large dress manufacturing company. Uh, Century Styles Incorporated. Yes, ma'am. Oh, and if you can manage to pick up one of their latest creations in my size while you're there, I love you forever. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's dance. No, no, wait. The auditors found a deficit in their books, $4,285. Well, naturally, the head of the company wants a settlement. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's... And, Johnny, your biggest problem will be Mr. Elliot. Mr. Robert Elliot, who I understand is something of a personality problem. He can't be any more of a problem than I'm having with you. Now... Let's dance. Expense account item two, $28.63. Train fare and incidentals getting from Hartford to Manhattan. With me, I took all the necessary information concerning the indemnity claim of Century Styles with Delaware Eastern Liability and Trust. I arrived at Grand Central at 2.05 and was checked in at the New Western by 2.30. Air brisk, sky clear, weather cold. Expense account item three, 10 cents, phone call. To Robert P. Elliott, Century Styles Incorporated. Mr. Elliott said he would be happy to see me, so I went right over and found a four-story building that housed two floors of factory and two floors of offices. The factory was the usual crowded, noisy collection of machinery and people. The general offices, overstuffed and overheated and overcrowded. Girls, girls, you must get ready. Come on, girls. Now, everybody... Look at this sand hill. Jenny, you'll just have to reduce. How can we fit you when the pins keep popping out? Uh, pardon me. Uh, I'm looking for Mr. Elliott. You are? True. Oh, I'm Robert Elliott. Oh, you must be Mr. Dollar. That's right. Stand by, Jenny Sweet. Please, these pins. We all suffer for our art child. Now, bear up. I'll deliver you soon. This way, Mr. Dollar, to a quiet corner. Mr. Elliott was small and wiry, wearing white warachis, green slacks, a corduroy jacket, and a flower print shirt of no identifiable color. As I followed him across the large and elegant showroom floor, I couldn't help stealing glances at the merchandise, animate and inanimate. Everything I saw was strictly high class, a group of goddesses. Mr. Elliot led me through a pair of swinging doors into an office with a carpet so thick I couldn't see my shoe tops. A desk in Russian gray sprawled in one corner. My office, Mr. Dollar. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how grateful I am that you're here, that the insurance company heeded my call. Well, I hope we can help you straighten this matter out. Well, it's scandalous. It's truly scandalous. $5,000. Really? Uh, the complaint said 4285 Mr. Elliot. Yeah, well, that's almost 5000 Besides, I like to deal in round figures. Brett Narnby to my auditors, and they said that you are the a very important investigator in insurance circles. Well, I'm flattered. Did they happen to leave a copy of their findings? Yes, they did. They most certainly did. But before I give it to you, I must explain how awful this situation is. Now, please do. Well, you've no doubt heard of Patricia's things. No, uh, no, I don't think... Uh... Uh, Patsy's things? Why, of co- Oh, you're just joking. I am Patsy's things. In fact, I made Patsy's things. It's our highest price line, you know, evening dresses. Oh, you don't say. I definitely do. Oh, the nights of thankless work that go into creating just one gown. One supreme gown for the season. Oh, I'm sure. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar, it's... Well, it's a thankless task in one respect. But that's a different story. What I'm trying to say is that this loss is devastating me. I mean it. I must. I simply must have an adjustment immediately. Well, the insurance company sympathizes with you, Mr. Elliott. We'll try to adjudicate it as quickly as possible. Oh, that's comforting. That's very comforting. Rob Elliott here. In my opinion, hats are just not important this year. Yes? No, 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 no. Positively no. No advance layouts on the new line. Not until later. No, not tomorrow. No, I can't. I simply cannot. Oh. Anything wrong? Well, that's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to explain. This matter simply must be handled with all dispatch, Mr. Dollar. You see, my firm operates on a... On a... Shoestring? Well, <laughs> spider's hair would be more apt. $5,000. Mr. Dollar, that comparatively small loss is stopping me from showing my new line of Patsy's... evening dresses. Yes, yes. I must show them before months end or I'll lose my entire opportunity for profit. So, you see, I must have compensation for the loss. I think I get the picture, Mr. Elliot. Now, there. That, 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 that was the newspaper calling, and it's terrible. They all want advanced viewings of my new line, and I simply can't afford to. I, I can't afford to pay my help to produce the models. Mr. Dollar, for three agonizing months I worked. Frantically, I drew, I cut, I stitched. And not one warp over for my creation will be exhibited, can be exhibited, unless this matter is settled. Then suppose we get down to business. 
Well, the business is that some ruthless brigand pussyfooted off with my company's money. Well, do you have any idea? I don't. I don't have... No, no, no. Not so much as a footprint or a strand of hair. And, Mr. Dollar, if you don't find out who it was and return my money, I'll be cremated. Professionally cremated, that is. Why, I might even have to join the Foreign Legion. Well, don't worry, Mr. Elliott. If your loss is verified, and apparently a reputable auditing firm has already done that... I can assure you that the insurance company will reimburse that loss in the time it takes to get a check made out and in the mail. Oh, good. I'll be forever grateful. Well, while you're in this mood, would you mind me having a little closer rundown on what happened? Well, the auditors simply uncovered a shortage, that's all. I know that much, Mr. Elliott. May I see their report? Yes, of course. There. Isn't that binder an atrocious green? <laughs> well, if you say so. I'd like to keep this, Mr. Elliott, to verify my report. Of course, Mr. Dollar, anything, anything at all. Just save me. I left Mr. Elliott in a fainting condition, went back to my hotel and studied the auditor's report. The obvious conclusion after an hour's reading was that the funds had been embezzled by someone in the bookkeeping department. A series of crude erasures and bad fumblings indicated that whoever had done it had been something less than expert. In fact, he or she had been almost idiotic. The next morning, I confirmed my own findings with Mr. Brett at the auditor's office. We uncovered the loss two days ago and advised Mr. Elliott to contact his insurance company first. Sure. Dollar, any reservations on your part? No, no. Elliott's got a legitimate loss here. I'm sending in my report today. He should be compensated in another two days. And he'll be relieved to know about that. <laughs> I know. I met him. Well, what's your next step? Well, we'll pay off Elliott so he won't have heart failure. But, of course, we'll try to make recovery. I noticed the losses were in book series F6 through G10. Yes. Did you talk to personnel over there at his place? Mm Mm-hmm. A fellow by the name of Forbes handled that series for them. Uh Uh-huh. And the accounting office, of course. Oh, yes. Been with Sensory Styles for five years. Where is he now? He's still there. Huh? Mm Mm-hmm. I thought it was kind of funny, too. A fellow pulling a crude job like this and not trying to run out. No, he's still working for them. Hmm. Maybe he isn't the one at that. Forbes was in charge of those books. I don't see how it could possibly be anyone else. No, neither do I, Mr. Brett. May I use your phone? Oh, sure. Help yourself. I noticed all the money was stolen in the last four weeks. Yes. You'd think you'd at least have strung it out. Greedy, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Hello. District Attorney's office, please. My name's Dollar. I want to talk to someone about a warrant. Embezzling funds, grand theft. Oh, hold it, please. Forbes. What's his full name? Uh, Sheldon Thomas Forbes. Thanks. Sheldon Thomas Forbes, bookkeeper at Century Styles Incorporated. Hmm? Good. I'm on my way. Expense account item four. Three dollars. Cab fare to the offices of John L. Gregory, deputy district attorney. I explained the situation to Mr. Gregory and furnished him with the auditor's report. An hour later, I was back at Century Styles with our friend, Mr. Elliott. Well, if it has to be, it has to be. There he is. Forbes? Hmm. Third desk. Sheldon Thomas Forbes was a tall, dark-complexioned man in his early 30s. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features regular, not good, not bad. The kind of man you see every day on the street. Somehow, the kind of man I hadn't expected would swipe $5,000. Oh, Mr. Forbes? Yes? This gentleman would like to see you. I feel like Brutus. Why don't you run along, Mr. Elliott? I'll handle it from here. Oh, thank you. Hello? Sheldon Forbes? Yes. My name's Dollar, Continental Adjustment Bureau. We represent Delaware Mutual Liability. They cover this firm for losses by theft and fire. Uh Uh-huh. Two days ago, the auditing firm of Brett and Iron Beach located a loss of almost $5,000 here. Naturally, the matter came to our attention. I'd like to talk to you about it. Why me? There's every indication that the loss has occurred in the particular accounts you've been handling. Uh Uh-huh. You do handle books F6 through G10? Yes. Will you step over here a minute, please? Sure. Would you look at this, please? Your figures? Yes. Your handwriting? Uh Uh-huh. Your entries and your initials? Yes. Yes. Well, what do you have to say? Nothing. Look, you know why I'm talking to you, why I came to you first. Yes. Still nothing to say? Nothing. Well, aren't you being a little silly? Why? I stole the money. You've proved it. 
What am I supposed to say? You admit it. How can I deny it? Okay, we've got that much covered. Well, look, my company's interested in recovery of $4,285. Do you understand? I think so. Oh, now, Forbes, come to your senses. What do you want to do? Go to jail, or do you want to give the money back? (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Oh, no, I don't think it's funny. I doubt if you will. I've got 16 cents in my pocket. Will that help? Where's the money? I haven't got it, Mr. Dollar. You'll have to take me to jail. Shall we go? Okay. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Forbes Matter tomorrow. What makes a man steal? Everybody's tried to answer that question at one time or another. Tomorrow I'll take a crack at it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Rob Elliott here, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Century style? I know, Mr. Elliott. How are you today? Terrible, Mr. Dollar. I feel terrible. I'm calling from the district attorney's office. You there about Sheldon Forbes? Yes. I had no idea I'd have to act. They want me to sign a complaint. Well, that's pretty usual, Mr. Elliott. Forbes admitted taking the money from your firm. He's guilty as charged. You're the injured party. They want to get on with the prosecution. Oh, dear. So you do whatever they say, Mr. Elliott. Well... Will it affect my payment at all? A uh, payment of the claim? No, not a bit. Your check's on the way to you right now. Oh, that's a relief. Now, how about you? Are you going back to Hartford? Uh, should I thank you now? You can thank me, but I'm not going back. What? My job's just beginning. I have to recover the money for the insurance company. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter theft of nearly $5,000. Expenses continued. Item four, I think it is. $10. Deposited on a rented car. First stop, Central Division Headquarters, where I was informed that Sheldon Thomas Forbes had been formally arraigned and was being held in the city jail. Second stop, an address on 56th Street. Second floor next to a dental laboratory, and on the door it said Edward Gumby, attorney at law. And below it said, walk in. So I did. Uh, Hello out there. Mr. Gumby? Yes, sir. Come on in. It's warmer in here. Edward Gumby was standing in front of a gas heater in the inner office, which consisted of nothing more than a telephone, a desk, and a dozen law books. He was a medium-sized man, about 40 or so, a little tired, a little seedy, but he had a nice grin. Dollar? Dollar? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Gumby. You don't know me. I'm with Continental Adjustment Bureau, representing Delaware Eastern Liability in this Forbes matter. Oh, yes, 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 of course. Understand you're representing Sheldon Forbes, is that right? Well, I don't know whether it is or not, Mr. Dollar. 
I happened to be in magistrate's court this morning when Forbes was arraigned. I took him on because he didn't have counsel and the court appointed me. I don't know whether he took me on or not. Uh, Sit down, sit down. Oh, thanks. New York is the coldest city in the world. Absolutely the coldest when it's cold. (laughs) Yeah, it sure is. Look, I don't want to take up a lot of your time, Mr. Gumby. Time? (laughs) I've got time, boy. That's all I've got. What's on your mind? Your client, mostly. He's admitted guilt. But, of course, we're interested in recovering the money he stole. $4,285. Yeah. Well, I can't blame your company for that. Well, prosecution could probably be stopped if we made recovery. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. I thought I'd tell you this and in case you had any influence on Forbes. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Dollar. It's very understandable. But, as I say, I was court-appointed. I really haven't talked to him yet. So I'll have to confess I don't have any influence with him at all yet. Struck me as a nice sort of chap. Mm -hmm. Don't quite get it myself. Probably an explanation for it. Married once, I understand, and widowed right after the war. He worked for Century Styles about five years. Have you talked to the police yet? No. I understand they're going to work on it today. Maybe they'll have a little more information for you about the recovery. Probably find the money in an old sock or something like that. That's the way these things generally run, you know. I agreed with Mr. Gumby. That was truly the way these kind of cases usually ran. And I was a little surprised that afternoon when I spoke to the officers at the city jail. They reported that a complete search of Forbes' apartment and automobile unearthed nothing like the missing money. They further reported that they had found no reliable evidence of any material possessions that the money could have been spent for. My next stop, city jail. He won't tell you anything. Hmm? Kept his trap shut all the time he's been in here. As far as we've been able to find out, no previous record, no background. Been checking his prints with Washington. I don't know about this one. You know, the ex cop wise. Know what I mean? Won't give a police officer the time of day. That means he could have been in before. Now, on the other hand, it could mean he's just scared. That too. Well. Well, how what? Take it easy, Forbes. This is Mr. Dollar. He wants to talk to you. Hello, Forbes. Hi. See you later, Dollar. Yeah, thanks, Sergeant. Just give a yell when you're finished. Right. They treating you okay? Swell. What do you want? I want to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to anybody. Why not? I just don't want to see anybody. That's all. Now, you're acting like a baby, Forbes. You'll have to talk to somebody. Don't lecture me, Mr. Insurance Investigator. I've had all the lectures I want from myself. I don't know why you're here. I I thought we settled our business yesterday. The whole thing's just a technicality. I've been arraigned. They've got my confession. I'll go into court, and they'll give me the business. What are you doing in here, anyway? Swell day to be outside. Yeah, it is. Want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Well, why are you here? To help you out of this mess, if you'll let me. (laughs) That's funny. Not a bit. Why should you want to help me? Well, it's not because I have any use for you, mister. You're nothing to me but a guy who stole a pile of money. My job is to get it back, $4,285. Oh, that. Yes, that. How about it, Forbes? Isn't it enough that I'm in jail? That that I'll go to prison? That's enough for the police, but not for my insurance company. Oh, it's too bad about your insurance company. No, it's too bad about you. You're being foolish. A hold or partial recovery can have a great deal to do with what happens to you from now on. Three years is the minimum sentence, you know. Twelve years maximum. Now, is it worth it? Sure. Sure, it's worth it. And I don't want to be foolish anymore. But I have been foolish. I took it and I spent it. Every dime of it. There's no way to pay it back. What did you spend it on? It uh, doesn't make any difference. They make a lot of difference. You can redeem it, turn it back. No, I can't. Why did you take the money? All right, look, your salary's close to 100 a week. You're single. Wasn't that enough to live on? Why don't you get out of here? I don't have anything to tell you. Ever been in trouble before? Huh? Under another name in another state? No, They no. consider backgrounds like that when a man comes up to be sentenced? 
Forbes, this is your first offense. I know, I know. Are you trying to shield someone? Why don't you go away? Now, you've been trying the market. Did you gamble? No, no. Just, just leave me alone. I won't tell you a thing, If though. you bought something with it or gave it to someone, if it can be recovered in some part... Oh, no, I tell you. Just go away and leave me alone. I'd like to. Believe me, I would. You're a thief, Forbes, and you're going to get what's coming to you, but I can't leave you alone. Listen. No, you listen to me. If I don't get the information I want from you, I'll get it elsewhere. I'm going to be very honest with you. Eastern Delaware wrote a comprehensive policy on century styles promising to indemnify them in full for every loss caused by fire or theft on their premises. In case you didn't know, Forbes, an insurance company won't take the word of some guy sitting in a jail cell. Sitting in a jail cell feeling sorry for himself where there's cash to be recovered. Now, you swiped it within the last month. You have something to show for it somewhere, somehow. Whatever you spend it on, or whoever you spend it on, remember that that money is the same as stolen property. A car, a diamond ring, or something. Now, if you give it to someone or spend it, when it wasn't yours, it's still redeemable, and we mean to redeem it. All right, now, what do you have to say? This won't do you any good. Don't, don't try to bulldoze me. I'm no punk caught crawling into a drugstore window late at night. I'm a college graduate. I've been in the business world ten years or better. I know what I want to tell you and what I want to keep to myself. And I don't want to talk to you about this. You or anybody else. I can't make it any clearer than that. Do you understand? And there's no way or no person who can make me talk about it. I took the lousy money. I've admitted that. I did a bad job of it. You caught me. I confessed. And you've got me. Now, what more is there? That's the whole story. Okay. Have it your way, Forbes. Go away. Just go away. On my way out, I saw his attorney, Edward Gumby, on his way in to see Forbes. I waited around the sergeant's desk. Accidentally, on purpose, I glanced at the admitted visitor's register... Only two people had contacted Forbes since his arrest, Gumby and myself. That struck me as odd. A glance at his folder named no close relatives, named no one, in fact. I was thinking about that when Gumby came out from his visit. Gumby looked worn out. Uh, hiya. Hi. How'd you do? Not so good. Hey, tell me something. He asked you to contact a girl or anyone? Nope. I don't think he has a girl. I don't think he has anybody. You want some coffee? Yeah, good idea. We slushed across the street and found a diner. Expense account item five forty-two cents. Coffee and sinkers for Ed Gumby and myself. I think you're going to strike out, darling. I already have. And I think I have too. Huh? You know what I've been talking to him about in there all this time? The same thing as you restitution. But he won't open his mouth about it. He did say one thing though. He wants me to waive a jury trial and go up for sentencing. What? Yeah. Plead guilty and take it. He's sure to get at least three years. What can I do? Yeah. Got any ideas? Oh, I've got a lot of ideas, Dollar, and all of them make me sick inside. That boy's not a criminal. He took that money because he was desperate about something. You know that from the awkward way he took it. He spent it on something, and he won't talk about it. But now he's about to ruin his whole life, in spite of what you or I or anybody else tries to do for him. All he has to do is give back the money or promise restitution or call up a friend and borrow it. With his clean background, the court had listened to a mercy plea. You told him all this? I told him. I told him and you told him, and what does he do? He waves his right. I tell you, I'm going to hate to file this waiver, but I've got to do it. Yeah, and how you feel? More coffee? Yeah, no. No, thanks. Dollar, you know what Forbes is? What? He's something I call a, a calendar job. A calendar job? Yeah. 33 years old. Now, now, think about that. Born with one war just ended. Raised in a depression and then bangled. Another war. You might say the first 25 years of his life, nothing but war and depression. Or the effects thereof. A calendar job. 
Apparently, it's what he wants. But, Mr. Dollar, I'm going to hate to see him go to prison. You know something, Mr. Gumby? So am I. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Forbes matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a sudden twist in the case that throws all the usual theories right out the window. The unexpected. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ed Gumby, Mr. Dollar. Attorney for Sheldon Forbes. Oh, hello, Mr. Gumby. How are you? Oh, I don't know. The hearing's been set for 2.30 this afternoon. Okay, I'll be there. No need to, particularly. As I told you yesterday, he requested me to waive trial and plead guilty. Well, won't he be sentenced today? No, this is just a preliminary hearing. He'll probably be sentenced before the week's out, though. The court will simply consider the waiver and inform him of his rights today. Oh. Anything I can do? No, I don't think so. I'm going to try to talk to him again and get him to reconsider the waiver. I doubt if I'll have much luck, but I'll try. All he has to do is return the money he stole. Well, buck up, Mr. Gumby. If he won't return it, maybe someone else will. Hmm? What do you mean? I'm going to try and find out what he did with it. My company wants it back, sure. But we also want Forbes to have a fair chance. You're pretty decent, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. Embezzlement and a very frustrating case. Expense account continued. Item 6, $3.50, lunch. For myself and a Mr. Arnold Haven, head of the accounting department for Century Styles Incorporated. Mr. Haven, a tall, balding man in a dark suit, had ulcers. His poached egg and dry toast didn't interest him too much. Uh, What's going to happen to Forbes? Oh, I don't know, Mr. Haven. That depends on several things. Right now, I have to tell you that it looks like he'll go to prison. Worse than that, it looks like he wants to go to prison. He's waived trial. Prison. That's too bad. Too bad. I always liked Sheldon Forbes. You, uh, you hired him, did you, Mr. Haven? Yes, I hired him. He was a good man right from the start. He did his job, and he did it well. I never had a complaint against Forbes. Why do you suppose he stole the money? You've got me, Mr. Dollar. We paid him the going rate. That's a good salary for accountants. He seemed happy enough with it. Well, he knew he was in line for substantial raises. Uh Uh-huh. I could understand it, in a way, if he had a family and heavy responsibility... 
or if he played the market, or if he gambled. But Forbes, he just baffles me. Yeah, it baffles me, too. Huh? Oh, yes, of course. Well, the people around the office, they're, they're pretty upset about this. Any particular people, Mr. Haven? Everybody. But anyone in particular? A girl, for instance. Oh, oh a girl, yes, I see. Well, no. Did he go out with any girl in your office? No, no, most of them are married. No, at least as far as I know, Forbes didn't go with any of the girls there. He kept to himself. Oh, he might have lunched with one or the other now and then, but... No, no, he more or less kept to himself. Uh-huh. Well, the reason I asked you, Mr. Haven, is that what little I've been able to find out about his personal life isn't very helpful. My company wants the money back. We're willing to give him a fair break if we can get it back. But he's pretty stubborn about cooperating. Yes, we know about that, Mr. Dollar. But how can we give him a break if he doesn't want us to? And we can't find out anything about him. Look, if there's anything you can think of, any any reason he might have had for taking the money... And I've racked my brain. I can't think of any reason. I... Oh. Now, wait a minute. Just a minute. I did notice a change coming, Forbes. It was about a month or six weeks ago. Oh, it was nothing, really. It was just, a, I guess, an anxiety about him. Well, he took all the money within the last four weeks. Would that correspond? Roughly, Yes. Well, that's a start. I hope. I returned to the accounting offices of Century Styles with Mr. Haven and spent two hours questioning different members of his staff regarding Sheldon Forbes. His habits and his personality were pretty much the same as Haven himself had described them. Expense account item seven, four dollars, gasoline. I put a tank full of gas in my rented car and went over to an apartment on 59th Street where Sheldon Forbes had lived. According to the penciled note above the first door to the right of the entrance, Mrs. Anastasia Kanopka was the manager. Yes, what is, please? You're Mrs. Kanopka? Yes. What do you want, mister? I understand Mr. Sheldon Forbes lives here, is that right? Oh, yes. Bad. Bad. I hear he still monies. Bad. He, he not in, uh, in uh, jail, I think. Yes, I know about that, Mrs. Kanopka. I'm from the insurance company, and we're involved in this case. We're trying to recover some of that money if we can. I wonder if you'd help me. I fix dinner for my husband. He's come home from work. It so... won't take long. Uh, what I do? Well, I, I want to know about Sheldon Forbes. What? The works, Mrs. Kanopka. Did he drink? Gamble? Did he stay in nights or go out? Did he pay his rent? He, he always pay his rent... You are policeman? An insurance investigator. Uh, please, uh, sometime else. Maybe you speak to my husband. He speak much better than me. But it's important now. I talk to Mr. Forbes on telephone. He called me from jail. He say I no have to answer any questions. No, no, you don't have to answer any questions, Mrs. Kanopka. But I'd sure appreciate it if you would. M- my husband home pretty soon. You ask him. You can help him, possibly. Now, would you like to help him in this trouble? All right, mister, but how I know these things you ask about uh, men who live here? Well, well, look, how about his friends? Who visited him? I I cannot say. No visitor. Was he a good tenant? No trouble, like Mr. O'Sullivan on third floor. Mr. O'Sullivan always drunk. Called police twice. Mr. Forbes not drink whiskey. Uh Uh-huh. Did you ever meet his girl? Girl? Sure. He had a girlfriend, didn't he? Oh, I think you mistake. I don't ever see girlfriend here. All right. How long have you known him? Five, six years, maybe. Ever since he moved in here to this place. But no girl? No. Well, how do he spend his time? Work. He work very hard. No, I mean besides working at the office. How else did Forbes spend his time? I... Oh, he poor fella, that one. Huh? Sure, he steals money, but he poor feller just the same. For him, I feel. Yeah. Mr. Forbes, he quiet and, and he think. I know he live up in that little room quiet and think. He does all time think. No whiskey, no girls. Oh, he paints sometime, listen to music, think. Oh, my husband, Dina Byrne, please, you go Well, uh, just a minute. I'd like to see his apartment if I can. No, no matter. Here. You bring back key, please. Sure. Thank you, Mrs. Kanopka. 
The apartment Sheldon Forbes called home was as dismal as the neighborhood. A tiny closet kitchen, a bed that came out of the wall, a pair of grimy windows that looked across the court onto another pair of equally grimy windows. The furniture was threadbare and dusty. A small ironing board and iron attested to the fact that Sheldon Forbes laundered his own shirts. Other small evidences of frugality were about the premises. A hot plate and a can of souring cream. Two suits of clothes, neatly brushed and pressed, but inexpensive. The record player and a collection of a half a dozen good albums were the only sign of material accomplishment. The painting materials, easel, canvas, and oils were also inexpensive. No liquor, no jewelry, no expensive clothes. Nothing that cost $4,285 or anything like it. Oh. Here's your key, Mrs. Kanapka. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I thank you. Well... What you think? I think he's had a very lonely life here. Oh, Doc. Yes. Lonely is the word. Lonely. Um, oh, wait. Has he got a car? In back through alley. Thanks. It was a Ford. Vintage of 1946. Tightly locked up. The paint was scaling away, the tires worn down, the mileage 77,000 miles. He certainly hadn't blown the money on a fancy car. Now I felt completely frustrated. Expense account item 8, 79 cents, dinner. I had it in a neighborhood restaurant called the 79er, a place I learned where Sheldon Forbes frequently took his evening meal. The restaurant manager, a man named Alexander Dupolis, remembered Forbes and he liked him. A woman who ran a bakery shop across the street also remembered him as the young man who bought a roll there every night. Probably the roll to go with a lonely cup of coffee in his room the next morning. She liked him, too. All in all, I was getting a composite picture of Sheldon Forbes that didn't look quite right. Whatever he was to the people who knew him casually, he wasn't a man who ever had any money to spend. I dropped in at the city jail about 7.30, and I was surprised to find lawyer Edward Gumby sitting on a bench, briefcase in hand. Hello, Mr. Gumby. Nothing new, huh? Well, that's the way it goes, I guess. We had some action today. Oh? Yeah. The hearing was this afternoon. Man from the district attorney's office took about 15 minutes to lay out the evidence against Forbes and make the charges. Uh Uh-huh. I spent the whole time pleading with Forbes not to go ahead with the waiver. Did I miss anything? No, he wouldn't open up at all. Just said he'd spent the money. I couldn't talk him out of the waiver, so it went through. When will he be sentenced? They set the date for Friday. I don't know whether they'll get around to it or not. I'd like to talk to him again. Has he been moved yet? No. Nope. I thought he'd be transferred to the sheriff's office. Well, ordinarily he would, but since he waived trial, they announced bail. It's proper procedure in cases like this. It gives him a couple of days to straighten out his affairs. What? Somebody bailed him out? I did. Oh. Has he left yet? Uh-uh. Won't get out till late. That's when the shift changes. Think it's worth trying to see him? Yeah, I think I'll stick around, Mr. Gumby. I gotta find out something about this case. An hour later, when Sheldon Forbes emerged from the doorway and turned right, I was following him. When he caught a cab and headed uptown, I caught one and stayed right with him. When he got out at the Empress Theater and walked around to the stage door, I was standing by the alley entrance. Ten minutes later, he came back out, hailed a cab. Once more, I followed This time, I followed him to his apartment on 59th Street. I waited 15 minutes before I went in. Forbes? Forbes? Hey, Forbes, it's me, Johnny Dollar. I want to talk to you. It took me a few seconds to understand what it was. I got a couple of whiffs of it coming from under his door. Forbes! The room was acrid, stinging with gas fumes, and Sheldon Forbes was stretched down on the floor of his six-foot kitchen. (laughs) When I picked him up and carried him out, I didn't know whether he was alive or dead. Oh, 
There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Forbes matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a switch in the case that starts a real chase and a race against time. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the police operator. Are you the party who called for an ambulance? Yes, didn't you get it? It's on the way, sir. I'm calling to verify the circumstances. Attempted suicide by gas. Yes, sir, we have that. The victim's name... Sheldon Forbes, F-O-R-B-E-S. Forbes? And your connection, sir? Relative, perhaps? No, no relation. Insurance investigator. I just found him. Will you please remain there until the officers arrive? Are you kidding? I asked you, but... Oh. Oh, well, thank you very much. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. Sheldon Forbes pleaded guilty to a $4,285 embezzling charge. He waived jury trial and was awaiting sentence when he was bailed out of jail, went home, and turned on the gas. Thirty seconds after I dragged him from the apartment, I called the police emergency squad. In a matter of minutes, they arrived, and a couple of interns were working on Forbes with a pull motor in that dingy, dirty, badly lighted hallway. There was no telling how much gas Forbes had breathed in, or for how long a period after he went into his apartment, the gas jet had been open. Hand me that hypo, Al. Thanks. Swab. Okay. He, uh... He alive? Barely. You the fellow who found him, mister? Yeah. Hard to say what can happen on these kind. That shot I just gave him should produce some reaction. Hmm? This your place? His. You know who he is? His name's Sheldon Forbes. Nice looking guy. Al, I'll need that. Yeah, thanks. I think we're getting somewhere now. Hey, look, can I help? No. Al, you better hand me one of those, too. I will be pretty sick if. Oh, hey, good. He's, he's catching on. Yeah. Let's have a little increase, Al. Up it just a little. Okay. Hold it there. The intern and his assistant worked quietly and methodically. There was nothing I could do but stand and watch. After about a half an hour, the color of Forbes' skin seemed to me a little more close to normal. His eyes were still closed, though, and he showed no signs of movement. I waited. Okay, Al. You can kill the pull motor. Uh, Getting some pulse now. Respiration, too. Will he make it? Uh, it depends, mister. If he has any kind of heart condition, it'll be tough. We can tell more when we get him into a hospital. Nothing more we can do for him here. 
Okay, Al. Have the boys load him up. Let's get out of here. Uh, now, mister, uh, you say he's a friend of yours? Just someone I knew. He's got you to thank, in case he makes it. Where'll he be? We'll take him over to Bellevue. All attempted suicides get over there. Mm-hmm. I'd like to talk to him when he comes around. Any idea when that'll be? No telling. Better phone in first. Police will want to talk to you. You give identification to headquarters when you called in? Yeah. Yeah, that's the third one tonight. What is it, the weather? Not for him. My job is to handle them, but I wonder why they do it. Oh, this guy's got a problem. He's out on bail, goes into court Friday to be sentenced, embezzling charge. Oh. Seemed like a nice guy to look at. I think he probably is a nice guy. Well, I thought you said he was an embezzler. I did. Well, be sure and call in. Yeah, sure, doctor. Thanks. Good night. The uniformed officers outside the apartment house questioned me thoroughly regarding the circumstances of the attempted suicide. I told them what had occurred and gave them my business address for reference. They asked me to ride over to the station with them and verify the facts. I did. All of that took about two hours. When I was finished, I put in a call to Bellevue. No change in Sheldon Forbes' condition. Expense account item nine, two eighty, one theater ticket. That's what it cost me to see the last 15 minutes of a fairly bad musical play at the Empress Theater. When it was over, I walked around to the stage entrance. Hey, didn't quite get that, mister. Dollar. Dollar? Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, uh-huh. Well, uh, what can I do for you? Between 6.30 and 7 o'clock tonight, a man came here to the stage entrance and talked to you. A lot of people talk to me here. That's my job, talking to them. One man in particular. His name is Sheldon Forbes. Uh, I don't remember nobody named Forbes. Well, maybe he didn't give his name. He was a tall man, about my size, 30 or so, dark hair, clean cut. Wore a tweed suit. Mm-hmm. Uh, beats me. Did he come here to see somebody in the show? Is that it? He might have. I don't know. Well, how do you know he came here? I followed him. I saw him. Huh? It's a business, my business. I'm an investigator. Oh, oh. oh wait now. Did he have a hat on tonight? No, no, he didn't. A uh, short haircut? Yeah, do you remember him? Sure, sure. What's he done? Struck me as a nice young fella. He's been around here a lot of times. Sheldon Forbes, yeah, yeah. I didn't recognize the name at first. Would you mind telling me why he comes around here? Comes here to see Betsy Walker. One of the girls in the show. Betsy Walker, is she his girlfriend? No, don't think so. Uh, it's like this. He comes here asking to see her, and she never sees him. You get it? Yeah, I suppose so. Well, who is she? Oh, she sings here. Dances a little. Pretty girl. Have you ever seen her with Forbes? Well, I I can't say. I guess not. Is she still here? Huh? Betsy Walker, is she still here? I'd like to talk to her. Well, she wouldn't be here this late. She finishes her bit in the second act. Could you tell me where she lives? No. Oh, no. No, no. I'm sorry, boy. I can't tell you that. All right. Well, where can I phone her? Can't tell you that either. Uh, now, uh... Why don't you drop around tomorrow? It's important tonight. Hey, look, would you do me a favor? Depends. What is it? Would you telephone Betsy Walker? Tell her my business and ask her if she'll see me. Well, suppose I can do that all right, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Take a chair there. I'll see what I can do for you. The doorman did all right. Expense account, item 10, $2.65, cab fare. I gave up my rented car and had the cab driver find the address Betty Walker had given. It was a rather nice apartment in a rather nice part of town. and was almost one in the morning when I got there. She met me at the door, wrapped in a chenille dressing gown with cold cream on her face. Miss Walker? Uh, You must be Mr. Dollar. Yes. Uh, Now, just wait a minute. Do you mind if I see some kind of identification or something like that? Oh, no, no. Here you are. Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, <laughs> you'd be surprised at some of the things some men will try. Come in, please. Thank you. I didn't quite understand Frank on the telephone. Frank? Oh, the doorman at the theater. Yes. I didn't know quite what to make of it. Goodness, are you really an insurance detective? Uh, yes, and I'd appreciate you letting me see you tonight, Miss Walker. Sit down. 
Can I fix you a drink? No, no, thanks. Uh, Frank mentioned something about Forbes. You're here because of him? Yes, Miss Walker. I understand that you know Forbes. No, uh, not exactly, that is. Uh, there's some reservation in the way you say that, Miss Walker. You know his name. Yes, I, I know the name. Uh, can I ask you what this is all about? Routine investigation. I'm curious. How did you get my name? How am I connected with Sheldon Forbes? That's what I'd like you to tell me. Well, first about my name. Forbes was at the theater earlier tonight asking for you. I understand he's been around there quite a bit. Yes. I really don't know how to tell you this, Mr. Dollar. I've only seen that man once in my life, honestly. He's... Oh, he's really quite impossible. I just... Oh, dear, this is so embarrassing to try to explain this. Maybe I can save you some embarrassment, then, if you'll answer one question. Sure, why not? Did Sheldon Forbes ever give you any presents? Yes. What? Well, uh, that cigarette box on the table there. And the lighter to go with it. Hmm. Tiffany's. Pretty, aren't they? Yeah, very. Also expensive. What else? Well, um, let me think. Um, oh, no, no, that wasn't from him. Oh, uh, that was the lamp over there. Mm-hmm. And a first stole. May I see it? I'm afraid I gave that away. You did? I gave it to my kid sister who was visiting me last week. I already had one. Oh, I see. What else did he give you? I think that's about it. Except for orchids that used to come every night. A dozen orchids every night for the last month. You only saw him once and he gave you all these gifts? Oh, dear, I, I know how that must sound. I just... Look, it started a month or so, I guess. I got a card in my dressing room one night asking me to dinner. It was signed Sheldon Forbes. So? Well, I'd never heard of anybody named Sheldon Forbes, and I just tore the card up. But every night after that, I kept getting orchid and the card. And then the gifts started to come. The cigarette box first. That's when I saw him. Uh-huh. I didn't even dine with him, Mr. Dollar. We had one drink, and I told him I had a headache. I see. But the gifts still kept coming. Flowers invitations. I ignored them. I tried to send the things back, and I didn't know where to send them. Some I gave away, and some I've kept. I didn't want his gifts. He was nice, but I... Well, I just didn't want anything to do with him. When I did meet him, he was so different than what I had imagined. I mean, well, gee, I've had my share of stage door Johnny's, but this man was... Well, he just couldn't say a word without stumbling. He had no poise, no sophistication, nothing. All he had was money. He told you that? He didn't have to. Those gifts. Well, he didn't have money, Miss Walker. He worked for $82 a week as a bookkeeper. You must be mistaken. I'm afraid not. He stole the money to buy you all these things. Well, for heaven's sake. For heaven's sake. And you caught him? Yeah. Forbes tried to commit suicide earlier this evening. Suicide? Oh, no. I'm sorry I had to come to you to get this information. He's refused all along to tell anybody what he did with the money. Will he go to prison? I'm afraid so. Oh, but it's crazy. We had nothing. He's just a name to me. He means nothing to me. Yeah. But apparently you mean something to him. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Forbes matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, proof that $4,285 worth of unrequited love can spell three years of prison. But sometimes there's an angle. In this case, a rather startling one. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Betsy Walker, Mr. Dollar. I'm up and around. Yes, thanks for calling. Have any time this morning? I think so. If possible, I'd like to come over to your apartment again and take an inventory of the gifts that Sheldon Forbes sent you. That'll be all right, sure. About an hour? Sure. Um, I couldn't sleep much last night thinking about all this. I mean... He stole that money because of me. You mustn't feel that way, Miss Walker. He knew what he was doing. You had no part in the theft. I have the gifts. Well, we may have to take those away from you. I don't mind that. I... You said he tried suicide. How is he this morning? I just talked to the hospital. He's going to be all right. But he has to go to prison? Yes. (sighs) Funny world, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. More expenses. Items 11 to 16. $78.40. Cab fares, meals, accounting services, legal services, cab fares, and more cab fares. I made a comprehensive inventory at Betsy Walker's apartment and spent the rest of the day tracking down the places where the items had been purchased and ascertaining their retail values. Total, $2,780 worth of gifts bought with stolen money. Betsy Walker also told me that Sheldon Forbes had made appointments to meet her at various times at very expensive restaurants in New York. She had never once kept any of these appointments, but a check with the Waldorf, 21, the Stork, and several other places revealed that Forbes had always made elaborate arrangements to entertain her. His restaurant bills came to $835. The florist bill, $670. Total amount spent, $4,285. Total amount stolen... $4,285. Century Styles Incorporated footed the bill in his unsuccessful courtship of Betsy Walker. Hello. Hi. Remember me, Forbes? Sure, insurance man. Well, what now? How do you feel? Okay. You saved me, didn't you? I suppose so. Why? Same reason you'd save a man who was dying. You know what I've been doing? What? Answering the questions you wouldn't answer. I met Betsy Walker. What? My job, Forbes. I had to. How did you know about her? I followed you night before last. When you got out on bail, I saw you go to the theater. Listen, you had no right to go to her. You have no right to involve her in any of this. Why didn't you think of that a month or so ago? It's the company's money you've been spending on her. I had every right, as unpleasant as it is. I suppose she knows all about me now. That's right, all. Boy, I sure must look like the prize sucker of all time. (laughs) Just handed her a laugh. She didn't think it was one bit funny. And Forbes, I don't think it's funny either. Then what are you standing here for, lording it over me? I'm not doing that at all. I'm just here to let you know how things are at the moment. All right. How are things? Well, first off, we took back all the gifts you gave her. Dirty scum. Don't get mad at me, Forbes. Get mad at yourself. I didn't steal the money and try to impress her. You did. Why didn't you leave it alone? What difference does the money make to you? Nothing to me, but it means something to my insurance company. They still want it back. And they'll get as much back as they can. Well, swell. Good for that. What do you want now? Your signature. Hmm? I think I traced most of it down. You want to look this over? Go ahead. Uh... Those figures about right? I suppose so. I didn't keep track. Approximately? I suppose so. You're pretty thorough, aren't you? We have to be. Will you sign this? No. It'll help to clear up our bookwork a little. What difference does it make now? We've got you cold. Okay. What difference does it make? Give me. Okay, thanks. It's all it means to you, isn't it? Hmm? Dollars and cents. 
Dollars and cents that were stolen, Forbes. Remember that. You wouldn't let me forget it. No, I wouldn't. You did the dumbest thing in the world. You stole nearly $5,000 trying to make an impression on a girl who didn't want to have a thing to do with you. You went about it wrong from top to bottom. You've acted like the great stone face ever since you've been found out. You wouldn't bother telling me about it. I had to go out and find out myself. Off the record, Forbes, what'd you do? See her on the stage one night? No, at the office. Office? Your office? No, not exactly. Ellie was having a showing for some buyers from the West Coast one day a few weeks ago. For those kind of showings, he hires models from the agency. Betsy's listed with one of the agencies. You know, she acts and sings and models. Oh, sure. Well, I happened to be upstairs when the showing was going on. A lot of publicity people there taking pictures and so on. And I saw her. She was wearing a black... A black dress and her hair was soft... She's got a smile like all the sun risings. Are... Sound silly? Not at all. It's just that I never in all my life saw anyone like it before. Yeah. I don't know how it is with other guys, but she was for me from then on. I, I couldn't get her out of my mind. I found out her name, and then I found out she worked in that show at the Empress Theater. Yeah. All I had was her name. I, I didn't know how to go about meeting her. I... I just didn't know. You figured a little money might attract it to you. I've heard that's the best way to do it. That's one way. Not the best way, kid. Probably not. The best way I could think of. What did you think about taking the money? I thought I'd be able to stick it back. I guess I really didn't think much beyond just meeting her. Having her look at me the way I... I wanted her to look at me. (laughs) What? It was the wrong way to go about it, sure. Sure. But then did you ever think of my alternative? Hmm? I thought of it. I pictured myself knocking on a door one night, and I could see her answering it. I'm Shelley Forbes, Betsy, I'd say. Clothes don't make the man, I'd say, while she sort of took in my tweed suit and the only coat I've got to my name. Listen, I'd say, I got an 8 by 10 apartment over on 59th Street. The halls always smell like cabbage, but I'm a heck of a fine guy. And I drive a 1946 Ford that misses a little, but it's good enough for us. Then I'd say... Why don't you toss on your mink and we'll go over to my dump and we'll have a bottle of beer and I'll tell you how much I love you. How about that? (laughs) Some alternative, huh? She makes more money in an hour than I make in a week. I couldn't even afford to keep her in cigarettes. (laughs) Lord, I... I wanted her like nothing in my whole life. She might have taken you up on it, Forbes, if you'd put it that way. Yeah? What makes you think so? She wasn't impressed by any money or any gifts. (laughs) More than that, I met her. She's a pretty nice girl. Yeah. Up until the time I talked with Sheldon Forbes in the hospital, I'd always had my doubts about love happening at first sight. After my talk with him, I was convinced that it could and did happen to him. I was sorry that he didn't know quite how to handle it. I was also wondering if I'd been in his shoes, would I have done the same thing? Expense account item 17, $4.90. I sent a wire to my home office telling them that the recovery would be in the amount of something like $2,500, obtainable on the redeemable gift items recovered. After that, I went back to my hotel. I was surprised to find Betsy Walker waiting in the lobby. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Why, hello. I was afraid you might leave town. I wanted to talk to you. Sure, you just caught me. I was going upstairs and pack. What is it? Could we have a drink or something? Sure. Expense account item 18, $2, two drinks. For Betsy Walker and myself at the hotel bar. It was midday, and there wasn't much action. She sat across from me, ordered an old-fashioned, and asked for a cigarette. Thank you. Sure. What'll happen to him? Forbes? Yes. Oh, he'll be sentenced Monday. They canceled the Friday scheduling because he was in the hospital. He'll go to prison? Yes. Have you seen him since he tried to kill himself? Just left him. I guess he feels awful. Yeah. I told you I haven't been able to sleep thinking about all this. Well, about him, I guess. Mm-hmm. Would he have to go to prison even if all the money was returned? 
Only half of it's redeemable. The rest, florist bills, restaurants and so on, just gone. How much does it come to, Mr. Dollar? Uh, short about 2000 roughly. If, well, if you had that money, what would happen to them? Oh, it'd be up to the court. I, I'd say he'd have a good chance of getting off if he changed his plea. Could I get him to change his plea? <laughs> I think you could get him to do anything. I want to pay it. You what? I want to pay that other 2000 for him and get him to change his plea. I'll make up the whole thing. Hey, now, look, Miss Walker, I, I know your motives might be the best, but you aren't responsible in any way for this man's actions. He stole money because of me. He tried suicide because of me. And now he's going to prison because of me. But you had nothing to do with it, no part of it. You may think I'm 22 years old. I'll be 29 next month. I'm not much of an actress or a singer or anything else. But I've been around this town and I know my way around. And I met all kinds. Whoever he is, whatever he's done, he's the first man I've ever known who actually went out on a limb for a girl he loved. I'm the girl and he's the man. You're serious. I probably won't remember his name a year from now. But that poor, stupid, wonderful dumbbell. He doesn't belong in any prison. He ought to get married to some nice girl somewhere. I want to help him get out of this trouble. Can I? Betsy, I... After all, he's given me something. Call it faith in mankind again if you like. What's the kiss for? What you just gave me, Betsy. Faith. Expense account item 19, $48, hotel. Item 20, $37, meals. 21, $15, miscellaneous. 22, same as item 1, $28.63, fare back to Hartford. Total cost of investigation, $363.51. Remarks? She got Forbes to change his plea. She paid back the additional money. He comes to trial next week. He might get a suspended sentence. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a trip south of the border where the flashing eyes of a dark-haired senorita spells plenty of, well, believe me, romance and trouble can go hand in hand. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Sandra Gould, Jack Edwards, Herb Ellis, James McCallion, Parley Bear, John Stevenson, Howard McNair, Bob Bruce, and Junius Matthews. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. to hear from you, George, especially when I have no assignment. That, uh, that's fine. What's fine about it? No expense account to pad means how do I keep the wolf in the door? Unless, of course, Floyd's of England has a case for me. Huh? 
Well? Uh, Johnny. Yeah? I, uh, well, a few weeks ago, you were kidding at the time. Oh, now, George, how could I ever kid you? I'll, uh, let that one go. Yeah, you better. The point is, you, well, you rather jestingly asked me if instead of selling life insurance... Oh, no. Don't tell me. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid the company is saddled with what you might call a death insurance policy. You mean, instead of insuring somebody against dying, you've insured him against living? Yes, John. Okay, Georgie, say no more. I'll be right over. Bob Bailey, in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the hope to die matter. Expense account item one, a dollar ten taxi from my apartment at George Reed's office, where I found him pacing the floor and wearing an even more worried expression than usual. And believe me, that's something. This thing has me so so riled up, Johnny, I can hardly see straight. Well, you should have known better than to issue a policy like that, George. I? It was Harry Baxter. Baxter? He filled in here for me while I was on vacation. I should have known better. What'd he do? Sell a lot of policies that you shouldn't have to handle? No, just this one. And I swear I don't understand it. He of all people. All right, you said on the phone that it was kind of life insurance in reverse. That's exactly what it is. Explain, please. Well, usually, of course, we pay the face value of a policy when the insured dies. Right. In this case, however, the company will have to pay the $250,000 that the insured doesn't die. 250000 Yes. How under the sun can a man be crazy enough to issue a policy like that? John, you know how it is. The company prides itself on the fact we'll insure anything. Not only life and property and health and so on, but the voice of a singer, the feet of a dancer, hands of a pianist, even the dimples on the knees of a chorus girl. Yeah, and singing mice, an old alley cat, a sick whale. Of course I can't say that Harry wasn't in position to do it, but... Johnny, you've got to help me. First, you'd better tell me who and why and what it's all about. It's just the trouble. I don't know. Well, in that case, you don't know. I only got back here to the office this morning. I found our copy of the policy lying here on my desk. But if you don't even... Oh, look, I've handled some pretty screwy cases for you, George. Yes, but they've all finally made sense one way or the other. And Johnny, we have paid you some very nice fees. You can't deny that. George. Tell me, have I ever questioned your expense account? But death insurance, it doesn't make sense. Have I? Insuring somebody against living. Have I? I'm sorry, but this time the answer is no. Listen, if you take this on, I'll okay your expense account without even reading it. Death insurance. Expense account unlimited. Johnny? George, there are some things even a conniving, chiseling, unprincipled rascal like myself won't... Even unlimited? Johnny? Okay, George, I'll take it. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. Lloyds of England insure anything. At least that was their boast. And now it looked as though it had finally backfired on them. Because somebody in the organization, some character named Harry Baxter, had issued not life, but death insurance. If it hadn't been for my friendship for George Reed, <clears throat> well, plus his promise of unlimited expense account, I'd have thrown the whole problem right back into his face, as it was. Thanks, Johnny, from the bottom of my heart. I'll never forget you for this. Believe me, George, I'll never forget you for this. And if you can get us off the hook... All I can do is try, so come on, give me the dope on it. Yes, now here... The name of the insured is Miss Mary Ellen Markham. Oh. Yeah, I got it. Where does she live? 514 East 52nd Street, New York City. Oh. Pretty fancy address. Yes. Okay. Now tell me why this Mary Ellen has insured herself against living. Well, that's the point, Johnny. She hasn't. Well, now wait a minute. You... Albert Schwinner has. You mean somebody else took out this policy on her life? Or rather death? Yes. Holy... 
Well, what is this guy, a professional gunsel who's going to wipe her out and then collect? I suppose he's the beneficiary, too. Yes, he is. Oh, fine. Well, come on, who is... I don't know. As I told you, the policy was lying here on my desk when I got back this morning. I do know this much about him. It's Dr. Albert Schwinner. Doctor? What kind? Well, those are the things you've got to find out. Who he is, what he is, why he's bought insurance against this woman's living beyond November 10th. The 10th? Well, that's only a few days from now. Oh, George, this gets worse and worse. Well, if only Harry Baxter hadn't issued that policy. But he has. Oh, boy, you sure picked a dilly to fill in for you while you were away. Picked him? What else could I do? After all, he never did anything like this before. You've known him before? Are you serious? Of course I have. Why, Harry? Back All right, now look. Times are wasting and we haven't got much of it. I take it you want me to see if I can find some legal grounds for canceling this policy. Yes, immediately. Now, have you got an address on the beneficiary, this uh, Dr. Schwinner? No, I've been so upset about this whole thing, I haven't even looked. Here, let me see. According to this, he lives at... Hmm. What's the matter? Dr. Albert W. Schwinner, C.L. C.L.? What kind of a doctor is that? I don't know. The address is 14327 E Street, Union City, New Jersey. C.L. Well, I'll soon find out. Where can I reach this uh, Harry Baxter who sold the policy? In New York at the... Uh, here, I'll jot down the address. I still don't see how Baxter could get away with this. Well, after all, when you consider his position... Here. He offered no explanation at all. Well, I'm afraid I didn't give him much chance. I practically threw him out of here. Oh, I can't say that I blame you. And that's another thing. Look, Johnny, perhaps you can reason with him. Oh, don't worry, George. He's number one on my calling list. I'll be talking to you. <laughs> Expense account item 2, 785, fare to New York and taxi to Harry Baxter's address. A real snooty one over near Sutton Place. And people don't live in that joint unless they've earned... Or chiseled a lot of money from somewhere. In the case of Baxter, I suspected a big chisel. My suspicion was considerably heightened when he opened the door. His apartment was luxury from stem to stern. As for Baxter himself... Dollar? Well, of course, old boy. I've heard a great deal about you from my dear friend and colleague, George Reed. Dear friend, huh? Well, you say that as though you doubted it. Oh, I know. That filling in for him while he was away, well... I really should have done better for the old thing, but I've had so many social obligations to meet these past few months, and after all, one must keep up with those things. Oh, I'm sure one must. Well, I did sell one policy, you know, a real dilly. Ah, oh, that's the understatement of the week. I suppose I can't really blame him for being a bit excited about it, but he gave me no chance to explain why I issued the policy. Why did you? Oh, now, really? Well... Well, I made it very clear to George that I would tell him when he calms down enough to be reasonable. Really, Mr. Dollar, he was in quite a tizzy. Brother, he still is. That's why he sent for me. But when he calms down, he'll be sorry he bothered you. Suppose you tell me why you issued that policy. You? No. What? No, I'll tell George when he's ready and when I'm ready. Oh, now, just a minute. And you may tell George I said exactly that. Goodbye, Dollar. You'll tell me, Baxter, right now. I'll do nothing of the sort. And what's more, since my plane for Europe is leaving shortly, I have no time to... to, to, to... Would you kindly remove your foot from the door? Not until I get an answer from you. Now start talking. If you can show some legal cause... Legal why, cause? Uh, furthermore, your behavior at the moment constitutes trespass, illegal entry, uh, call it what you like. And believe me, unless you leave here immediately, I shan't hesitate to ring up the police. All right, all right. Now look, just tell me one thing. I might. What? What is your connection with the beneficiary of this policy? Dr. Schwinner. That's right, Albert Schwinner. But Albert happens to be a very close personal friend. Oh, I might have guessed as much. All right, then tell me this. No, I'm sorry, just one question. I've given the answer. Goodbye. Right, sir. Are you hard of hearing? Look right here now. Goodbye. Well, there was no point in trying to batter down the door of Harry Baxter's apartment, so I left. Downstairs in the lobby, I put in a phone call. That's item 355 cents to George Reed's office in Hartford. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but he seems to have stepped out for a few minutes. Oh, well, uh, then please tell him when he gets back that I want a complete rundown on Harry Baxter. Well, that shouldn't be difficult. Right. Having hired him, George shouldn't have much trouble getting that for me. Well, that isn't what I meant, Mr. Dollar. As a matter of fact, I think I can tell you just Now, let George do it. I'll call him back. <laughs> Item 4, 65 cents taxi to Mary Ellen Markham's apartment on East 52nd Street. 
A uniformed nurse met me at the door, told me I could stay with Miss Markham only a very short time, then led me into the bedroom. And there, carefully propped up in bed, lay a pale, wan, tired woman who looked to be 65 or 70. The room was full of flowers. You may leave us, Mrs. Haskell. I'll ring when I need you. Yes, Miss Markham. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. I'm sorry. I won't be able to speak with you very long. But as you can see... Yes, yes, I can, of course. I'll get right to the point. You must know, I'm sure, that someone has just taken out a policy on your... Well, an insurance policy on you. Yes. And you're so smart. And so... And so helpful with Harry Baxter. Oh. You see, I am suffering from a rare, incurable... Disease of the blood. I'm sorry. I don't have long to live. A few days, perhaps. A few weeks at the most. Excuse me. This is such an effort. Well, you, you're getting the best of care, I trust. Yes. It's the very best. Now, now, what do you wish to know? You know a Dr. Albert Schwinner, don't you? I have known Albert for many years. He's been great friends. Then why does he take out a policy that... Well, that indicates he hopes that you'll die. Hopes? I'll die? Yes. What else could it be? Oh, you don't understand. Don't you see? Schwinner has bought insurance against your living beyond November 10th. Yes. Yes. My 50th birthday. You mean to say you're... The reason... The reason is so. Yes? I'm sorry, you You mustn't. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. But just one more thing. Your doctor. The doctor who's taking care of you. Albert. Albert? This same Dr. Schwinner? Yes. Now... Now you must leave. of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Oh, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the hope to die matter. The little that Mary Ellen Markham had been able to tell me left me more puzzled than ever. I've never been given such a runaround in my life, deliberate or otherwise. But I didn't dare tax her strength further, so I left. Item five, another 55 cents for another call to George Reed in Hartford. This time he was in. Yes, Johnny, I must confess I'm calmed down a bit, but the first shock of learning that Mr. Baxter had issued that seemingly absurd policy... What do you mean, seemingly absurd? George's whole thing has been a tizzy now, a double-barrel one. Well, I tried to call Mr. Baxter a few minutes ago, but got no answer. I wanted to apologize, of course. Apologize? Well, after all, since he's chairman of the board... Chairman of what board? The company, this company... What? I tried to tell you that this morning, but you didn't give me a chance. Harry Baxter is also the majority stockholder. Oh, brother. In any event, as I'm sure you can see, he must have had some good reason for that policy. And as soon as I can get him by phone... You won't. What? He just left for Europe. Where? I don't know, and right now I don't care. But if I can't contact him, Johnny, I don't dare cancel this policy until I've talked to him. And if Miss Markham should die before the 10th... Yeah, 250 G. You've got to carry on. Would you like to tell me how... If Mary Ellen Markham dies on or before November 10th, Floyd's of England pays Dr. Albert Schwinner $250,000 on a policy taken out by him. And he is her doctor with her life in his hands. And if there isn't something wrong with that setup, Expense account item six, eight dollars for a taxi to Schwinner's address in Union City, New Jersey. And there at last I learned what the CL meant behind his name. It was an abbreviation, for this was the Albert Schwinner Clinic, devoted to the study of rare diseases of the blood. But Schwinner wasn't there. He'd gone to New York to see Miss Markham. Item seven, ten dollars even for a fast taxi ride back there to Manhattan. 
As the nurse led me into the unfortunate woman's apartment, he was just coming out of the bedroom door. Oh, Dr. Schwinner, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar, Harry Baxter told me I might expect you. Oh, he did, huh? Yes, he phoned me just before his plane took off for Europe. Pretty smart. You're an insurance investigator, aren't you? That is right. Oh, you may go in to see Miss Markham now, Mrs. Haskell. Very well, Doctor. How is Miss Markham, Doctor? Much better, thank God. Oh, why do you say that? What? If she dies before this week is out, you stand to collect a cool quarter of a million, don't you? I? No, the clinic. Isn't that the same thing? Hardly. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Now... You're concerned about the rather unorthodox insurance policy that Mr. Baxter issued. I certainly am. I think you'd better let me tell you the reason for it. I think you'd better. At the onset of her illness some 15 years ago, the best doctors in the country gave her five years to live at the most. And that's when you came into the picture? Yes. Because of the devotion, the concentration of all our efforts to this one field of medicine, the clinic was able for the first time to give her hope. Her hope was justified. We have given her years of life. But now, wait a minute, Doctor. She told us then that if she could be helped to live until she was 50... And that'll be on the 10th. Yes. That would prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that our methods, our practices were right. That we could prolong and possibly ultimately save not only her own, but thousands, perhaps millions of lives. Therefore, she agreed that if she reached 50... She would make an outright gift of $250,000 to the clinic and its work. Money which is much needed, by the way. But then it began to look as though she might never reach 50. Yes. And she suggested this unusual insurance policy. On her death rather than on her life. I see. Why Harry Baxter, chairman of the board of the insurance company, its biggest stockholder, would ever... I don't get it. Baxter's own mother died of the same disease, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Of course. Then he knew how necessary this money is to the clinic. Yes. And let's face it, Baxter is something of uh, an eccentric. And that's the reason he chose this... This offbeat way to make sure you get the financial help you need. Exactly. Then, if I try to get this policy canceled... A great many lives in the future may depend on its remaining in force. Of course, if you feel it your duty... Doctor, my duty as I see it is to do just exactly nothing. Mary Ellen Markham did live to see 50, but only for a few days. Just long enough to make her gift to the clinic. Harry Baxter and the company? Well, Harry came back from Europe, and he said he found some, quote, mistake, unquote, in the policy that requires the company to pay off on it anyway. <laughs> Eccentric? We should have more of them like that. Expense account total? Are you kidding Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Savings Deposits Program.
from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ben Orloff, Mr. Dollar, at Continental Insurance Company in New York. Oh, yes, Mr. Orloff. What can I do for you? Did you ever hear of a place called Virtue? Are you kidding? I'm very serious. Oh, wait a minute. Virtue, South Carolina? That's right. You, uh, want me to go down there? Yes, if you will. <laughs> Do you have a bulletproof vest and a couple of extra handguns I can take along? Well, my one suggestion would be that you do not take along any firearms. After all, ex-gangsters... Yeah, I see what you mean. All right, what do you want me to do? Our representative has his office in Georgetown. He can give you the whole story. His name is Joseph Pigatello. Got it, Joseph Pig... Smokey Pigatello? The guy whose name was linked with Murder Incorporated a few years back? Yes, Dollar Joe Smokey Pigatello. You, uh... Sure you want this assignment? Well, I'll tell you this, Mr. Orloff. Yes? If you don't have to pay off on my insurance policy before I'm through, well, mister, this is going to cost you a whopping big expense account. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Insurance Company, Georgetown, South Carolina office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Village of Virtue matter. Expense account item one, $47 even, transportation and all the incidentals I could think of, Hartford, Connecticut to Georgetown, South Carolina. Item two, a dollar for a cab to Continental's office on Screven Street. Hi, Dollar. I'm Joe Pigatello. Uh, glad to see you. Sit down. Thanks. Now, look, Joe, before we go into this matter, there's something I'd like to know. <laughs> sure, pal. Ask it. Just what are you doing in the insurance business? Look, you remember back in New York just before Tom Dewey took over as DA? The great holy racket buster? Yeah, and I'm sure you do. Okay. Well, I was just a young punk then, but I was a bright one. Ambitious, you know. Finished up my high school, started taking law. You studied law? Why not? I could have cleaned up. You know, mouthpiece for some of the mob, some of the boys I knocked around with. But then Dewey came along, broke up the racket, so I gave it up. To do what, Joe? Oh, you know, this and that. Chicago for a while with some of the boys Al Capone left behind. And down near the border at San Diego for a while. Smuggling then... narcotics across from Mexico? Then some of us tried Las Vegas, but we didn't get any... What was that crack? Well... Listen, I'm clean. You make a crack like that, you can prove it, okay. If you can't, don't say it. You were telling me how you got into the insurance business. All right. When I'm taking you on this case, don't talk like that. The gents I deal with don't like it. And don't forget, whatever you think about them, you could also be wrong. Okay, Joe. Two kinds of wrong, Dollar. Just plain wrong and dead wrong. You see what I mean? All right, as I was saying, uh, how I got in this insurance racket. As you were saying. Well, some of the boys from New York and Chicago and around did pretty good. Instead of blowing all that dough on booze and dames and big times, they were smart. They leased an old plantation up in the valley north of here on the P.D. River. The old Caraway Plantation. It's right next to the town of Virtue. Great name for a hideout, I'll say that. I didn't say hideout, Dollar. It was just a nice, quiet place where they could live it up in a nice, quiet way. And at the same time, they wouldn't have any cops around their neck. No police in Virtue? <laughs> Nobody but old Polly Caraway. Anyhow, after six, eight months of taking it easy, mint juleps and hunting and fishing instead of being on the lamb all the time... Well, Johnny, you wouldn't believe it. What do you mean? Well, they all settled down there to spend the rest of their life. They all went respectable. Every last one of them. You sure of that? Well, it's been 20 years now. Can you be any more sure than that? I don't know. But uh, go on with what you were saying. All right. I, I got an idea. I signed up with this little insurance company. Then I went up to Virtue and made the pitch. They're all respectable now, and they got to make like respectable people and cover themselves with a lot of insurance. And it worked? <laughs> you remember Lefty Stemper? The old-time numbers king for Chicago? Right. Bookies, slot machines, everything. Oh, pal of mine. So when he told the rest he was buying insurance, well, Johnny, I got policies on every one of them. The rest of the town, too. On their life, their homes, everything. Okay. Now let's get to the point. What's happened up there in Virtue? Trouble, Johnny. Old man Carraway for me. What kind of trouble? Well, 20 years now, the boys and the people in Virtue have been getting along fine. 
The boys have been behaving themselves, and the, the people in town are all nice people. Until a couple of weeks ago. What happened? Bully Magoon had himself a nice little fishing boat. Had it ever since he went straight and moved in up there. Twenty years ago. Now somebody stole it. Well, why don't you just pay off his claim and forget it? Listen, a couple of days after that, Mr. Avery, that runs the general store in Virtue, had his boat stolen. So you'll have to pay another claim. But small ones, Joe. Look, will you listen? Ever since then, not a day has gone by that somebody hasn't had something stolen from him. Mostly the people in Virtue. Boats, cars, money, furniture, anything you can think of. The people blame the boys, and the boys blame the people. And, Johnny, there's going to be a civil war in Virtue unless somebody finds out who's doing this. And if that happens, there's going to be a lot of killing. And, well, with all the insurance I've sold, me and the company are going to be in trouble. Well, can't you get the state police to come in? State police? Invite you? You said it's a real respectable community now. Yeah, sure it is. But, well, dragging them in might really start things off. That, well, that's why I had to send for you. <sighs> Look, why don't we go up there so I can see for myself? <laughs> sure, Johnny, sure. But, hey, uh, open your coat. What? I mean, if you're going to take along that lemon squeezer... Well, take my advice and don't. <laughs> you have a pretty sharp eye, Joe. Johnny, boy, I can spot a shoulder holster a mile away. But so can some of the boys up in the valley on the plantation. And I don't want you to end up with a slug between your eyes. Real respectable people. Well, uh, shall we go? Uh, my car's outside. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Huh? At least a couple of them. What are you talking about? Uh, nothing, Joe. Let's go. <laughs> Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Florida state flag bears the Red Cross of St. Andrew in sympathy with the flag of the Confederacy on a field of white. Centered over the cross is the state seal. Within a golden circle, the sun, an emblem of glory and splendor representing absolute authority, peers over a highland in the distance. Flowers, a symbol of hope and joy, are scattered by an Indian maiden, indicative of the Indian influence within the state. Centered is the cocoa or palm tree, an emblem of victory, justice, and royal honor. Florida state flag, the flag of the 27th state to enter the Union, was adopted in 1900. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Village of Virtue Matter. <laughs> Joe Picatello, erstwhile gangster turned insurance agent, led me out to his car and we headed north out of Georgetown, South Carolina. After 20 miles or so, we swung onto a side road paralleling the P.D. River. Then finally, we came to the old Caraway Plantation. Acres and acres of huge old live oak trees festooned with Spanish moss. Flowers, millions of them. Azaleas, iris, roses, rhododendron bushes aflame with color in the afternoon sun. Then, at the end of a broad, tree-lined path, the fine old colonial mansion with its towering pillars. The property faced the curving, lazy yellow river. And lying across it was a broad expanse of marshy grass, crisscrossed here and there by canals, through which the slaves in olden times hauled the rice crop to the riverboats. Yeah, it was a beautiful spot. A calm, quiet, peaceful spot. Apparently. Well, here we are, Johnny. Let's go in and see if anybody... What? Hey, hey, hold it, hold it, you punks! It's me, Smokey! Smokey! Who else? Put those guns away! You want to get in trouble? Don't you guys know no better to come barging in this way without letting us know you're coming? Come on, Johnny. Sure. <sighs> nice, peaceful spot, huh? Who's that you got with you, Smokey? Boys, this is Johnny Dollar. He's from the insurance company. Uh, Johnny, uh, this is Bo Magoon. Yeah, hi. And uh, this is Lefty Stemper. Hiya. Johnny Dollar, huh? And the shrimp there is Flippy Lakovich. Hiya, J Johnny. I'm pleased to meet you. What the... That's your way, Flippy. What did you bring here? Smokey a dick or something? Yeah, Dollar. What's the idea of packing a rod? All right, all right. Let him go, you guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, he's on our side. He's up here to find the stuff that's been stolen. Yeah. We don't need no outside help. Oh, you've uh, found who's behind the thefts, huh, Lefty? No. If it's any of your business, it is I don't my th business. You're interrupting me. Yeah, Dollar, shut up. I say we'll find out who's coming over here from virtue and taking our stuff ourselves. And when we do, we'll eliminate them. Right back to the old days, huh? If we got to, to protect our rights. How about letting me have my gun? Well? Here, yeah, Flippy, he wants his gun. Huh? <laughs> 
You make a move the dollar and I'll flip you so fast that Oh, you'll... you mean like this? <laughs> hey, 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 it's Flippy got flipped. a boy, Johnny. Yeah, the shrimp finally got it. <laughs> hey, Johnny Dolly, you're okay. Anybody else want to get smart? <laughs> He caught me off of good guard. You're an expert, have Flippy. Well, you ain't any more. Now, Lefty, I'll take my gun. Oh, oh sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're okay, Johnny. Dunn. All right, now let's get things straight. I'm not the cops, but I'll drag them in if necessary. Oh, no, listen. You listen. I'm going to try to stop what's going on around here, and if any one of you interferes, I'll have you locked up so fast you won't know what's happened to you. No, no, wait a minute. Now listen to me, will you, Dollar? Well, look. I guess we're all kind of shaky. You know, we're... <clears throat> well, we, we're sort of uh, somewhat upset by the events of the past couple of weeks or two. You, you know what I mean? Lefty, Joe told me that if the burglaries, robberies, whatever they are, go on much longer, there's liable to be a war between you and the people of the town. Well, you ain't worried, no. We got enough guns and ammo stashed away around to shut Double. up again. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Lefty, sure. I'm sure you have. But if you ever expect to make peace again with the townspeople, if you expect to stay on here... We got at least 15 I years to go. Shut up. Okay. All right, look. <clears throat> All we got here is our uh, hunting rifles and we're shotguns and a uh, couple of pistols. In case of a snake, you know, while we're hunting or fishing here in the swamps. <clears throat> A lot of cottonmouths around here, you know. Yeah, that's a fact, Johnny. The point is, I didn't come here without providing for any and every exigency. Uh, well, 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 what's that mean? Oh, boy, what a dope. <clears throat> it, it means if anything happens to him, we're dead. Now, uh, ain't that... Uh, excuse me. Uh, isn't that right, Dollar? Right. You see? Now, give me a hand, cooperate with me, and maybe we can clear this thing up. Don't... And I have only one alternative. Well, 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 what's that mean? Shut up. And that's to have you legally ousted from here, out of the state if necessary. Oh, now, look, Dollar. We'll cooperate. Now, I don't mind telling you, we love this place. Look, it's the only real home we got. Flippy and Sadie, we got Bull and Mary and me and Nora. Maybe, maybe we got records, all right. Now, some of us maybe did time for some of the little jobs we pulled, huh? But we've been playing it straight since we come here all along the line. It's like I told you, Johnny. Yeah, honest. Look, that's the way we want to keep it. If the people in virtue will just leave us keep it that way. And, and you know something? I, I don't get it. Don't get what, Lefty? Well, over 20 years, everything's been nice and okay, huh? Now they got to start this. What about the losses they've suffered? They ask me, Dollar, they're phonies to cover up for robbing our stuff. Nobody asked you. Oh. Maybe they think the same way about your losses. Huh? Say. Yeah. Now, where's the owner of this place? Uh, Carraway? Oh, yeah. He's over in Virtue at his office. Office? Sure. He's a mayor and a police. All right. Joe and I are going over to see him. Now, now, Johnny... Oh, uh, Smokey, will you please don't go? They see you guys coming from here, they're going to take a shot at you. That Caraway told me so. Yeah. Sure. Uh, we'll take that chance. Come on, Joe. Well, uh, I, I'll tell you, Johnny. Tell I... me along the way. Come on. The more I thought about the whole thing, the sillier it all seemed. Yet it was obvious that even after 20 years, Lefty and Bull and Flippy might think of only one way to settle their problems. With a gun. And if the people of virtue were feeling the same way. But as Joe and I walked along the main, the only street of the little town, there were no signs of hostility or even suspicion toward us. Now, now look, Johnny. If those bums back at the plantation are making this trouble... Why? Why would they, Joe? Well, that's what I don't get. But what if they don't like your interfering and uh, decide to knock you off? Then I'll probably go to my grave unmourned, unremembered. Yeah, but you told Lefty you'd provided for every exigent... For, well, for if anything should happen to you. Yeah, and he and the boys believed it. And if anything does, the... Huh? Yeah. All I can hope is that they keep on believing. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Sometimes a quotation is a helpful thing because it points out some wisdom that helps us to lead better lives. Here's one that struck me as being very wise and true. Dr. Samuel Johnson, that wise and witty man immortalized by Boswell, said, quote, It matters not how a man dies, but how he lives, unquote. A man's life may be long or short, but the way he lives it is the important thing. It's important, no matter what he does, that he have integrity. 
loyalty, and honor, and a sound code of conduct. Enlisting at the age of 17 with his parents' permission, Corporal Charles L. Gilliland found himself soon after his 18th birthday in a narrow defile in the middle of the treacherous rocky terrain of Tongman Ni, Korea. At 2.30 a.m. that moonlit morning of April 25th, 1951, Corporal Gilliland's Army Unit, Company I, 7th Infantry Regimental Combat Team of the 3rd Division, became the focal point of a murderous assault from Chinese Communist forces. The fighting became brutal and bloody. The brunt of the attack was directed up the defile guarded by Gilliland with his automatic rifle. The slashing barrage of small arms, automatic weapons, mortar, and artillery fire was dropping the men all around him. Gilliland faced the full force of the assault and, advancing against tremendous odds, poured a steady fire into the attacking forces and eventually halted them. For valiant and heroic conduct, Corporal Charles Gilliland was awarded the Medal of Honor. Although in age, he still may have been considered a boy, he had lived and died like a man. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Village of Virtue Matters. Joe Pigatello and I walked the main street of Virtue, South Carolina, unmolested, virtually unnoticed. And we found the mayor, Parley Carraway, in the little shack that served for an office. I'm also the police chief, Mr. Dollar. Don't you forget that, sir. And you found no clue as to who has been committing the robberies? No, sir. None whatsoever. But who else would do it? They're all three of them ex-gangsters. Sure. Ex-gangsters. Why, Mr. Carraway? Why would these men suddenly want to make trouble with their friends, your townspeople? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Unless, of course, they think they can take over the way they used to take over gangs in the old days. After 20 years of a happy relationship? Mr. Carraway, they never made a bit of trouble in all that time. I know it, I know it. But the fact remains that unless this trouble stops, after all, Virtue was here long before they came, unless it stops, I say, I shall have to break their lease and make them leave the plantation. Oh, they pay you pretty well for it, huh? Enough to keep it in good repair. And... Hey, that's a beautiful ring you're wearing. Huh? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, two and a half carat diamond, sir. Yeah. And is that your nice new car out front? Yeah, it certainly is. Ain't it pretty? About $8,000, pretty. Yeah. Hey, didn't you have a new one last year, too, Mr. Carraway? Of course. I try to have one every year. But now, gentlemen... Tell me one thing, Mr. Carraway. Uh, yes, sir? If you really think the robberies around here are going to cause so much trouble... Oh, I do. I do. That's why I contacted uh, Mr. Picatello. Well, why haven't you called in the state police? Because I am the mayor of Virtue. I'm the police department. And I can take care of these things myself. And now that you gentlemen have witnessed the bad blood between these gangsters and the people of the town, well, sir, I'm going to throw them off that plantation. In spite of all the money they've been paying you? Yes, sir, and I'm sure you gentlemen will back me up in... Uh, all the money, did you say? Enough to keep you well-dressed, well-fed, and fancy cars. And now look here, sir. Do you realize how much that property will bring? Well, that depends. How much have you been offered? I'll tell you how much. A hundred and twenty-four thousand. Ah. How did you know? You just told me. Well, now listen. You also you... told me why you've been robbing the people of virtue and those men at the plantation to stir up bad feeling, uh, give you an excuse to get them out. What? Johnny, you're right. Uh, uh, now, just... just Tear uh, away uh, if uh, I do call in the state police. It'll be to have you locked up. No. And if Joe here has any sense, he'll tell the insurance company to bring charges of fraud against you. You said it. Oh, but the money. Think of all the money I could make selling the old place. Now, where's the stuff that's been stolen? It hasn't been harmed. It's stored away, carefully stored away. I was going to give it back when, when those men left, and, and I could sell the place. Give them their stuff, too? Oh, I'd make up for it in cash, every cent of it in cash, yes. I'd, I'd say it was for breaking the lease. Truly, Mr. Dollar. Now, you listen, you old money-grubbing crook. You're in trouble. You... you call in the state police? You bet I will. Unless... Unless what, sir? First, you lay off the plantation. You've leased it to those men. Let them have it. And return all the stuff you stole. Oh, but if they find out... Well, you figured how to get it away from them. Now figure out how to get it back. Discover it, anything you like. Well, the point is that if you don't get it back, I'll tell them where it is. Oh. And you know what that'll mean. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. I'll, I'll get it back. Also respect that lease. I believe it has 15 more years to run. Yes, sir, it has. I will. Okay. I... Do all this and Joe and I will forget the whole thing. But if you don't, 
And Joe will be checking on you. You said it. Oh, but I will, I will, Mr. Dollar. I promise you I'll okay. get right on this. Come on, Joe. Let's go back to the plantation and have a drink with some respectable citizens. <laughs> Yeah, this insurance business really has some funny ones. And I guess it's the funny ones that balance out the bad, the tragic cases. Anyhow, I like it. Expense account total, including the trip back to Hartford. Oh, uh, call it a hundred bucks even. And in view of our little, uh, secret, Joe, well, maybe you'd better pay it out of petty cash. And listen, those pals of yours, you better drop in on them now and then to make sure they do stay on the straight and narrow, as well as that old coot caraway. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Michigan's state flag was born on February 22nd, 1837. Because of the strategic role played by Michigan in the War of 1812, the word, to a bore, I will defend, is prominent on the blue flag of Michigan. Beneath it, a rising sun casts its rays over a lake, and a man standing on a peninsula with his right hand raised, symbolizing peace, while in his left hand he holds a gun, indicating that although they love peace, the people of Michigan are ready to defend their state and nation. Another motto, the state's official one, is at the base of the flag. Seek queris peninsulum emonem circumspice. If you seek a pleasant peninsula, look about you. Thus does Michigan's flag carry its own invitation to visit one of America's scenic areas. Michigan state flag, the flag of the 26th state to enter the Union, was adopted on August 1st, 1911. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a strange series of fires. And believe me, the reason for them is a strange one, too. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Frank Nelson, Billy Hallop, Jack Crucian, Peter Leeds, Gil Stratton, and Will Wright. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Jim Paris at Worldwide Mutual. Don't tell me, Jim. Let me guess. Huh? 
What are you talking about? The reason you call me, I can smell the smoke all the way over here at my apartment. Oh, well. Also, I heard something about the fire on a news broadcast a few minutes ago. Yes. Somewhere out on Albany Avenue, he said. Yes, it's the cash and save market over the other side of town. And since your company insured it, you want me to go over and take a look? A good look, Johnny. You thinking of possible arson? I am. Okay, why? That store is just one of a chain. Hartford, Boston, Providence, Springfield, Lowell. Yeah, yeah, I see. But how does that make it arson? This is the fourth one to go up in as many weeks. Oh. The outfit that owns them having financial troubles? The outfit that owns them is one man. Oh. John Wakefield Carson. Then I repeat my question. Johnny, if he is burning up his own markets, if you can prove it, you can save our company a lot of money. That might cost you a lot of money, Jim. What do you mean? Wait till you see my expense account. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Carson arson matter. Expense account item one, a dollar and a quarter for a taxi from my apartment to the offices of Worldwide, where I hoped Jim Paris could give me a little more to go on. He did. Very little. First loss four and a half weeks ago was the market up in Thompsonville. How much? Loss in Thompsonville, $41,204. That was the smallest one in the chain. Uh Uh-huh. The following week, the one over in Fall River burned to the ground. And the claim on that? Uh, some $58,000-odd. Nothing odd about that much, though. And the loss in Lowell was a bit over (sighs) $64,000. How much the claim will be on this one here in Hartford remains to be seen. How much coverage does he have on it? Around $100,000, I believe. Yes, 106,000. Well, then that's probably what he's going to claim. Look, you can still see the smoke out there. Yes, and the telephone report I just got says it looks like a total loss. Will you go over and take a look at it? John Wakefield Curse. That's right. His office is up in Boston. That's where his newest, biggest market is. Oh, how much insurance on that one? Nearly half a million. It's one of the largest, most modern supermarkets. Then I'd better get over and see him in a hurry. Hmm? You want me to get there before that one goes up, don't you? Expense account item two, four fifty for a cab to the scene of the fire way out on Albany Road. Three or four fire companies were hard at it, but it was easy to see there wasn't a chance of saving much. It struck me that this location, part of a brand new residential area, was about as far from an established fire company as it could be. I wondered for a moment if this was deliberate. I finally ran down Hal Gibbons, an old pal, and one of the best men an arson squad ever had. Stick your nose up in the air and take a deep one, Johnny. You smell it? Well, it's not kerosene, Hal. I don't think it's gasoline, either. No, but it's something highly inflammable. The boys of that chemical truck could get it out. Might learn something. Of course, these stores always stock a lot of cleaning fluids, stuff like that. Most of them are not inflammable. Well, how about... Johnny, look out! Hey, maybe we'd better move back a ways. Yeah. Must have got a pretty big start on the fireman, Hal. Sure, because it's so far out. It's like the markets in Thompsonville and Fall River. And Lowell, too. Oh, kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? At this point, I'm more than just wondering, Johnny. Have you come up with anything? Those other towns are out of my bailiwick, but I know all the boys in the departments. Have they come up with anything? No, and that's why I feel I've got to get the first lead, if there is one, right here. Has old man Carson showed up? No, not during any of the fires. He just sits calmly in his office in Boston, mutters something philosophical about the vagaries of fortune, and lets it go at that. And files a big, fat insurance claim. I think I want to see that guy, Carson. I don't think it'll do you any good, but go to it. Know anything about his financial situation? He's loaded. Multimillionaire. And boy, what a queer one. What's that mean? A regular nut. Always quoting Shakespeare, the Bible, poetry, but a good businessman. You sure he hasn't got some big investments, something like that, that went bad on him recently? I'm sure. 
There has to be some No, get back, I tell you. You've got to stay back in the line. You want to keep your job, you tell your chief I'm here, and I want to know why this fire got out of hand. Well, who's that? Now, look, miss, I got orders. Don't choke on them. It's all right, Jerry, I'll take care of her. Whatever you say, Mr. Gibbons, but I got orders. It's okay. Well, Miss Carson, it looks like you're losing another market. This is the fourth one. The fourth one and a little over a... Hey, don't I know you? I'm afraid I haven't had the pleasure. Miss Margaret Carson, this is Johnny Dollar. The insurance investigator. Good. Now, maybe we'll get somewhere. Oh, this is... Walter. Walter! What? Oh! Yes, Margaret? My fiancé, Mr. Dollar. Walter Smitten. Smitten? Hello, Walter. Mr. Gibbon? Walter handles the legal end of things for Dad. Oh, I see. Next president of the company, Walter? I? In the grocery business? Oh, no. No, sir, thank you. The legal end is enough for me. What do you think about these fires? Four in a row. Well, if I were you, Mr. Dollar, I'd suspect arson. Oh, Walter, for heaven's sake. Why, Walter? Mm -hmm. Someone trying to put Mr. Carson out of business, something like that. Put father out of business with a couple of fires? (laughs) Miss Carson... Come on, Walter, we've seen all we need to make the final report to Dad. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, uh, see ya. Like a motive, Johnny? That Walter character? If he marries Margaret Carson, and he doesn't seem to like the grocery business... Yeah, but if he could get the money from it. Yeah, I see what you mean. Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. South Dakota's state flag was inspired by a song, South Dakota is the Sunshine State. A stenographer named Ida Anding designed the flag with a sky blue background and a blazing sun in the center. And the words, South Dakota, the Sunshine State, in gold around the sun. Later, the state seal was inserted over the sun, a seal representing mining and agriculture, the prime pursuits of the state. The state's banner also carries the motto, Under God, the People Rule. South Dakota state flag, the flag of the 40th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 8, 1909. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Carson Arson Matter. Expense account item three, 20 cents, phone call from a booth near the scene of the fire. I wanted more information from Jim Paris at Worldwide Mutual. Information about the policies covering the 13 cash and save markets, four of which had recently gone up in flames. I waited in the phone booth until Jim called me back. Johnny Dollar. Jim here. Oh, good. All right, here's the list of markets, Johnny, in the order of insurance coverage, starting with the smallest amount. Go ahead. Thompsonville, Fall River, Lowell, Hartford. That's the same order in which they burn. Exactly. Okay. Which remaining store has the next biggest coverage? Salem. Okay, I'll start with Salem. What are you thinking of, Johnny? It's just a hunch, Jim, but... Well, I'll call you later. Item four, five dollars and a quarter for a cab back to my apartment. Item five, twenty-one dollars even, mileage in my own car, Hartford to Salem, Mass. Despite burning up the highway, it was almost dark when I pulled into Salem. It was well after dark when I finally located the cash and save market. Again, the store was far outside of town, and it was a long way from the nearest firehouse. I don't know exactly why I went there instead of the main office in Boston. After all, it was the same day as the Hartford fire... And the others had all been about a week apart. As I said before, call it a hunch. But as I pulled up in front of the place, I saw the shadow of a man dart furtively around the back of the building. As I reached the far corner of the building, I stopped. But with only the sliver of a crescent moon, I could see no one. Somewhere ahead of me, I heard a door open. Then silence again. But somebody had entered that building. Slowly, cautiously, I felt my way along the wall. And then I came to it. An open door. Storeroom. But inside it was pitch black. 
I drew my gun and carefully, quietly fell around for a light switch. After stumbling gently against a big packing case, I found it. I hunched down behind the case and flicked it on. All right, where are you? I heard you. I saw you come in here. Now, look, I got a gun, so don't try anything funny. You hear me? Where are you? Right huh? over your head! Oh! I must have been out a long time. I came to lying on a cot in the back room of Salem Police Headquarters. A couple of gallon jars. It. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Well, it was a couple of big gallon jars of kosher pickles that he dropped on top of your head. He, officer? Well, I'd like to split your head open. So he brought you in here to headquarters and had the doc look you over. Up. Easy now. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, doc says no permanent harm done. He give you a shot to make you sleep and rest. Now, how about this cup of hot coffee? Yeah, sure. And about a dozen aspirins. My head feels like... There you are. Thanks. But you... You said he... Well, according to him, you left yourself wide open when you sneaked in there after him. And then to turn on the lights... Son, you've got a lot to learn. Okay, so I pulled a bubble. But do you know who it was that slugged me? Of course, son. He brought you here. Who? Owner of the market. What? Mr. John Wakefield Carson. Item six, two dollars, more mileage on my car. This time down to Boston in the main office of Cash and Save Markets. To the private office of John Wakefield Carson. Please be calm of mind. All passion spent, Mr. Dollar. What? That's from Milton. Please sit down. <sighs> now, look, Mr. Carson, about last night... Vadoff plays tricks upon us all. It did so in bringing us together last night. How did you know I was going to investigate that market of yours up in Salem? Well, I didn't know. But look, you young man. Yeah? The fires which destroyed those four markets did so in order their value to me. So I found out. Well, possibly then the next to go would be the store in Salem. For that indeed is next in order of value. It figures. Or perhaps it was mere coincidence those accidents occurred in that order. Accidents? Remember, coincidence breeds further coincidence. That's a quotation from Brasco. Now listen to me, Mr. Carson. But for that reason, I decided to inspect the Salem store myself. Inspect it, huh? To make sure there'd be no possibility of spontaneous combustion there. Let's get one thing straight right now, Mr. Carson. Uh, yes? I think those fires were set. And if you'll come down to earth... Possible, I suppose. It was Shakespeare who said fire answers fire. Oh, for... Through their paley flames, each sees the other's umbered face. Listen to me, will you? Uh, oh, of course. I think you set those fires, or had them set. By Mr. Dollar. I think you were going to burn down the store in Salem until I came along. When I saw you there, I thought that was your intent. Oh, sure, sure. All right, tell me this. What do you plan to do with the insurance money, if you get it? Rebuild? Bigger and better stores where the old ones stood? Oh, no. Or did you find out you hadn't made them big and modern enough for those real estate developments where they were located? And decided the cheapest way for you no. to do... No. No. To build again where tragic dealt the fate. Forget the fancy quotes and answer my question. Shakespeare said you tread upon my patience, sir. Look. It's most enough to make a deacon swear. That's by James Russell. Mr. Carson. What disposition of the funds I choose to make is mine alone to settle. And from my heart. Carson. Enough. <laughs> I've had enough of this. Now be on your way. No, wait a minute. Be gone, Dollar. And irk me now no more. Now you wait. From your heart, you said. And now I have said enough. Henceforth, my lips are sealed. Okay, okay. But you know something? I think you've told me who might have set those fires. And if you'll answer me just one more question. No? Okay, we'll see. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Sometimes we may wonder why a football team doesn't quit playing and walk off the field when it finds itself 50 points behind with only a few minutes of play to go. What is that indomitable spirit that fills men with hope and keeps them going in spite of terrific odds? 
keeps them going just to play the game according to the rules, just to get the job done as well as they know how. This kind of spirit pervaded the feelings of heavy bomber crews of the Ninth Air Force on that day of glory, August 1st, 1943, the day of one of the most secretly planned surprise bombing missions of World War II, the day of the low-level attack on the Romanian oil refineries at Ploeste. More than 170 B-24 heavily loaded bombers took off in a swirl of red dust from Benghazi, Libya to bomb a highly defended priority target. The element of surprise in the low-level attack was to be one of their greatest weapons. But things went wrong from the start. Three planes exploded during takeoff operations. Eleven more aborted due to engine trouble. Of those that reached the target area, less than one-third returned to home base. The leaders of the mission encountered navigation difficulties and difficulty in identifying the specific targets. And due to the loss of that elemental hope, surprise, they also encountered devastating enemy firepower from flak and fighters. The mission was partially successful, but a horrifying experience. Five medals of honor were awarded to the heroes of the Ploeste raid for valorous action above and beyond the call of duty. At any time, the men would have been justified in turning back. But they had a code of conduct that made them want to see the unequal game through to the end. It was a job that had to be done. A charge of the light brigade in the air as they flew down the valley of death to glory. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Carson Arson Matter. <laughs> Expense account item 780 cents. Phone call to Hal Gibbons and the arson squad back in Hartford. Yeah, Johnny, I finally found plenty in the remains of that fire. Then it was arson. By some rank amateur. That's why it was hard to spot. What do you mean? When a pro sets a blaze, we know what to look for. I see. Now, what about the other three fires? I called the boys in those cities immediately. Heard back from them this morning. Same story. All right. Have you checked on Walter, what's his name, the fiancé of Carson's daughter? You mean stepdaughter. Stepdaughter? I have, and that's what stops me. Alibis, huh? Perfect. Walter Smitten couldn't possibly have started those fires. I didn't think so. Huh? Now, that boy may call himself a lawyer, Hal, but he just hasn't the nerve, the gumption. But who else? He stands to benefit if he marries Margaret Carson. And surely you don't think Carson himself... Johnny? Call the Boston police, will you? Have them meet me at Carson's office. What for? Maybe to make an arrest. Do that for me, will you? Hunch? Maybe it was more than a hunch now. Sure, I know there was no real clues in the case, but maybe for once I could get along without them. I went back to Carson's office and, I must confess, tried a little bluff. Caught? You'd hail me into court? That's right. Unless you open up and tell me what I want to know. Very well. Speak to me as to thy thinkings, as thou dost... And you can forget the quotations. Walter Smitten is your lawyer, isn't he? A timid but an eager lad who saved me many a fall. You like him? Like a son. Why would he were my son? Or as the Bible says, a wise son maketh a happy... All right, all right. Uh, Oh, yes, yes. You have a stepdaughter, Margaret. Alas, I have. Okay. Now, who is to get the insurance money you may collect? Well, that, sir, is none of your concern. You're going to talk now, Mr. Carson, but or it's in a court? family matter. Who gets it? I... I pledged to my wife before she died that Margaret would have all monies from any profit, any monetary gain of any kind, of any of my ventures. That would include the insurance money. I see. That, Mr. Dollar, was my pledge, and oh, how I have rued it. Why do you say that? She's not of my blood, Mr. Dollar. She has no soul for art or poetry. And since she's come of age, she's made so many demands upon me. Money, money, money. That's all she thinks of. And unlike Walter, she's so bold, aggressive, headstrong. Were it not for Walter, I'd mistrust her every move. But if he's in love with her... Because she demands he be. And why? So she can use his legal guidance in her fight to take this business away from me. All right, Mr. Carson. I haven't notified the authorities yet, but I've found proof that Margaret is the one who started those fires. You what? And you just told me why. Because the money would go to her. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm glad. I've suspected, yes. But because of family honor, 
No, no, no. I'm glad you have proof. Long last it will take her. Take this millstone from about my neck. Proof, huh? Margaret. Well, Dolly, you'll never live to tell the authorities. Margaret, that, that gun. Unless you'd like to make a deal, Johnny. It would be worth a lot of money to you. I'd even promise not to set any more fires. Oh, you were right, Mr. Dollar. Unless I'm mistaken, Margaret, the man who just came in... What man? ...who heard your little confession is from the police department. Are you trying to make me look around so you can grab for this gun? Oh, no. Fact remains, he's standing right in back of you. <laughs> That's right, Margaret. What? No! No! Oh, my hand! My hand! Oh, my hand! How sharper than a serpent's tooth is an ungrateful child. Yeah, the company will have to pay on those four markets. And the courts will have to take care of market. I'm sure they will. And next time, well, give me something clean to work on, will you? I hate this kind of stuff. Expense account total, including the trip home, $56.90. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Oklahoma's state flag depicts an Osage warrior's circular buckskin shield from which hang seven eagle feathers. Across the shield is the Indian's calumet, or pipe of peace, crossed with a white man's peace symbol, the olive branch. On the shield are small crosses, the Indian's graphic sign for stars, indicating lofty ideals or a purpose for high endeavor. The background of the flag is a field of blue, the blue of the Oklahoma sky, signifying loyalty and devotion. The important symbols, however, are the calumet and the olive branch. These override the shield, the symbol of war, and bespeak a predominant love of peace by a united people. Oklahoma state flag, the flag of the 46th state to enter the Union, was adopted on April 2nd, 1925. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the Rolling Stone matter. Remember that old saying about a Rolling Stone? Well, it applies here with a vengeance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Byron Kane, Harry Bartell, Jack Edwards, Joe Kearns, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.